The Mystery Playhouse, a rebroadcast for the service men and women of the United Nations. Good evening. This is Peter Lauren. The circumstances leading up to horror and tragedy are many times as innocent seeming as a Sunday school picnic. And the perpetrators of evil appear often as ordinary, normal human beings. Yes, but they are capable of conceiving acts of diabolic destruction, as you will hear tonight in the Mystery Playhouse. Listen now to Mr. Boris Karloff in Those Who Walk in Darkness. We look in on a scene taking place in a private room at Bayside Hospital. A man with heavily bandaged eyes lies restlessly in a bed. At his bedside are his wife, Valerie, a nurse, and a famous eye surgeon, Dr. Paul Wade. Dr. Wade looks strangely and intently that is patient before he speaks. The dressings at midnight and again in the morning, nurse. Yes, doctor. Well, doctor, what did you find? Will I be blind? Is it very bad? Now, now, take it easy, Mr. Denton. There's nothing to worry about. Nothing at all. You... You're sure? You aren't just saying that. I'm quite sure. Valerie... Valerie, did you hear that? I... I'm not going to be blind. Valerie? Valerie, where are you? Right here, darling. Did you hear? I won't be blind. Isn't that wonderful? Yes, darling, it's marvelous. You... You don't sound very excited. Valerie, don't you realize I'm going to see again? She doesn't sound excited because I don't want you to be excited, Mr. Denton. You've got to relax. Try to sleep. Sleep? With this ungodly pain? My eyes feel as though they were on fire. That will stop as soon as the opiate I gave you takes hold. You'll be comfortable, I'm sure. Now, good night. You're going now, Doctor? Yes, I'll... I'll look in on... on your husband in the morning. Stephen. Yes, Valerie? Do you mind if I step out into the corridor for a moment? But you... you promise not to leave me. I... I'm afraid, Valerie. Everything's so dark, I... The nurse will be here, dear, if you want anything. I just want to ask Dr. Wade some questions. Questions? But he's already told us that... Yes, Stephen, I know. But I'd like to find out about the treatment and how I'm to take care of you when we get you home, you know. Just little things. All right. But... but hurry back, I... I want you near me. I will, dear. Uh, Good night, Mr. Denton. Good night, Doctor. And thank you. You're quite welcome. After you, Mrs. Denton. Thank you. I suggest we step into the consultation room across the hall. We'll have more privacy. All right. Here we are. Thank you. Well, it's been a long time, Valerie. Yes, Paul, it has. Almost ten years, isn't it? About that. Strange that you should have called me, of all people, to treat your husband's eyes. Oh, I I was panicky, Paul. I didn't know what to do. It all happened so suddenly. Stephen was working in his laboratory at the house when suddenly I heard a violent explosion. I ran in and found him clutching his eyes and screaming, I'm blind. First thing I thought of was an ambulance. Then you... Why didn't you think of me ten years ago? It's not fair, Paul. Was it fair to turn your back on me and then to marry a man almost twice your age? Paul, please, why bring up ancient history? It isn't ancient history to me. I've never forgotten you. Paul, about Stephen's eyes. What about them? I have a feeling that you weren't telling him the truth. You're right. Oh, you mean he's not going to regain his sight? He's going to be blind? Oh, Paul. You don't expect me to be to be terribly concerned, do you, Valerie? 
After all, he did take you away from me. Don't be vindictive, Paul. It wasn't Stephen's fault. He didn't even know of your existence. And you never told him that we were on the point of being married? No, never. (laughs) It's rather ironic that we should meet again at the bedside of my rival. Your husband. A man who may forever walk in darkness. Don't say that, Paul. It's horrible. But unfortunately true. A moment ago, you told me not to be vindictive. I'm not, really. But if I were... I could have my fill of vengeance if I told him about us. And then told him that he'll be blind forever. You wouldn't, Paul. Or I might take another form of revenge. I could tell you that an operation is called for. A very delicate operation. Are you trying to say that there might be a chance? Yes. But supposing I refuse to perform the operation. Paul, you're joking. You can't mean that. Perhaps not. But you call me vindictive. Suppose I operate and my scalpel slips. What if he dies? That would be murder. You're not a murderer, Paul. You wouldn't risk your professional reputation. Why must you torment me this way? You really love him, don't you? Yes, I do. Then forget the things that I've been saying. I want you to think of me... As a friend, I want you to trust me. I do trust you, Paul. Thank you. Now as to the possibility of surgery. Here is the situation. The transparent film over your husband's eyes, the corneas, were burned and torn with the explosion. They've been so damaged that blindness will result, even though the eyes heal. But you think an operation would cure that? Possibly, although it's a very delicate job. The injured cornea must be peeled away and replaced by a fresh, healthy one. Where can you get healthy corneas? From the eyes of the dead. Oh. It isn't quite as horrible as it sounds, Valerie. You know, dying people often will their eyes for just this purpose. We maintain what we call a corneal bank. It's much the same as a blood bank, only but there's this difference. Corneal tissue can't be stored more than 48 hours. It must be fresh, or it's no good. You have some available in the bank? No, that's the trouble. I'm afraid we haven't. But there's got to be some, Paul. I don't know where, Valerie. Unless... Unless what? I was just thinking. Last night, one of the interns asked me to look at a charity case that puzzled him. He lives in a dirty little shack near the waterfront. Yes, Paul. I stopped by and examined him. I found an incurable condition. There's no way to save him. He won't live more than a day or two. But his eyes are healthy. You mean, you think he might... I don't know. You'd have to have his consent, of course. Take me to him, Paul. I'm sure I can make him understand. Oh, it may not be so easy, Valerie. He's a strange person. A mystic and a spiritualist. Let me try Just take me to him. All right. We can go there now. How can anyone live down here, Paul? wet streets and fog rolling in from the river. I shudder. You'd be surprised where people are forced to live. That's the house over there. That, that gray shack. Does he live alone? No. There's a toothless old woman, I don't know where he picked her up, who keeps house for him. She's rather hideous and I suspect a bit demented. So don't be frightened when you see her. I'll try not to be. Here we are. There's no bell. Those fog horns are giving me cold shivers. Yes, they do sound eerie. Here comes the old woman. Yes? We'd like to see Chandra, please. You can't. He's getting ready to go away. Chandra's going on a long journey. Yes, we know. We'd like to see him before he leaves. We are friends of his. I said we are friends of Chandra. I was here last night. 
Don't you remember? All right. Come in. His room's at the end of the hall. You know the way. I have to stay here by the stove. I'm cooking something. Yes, something for Chandra's journey. I see. Come, Valerie. Oh, she's ghastly. But harmless, I'm sure. Here, this is the room. Hmm. Dark in there. Yes, but there's a lamp burning. But the wick is down. I'll turn it up. There, that's better. Paul, there on the cart. Is he alive? Yes, still alive. Chandra. Chandra. Who calls Chandra? It's Dr. Way. You remember me? I was here last night. Yes. Chandra remembers, but it is too late. I am going away on a journey. I know. That's why I've come. I brought a young lady with me, Chandra. She has a favor to ask. Chandra has no favors to grant. Soon I will start to the other side. Let her tell you what she wants, Chandra. Now go ahead, Valerie. Chandra? Well? Chandra, my husband suffered an accident. A- an explosion. It- his eyes. <laughs> oh, Paul, I can't. You tell him, please. All right. Can you hear me, Chandra? I hear you. Now, this young lady's husband just lost the sight of both his eyes. He'll be completely blind unless I perform an immediate operation. Unless I take parts of two healthy eyes and place them on him. She's asking that you give her your eye. Do you understand? I understand I am visited by those who would rob me. But you're going to die anyway. Die? No, you are wrong. There is no death. I am going on a journey. Please, please help me, Chandra. No, I will need my eyes. I will need them to see into the great beyond. To guide me through eternity. The eyes... Are the windows of the soul. I'll give you anything you ask. I'll... No. No, I said no. No, I... Oh. Oh. Something's happened. He's dead. Then it's all right. You can take his eyes. No, I can't. He refused you. Paul, listen to me. A doctor's first duty is to the living, to heal them, to make them whole. What responsibility have you to this this lifeless thing? It's a matter of professional ethics, Valerie. Paul, you've got to do it. For me. Blindness would drive Stephen out of his mind. He's always hated the dark, like a little boy. Paul, please. It wouldn't be right, Valerie. It's a matter of life and death, not right or wrong. Paul... Paul, you have your surgical kit with you. Yes, but... Paul. Paul, please. I beg you. All right. Close the door. It's good to be home again, Valerie. That hospital room was beginning to get me down. It's going to be even better once the bandages are taken off. Yes. Just another week, that's what Wade said. Oh, he's a good doctor, Valerie. I I like him. I'm glad. Imagine being able to see again after all these weeks of darkness. I've never liked the dark. (laughs) Why... It will be like coming into a new world. Yes. Tell me, what sort of an operation was it, Valerie? Well, I... I don't know. You don't... 
You sound like you're trying to hide something. Oh, don't be silly, Stephen. Oh, that must be Paul. <laughs> Dr. Wade, no. I- I'd better let him in, Stephen. I think Jenny's in bed. Good evening, uh, Mrs. Denton. Good evening, Doctor. Sorry I'm so late, but I had an emergency call. Oh, it's quite all right. Hello, Doctor. Well, how is the patient? Oh, fine, fine, thank you. And anxious to get these bandages off. Patience is a virtue. Yes. But blindness is a curse. Don't be so morbid, Stephen. You're very lucky. Yes. I know I am. Uh, it, it's a warm night, isn't it, Doctor? Yes, a lovely night. Stars and a new moon. They say a new moon's a good omen if you look at it over your left shoulder. Did you know I was superstitious, Doctor? Well, I guess we all are in one way or another. Yes. Oh, would it be all right if we took a short walk in the garden while Valerie makes some coffee? That is, if you have the time, Doctor. Yes, plenty of time. Well, can't I come along? Oh, no, this is a stag party. You you, you fix some coffee for us like a good girl, and we'll be back shortly. All right. Here, we can go out through the terrace. Here, let me take your arm. Thank you, Doctor. Oh. What a gorgeous night. Yes, isn't it? See how the moon is... I... Oh, sorry, old fellow. I forgot for a moment. That's all right. I, I'll be seeing it soon enough, thanks to you. And now you're seeing it for me. Over my left shoulder, I hope. Why, uh, no. It's the right one. That's bad luck. I... Oh, but you couldn't possibly bring me bad luck, Dr. Wade. Not after giving me back my sight. You'll never know what you've done for me. No? No. You can't possibly know how much it was because you're not in love with Valerie. Valerie is my life, Doctor. So young, so beautiful. Without eyes, how can I see her beauty? I, I'm getting on in years, you know, and there, there'd be very little left for me if I couldn't look at Valerie and see the warmth of a smile. Oh, I don't expect you to understand that. Nobody can understand it except the one who's in love. Perhaps you're right. It must be very pleasant to see with the eyes of love, even though the eyes are borrowed. Borrowed? What do you mean? Oh, what? Nothing. Nothing, really. That's not the truth, Doctor. Shall we keep no, walking? No, no, I want you to explain what you meant when you said my eyes are borrowed. It had something to do with the operation you performed, did it not? Now, look, I won't me. be put off. I told you I was superstitious. Give me back my eyes. <gasps> Who said that? Dr. Wade. Who said what? Give me back my eyes. There. A strange voice. I didn't hear anything. Yes, yes. I heard a voice saying, give me back my eyes. Give me back my eyes. There. There it is again, Doctor. Oh, for the love of heaven, whose voice is it? Tell me. Tell me. I'm blind. I can't see. I think perhaps we'd better go in, Mr. No, Dandy. no, no. I tell you, I heard a voice. Oh, but you're tired. Now, come. But I... All right. I, I can't understand it. I swear I heard a strange, no other hollow voice. There was no voice, at least. None that I heard. Here we are. Step up. That's fine. Back so soon? I think you'd better go right to bed, Mr. Denton. You're tired and unnerved. Yes. Yes, I will. Coffee will be ready in just a few minutes. Oh, I... I think I'll retire, Valerie. Is something wrong, Stephen? He's tired. Oh. Oh, here, let me help you. No, no, don't bother, please. I can find my own way. You stay with Dr. Wade. Doctor, are you sure we didn't hear... I'm positive. I see well, good night. 
Good night. I'll be in shortly, Stephen. All right. What happened, Paul? I'd rather not discuss it. Please, you must tell me. Well, it's... It's something I've been worried about. What do you mean? I haven't brought this up before because... I was hoping against hope that the thing I feared was not true. Paul, you don't have to hide anything from me. Is something wrong with Stephen? I'm afraid, sir. I'm afraid the explosion injured his brain as well as his eye. Paul! It isn't going to be easy to take, Valerie. What happened in the garden? He said he heard a strange voice saying, Give me back my eye. Oh, I, I shouldn't be telling you this, Valerie. You're trembling. Oh. I'm thinking of that Hindu, Chandra. You said he was a mystic, a spiritualist. Do you think it's possible that... Oh, no, it couldn't be. No, Valerie. I'm afraid Stephen's brain has been affected. And the horrible part of it is that I'm convinced the complete insanity will set in eventually. Stephen! I heard what you said, Doctor. Oh, Stephen! It's all right, dear. Stephen, darling. Come back into the bedroom, Mr. Denton. I want to talk with you. No, Valerie. You stay out here. Or better yet, go and get me some hot water. Hot water? Yes, I, I think I'll change these bandages and... Uh, I'll want the water boiled. So watch it for at least six minutes. Very well. I'll, I'll go to the kitchen. Now, Mr. Denton, shall we go into your room? It's no use, Doctor. Let me guide you. There. That's fine. I know you're trying to cheer me up, but I tell you it's no use, Dr. Wade. I understand. I'm... Going mad. I'm sorry you overheard. After all, I I could be wrong. Although... Although you know it's true. I may as well be frank with you, Mr. Denton. Give me back my <gasps> eyes. That voice. I tell you, Doctor, I keep hearing that voice. I <laughs> Your imagination is working overtime. Now, I'll get you a sedative. <laughs> Valerie! Oh. Oh, here you are. I thought you were in the kitchen getting some water for me. No, I didn't go. You didn't fool me asking for hot water. Fool you? I'm afraid I don't understand. You monster. You horrible monster. What are you talking about? Get away from that door. Let me go into my husband. Let me tell him. Just a moment. Valerie. Get your hands off me. Let me go. I should have known right from the beginning. Instead, I trusted you. I had faith in you. Valerie! Holding me. Make my skin crawl. Valerie, I demand an explanation. You'll get it, all the explanation you want. I suspected something wrong when you sent me for hot water. That was just to get rid of me. Get me out of the way for six minutes. But I didn't leave this front room. Now listen. I did listen. The bedroom door didn't quite latch. I saw what you did. He couldn't see you because his poor eyes are bandaged. He's blind. But I saw your lips move and I heard you say the words. Give me back my eyes. Valerie, will you please let me... If you don't get your hands off me. You unspeakable monster. Trying to drive Stephen mad. Playing on his superstitions, his fear of the dark, of the unknown. To turn him into a raving maniac. Valerie, be quiet. Quiet? Why, you filthy, desperate... <coughs> what was that? Stephen! Stephen! He shot himself. He's dead! Oh, oh, Stephen... <laughs> Valerie. Go away. Go away. Valerie, it was all for the best. The best? Let me talk to you, Valerie. I can explain everything. You murdered him. I did it for you, darling, for us. Come into the living room and let me explain. You murdered him. Just as if you'd held that gun to his head and pulled the trigger yourself. Please, darling. Go away. Leave me alone. Valerie, believe me. I did it to free you from a man who didn't deserve you. I did it so that you could know happiness with me. You're young, Valerie. You have years ahead of you. You're entitled to everything in life. You understand? <laughs> Come into the living room. There, that's it. 
We are going to be so happy together. Let me close the door and shut out the last memory of what has gone before. Now, our life is before us. Here. Sit down. My head, Paul. I, I have a terrible headache. I'll get you some aspirin. Where is it? In Stephen's laboratory. I'll get it. Let me help you. There. I think it's on the middle shelf. Turn the light on, Paul. The switch is on the right. I have it. Let me get the aspirin for you. Uh, I can find them more easily. I've been thinking, Valerie. After this is all over, we are going away on a trip. Perhaps somewhere off in the mountains or... You've got the wrong bottle, dear. That's not the aspirin. No. It's one of Stephen's chemicals. It's acid, Paul. Sulfuric acid. Oh, Valerie... Put it back on the shelf. That stuff will burn. No, Paul. No, you cold-blooded murderer. You're going to know what Stephen knew before you forced him to take his life. You're going to know what it is to walk in darkness. Valerie. Forever. Down my eyes! <laughs> there, my friend, is a young lady who takes literally the old adage... An eye for an eye. Thank you, Boris Karloff and Cast, for keeping our growing reputation for horror quite intact. And now, ladies and gentlemen, if you'll follow me, please, I want you to visit the green room. The players are rehearsing our next performance. Come. Come, come. Watson. About this man, Damery. Damery? What Damery? Lord Damery, of course. You can take his photograph in all the society weeklies. Well, naturally, the fellow's a household word in society. Mm, yes. He's a man of the world with a natural turn for diplomacy, and he's asked me for a 4 appointment, which I granted. You mean that uh, Lord Damery's coming here, but it's 4 30 now? Look at the message. Oh, yes. Sherlock Holmes and the elementary Dr. Watson, played by Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce, respectively will appear in our next tale of mystery. This is Peter Lorre closing the doors of the Mystery Playhouse. Good night. Sleep tight. This is the Armed Forces Radio Service. I said, who are you? What are you doing here? My name is Gabriel. I am butler to the Holloways. Gabriel? But you... You can't be. Well, you're... You're dead. Midnight. The witching hour when the night is darkest. Our fears the strongest... And our strength at its lowest ebb. Midnight, when the graves gave open and death strikes. How? You'll learn the answer in just a minute in The House That Time Forgot. <laughs> Now, murder.
Murder at Midnight, Tales of Mystery and Terror by Radio's Masters of the Macabre. Our story by Sigmund Miller is The House That Time Forgot. Early evening on a desolate part of the Virginia coast, along a road near the beach comes a car with two people in it. I guess we've done enough looking for today, Eva. Oh, it's really beautiful country around here, dear. Wild and lovely. Mm-hmm. Darling, if we can't find a house, perhaps we should buy some land and build. Well, we'd better start back to town. It's getting dark, and I, I think we're in for a storm. Oh, look, Fred. Hmm? Look at that house we're coming to. Where? Oh, now, isn't it a beauty? Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Nobody that owns that one would want to sell it. Drive slowly, dear. I'd like to take a good look at it. All right. There's a for sale sign. Yeah? This house for sale. See Mr. Cecil Smith, Westfield, Virginia. Oh, that's interesting. Well, let's drive in there, into the ground. I'd oh, like we to... can come back tomorrow, Eva. It's really starting to blow up. But it'll only take a minute. I've, I've just got to have a close look. All right, but we're going to get caught in the rain. I'll back in to save time. We'll watch the fenders on that side. All right, dear. <laughs> come ahead. Am I clear? Okay, you're all right. Fine, fine. Ah, there's a light in one of the gable windows. Well, I guess somebody's home. It's beautiful, Fred. Simply magnificent. Yeah, the grounds look a little neglected, though. Grounds? Who cares about that? Go ahead and knock. Okay. I wish they'd hurry. We're going to get caught in the storm. Oh, don't worry about it. They don't seem to answer, do they? Try knocking again. Hmm. It's odd. Must be somebody home. We saw a light in the window. Maybe they can't hear us. Let's try calling them. Oh. Hello, there. Hello? <laughs> That's very strange. Yeah, I... What? I hear something. Listen. It's a clock striking. Now, let's, let's try the door. It's not loud. Uh, what do you think? Uh, well, uh... Let's go in. Mm-hmm. It's a big place, but lovely. Oh, wait a minute. Here. Anybody home? Well, if there is, they can't hear us or don't want to. Uh, come on, dear. We'll, we'll come back tomorrow. <laughs> place needs fixing up, but it's worth the fixing. Shall we take it? Well, I... Well, I don't know, Eva. We'll talk to the agent in Westfield, and then, well, we'll see. So you're interested in buying the Holloway house? Yes, Mr. Smith. It's just the kind of house we've been looking for. Uh, It's a fine place, all right. Even got a private inlet to moor a large-sized boat. It's got everything except... uh... Except what, sir? Well, it's only fair that I tell you all its uh, defects. <laughs> what defects, Mrs. Smith? Well, you see, Mrs. Jordan, it's kind of hard to put your finger on it. There's something very queer about the house. Huh? Oh. <laughs> you mean it's haunted? <laughs> well, I don't know exactly, Mr. Jordan. No one has seen a ghost there yet. <laughs> well, we we don't mind ghosts, do we, Fred? <laughs> no, no, we don't believe them, Mrs. Well, Smith. I, I didn't say it was haunted, but... Well, people say that the house is alive, that that it has a life and a will of its own. A life? Well, I don't know what you mean. Well, I've had four caretakers in the Holloway house since I took possession of it, and none of them stayed more than a few days. Well, why did they quit? I don't know. They didn't see any ghosts or apparitions, but they all felt the same way, that, that the house was alive. Every one of them. Oh, well, there must have been something that scared them away. Well, I'd better tell you the whole story. Yes, we'd like to. Please do. Now, the house originally belonged to Richard Holloway. Mm-hmm. Seven years ago, in 1939, Richard and his wife, Diana, went on a short cu- cruise in their yacht, the, the Viking Second. Oh, that's an interesting name, isn't it? They never came back. Oh? They had two friends visiting them who refused to go with them. The strangest part about it is that these friends warned them that they'd never return alive from the cruise. The Holloways left at them. Oh, well, well, how did they know, th- these friends, that the Holloways wouldn't come back? I don't know. 
Nobody knows. Well, uh, did, did you talk to these friends? No, I never saw them. Uh, I only know about it through John Gabriel. He was the Holloway's butler. Oh. Been dead for two years now. As a matter of fact, even Gabriel didn't know these friends. He'd never seen them before. Uh, it's a mystery that I've thought about for years. Uh, I'm afraid it's going to be a mystery forever. Hmm. Very interesting, but uh, we'd still like to buy the house. Uh, Mr. Smith, uh, there was a light shining in one of the windows when we were there yesterday. We also heard a clock chiming. Mm, that's funny. No one's been inside that house in over a year. Oh? Uh, Eva, perhaps we ought to think this over. Oh, huh? nonsense, darling. You're not going to let some old wives' tail bother you, are you? No, no. But how could a clock still be going if no one's been in that house for a year? Well, there's a life boy not far from the house. You might have mistaken it for the clock. Now, you see, everything has a logical explanation. Yeah, what about the light in the window? Well, it was probably a reflection from the sun or something. We'd like to take the house, Mr. Smith. Well, if you want it, I'd be glad to sell it to you. I just thought it fair to tell you all about it, so if anything happens, you can't blame me. Here we are, darling. Our house. Mm, I hope we'll like it. Oh, of course we will. Let's go in. Mm-hmm. Do you have the key, dear? Yes, but we don't need it. The door was open, remember? Oh, yes, yes, that's right. Hey. Huh. It's locked again. Oh, Mr. Smith must have locked it. There we go. There we go, dear. Well, look. Hmm? Darling, everything clean. Dusted. Why, it's spotless. Oh, now, Mr. Smith really is a dear. Hey, it looks lived in, doesn't it? <laughs> I, I told you we'd like it. Uh, I suppose. Uh, hmm, he also put flowers around. It does smell of flowers, roses. But let's look around. Hmm, bright-looking kitchen, isn't it, Fred? Yeah. And this Wonderful big refrigerator. And it's full of food. No. Fresh food. Yeah. Oh, that Mr. Smith, why, he thought of everything. Oh, the bedroom is even bigger than I thought. Look at the beds. What? Someone has slept in them. That man Mr. Smith sent to clean the house must have slept in it. Yes, and he apparently slept in both beds. <laughs> This library. Darling, look at that paneling. Yeah, yeah. It's a very lovely room. Everything is charming. But... But what? Look at the fireplace. Well, what's wrong with the fireplace? Is there is just some half-burnt logs in it? Yes, yeah, just some half-burnt logs still <laughs> smoldering. Well, it was the cleaning man. I don't think there was a cleaning man. Now, don't be absurd, Fred. Huh. The clock we heard the first time we were here. Eva, I just can't shake off the feeling that someone is still living here. You're being ridiculous. Well, maybe I am, but I I feel like an intruder. Oh, darling, it's, it's that story Mr. Smith told us about the Holloways and their mysterious friends. It, it, it's got you all keyed up. Yeah, well, I'm going to call Mr. Smith and find out about that cleaning man you think he sent here. Uh, operator. Oh, operator, give me Westfield 403... You're really being a fuss part, Fred. Yeah, we'll see. I'll try... Oh, h- hello, Mr. Smith? Yes? Uh, this is Fred Jordan. Oh, hello, Mr. Jordan. How's everything up at Holloway? Oh, everything seems fine. Uh, thanks for having the house cleaned up. Cleaned up? I don't understand you. Didn't you send a cleaning man to straighten up the house? Uh, no, Mr. Jordan. The house was sold as is. I never sent anyone over. Uh might interest you to know we found the house in a spotless condition. Cleaned and ready for occupancy. Oh. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Smith. I'll be in touch with you later. Lovely night, darling. I'm glad we came out. Yeah, well, we'd better go back to the house. Oh, now, please don't be upset. There, there must be some logical explanation. Mm. Maybe, maybe somebody took advantage of a boarded-up house and was living in it rent-free. I'd like to correct you, dear. Someone is still living in it besides ourselves. Sometimes, Fred, you get very ridiculous. Mm, maybe. Let's go back inside. 
Look. What? There's a fire burning in the fireplace. Well, now, what's wrong with that? I haven't touched this fireplace since we got here. You didn't. Well, look. The table is set for tea. Did you do this? No, I... I, I didn't. Oof. The teapot is hot. Somebody... Somebody must be here. Hiding. If they are, I'll... I'll find them. Come on. I don't understand it. I, I just... Cellar to attic and there's no one here. But it's incredible. Someone is living here and we can't see them. It, it, it doesn't make sense. There's somebody here right now. Right in this room. It sounds crazy, but I know it. Fred. What? The clock. What about it? It it just struck midnight, and it's it's only ten o'clock. A house that is deserted, except for invisible tenants, and a clock that is running backwards. Has it just struck twelve for? Murder at midnight. And now, back to Murder at Midnight and the house that time forgot. Fred. Hmm. Fred, wake up. Huh? Get up. Huh? Uh, what? What is it, dear? What's, what's the matter? Look out there. Out the window. Why? Get up and take a look. Oh. At what? That boat out there in the inlet? It must have put in while we were sleepy. Can't you read the name, dear? Huh? It's the Viking Second. The Viking Second? Yes. Wasn't that the Holloway's yacht? The one that never came back? That's what Mr. Smith said. Either Mr. Smith is a fantastic liar or something very fantastic is happening to us. Perhaps the Holloways have finally come back. After seven years? It it doesn't make sense, none of it. Yeah, that's putting it mildly. Darling, we... We ought to take a close look at the boat. You don't sound very enthusiastic about it, but... Yes, I suppose we ought to. Whoever's on it might be able to tell us something. is down. Mm. Somebody must have come off the boat. Well, they couldn't have, dear. At least they didn't come up to the house. Well, let's let's go up and see. Hmm? All right. Huh. Well, there's no one on deck. There, anyone here? No answer. Maybe they're down below. They must be. I'd rather not go down there. Well, we've got to find out. Let's, uh, let's both go down together. All right, you... Keep right behind me. Oh, don't worry, dear. I will. Here's the stateroom. No, there's, there's nobody here either. Anybody here? No one. At least... Yeah, but the beds are still warm. Somebody just left the stateroom a little while ago. It, it seems so. Let's get out of here, Eva. I've got to... Kill your feeling down my spine. It, it, it is chilly. Well, we'd better go back to the house. Lights are on in the living room. Did you put them on? Just one of the lamps, a floor lamp. Well, all the ceiling lights are lit. I can see that, dear. Let's go in. Here. The door's locked. We didn't even close it when we went out. No. I remember we left it up. A- Good evening. Who are you? I beg your pardon. I said, who are you? I'm John Gabriel, butler to the Holloways. Gabriel? Uh, that's right, ma'am. Whom do you wish to see? Oh, we don't want to see anyone. We, we live here. I'm afraid you're mistaken, sir. The Holloways live here, have been living here for years. But this is our house. We bought it. And, and, and the Holloways are dead. Dead? Yes. I'm afraid someone has misinformed you. Well, this is 
This is like a nightmare. Look here, Gabriel, or whoever you really are. We bought this house from Cecil Smith, a real estate agent in Westfield. He's not the kind of a man who plays practical jokes. No, he's not. He's a very sober man indeed. He told us you were dead, too. As you can see, madam, I'm very much alive. Oh, the... This is crazy. We'd better talk to the people who call themselves the Holloways. Perhaps you should. They'll be in any minute. Please come in, won't you? Will you excuse me if I close the windows? We're going to have a storm. Perfectly all right. Would you care for some tea? Look here, Gabriel. We've been waiting an hour for Mr. Holloway and his wife. They haven't shown up, and I don't think they will. Now, just what is your game? Would you care for some tea, Mrs. Jordan? No, thank you. Did you hear what I said? Yes, sir, I did. As soon as Mr. and Mrs. Holloway arrive, I'm sure you'll be convinced of your error. They should be here any minute since they plan to leave tonight on a cruise. This is mad. Fantastic. Uh, Ah, they come. Just miss the storm, Gabriel. Oh, hello. I don't believe I know you. This is Mr. and Mrs. Jordan, Mr. and Mrs. Holloway. Oh, I'm glad to meet you, Mrs. Jordan. Mr. Jordan. Well, thank you. Are you Richard Holloway? Yes. I can't believe it. It's all terribly confusing, Mr. Holloway. These people claim that this is their house. What? That they bought it from Cecil Smith. They also claim that you, Mrs. Holloway, and myself are dead. Somebody's playing some kind of a joke on them. I'd say it was a very unpleasant joke, Dick. We've been living here for years and years, Mr. and Mrs. Jordan. Oh, uh, before I forget, Gabriel, uh, get our suitcases aboard the yacht, will you? We'll be leaving in a few minutes. Yes, sir, right away. Fred, do you suppose that maybe we're dreaming this? Well, if we are, we're dreaming it together. I'm sorry, I don't know how this happened to you. Uh, Perhaps you'd better stay here for the night. There's plenty of room. And we'd be delighted to have you. Uh, Would you mind if I called Mr. Smith? Oh, please do. The phone's right there on the table. I know, thanks. Operator, operator, let me have Westfield 403. Never. Hello, Mr. Smith? That's right. Uh, This is Mr. Jordan. Who? Uh, Fred Jordan. Remember, you sold me the Holloway house? The Holloway house? Yes. You must be mistaken. I never sold it. That property's not for sale. What are you talking about? Who is this? Listen, Mr. Smith, you know very well who I am. You won't get away with this. I'll have you brought into court now. I never heard of you in my life. You must be crazy. Goodbye. Hello. Hello. He he hung up. What did he say? He said he'd never sold the house and he'd never even heard of me. You must have been taken in by someone who posed as Mrs. Smith. That's really a shame. You have to be very careful these days. We'd be glad to have you stay here until you find other quarters. Well, I... As a matter of fact, you can stay for a few days until we get back. We're taking a trip on our boat. Perhaps you'll be able to get it all straightened out in the morning. I, I, I just don't understand it. The Mr. Smith we had dealings with wasn't a crook. I know he wasn't. That was my feeling, too, but I... You're not going out to sea in this kind of weather. Oh, we don't mind a little rain. My husband's a very good sailor, Mrs. Jordan. He can handle the Viking second in any kind of weather. It sounds like a gale coming up. No, we like them. Exciting. Well, it's dangerous to set out in this weather. Very dangerous. Oh, now, don't worry about us. We don't drown easily. Darling, we'd better get started. Oh, yes, yes. I'm all set. Uh, are the suitcases aboard? Yes, uh, Gabriel took them. Uh, uh, something's wrong with your grandfather clock. It, it only struck eight times. Uh, yes, it's correct. Uh, my watch says eight o'clock, too. Well, how can that be? It's, it's after midnight. <laughs> you really are mixed up, Mr. Jordan. It's only eight o'clock. Well, my watch says one thirty. Uh, well, so does mine. I'm afraid ours is right, Mrs. Jordan. It's very old, but very accurate. Of course, there's a legend about it. The story is that it will sometimes go backwards in time. Has... Has that ever happened? (laughs) No. No, it's only a story. It's never gone anything but forward, like any other clock. But it's a nice story, isn't it? Yes. Yes, delightful. (laughs) Might even be true. Mrs. Holloway. Yes? Uh, What is today's date? What? I believe it's September 10th. What year? 1939, of course. 1939? Yes, yes, of course, Fred. Uh, Mrs. Holloway, I'd, I'd like to ask you and Mr. Holloway something. Yes? Please, please, don't go out on this trip you're planning. Why not? Because if you do, I, I don't think you'll ever come back. What? What a terrible thing to say. Please, Mrs. Holloway, please. I don't know what's wrong with you two. 
You came in here with a strange story about owning my house, and now you tell us we're never going to come back. She's right. You won't come back. You'll pardon me for saying so, Mr. Jordan, but I think you're both crazy. I don't care what you think, but please don't go. Why, Mrs. Jordan? I have a hunch about it. We don't believe in hunches. Well, it's more than a hunch, Mr. Holloway. I know you're not coming if back. If you'll excuse us, I think we'd better get started. Come along, darling. I'm ready. I've put everything on board. Is there anything else, sir? Uh, yes. Uh, just take care of our guests. So that they're comfortable. Goodbye, Gabriel. Goodbye. A pleasant voyage. Make yourself at home and we'll be back, despite your hunches. Oh, you must go, please. Gone. If you wish, you can occupy the master bedroom. I'll go up and make it ready for you. Was there anything else you wished, Mr. Jordan, ma'am? Uh, no, Gabriel. Just go to bed. We'll we'll sit here for a while. It's rather late, sir. Nearly midnight. By your clock, Gabriel. But it's. It seems to have stopped. So it has. It needs rewinding. It's going now. Yes. Seems to be ticking rather fast. Something's wrong. It never did that before. (laughs) Something's happening. As soon as I find the switch. What what happened? I I don't know. Maybe the storm. Lightning. Where's Gabriel? Gabriel. Gabriel. Never mind, dear. Can't you find the switch? Uh, Here it is. Oh. Fred. Fred. All, All that dust. Like the first time we saw the house. It's as if no one had been here for years. Where's Gabriel? There, there is no Gabriel. We're back in 1946. And that means he's dead. You mean the clock did go backwards? Something else. You understand too now, don't you? We were the friends that Mr. Smith told us about. The mysterious friends that urged the Holloways not to go on that trip. Yes. Fred. What? Clock is stopped. Well, it needs rewinding. No, 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 don't touch it. We we won't wind that clock again, ever. A house without tenants, except for the dead, and the clock that runs backward in time. If it was your clock, would you wind it? Or are you afraid it would keep you up nights while you waited for it to strike twelve for... Murder at again when death comes out of the past, out of time gone by, and the clocks strike twelve for murder at midnight. The Jordans, husband and wife, were played by Vinton Hayworth and Elsie Hitz. With music by Bert Berman, Murder at Midnight was directed by Anton M. Leader.
the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California, presents... Suspense. Tonight, Roma Wines bring you Mr. Zachary Scott, a star of Murder Off Key, a suspense play produced, edited, and directed for Roma Wines by William Spear. Suspense, radio's outstanding theater thrills, is presented for your enjoyment by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. Those excellent California wines that can add so much pleasantness to the way you live, to your happiness and entertaining guests, to your enjoyment of everyday meals. Yes, right now a glass full would be very pleasant, as Roma Wines bring you Mr. Zachary Scott in a remarkable tale of... Suspense! If I could just shut out that singing, I'd be all right. But it goes on pounding inside my head, and I keep hearing Violet screech those desperate, urgent scales. The first time I heard her, I was sitting on the balcony outside the apartment, and everything was unnaturally still, the way it is late at night. And maybe that's why her singing sounded louder than it actually was. But something abnormal about it is... Though a control inside her had snapped and she couldn't stop that horrible noise that was coming from her throat. It went on over and over again, rising and falling and scraping the hot night into shreds. She's pretty terrible, isn't she? What? I'm over here on the next balcony. Oh, sorry, I didn't see you. What did you say? She's pretty terrible, isn't she? And she thinks that's a trained voice. Awful. Does she do it often or only when the moon is full? Oh, she goes on like that almost every evening. You must be new around here. I just got into New York this afternoon. Are you visiting Mr. Morley? Well, in a way, he went out of town. I'm staying in his apartment. I didn't mean to sound prying, but he told me he was going on a vacation, and I wondered if he'd left. Her family must be all deaf mutes. No, she lives alone. Well, that's not hard to understand. Hasn't the manager done anything about it? She has too much money. They'd never ask her to move. But someone should do something. They could always try strangling her. What did you say? They could always try strangling her. Oh, she heard you. Oh, do you think so? I hope so. Well, I must be going in. Good night. Good night. It was in the lobby the next afternoon that I met her. When she came up to me, I knew instinctively that she was the songbird of the night before. She was past middle age and was ignoring it. Her hair was dyed and piled up in coquettish curls, and she used some kind of heavy, sweet perfume that was overpowering. She came tripping up with the usual old white poodle dog yapping at her heels. Pardon me. Would you hold this package for a moment? I have so many things I'll never find my key. Well, I was well, just... Thank you so much. Are you not happy? Is that nice, making such a fuss of this charming gentleman? Oh, no, he's, what he's will he be... think? Oh, I don't know what I'm going to do if this weather keeps up. Yes, it's... I've so... always been on the delicate side, and I, I've never been able to stand the heat. When my husband was alive, he's dead now. Oh, right. He always whisked me away to the ocean the first warm day. Even when I was in the theater. Oh, my manager would be furious. Well, I can understand. I can't imagine where my key is. Um, Would you hold Teddy for me? Well, I don't know. Oh, thank you. You must not Teddy, Teddy, and he won't hurt you. My husband used to say to me, Violet, uh, my real name is Imogene, but he called me Violet. It's always been my favorite color. Violet, he used to say, you must go to the sea. Oh, you'll be withering those lovely petals of yours. And before I knew it, we were in Atlantic City. It's very nice. Oh, here's that horrid little key on my key ring of all places. Well, those things sometimes happen. Thank you so much. I don't know what I would have done without you. My husband used to say, Violet, you're a woman who needs a man around. Of course, he was a pillar of strength himself. 
Oh, and to think of his dying of a gallbladder that way. Well, thank you again. Now, oh, uh, what did you say your name is? Oh, Carlson. Oh, how nice. Carlson. Such a sturdy, dependable name. So suitable for a man. Uh, you must come up and have tea with me sometime. Well, I... I have a special Chinese brand. It smells like dead flowers. Going up? Uh, going up, but only war until we meet again. <laughs> That next meeting would be never, as far as I was concerned at that point, but it actually happened that night. She was at the scales again about nine o'clock, and there was a desperate urgency in her singing. It was the last frantic attempt to stop the clock and the double chins and the fading light. Those pathetic scales had a shrill terror that made me embarrassed listening to them. Well, as though I were eavesdropping on some shameful secret. It was then that I went to leave the balcony and saw the sheet music lying behind the urn. My first impulse was a humanitarian one, and I threw it in the wastebasket. But for some unknown reason, I suddenly felt a kind of pity for that woman singing alone up there. And the next thing I knew, I was on my way upstairs with the music. Yes, what do you want? Oh, uh, is uh, Mrs... Um... Is Violet in? Violet? <laughs> I'm sorry, old boy. She must have given you the wrong number. Oh, I thought it was on this floor. Oh, uh, hold on. If you mean uh, Mrs. Pondecker, it's the uh, next apartment. Oh, sorry to have bothered you. Going in for tea? Or do you have your own bank account? Thank you very much. Oh, not at all, not at all. I'm always glad to help a, a music lover. As I stood there in the hall, I began to think about that leer he had given me. I was about to turn back when the door opened. Oh, 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 Mr. Carlson, you come for that tea after all. How nice. Oh, 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 there was something obscene about the hand fingers, heavy with diamonds, the nail polish too red. Obscene and pathetic. The room was heavy and operatic, just like her. There were glass cases and curio cabinets filled with every imaginable kind of glittering thing. Rings and bracelets, brooches. Most of it in terrible taste, but all of it unquestionably expensive. Oh, admiring my collection. Most everyone does. Your friend, Mr. Morley, just... <laughs> Be quiet. Oh, I do believe he's jealous of you. You know he has a sick sense about admirers. I remember when I was in the theater. He used to carry on dreadfully when my dressing room was filled with fans. He bit my husband in the leg. So oh, now, sit down in this chair. I'm afraid all the others are too small for a big man like you. Well, I really came to return this music. It must have blown down on my balcony. Oh, Roses of Picardy. It's always been one of my favorites. My husband simply adored it. I remember I sang it to him on Saturday night. And that Sunday afternoon, he was dead. Well, that... That must have been quite a shock. Oh, I sometimes wonder that I'd found the courage and strength to go on. Of course, my music has been a great consolation. Now, you sit right down. I won't be a moment. Pity will look after you. Won't you pity her? The roses are shining. You <laughs> said, dear, and answer that is probably the elevator voice. I've come to take the... Do oh, a new one. Guess what is it? I uh, came for Mrs. Pondaker's dog to take him for a walk. Here he is, and he's all yours. Thanks. Come on, Rinton. I didn't care for the way the elevator boy smirked. And as I sat there in her apartment with that heavy perfume suffocating me, I cared less for the trapped feeling I was beginning to have. It wasn't until two days later in the garage that the trap closed. Good 
morning, Mr. Carson. Can I do something for you? Oh, no, thanks, Joe. Just want to get my sunglasses out of the compartment. Well, your car's right over here. I cleaned her up for you. Gee, it was a mess, let me tell you. You must have run into something. What? The whole front was stuck with brown stuff and white fur. Like you hit a dog or a cat, maybe. Funny, I don't remember hitting anything. Well, right, don't worry. I cleaned it off. Hey, Joe. Yeah? Wait a minute. Wait, something wrong? Tell that help of yours my car's in an ash can. They dumped all these old newspapers in the back. Oh, gee, I'm sorry, Mr. Carson. Well, just give them to me. I'll throw them out. Boy, they sure are a mess. Looks like something out of butcher shop, don't it? Well, you won't have to begin, sir. You don't you bet your bottom dollar on that. When I came upstairs, I was still trying to figure out the angle of those stained old newspapers, but I didn't have long to wait. I found out the minute I stepped into the lobby. Oh, Mr. Carlson, thank heaven you're here. I've been out of my mind. It's petty. He's disappeared. We can't find him anywhere. I just know he's been run over. I just know it. R- run over? Well, when did all this happen? Last night, when this wretched boy took him out. Now, look, Mrs. Oh. Fondecker, it's like oh. I told you. I only stopped in for a cup of coffee, and the next thing I know, the dog is gone. Of course he's gone. Some uncouth person in that saloon undoubtedly made off with him. Well, there's only one thing to do, and that is to offer a large reward. Don't you agree, Mr. Carlson? Oh, yes, yes, that's a good idea. But I knew then, as sure as I was standing there, that nothing would bring Petty back. Just as I knew that he had been in my car sometime last night, lying on some old newspapers. That's why I wasn't too surprised at first when the heavy blonde man with the soft voice came to see me. Mr. Frederick Carlson? Yes, that's right. I'm from headquarters. I'd like to ask you a couple of questions about this Pondecker business. Have they found the dog? I didn't know about that, huh? Well, she mentioned it to me. You two were pretty friendly, weren't you? Well, I spoke to a couple of times. And what is this? I don't... Come into my place full of innuendos. I don't see... There's no need to get excited, Mr. Carlson. I'm just checking up on the people who last saw her alive. I still... What are you talking about? She's dead? Very much so. She was strangled sometime last night. Suspense, Roma Wines are bringing you as star Mr. Zachary Scott in Murder Off Key by Gene Russ Kern. Roma Wines' presentation tonight in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Between the acts of Suspense, this is Truman Bradley for Roma Wines. This holiday season will be a round of gay homecomings, joyous reunions, and festive entertaining. To graciously greet your guests, to add warmth to the welcome, to give extra full pleasure to your holiday meals, be sure to have plenty of Roma wines on hand. Roma California wines offer you sherry, port, muscatel, and toque for entertaining, burgundy and sauterne for mealtime enjoyment, and gay Roma California champagne to make any happy occasion unforgettable. Each of these fine Roma wines brings you the goodness of luscious grapes, gathered at peak of flavor, gently pressed, then unhurriedly brought to delicious perfection under the patient guidance of Roma's ancient winemaking skill, bottled at Roma's own famed wineries in California's choicest vineyard districts. Enjoy the taste luxury of fine Roma wines more often, for Roma's new low prices enable you to save as much as one-fourth. Insist on Roma wines. No other wines offer you so much for so little. That's why more Americans enjoy Roma than any other wine. Roma. R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. And now, Roma Wines bring back to our Hollywood soundstage Zachary Scott as Frederick Carlson in Murder Off Key, a play well calculated to keep you in suspense. The heavy blonde man with a soft voice asked a few more questions after that, and then he left. The motive was robbery. Very valuable jewelry and a great deal of money. Everything gone. It seemed Violet was in the habit of drawing out large sums and keeping them around in old beaded purses and tarnished gilt boxes. It all fitted in with Violet, who was so helpless without her pillar of strength and who sang those desperate jangling scales. 
Obviously, she had no idea of financial matters. But somebody else had plenty of other ideas, and I was one of them. I knew it that night when I went around to the corner automat. Yes, I was definitely one of them. There was no doubt about it. Do you mind if I join you, Mr. Carlson? It was soft voice, smiling down at me over a cup of coffee and a piece of pie. Murder a la mode. I always come here for their apple pie. You ever tried it? Haven't gotten around to it. You should. It's excellent. Can I have the sugar? Thank you. How'd you happen to come here for your vacation? Oh, I don't know. I was short on cash, and then Morley wrote and suggested I stay in his place. It seemed like a good idea at the time. You don't have that letter, do you? Say, what is this? No need to get excited, Mr. Carlson. I was just asking. Oh, you really should try this pie. The apples are just right, firm and tart. Dog. How should I know? Very interesting angle. I understand he was a regular burglar alarm. Always barked if anyone ever came to the door. And then he disappears the night before her death. Very convenient. Don't you agree? It would look that way. Perhaps more of that sugar. Thank you. I never seem to get enough. Did you drive up to New York? That's right, and I haven't run over any dogs or anything else, so you can skip that. There's no need to get excited, Mr. Carlson. I never suggested that you did. I was just asking a simple question. If you haven't any more simple questions on your mind, I'll be going on. Of course. Don't let me detain you. I think I'll have another piece of this pie. You really should try it sometime, Mr. Carlson. <laughs> As I walked away, I could feel him watching me. Hunched over the table, his small eyes wary and suspicious. There's no doubt about it. I was the idea. I rode around on top of a bus for almost an hour, and I kept thinking about the dog and that white fur and those stained newspapers. I knew I had to go to the garage and have another look at my car. The garage seemed deserted, and only one arc light cut the blackness that stretched silently ahead. It was then I passed the office booth when I first heard the voices. There were two men, and they were standing by my car. It was soft voice, full of apple pie and suspicion and wide awake on those two cups of coffee. I was asking Joe about my car. It looked like he hit something. But I couldn't say it was a dog. It, it might have been a cat. But you're certain about the white fur. Huh? Was there anything else you noticed? No. No, I don't think... Well, yeah, there were some newspapers... At first, I thought, seeing as how they were all stained, that uh, maybe he had put in them whatever he hit, you know? Hey, excuse me a minute. Uh, somebody must be out there. Well, well, Mr. Carlson, glad you came in. Perhaps you can clear up a few things for us. Look, I uh, don't know anything about the newspapers or the stain, but I can tell you this much. I never ran over a dog, and I can prove it. Well, then. That's all we're interested in. I haven't taken the car out since I came to New York. Joe here can tell you that. Well, you did take it out once, Mr. Carson, the night before last. Are you crazy? Well, gee, I'm sorry, Mr. Carson, but I remember you called me up and asked me to bring it around. Here. Here. You can look at my record book. You must have forgotten about it, because, uh... Nine o'clock. Nine o'clock. That must have been just about the time the elevator boy took the dog for his walk. <laughs> From that time on, Soft Voice was after me. I was his man, and he didn't miss a trick. Now, you say you talked to Carlson last Saturday? Yes, I, I was sitting out on the balcony. Did he mention Mrs. Pondecker in the conversation? We heard her singing. She had an awful voice. And he asked about her, whether she had a family or, or lived alone. I don't remember anything else. But it was the oddest thing. I mean, his suggesting strangling her, and now this. Makes you think, doesn't it? <laughs> And Mr. Carson came to your door the other night? Yes. Yes, he was asking for some woman by the name of Violet. At, uh, at first, I never connected it with Mrs. Bondecker. She seemed a bit old for him, but <laughs> you never can tell. Probably mutual interest in uh, music, hmm? Yeah, that's right. I came to get the dog, and this Carlson guy opens the door. But I don't think nothing of it. Working on the elevator, you see a lot of that, you know. Oh, some of the stuff I could tell you. It 
was about this time that I began hearing those scales again. They were so shrill and desperate, I thought everyone else must hear them, too. I even heard her on the elevator. <laughs> what are you staring at? Nothing, Mr. Carlson. This is your floor. Hey, do you think the police would catch a guy who'd done it? I don't know. I figure it must have been somebody who knew her and been in her place. Those old dames always go for the young guys. I say, find her boyfriend and you got to kill her. Am I right? Why ask me? How should I know? Well, you'll have to get sore, Mr. Carlson. I was just asking. Well, what are you waiting for? Me? Nothing. Well, shut up. Stop it, do you hear me? The concert's over. Good evening, Mr. Carlson. Oh, uh, oh. I hope I didn't startle you. The elevator boy let me in. Well, what's on your mind? I just wanted to go over a few points with you. Do you know anything about a resort called Orchard Beach? It's not far from here. Yes, I stayed there for a couple of weeks last summer. Why? Strange you never ran into Mrs. Pondecker. She played in the summer theater there. I told you I never saw her before I came here. If you're trying to pin this on me, you're wasting your time. Look, how could I have planned this thing? I never even knew I was coming here until Morley wrote me and asked me. He'll tell you that. Unfortunately, we can't seem to contact Mr. Morley. You don't have his present address, do you? All he said was something about a camping trip, but he's bound to turn up in a couple of days, and he'll set you straight on all this. That is, if he turns up alive. What do you mean by that? I was just considering a possibility. After all, if anything happened to Mr. Morley, he couldn't back up your story, and he couldn't deny it either. Could he? Well, I'll be getting along. Good night, Mr. Carlson. That night, the scales were louder than ever. They went on. Over and over, echoing in the room. Shrill and urgent, and I couldn't shut them out. Shut up, do you hear me? Shut up! Uh. What the devil's going on in here? Morley. Morley, good Lord, I thought you'd never turn up. Well, I always say it's nice to be wanted, but if I'm not too inquisitive, may I ask what you're doing in my place? I'm waiting for you so you can tell him about that letter. Letter? The one you wrote when you asked me to come here. Well, now, look, I don't care if you stayed here, but I didn't write you. But you must have, Morley. I read the letter. I tell you I saw it. I held it in my hand. It was real. All right, Carlson, don't be so tragic about it. After all, it's not a matter of life and death. It certainly is. Look, Morley, you don't know what's been going on here. Ever since I got here. me nearly crazy. There doesn't seem to be any way out. Mm. Well, well, Carlson, there's no point in sitting out here on the balcony all night. No? Oh, I'll admit you're in a bad jam, but it's not hopeless. They haven't arrested you. It's only a matter of time. But they haven't any proof. And I can tell the police I wrote that letter. I suppose I can. Well, you'll have to be more convincing than that. No thanks. My neck's in the noose, and I might as well face it. Now, let's not be noble, Carlson. It's only a technicality. I think I can make them believe me. Too late now, they're here. Who's here? The police. The car just pulled up. Are you sure? Soft boy. Yeah. And I don't like the way he's bouncing with so much energy. Why should he come now? Someone must have tipped him off your back. He was anxious to see you as I was. Morley, is there back stairs here? Yes, why? I'm going to try to get out. It's my only chance. Will you help me? Sure, certainly, Carlson. I'll show you where to go. I can at least do that. I had to try. I couldn't just lie down and take that rap, and there was no way under heaven I could escape it legally. I followed Morley off the balcony, and when we got to his living room, it was almost more than I could stand. Because the singing started again, but not the scales this time. Roses of Picardy. Roses of Picardy, she was going to follow me all of my life. I almost dropped in my tracks. Something, I guess you'd call it a hunch. Something about the stiffness of Morley's back made me hang on. And Morley swung around. It was more than a hunch. Morley was sweating. I decided to play it for all it was worth. Who, who's that? Who's what? Don't you... Don't you hear something? What are you talking about? 
Nothing. Hey, come on, you better hurry. Well, I, I, I don't know. Hurry up, Carlson. I don't know. Now that I think of it, I don't know. But you said yourself. Yeah, but all my life I'd be ducking the law for something I didn't do. You said yourself it's your only chance. Yeah, but that'd be worse than being convicted. Anyway, how could they convict me? The evidence is all circumstantial. There's an awful lot of evidence, Carlson. The dog being killed by your car, the threat you made against her, and your being at Orchard Beach the same time she was there. Yeah, that's a clincher, all right. But how did you know? Are you... How did you know I was at Orchard Beach? I never told you. You haven't talked a soft voice yet. Come on, Morley. Tell me how you did it. Tell me how you killed Mrs. Pondecker. You're out of your mind. How did you get that car business fixed? Did you disguise your voice and take the keys while I was out of the apartment? That would be simple enough to do. Crazy. And that sheet music on the balcony. Did you plant it? Well, you had me right where you wanted me. A beautiful frame up. It's a shame to ruin it. I don't have to ruin it. I can... Oh, no. You can't kill me, Morley. I'm your fall guy. Remember? I can kill you in self-defense. I can kill a murderer who's living in my apartment, who's threatened me. Unfortunately, the police didn't get here in time, and in simple self-defense, I had to... Oh, no. Yeah, but they did get here in time, Morley. Yes, Carlson. You're very lucky. How much did you hear? Enough, enough. He was a slick boy. He had you measured for the noose, all right. How did you get him to open up? Well, in a way, I didn't. It was the Roses of Picardy. Roses of... Well, I, I thought it was Mrs. Pondecker. When she started Roses of Piccadilly, Mar- Morley thought so, too. It scared him green. It scared him more than me. You know, I thought everyone felt the same about Violet singing, but not the little girl next door. The only thing she had against Violet's voice was professional jealousy. She thought her voice was better, but Violet could drown her out. Well... Someone else will have to strangle her. Roma Wines have brought you Zachary Scott, a star of Murder Off Key. Tonight's study in Suspense. This is Truman Bradley for Roma Wines, the sponsor of Suspense. Are you planning now for that Thanksgiving dinner next week? Well, here's a timely suggestion from famed hostess Elsa Maxwell. This Thanksgiving, many families will be together for the first time in years, enjoying the traditional turkey and trimmings and pumpkin pie. At dessert time, I suggest serving Roma California Muscatel. Roma Muscatel is a glorious ending to a festive meal. Yes, at dessert time or later in the evening, Golden Roma Muscatel is the choice refreshment wine. Served cool, Roma Muscatel is delicious with dessert or later with nuts or cake. A wine mellow indeed, bursting with gold and sweetness. Roma Muscatel brings you the distinctive fragrance and the warming taste richness of the famous Muscat grape. Like all Roma wines, Roma Muscatel is a true wine, unvaryingly good always. Made in California, enjoyed throughout the world. Remember, because of uniformly fine quality at low cost, More Americans enjoy Roma than any other wine. Insist on Roma. R-O-M-A. Fine Roma wines. Zachary Scott appeared through the courtesy of Warner Brothers Studios and is currently appearing in Mildred Pierce. Next Thursday, we bring you Lloyd Nolan in Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills. Presented by Roma Wines, R-O-M-A. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Again, the immortal tale 
The Burial of Roger Malvin. Here, this way. Lean on my shoulder. Now, hurry. I think we've escaped the Redskins. They were two to one against us. Very few of us will return to the settlements. Hark to their savage yells. Aye, but they are further distant now. Come on. Now, watch out for those branches. There. There's a clearing in these oaks. Why, look at that great rock. Its smooth surface must be 15 feet high, like a granite palisade. More like a gigantic gravestone. Reuben, my boy, I can go no further now. Put me down. You are badly wounded yourself, so rest a while and gain strength. For there are miles of howling wilderness between us and the settlement. We ought to press on, sir, for we must win through. I, for one, mean to do so. If the smoke of my own chimney were on the other side of that hill yonder, it would do me no good. The Indian bullet was deadlier than I thought. Oh, nonsense. An old hunter like you doesn't give up. Now, come along. No, lad, no. There's not two days' life in me. I shall not burden you much longer with my useless party. And when I die, you can bury me here and mark my name, Roger Malvin, on this granite head. Wait, wait. I have an idea. There were other fugitives from the fight. They must have carried the news to the settlements, and by this time, parties will be out searching for survivors like us. Yes, there was one dirty coward who ran away in the beginning of the fight. He most probably made good speed home. Every man on the frontier will shoulder his musket at the news and set out on rescue parties. You give me courage, lad. One of them may find us here at any time. Oh, not us, sir. Not here. For I mean to go in search of rescue. He travels best who travels alone. Reuben, you're not going to leave me here wounded and alone. The Indians will scalp me. Well, the Indians are far off by now. But there are wild beasts in these mountains. You have your hunting knife. I shall die of thirst. Here is my powder horn now filled with water. I'll leave it with you. I have loved you like a father, Reuben Bourne. And you would desert me in this trackless wilderness. Leave me as food for the buzzards. And what about Dorcas, my dear daughter, whom you profess to love? Will you dare meet her eye? She will ask the fate of her father, whose life you promised to defend with oh, your wait, own. Wait, wait, old man. I would give you my life if its sacrifice would do any good. It is the fever that makes you rave so. Listen to me. I'm going for help. I shall return and with a rescue party. There's no hope for either of us if I stay here with you. And Dorcas would be desolate indeed if neither of us returned. Forgive me, boy. I was thinking only of myself. But you will come back. Of course, of course. See, here are roots and berries that I've gathered. And here is the water. Now I'll mark this place if I can just climb the rock and bend down this young oak. There is just such a sapling growing at my front door at home. Remember? I Yes, they are alike. While you are gone, I shall pray to see my own home again. Hell, it's done. I've bent it down. Now on the topmost branch, I'll bind my kerchief. And by my blood that stains it, I vow to do my best to save you. But, Reuben, you may not meet a rescue party until it is too late for me and... The Indians war on the dead as well as on the living, so swear to return. When you are strong again, return to this wild rock and lay my bones in a grave and say a prayer over them. Oh, I do, I do. I most solemnly swear to return, and if it's too late, see that Roger Malvin has a proper Christian burial. It is enough. God speed you. Reuben. I... Reuben. What is it? Before you go, raise me. Let me lean against the rock. My face will be turned towards home, and I shall see you a moment longer as you disappear in the forest. There. Now I've swept together a bed of these dry leaves. Is that comfortable? Then farewell, sir, till we meet again. One last hand clasp, Reuben. Now go and go quickly. Follow this stream far now. Doubles Lake is to the northwest. Come on. Uh, this is a frightful neck of woods for any wounded to be lost in. I fear there'll be mighty few of our rangers surviving. They were ambushed. Our men broke the strength of the tribe, though. We'll hear no more of the Redskins for a while. So I trust. Well, the woods are getting dark. Going to rain, I calculate.
But I, I'm so weak. I, I keep falling. I must get up. I, get up. I'm lost. There's no sun, only this rain. It, it's so dark. I don't know which way to go. No food. I'll, I'll die here. I'll, I'll die too, but I'm young and I want to live. Both of us will die alone in this awful solitude. Roger Melvin and I. The buzzards were plucking our flesh. He said so. He... Ghastly features of death are grinning at me back of every tree. I said I'd go back to him. I can't go back. I... I won't go back. Anyway, he's dead by now. Aye, that's it. He's, he's dead and I... I buried him. I'll tell them that I buried him. Who's to know? But I won't go back. I won't go back. Doctor. Yes? Over there in the ground. It's a ranger. What? Why? Why, it's young Reuben Bourne. He went out from the settlement with Roger Malvin, didn't he? He's lost a lot of blood. Reuben, uh, it's Dr. Wentworth. Are there any other survivors? Where is Roger Melvin? Uh, Melvin, he's back there. Oh, come on. We must go and find him. No! It's no use. He, he's dead. It's no use. I tell you, he's dead. He's dead. He's... Oh, poor lad. He's fainted. Uh, uh, we must carry him. Yes, yes. Now, be careful. Help me pick him up. Help me. All right. We get him back to the settlement. Will he live, Doctor? Well, I hope so. Yes, I think he'll live. Dorcas! Dorcas! Why, Ruth, good morning. I hear they've brought Reuben back here. Yes, last evening. Wasn't it wonderful? But, but he's very sick. It's a great task for you, Dorcas, to nurse him back to health. It's my privilege. Has he said anything about my Silas or about any of the other men? No. No, not even a word about my father. Oh, Dorcas, I'm so afraid. Don't worry. The search parties are still bringing in many of the wounded. But not my good man. Oh, why did we ever come to the frontier? I'm not fit to be a settlement wife. I can only think of Silas in captivity or in death. Now, Ruth, you mustn't talk so. When Reuben is better, he will have news. Is he still out of his head? Yes. He raised about wild beasts. He must mean the Indians. I suppose so. Oh, Ruth, I must go to him. Can't I help? Reuben. Uh, what is it, Reuben? I'm here. Find the sapling. I'll get some well water to bathe his head. And drive off those buzzards. There are no buzzards, Reuben, dear. Foxes. Red foxes. I'm thirsty. I'll... I'll die of thirst. No, Reuben, you won't die of thirst. Here's some water. You're safe now with me, with Dorcas Malvin. Well, well, scout the dead. No, no, Reuben, Reuben. Dorcas, my child, these two weeks since we brought Reuben home have been very difficult for you. But I think I've won my battle, Doctor Wentworth. He's been sleeping quietly like this lately. No more of those horrible nightmares? None. Good. Well, his wounds are nearly healed now. Your Reuben will get well. Oh, doctor, I'm so thankful. Look, Dorcas, he's awake. Dorcas. Reuben. Oh, at last you know me. I can see it in your eyes. Oh, Reuben. Where am I? You're at the farm. And Dr. Wentworth and I are taking care of you. How long is it? Since the fight at Lovell's Pond. And the fight was early in May, my boy. And it's now the 20th. My father, Reuben. What of my father? Roger Melvin was badly wounded, Dorcas. He told me not to burden myself with him, but naturally I would not leave him. I, I helped him all I could, and for three days we struggled homeward together. Oh, Reuben. You gave him your strength, and you were wounded and bleeding yourself. And at sunrise the fourth day, I saw that his life was fast ebbing away. He died. I marked the place where I... 
where I buried him. With your poor weak hands, you dug a grave for my father. I did what I could. I... There is a noble tombstone above his head. Oh, I would to heaven I slept as soundly as he. Well, there's no need to thank me, Reuben lad, for letting you visit me these few weeks. Your health is much better now. But now, let's not dwell on these past tragedies, Reuben. You have your own life to live, and a mighty life it'll be when you're married to our sweet Dorcas. And you approve of her choice? With all my heart. And I know that this marriage was the great wish of my old friend, Roger Melvin. I'm not sure of that. What have I to offer, Dorcas, except my love? Your stout heart and strong shoulders will be badly needed on the farm. Why, these properties are about the largest and most prosperous in the colony. You two can work out a marvelous future. There he is, Ruth, sitting out in the sun with Dr. Wentworth. My husband-to-be. Oh, he's so handsome, and he looks so well. He is well. Aren't you, Reuben, dear? Oh, Dorcas, my sweet. Oh, come and join us, girls. Hello, Mistress Ruth and Dorcas. <laughs> You're a picture to the eye. Oh, Doctor. We were just saying how healthy you look, Reuben. Well, how can I help it? How can I help but be well after the wonderful nursing that Dorcas gave me? But you've been through so much, wounded and exhausted. Why, you dug a grave oh, and please. Even... No more of that. Well, everyone says it was so good of you to risk your own life to save Mr. Melvin from dying alone and unburied. Will you stop? Oh, oh Reuben. Now, he's a young fellow. Oh, I know that these memories distress you, but take it easy. Come, Mistress Ruth. I think that you and I can leave this future bride and groom alone, eh? Oh, yes, Doctor. He certainly is modest about his bravery. Ruth didn't mean to annoy you, Reuben. Dear one, I'm, I'm sorry I grew angry, but... I hate to talk of your father. I don't quite understand why, Reuben, but I shall try to remember. Let me see you smile. <laughs> That's it. Are you excited about the wedding? Oh, it's so wonderful. Two days from now, I'll be your wife, Dorcas Bourne. Or better still, Mistress Reuben Bourne. Oh, Dorcas. Oh, there she is with Dr. Wentworth. Oh, yes, yeah, she looks lovely. And so happy. Oh, there's Reuben. He's taking her hand. Shh, shh. Elder Perkins is starting the service. Reuben Bourne, do you take this woman, Dorcas Malvin, to be your wedded wife? I do. Do you solemnly swear to love and to cherish her, honor and keep her, in sickness and in health? Reuben Bourne. Reuben Bourne. Do you solemnly swear? Solemnly swear. Who spoke? Reuben, what is it? What's happened? He's white as death. I'm waiting, my son. Do you swear? Reuben Bourne, you made me a sacred promise. Can you keep this vow? Reuben, Reuben, please answer. I... I do. I... I do solemnly swear. Dr. Wentworth, I cannot intercede again for Reuben Bourne. My conscience will not allow it. For in all these years, he has broken every law of the governor's council. Yes, I know that every man's hand is against him, Elder. What possesses him to behave as he does? Some evil spirit. Ever since the day I married him to Dorcas Malvin, he has been as a man possessed. Oh, no, Elder Perkins. Reuben is not possessed. He was badly wounded. That was 18 years ago, Ruth Whitman. I think Ruth is right, Elder. He's still a sick man. His soul is sick. He has squandered his heritage, neglected his land. I'll admit that his farm is hopelessly run down. It yields less and less every year. And now this dreadful fine, 200 pounds. It will ruin them. They'll lose the farm. He should have thought of that when he refused to give his trees for the masting of the king's ships. Reuben Vaughan has brought this just punishment upon himself. 
There's nothing I can do. In pity's name, Elder, what of Dorcas and that fine boy of theirs? Cyrus Bourne is 17 now, with all his life before him. He should be given another chance. I'm sorry, Doctor. I cannot intercede another time for Reuben Bourne. You understand, I'm sure. I bid you both good day. Good day, Elder. Good day, Elder. Oh, Dr. Wentworth, I can't bear to have Dorcas know it'll break her heart. And I don't relish the task of telling young Cyrus. He's in there in my library, waiting to hear the news. I shall have to call him. No need, sir. I couldn't help overhearing. So Elder Perkins' godly conscience won't let him help us. Well, I guess old Stony Heart is within his rights. Father is a bit high-handed in his dealings. You were a good lad, Cyrus, to take it with a smile. You know, you remind me of your father when he was your age. My father? Smiling? Yes, yes, he was always happy and cheerful until he came back from that expedition against the Indians. I think Cyrus is more like Roger Melvin. That's what Mother says, Mistress Whitman. She loves to talk about Grandfather. Ever since I was a baby, she's told me the story of his death and how brave Father was to stay with him and bury him and all that. We call it our secret because we never dare speak of it to Father. He never mentions your grandfather, does he, Cyrus? No, sir. And if anyone else does, he flies into a rage and shuts himself in his room. Battling with some demon of his imagination. I never understood it. It's very frightening sometimes, sir. I remember so well one day when I was six or seven years old. What happened, Cyrus? I was playing on the rocks near the porch of our house. Mother was churning. I remember having fallen, cutting my arm pretty badly. Cyrus, darling, come here to Mother. Oh, why, that is a pretty big cut. Here, let me tie it up with Mother's kerchief. Now, there. That will stop the bleeding. You're a brave boy not to cry. My father didn't cry when he fought the Indians. No, little son, he didn't. See, Mother, I got blood all on me just like he had. I'm going to pretend I'm big and brave like Father was. Yes, dear. And can I dig a great big grave? Oh, Cyrus, I don't think you... Right by this little sapling? Well, if you do not hurt it, it was your grandfather's favorite tree. And I'll find a stone, a great big stone. Funny boy. What a strange game for him to play. Marcus! Marcus, where are you? Here in front of the house, dear, watching Cyrus. Oh, Reuben... Did you sell the grain? The fools fined me 50 pine tree shillings for overcharging. Oh, Reuben, dear, you overcharged them again. I begged you not to. Father! Father, see? My hands got all blood on just like yours did. What, Cyrus? What's that? What are you doing? Digging Grandfather's grave. Oh, by heaven. Under the sapling, see? Come see, Father, come see. My own son taunting me. Where's my axe? Don't hurt the boy, Reuben. Cyrus, come here. Out of my way, boy. This sapling will stand no longer. Reuben, no. Oh, beautiful young oak tree. Reuben, stop. Father's tree. Blast of Father's tree. This will be an end to it. Yes, Reuben Bourne. You destroy this sapling. But try as you will, you can never destroy your memories. Mother, I'm scared. Look at Father. What's he staring at? I don't know, little son. I don't know. I remember when your grandfather planted that young oak. That's an unbelievable story, Cyrus. No wonder it's haunted you. Your father is queer, but don't forget we've had a lot of fun together, hunting and fishing and such things. But I'd better stop talking so much and ride on home to tell the news. Mother will be terribly unhappy. Not while she has you, Cyrus. You're a fine boy. Mistress Whitman, I think you're prejudiced. But thank you just the same. Goodbye to you both. Carry my love to Dorcas. Goodbye. Goodbye, boy. God bless you. Whoa, Brownie. Whoa. Here we are, boy. Father! Mother! I'm back. It's Cyrus, Reuben. Oh, what news? Cyrus, what news? And what did the great governor's council say? No hope, Father. We have to pay the hundred pounds or give up the farm. Well, I'll not pay it. 
I can have this place. I'm sick of it. I'm sick of them all. Bigoted, narrow mind. What do we do, Reuben? We'll go into the wilderness and make a new home. Mother, dear, we'll build you a fine new house, won't we, Father? Yes, son. A house of my own. We'll only take what the horse can carry. As for the rest, the council can have it and welcome. Good riddance to the Malvin farm, say I. Father, for the last two days, we've not been following the Blaze Trail. I know where we're going, Cyrus. Yes, sir, but I mean the new grants lie due west. I know they do. I can show you the trail. You're a good woodsman, son, but I shall show you the way. I know where we're going. Well, we're heading too far north. Enough! Do you object? No. Our journey will be longer and more exciting this way. Look, Reuben. Wouldn't this be a good place to make camp? By this stream. And see, that fallen log can be our dining table. Aye, I think you're right, Dorcas. And there's plenty of dry wood for our fire. Well, I'll gather the wood. You two had better hunt some game for our supper. I'll bring you some partridge and wild turkey. And maybe a deer. <laughs> My brave young hunter. But don't go too far from camp. Coming, Father? Aye, son. Reuben, wait just a minute. Aye, what is it? I wonder if you remember that this is the 12th of May. And what if it is? You don't remember. Eighteen years ago, on this day, and somewhere in this very forest, you... You buried my father. Well, this is too much. I don't mean to vex you, Reuben. But this wilderness brings back memories that for some reason you will never talk about. Dorcas, for the last time, will you please stop talking of your father and of his death? Yes, of course, Reuben. But I did so hope you remembered. Come back as soon as you can and... Good hunting, Reuben. Now, where did I leave you? I'm sure I'd know that great rock. I must find it. Where am I? Ah, oh, there's the sunset on my left. I'm heading north, all right. I'm sure the rock is nearby. Is that a grove of oaks ahead? Yes, it is, and there were oak trees where I left him. This must be the way. I will find the place, and when I do, I shall take up his bones and finally give them burial. And at last, I may have peace in my heart. Wait. It... The sunlight shining on a mass of granite rising above the trees. It's the rock. Yes, it is. I found the rock. Yes, Reuben Vaughn. You found the rock. All these long years, my bones have lain on the cold, hard ground. They're only covering the rotting leaves. And now you've dared to come back. Yes, Roger Malvin, I've dared to come back to right the wrong I did you and find rest for my tortured soul. You are too late, Reuben Bourne. There can be no happiness. It's never too late to make amends. You are too late, Reuben Bourne. There can be no happiness. But I've come back, Roger. I've promised to come back. Too late. Too late. Reuben Bourne is too late. Silence! Silence, old man. The whole forest will hear. You are too late. Too late. Silence, I say. Silence, I'll stand no more. Ow! Why, that was a human cry. Oh, what have I done? Oh, what have I done? Oh, great heaven. Reuben? Reuben? I heard a cry. Where are you, Reuben? Reuben? Reuben, what's happened? Speak to me, Reuben. Speak to me. What are you staring at? Look. Cyrus. <gasps> yes, Dorcas. I have killed our son. From the time-worn pages of the past, we have brought you the immortal tale, The Burial of Roger Malvin. Bellkeeper, toll the bell.
This is Orson Welles, speaking from London. The Black Museum. Here, in the grim stone structure on the Thames, which houses Scotland Yard, is a warehouse of homicides. A warehouse where everyday objects, a piece of wash line, a medicine bottle, an electric light bulb, all, all are touched by murder. There's a telegram. That's a familiar object. Usually it says happy birthday or congratulations on your wedding or will arrive 10 o'clock train. This telegram was an urgent request to die. Take this telegram, miss, please. Yes, sir. Daily Star. Come at once. 4.30 train, Waterloo, Bournemouth Central. Something will meet. Sorry, sir. What is this? Car. Car will meet. Today, this telegram can be seen in the Black Museum. From the annals of the Criminal Investigation Department of the London Police, we bring you the dramatic stories of the crimes recorded by the objects in Scotland Yard's Gallery of Death, the Black Museum. Museum, Scotland Yard's mausoleum of murder. Here lies death, arranged on shelves, in cabinets, ranked along the floor and on the tables. Death in many disguises. This oil lamp. This one was found in time. There were others before it in other places, part of a baited trap. A house cat leaped, knocking over the lamp. Flames flared. Arson. When somebody dies in such a fire, arson becomes the murderer. Here's a bit of ribbon from a Christmas package. Shining, tinseled ribbon. The gift unwrapped in pleasant anticipation was death. Ah, a telegram. There we are. It's a slip of yellow paper with familiar type pasted in stripes across its face. Urgent, a summons. One day, this wire rested in a closed handbag on a woman's lap. She was riding on a train in response to the wire. The men sharing the seat with her smile started a conversation. Going all the way to Bournemouth? No, I'm getting off at Boscombe. Oh. This train does stop at Boscombe, doesn't it? Well, I believe it does. I'm going through to Bournemouth myself, so I didn't pay particular attention. Your holidays? Well, in a way, I'm taking a day off to see some friends, and I'm going back to Southampton to catch a ship for a business trip. Ah, oh, it must be nice to have a life like that. Oh, I don't know. Mine's very dull. Oh, well, then my guess is that, like some of the ladies I know, you'll find your gaiety in your hat. <laughs> <laughs> my one extravagance. Oh, yes. I've always liked a pretty hat. Just chit-chat on a train speeding southward from London. The gentleman contributed no information about his business. The lady didn't give her name. She did, however, volunteer. I'm going down to Boscombe to cook for some people. That's what I do, cook. And the time passed. Others entered the compartment of the train at various stops and left a little later, but that was all. And as the train slowed for Boscombe... Here, let me, miss. Uh, that bag looks heavy. I'll get it down for you. Oh, please don't trouble, oh, sir. Oh, this is no trouble uh, at all. There we are. Well, it's been pleasant chatting with you. Well, good luck on your new job. And thank you, sir. And uh, good luck on your trip. Thank you, miss. Big pardon, miss. Are you the new cook for the Egan's of Woodmere House? Uh, yes, I am. Ah, oh, then this way, please. Mrs. Egan told me to watch for you. I'm their chauffeur. I have the car. It's a fair way out, you see. Oh, yes, the telegram said the car would meet me. Is it nice working for the Egan's? She put her luggage in the back of the big limousine, stepped into the front seat next to the chauffeur. The 
train pulled out of the Boscombe station just as the car moved away along the road. Apparently it was a fair ways out, as the chauffeur had put it. The road wound through the countryside. The land seemed to grow more and more bleak as they rode along. The sun dropped below the horizon. The young woman began to feel a little edgy. Is it much further? Seems to be getting dark. <laughs> it not only seems to be getting dark, my girl, it is getting dark. Well, you never told me if it's nice working out here. You won't have any trouble if you're nice, that is. If I'm nice? I've got the master's and mistress's ears. What I say usually goes. Anyone who's not nice to me goes. I, I don't understand. You've worked before, haven't you? Well, yes, of course. I have the very best of references. I. <laughs> In most places, it's the butler, isn't it? Out here, it's me. I, I don't understand. Why have you left the road? Because, my girl, I took you out this way for reasons of my own. No, no, I came out here for a job. As cook, I... Forget that. Come here. No, don't let go of me. Oh, no, you can't. You can't help to me. Not to me. It's someone else. It's I... no one else. It's you, understand? Now be good. Be quiet. I, 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 I... That was all till the next morning. A farmer cutting across the empty fields found that they were not quite as empty as he'd supposed. Here, here, here what's this? Are you sleeping, miss? Ah! I, she, she's dead. Or this be for the police. The farmer made it as fast as he could to the nearest telephone, and within an hour the police had arrived. Very well now. Suppose you repeat your story, uh, sir. You, you're uh, Inspector Gardner. Ah, uh, well, they, they told yes, me. Yes, I'm Gardner, I... Scotland Yard. Uh, Go ahead. Well, I, uh, I was cutting across the field, uh, save a few steps, like, and I, I, I come on her, lying like that. I went for help. Uh, that's all, sir. You didn't touch anything. Oh. You didn't mess up the ground. Oh, no, no, sir, nothing like that. All right. Give the constable your name and address. Yes. We'll call you if we need you. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, what do you make of it, Martin? One of those things, Inspector. Murder by person unknown. After a bit of a struggle, it looks like. Yes, ground's pretty well trampled. Any idea of the time of death? Medical examiner can't say yet, sir. My guess is sometime after 7 o'clock last night. The rain stopped around 6.30. She's not even damp, sir. Very good. I judge from the tire tracks, we'll get the make of tires and the size of the car easily enough. Yes, sir. You have her handbag? Yes, right here, sir. Hmm, yes. Well, she had an identity card. Ida Matthews, Streatham, London. We can check that quickly enough. Hello? It's a telegram. Daily Star. Come at once. 4.30 train, Waterloo, Bournemouth Central. Car will meet you. Expenses paid, Egan, Woodmere House, Boscombe. Yes, I've seen this sort of thing before. What are the odds, Martin? There is no Woodmere House, nor any Egan hereabouts. The odds were high. The inspector was right. No Woodmere House and no Egan. But the telegram was a lead. Not an important lead, but a thread to start on. Aren't very many post offices in Boscombe, and you send telegrams from post offices in England. Detective Martin had an assignment. I'm sorry to bother you, but was this wire filed at this office? Not at that office. No. Nor at the next one. But the one after that. Yes. That's one of ours. May I see the original of the wire, please? Well, now, I don't know that I should... Scotland Yard, miss. My credentials. Oh. Oh, well, that makes it proper, then. And since it was proper, Detective Martin returned to his superior with the original of the wire. Did you ever see such atrocious handwriting, Inspector? Oh, I can't say I ever have. Party can't spell either. No E in Bournemouth and expenses with a C in place of an S. Interesting. Martin, this will be a long job. Check through Central Post Office and go at the Bournemouth area yourself. Get the originals of every wire over the past six months that have had bad handwriting and worse spelling. It's a long job. Patience and routine. The two great strengths of the forces of law and order. And they pay off. Sometimes it takes months, sometimes only weeks. This time, 
It was two weeks. A triumphant detective might return to Inspector Gardner. We've got two more wires, sir. Good work, Martin. Here, sir. Notice this first one. To the Dandre woman. No E in Bournemouth. C in expense and a new error. Two Fs in if. Uh, this one to the domestic agency. Someone wanted a, a, a young, pleasant nurse. Without an A in pleasant. And again, the E is missing in Bournemouth. The writing's identical. No question about it. Put some calls through, Martin. I wonder if the Dandre woman or the young, pleasant nurse ever came down this way. <laughs> That check was an easy one, no trouble at all. The Dandre woman came down, no car, she went back. A lucky lady, that one, apparently. The employment agency was a bit more careful. The agency wrote to the return address for more information. Name and address were fictitious, of course. Oh, of course. All right, Martin. Back to the Boscombe Post Office. Jog a few memories, will you? <laughs> I see, miss. You filed this wire. I did. We get a lot of business through here, but I remember that awful handwriting. Do you remember anything about the person who gave it to you? Well, it was a man. I know that. Good. That's something. There was a... Let me think. No. No, it's all blank. Don't try too hard, miss. It'll come back to you. Here, let me read you the wire. Daily Star, come at once. 4.30 4.30 train, Waterloo, Bournemouth Central. And something here I, I can't quite make out. That's it. Car. Car will meet. I asked him the same question. He repeated the words like that. Car. Car will meet. I'd know his voice anywhere. Why? Well, it was that kind of voice. Smooth, too soft. Sent shivers over me. Do you remember the man at all? No, sir. You know how it is. Don't look at all the people who come in here. But I think, I'm not positive, but I think he had on a chauffeur's uniform. Patience and routine were bringing results. From nothing, except Ida Matthews' body, they built their evidence to a man in a chauffeur's uniform who couldn't spell. And from the tire tracks, they knew the make of tires and the length and width and therefore the make of the car. Within hours now, every chauffeur in the vicinity who drove a large sedan of a certain make had been called into the police station. Now, sir, on the evening of November the 11th, I was in London, sir, with my family. Now, we lost a boy in the war, Inspector, and the whole family always gets together on armistice night for that reason, sir. November the 11th, Inspector? Oh, I was off that night. I didn't have the car. No, the young master was permitted to drive it himself that night, seeing as I was having my regular night off. I picked up the old man, uh, Mr. Dutton, at his regular train, drove him home, put the car away and locked it up. Did you have your own key to the garage? No, sir. I always turn it into the big house after I put the car away. That's what I did that night, sir. And after that, Mitchell? I went into Bournemouth on the bus, sir. Had a bite and went to the cinema. <laughs> you seem to remember all that very well. It was over a month ago the case we're investigating happened. Oh, I've got a great memory. Well, how is it on spelling? Oh, huh. I wouldn't know. I, I never tested it. Let's test it right now. Take this pad and pencil and write the words I asked you. Now, I know you, Smartin. We shouldn't have let the newspapers publish those wires. Not one of these chaps spells those words wrong. And their handwriting doesn't match. Nothing. Yes, it's too bad, Inspector, to draw a blank when it looked so good for a bit. That's about it, Martin. For once, we've drawn a blank completely. But that was not to be the end. Fate was to play a hand, and one of the strongest cards in that hand turned out to be the telegram. Yes, this same telegram that can be seen today in the Black Museum. Orson Welles will be back with you in just a moment. And now we continue with The Black Museum, starring Orson Welles. They'd drawn a blank, but carefully built up points which should have led to a vicious killer led nowhere. 
the pitiful and tragic story of Ida Matthews seemed headed directly for the unsolved file at Scotland Yard. How to account for what happened next? Chance? Stupidity? The intelligence to capitalize on a tiny fact? It really doesn't matter. What does matter is that one morning at the post office in Boscombe... How many stamps for this package, miss? I'll just put it on the scale. Uh, uh, take care now. It's marked fragile. You can see that. I see it. It'll be one and three. Right you are. <laughs> Thank you, miss. Jimmy, quick. Yes. Please, where's he going? Say, Marge. The fellow in the chauffeur's suit. Where's he going? Get to the window. I can't leave the cage. Quick. He's... Yeah, he's getting into a car. Big great sedan. Get the number. Whatever for? Get it. Wait. LK9054. What do you want it for? Ex-husband owes you am alimony, eh? Oh, don't be ridiculous. That's the man who sent the telegram. The one the coppers were so interested I... in. I'd know his voice anywhere. Yeah, you take over. Okay. I'm going to telephone that nasty detective. <laughs> The young man might have taken that package. The girl might have forgotten the voice. Neither of these things happened. And a new lead was developed for the yard. Mitchell drives that car, Inspector. John Mitchell. Owner is Dutton. We had Mitchell in. His writing doesn't match and his spelling's fine. Well, the girl swears he's the man. Martin, can you picture a British jury hanging a man because a girl remembered his voice? No, such things aren't happening. But the points were added to the Ida Matthews file and held waiting their use. Patience and more patience and more results. Inspector Gardner speaking. Uh, this is Sidney Harris. I'm told, sir, that I ought to give my information to you. It's on the Matthews case, sir. You see, I rode down to Boscombe on the train with her. Sidney Harris received a warm welcome at Scotland Yard. Uh, sit down, Mr. Harris. Uh, thank you. If I may ask, what took you so long? I was out of the country, Inspector. I returned just yesterday. Oh, go on, Mr. Harris. Well, you see, my business takes me abroad quite a bit. I had the opportunity to spend a night with some friends of mine in Bournemouth before I sailed the next day. And that's how it happened that I was on the train. The Matthews woman was in my compartment. We talked a bit. I commented on our hair, just passing the time. I'd never have thought of it again, I suppose, if my ship had sailed on time, but it didn't. The steward brought aboard some late papers, which came out while we were still at Southampton. I saw them after we'd been at sea for a few hours. There was this woman's picture and the story. I understand. And now then, Mr. Harris, what information do you have which may be of help to us? Well, the luggage rack on the car, Inspector. Uh, it, it was a large grey sedan. How did you happen to notice it? Well, I watched her cross to the station platform. And I saw a man meet her in a, in a chauffeur's uniform. I watched her enter this car. Now, it happens, Inspector, that I design auto bodies. Uh, the luggage rack attracted my attention. It doesn't belong to that make of car. It's been specially fitted. You're a very observant man, Mr. Harris, for which our deepest appreciation. Uh, at <coughs> one point, Mr. Harris, among these ladies' hats on the desk, which one would you say was Miss Matthews? Oh, this one, sir. That, Mr. Harris, is the hat we found beside Ida Matthews' body. At last. Someone to establish that Ida Matthews had been met by a chauffeur at the Boston station. Which chauffeur? Yes, that's the car, the grey one. LK9054. That's the luggage wreck I was talking about. But what about the handwriting and the spelling? Ask the license bureau for Mitchell's application for a driver's license. I want to see the handwriting on it. Within a day, the application lay on the inspector's desk. Beside it were the originals of the wires with the misspelled words. Well, Martin? Not much doubt about it, is there, Inspector? The experts will testify for us, Martin, but I'm satisfied. Get your hat. We're going to pick up Mitchell. Well, Martin, what kept you? I saw his room, sir, and spoke with Mr. Dutton. Mitchell must have got the wind up. He's gone. But I found this in his room. The key? Duplicate key to the garage. Uh, Mitchell had access to the car any time he wanted to use it. And Mr. Dutton tells me he was on the verge of calling us when I walked in. Mitchell is paying the expenses of his little trip with forged checks. That does it, Martin. Let's get back to the office. 
how the vast interlocking network of police authorities and police communications went into action. All across and up and down England, the teletypes carried the message. Bournemouth to all stations. General alarm for one John Mitchell, age about 42, 5 feet 8 inches tall, weight about 165 pounds, hair brown, eyes blue, distinctive, smooth, low-pitched voice, wanted for forgery and murder. The word was out. Somewhere in England, a policeman would recognize John Mitchell. And a policeman did. Inspector Gardner speaking. Uh, this is Superintendent Cowan and Reading, Inspector. We have this John Mitchell for you. Picked him up when he tried to get a job in a garage here as a mechanic. John Mitchell was brought back to Boscombe. But the job wasn't done, even yet. After all, when the charge is murdered, the plea of not guilty is mandatory. There must be a trial. And there must be attorneys for the defense. A man is to be presumed innocent and to proven guilty, therefore... The case had to be airtight, foolproof. No loopholes for a smart defense counsel. Now then, miss, when you walk into this room, there'll be a dozen men there with their backs turned towards you. You'll walk in backwards yourself, so that there'll be no chance of your seeing even the backs of their heads. Sort of blindfold test, sir. Yes, without benefit of blindfold. Are you ready now? Well, as ready as I'll ever be. Let's go. Through here. These men have been briefed, Martin? Yes, sir. They know what to do. They're to read the words on the cards I've given them. Very well. You can begin. All right. You. Car. Car will meet. Next. Car. Car will meet. Next. Car. Car will meet. Next, please. Car. Uh, car will meet. And the next. Car. Car will meet. That's him. That's the voice. I'd know it's anywhere. <laughs> They were ready, now they felt, to give the Crown its chance to avenge the untimely and brutal death of one of its subjects. The prosecutor was confident. The defense was bold. Time and again, despite the experts, despite the weight of evidence, the defense managed to throw what seemed a reasonable doubt on the guilt of John Mitchell. The climactic moment came when Mitchell himself was on the witness stand. The prosecutor faced the prisoner. Mr. Mitchell, we're about to go back to school. We shall have a spelling lesson. I'm ready. Ask away. Will you spell if? I-F. If. We shall be more difficult as we go along. Will you be good enough to spell expense? A-X-P-E-N-S-E. Huh, very good, Mr. Mitchell. You've learned your lesson well. And now then, please spell Bournemouth. B-O-U-R-N-E-M-O-U-T-H. Yeah? Oh, well, fine, just fine. And, um, pleasant, Mr. Mitchell. Uh, how do you spell pleasant? P-L-E-S-E-N-T. I see. Pleasant. Uh, just like a present. That's right. But it isn't right, Mr. Mitchell. Pleasant is spelt with an A. But you didn't spell it with an A today, nor did you spell it with an A when you wrote the telegram asking for a pleasant young nurse. What was your plan, Mr. Mitchell? Did you want to murder a nurse the way you murdered Ida Matthews? Perhaps in that terrible moment as he stood in the dark at the Old Bailey, the mind of John Mitchell may have turned to that other moment when all unsuspecting he wrote out that fateful telegram. The self-same telegram that can be seen today in the Black Museum. It might be said that John Mitchell was hanged by a missing letter A in the word pleasant. Be that as it may, circumstances caught up with this gentleman one morning at eight o'clock, and he passed from this world because of a set of coincidences which fitted together in the minds of alert detectives in Scotland Yard. If Mitchell had known how to spell correctly... If Harris had not been a keen-eyed designer of automobiles, if Harris had not taken his trip when he did, if Marge, the post office clerk, had not been struck by Mitchell's voice. But it's no matter now. Now the telegram is to be found in its customary place in Scotland Yard in the Black Museum. And now, until we meet next time in the same place, I tell you another story about the Black Museum. 
I remain as always obediently yours. And now... The Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the series of radio dramas dedicated to the supernatural, the unusual, and the unknown. Come with me, my friends. We shall descend to the world of the unknown and forbidden down to the depths where the veil of time is lifted and the supernatural reigns as king. Come with me and listen to the tale of The Telltale Heart. I had nothing against the man. I didn't want his money. And those who say I did are crazy. He was always agreeable and liked me. But there was one thing about him that bothered me. That eye. That eye of his. That pale blue vulture eye. Why did you do it? That, that voice. It's always with me. It's always with me. Why did you do it? Why did you do it? Listen. Can't you hear it? So rhythmic. Beating, beating. It's with me. It follows me wherever I go. The pounding of his heart. The pounding, beating rhythm of the telltale heart. Be quiet. Be quiet. Be quiet. In just a moment, the Hall of Fantasy will present the telltale heart. And now for our story. Adapted for radio by Richard Thorne, entitled The Telltale Heart. Yes? Uh, there was an advertisement in the paper. I'm here to answer it. I see. Won't you come in, please? Yes, thank you. Are you the one I'm supposed to see? No, I'm Mrs. Gorman, the housekeeper. Mr. Lawrence, the old gentleman, he's the one you ought to see. You'll just wait here. I'll tell him you're here. Yes, thank you. Of course. Mr. Lawrence. Yes? Someone here and asked for the advertisement you placed in the paper. Uh, send him in, Mrs. Gorman. Sir, Mr. Lawrence will see you now. Thank you. He's over by the desk, sir. Yes, ma'am, I see him. Thank you. You come in answer to the advertisement in the paper? Yes, sir. Care to sit down? No. No, I'll stand, thank you. What's your name? Uh, Crowther. David Crowther. Aside from my housekeeper, Mr. Crowther, I live here by myself. I feel the need of a companion. Someone to whom I can talk. Mrs. Gorman is a housekeeper. She doesn't talk very much. Very competent person, but very uncommunicative. You have references, I suppose? No, Mr. Lawrence. I, I haven't. Oh. Uh, what work have you been doing? I'll be completely honest with you, Mr. Lawrence. I I haven't been working for the past year. I was only released from the hospital two weeks ago. I noticed you looked rather pale. Are you well now? Oh, yes. I've completely recovered. Well, uh, you don't have references. I don't uh, know. Please, Mr. Lawrence. I need employment. My money is all gone, and I must work in order to live. I see. What about your family? I have no family. No other attachment? No, sir. I'm going to take a chance on you, Mr. Crowther. Thank you, of sir. Of course, your salary won't be too large. But you'll have a roof over your head and plenty of food to eat. When can you start? Tonight, if you like, Mr. Lawrence. Excellent. You know, Mr. Crowther, David, if I may call you that. Yes, sir. I have the feeling that we're going to get along quite well together. was with him for several months. I don't know when the idea first entered my mind, but once it was there, it haunted me day and night. It enveloped my brain with its cunning. I had nothing against the man. He was always agreeable and liked me. 
But there was one thing about him that bothered me. That eye. That eye of his. One day I asked the housekeeper about it. Mrs. Gorman. Yes, David? The old gentleman. One of his eyes. Is there anything wrong with it? What? I don't think so, David. I, I hadn't noticed. To me, one of his eyes resembles that of a vulture. Pale blue it is with a cloudy film covering it. It didn't bother me at first. And, well, in fact, it doesn't bother me now unless he looks at me, but... Unless he looks at you? Why? Well, every time he looks at me, my blood runs cold. That pale blue vulture eye... I think I... you're imagining things, David. <laughs> yes, yes, Mrs. Gorman. Per perhaps I am imagining things. You won't say anything about it to Mr. Lawrence, will you? Of course not, David. <laughs> I don't know what came over me. Of course, there's nothing wrong with the old gentleman. Nothing at all. <laughs> yes, but there was... That eye of his, that pale blue vulture eye. Little by little, I began to hate him with all my heart. One evening, a few weeks later, the old man and I sat in the living room. We had just finished dinner and we were talking as we usually did. <laughs> Just as you say, Mr. Lawrence, we'll have to wait and... And, well... What are you looking at? What, David? Are you staring at me? No, of course not. Yes, you are. Don't look at me like that. I'm not looking... Don't look at me! Turn it away. Turn it away. Turn your eye away. David. What's wrong with you? Nothing's wrong with me. Only your eye. It's like a vulture's... days passed, and I guess he thought I had forgotten about his eye. <laughs> but I hadn't. No, I hadn't. And every night about midnight, I'd get out of bed, creep from my room to his, I'd unlatch the door, and open it, and then, after it was opened wide enough to stick my head through, I would put in a covered lantern, all closed, so that no light would shine forth. <laughs> and after I had my head in the room, I would undo the lantern, so that only a single ray of light darted out. And I would shine it on his face to see if his eye were open. But no, it never was. Not then. I found the eye always closed. And you see, that made it impossible to do my work. For it wasn't the old man that bothered me, but his eye, his evil eye. And unless his eye were open, I couldn't do it. <laughs> but I knew that one night it would happen. Yes, it would open, and then I could do it. Then I could kill him. <laughs> <laughs> Now to our story, adapted especially for radio by Richard Thorne, entitled The Telltale Heart. And so I waited. I went out of my way to make him comfortable. I made sure that I never mentioned anything about his eye to him. And every morning I would go into his chamber boldly and ask him, Well, Mr. Lawrence, did you sleep well last night? Why, yes, David, I did. You didn't hear anything? Uh, any noises? No, not a one. I'm glad of that. Why? Did you hear anything? No, 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 not a thing. And why did you ask me if I had? Oh, I was just asking, Mr. Lawrence. I wanted to make sure. I wanted to make sure. And he thought everything was all right. He was a fool, just like all the others. <laughs> well, how could he know? Yes, how could he know that every night on the stroke of twelve, I looked in upon him as he slept. <laughs> you know, David, I didn't sleep very well last night. You didn't, Mr. Lawrence? No, I had a bad dream. Oh? What did you dream about? I dreamt that someone was looking in at me while I slept. Just waiting for a chance to kill me. 
Well, that's just a dream, Mr. Lawrence. Nothing to worry about, you know that. Yes, I... I guess it was just a dream. <laughs> because the only people here are Mrs. Gorman and myself, and neither one of us would hurt you. You know that, don't you, Mr. Lawrence? Yes. I'm glad you're both with me, David. It's just the same. I can't seem to get rid of that feeling. It frightens me. Don't worry about a thing, Mr. Lawrence. No, don't worry. I'll take care of you. On the eighth and last night, I took special pains to make sure he wouldn't hear me. A watch's minute hand moved more quickly than did mine. I crept out into the hallway, made my way to his door. His room was all black. Black as coal, black as midnight. I think he heard me, but I knew he couldn't see a thing. <laughs> the room was too dark for that. I was almost in the room and about to open my lantern when my thumb slipped upon the tin fastening and the old man was immediately fully awake. He sat upright in bed and whispered, Who's there? I said, Who's there? I kept still. I didn't say a thing. No, not a thing. And for what seemed like an hour, I stood there and didn't move a muscle. I knew he wouldn't lie down. He was sitting up in his bed, listening. Listening for what it was that had made the noise. <laughs> the old man was in mortal fear. When I had waited a long time... And still had not heard him lie back upon his bed. I resolved to open my lantern a little. Yes, just a little. Just the tiniest bit. And presently, the tiniest bit of light struggled out. I directed it towards him like the thread of a spider. And finally, it came to rest upon his vulture eye. And then... I seemed to hear something. I didn't know what it was. I couldn't distinguish it at first, and I racked my mind to think of what it was. And then finally it came to me. Yes, that was it. It was the beating of the old man's heart. Who is in here? I could hear it distinctly. He was so afraid. Beat, 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 beat. It went. I could feel its rhythm. The old man was in mortal terror. But I held the lantern motionless. I tried to keep the beam of the light focused on that terrible eye, that pale blue vulture's eye. The incessant drumbeat of his heart increased. It grew quicker and quicker. Beat, beat, beat. Louder, louder every moment. The old man's terror must have been extreme. Then I thought of something else. The sound of his heart was so loud it might be heard by someone else, by Mrs. Gorman, by some prying neighbor. And I couldn't allow that, could I? No. And the beating grew louder and louder and louder until I could stand it no longer. Who's there? Don't be afraid, old man. Is that you, David? Yes, that's right. It's only me. Nothing to be afraid of. What are you doing in my room? Just watching over you, Mr. Lawrence. I thought it was someone else. You have nothing to fear from me, old man. But you should be asleep. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'll go to sleep. And so will you, old man. So will you. David, what's wrong with you? Nothing. Nothing, old man. Nothing at all. Don't come any closer to me. Stay away from me. Die, old man. Die. Let your heart die with you. Die. Die. Close your eyes. That vulture eye. Close it forever. <laughs> stood there in the darkness, looking down upon him. He was quiet now. Strange kind of stillness was upon him. <laughs> For he was dead. His eye would trouble me no longer, and I knew that I had to dispose of the body, and I racked my brain to think of a place, and then it came to me. Yes, I pulled three boards from the floor. I had to work quickly. The blackness of night was fast changing to gray. I placed his body under the flooring very neatly, and then I boarded it up again. <laughs> I 
did it so well that even I could hardly recognize the spot under which the body was hidden. Yes, his room looked as if nothing had happened. The striking of the town clock made me realize how late it was. Well, the job was over and no one would ever be the wiser. Who's there? Mrs. Gorman. Uh, just a moment. Yes. Yes, what is it? Where's Mr. Lawrence? He's not here. Not here? No, no, he... He went out to the country late this evening. Well, I heard something up here. Such as... A scream. No one screamed, Mrs. Gorman. What? I, I guess I was mistaken. I'll have to send them back then. Who? I was afraid when I woke up I heard or... Or I thought I heard a scream. You didn't hear a thing. Mr. Lawrence has been gone for some time. What are you doing up here? I wanted to make sure he hadn't forgotten anything. But what you probably heard, Mrs. Gorman, was the neigh of the horse as the carriage carried Mr. Lawrence away. Then I... I must tell him to go. Who? Who's downstairs? Who is it? Well, I... I was frightened. I called the police. Huh? They're waiting for you downstairs. For both you and Mr. Lawrence. <laughs> Now to our story, adapted especially for radio by Richard Thorne, entitled The Telltale Heart. I was so sure that no one had heard anything. But Mrs. Gorman, the housekeeper, she must have heard him scream. Or did she hear the beating of the old man's heart? I went downstairs with her. Here's Mr. Crowther, officer. Thank you. Will you be needing me anymore? No, I don't think so. Good night, then. Well, what can I do for you gentlemen? You'll have to pardon us, sir, for disturbing you. We received a complaint from your housekeeper about some strange noises she heard. Oh, she must be mistaken, officer. Nothing's happened here. The housekeeper said she heard a scream from upstairs. Oh, she must have been dreaming. Perhaps. But I hope you'll excuse us, sir, if we take a look through the house. Why, certainly, officer. I have nothing to hide. Uh, Well, where do you want to start, gentlemen? If you'll just show us around. With pleasure. Just follow me. I led them from room to room. I took them all over the house. I wanted to show them I had nothing to hide. I showed them every nook and cranny in the Uh, place except the old man's room. I wanted to say that to last. (laughs) Finally, I took them into his room. And though they searched exhaustively, they found nothing. I was quite pleased with myself. That housekeeper of yours must have imagined she heard a scream from up here. Probably just a nightmare. Well, perhaps what she heard was me. I, uh, yes, I had a nightmare, and I think it, well, I might have been the one she heard. Well, there you are. That's a simple explanation of it. <laughs> yeah, I, always, I often have nightmares. You know. We uh, ought to go to her room and tell your house. Don't worry about it, Tom. It wasn't her fault. Yes. Well, as a matter of fact, how will she know who made the noise? She said there was a, a Mr. Lawrence living here, too. Oh, yes. Where is he now? Well, he... He isn't here. Well, that's evident. But where is he? Well, he... He went out to the country for a few weeks. He left tonight. I see. Uh, Sorry to have troubled you, sir. No trouble at all, officer. Well, let's get out of here, Ed. We're keeping this gentleman up. If you gentlemen won't think it presumptuous, uh, won't you have a glass of wine with me? I know how it is after you've been up all night. Oh, I don't know, sir. We're not supposed to drink while we're on duty. Ah, but Ed, we're, uh, we're almost through. Let's have a glass of wine. When we finish here, we can go home. Yes, yes, do have some wine. All right, it's a pleasure. All right, I'll get it for you. And Mr. Lawrence always kept a decanter and glasses on that table. Did you say kept, sir? <laughs> a slip of the tongue, officer. <laughs> the hour is late, you know. I uh, don't mind, Ed, Mr. Crowther. He's suspicious of everybody. <laughs> yes, of course. Well, that's your job. Well, here we are. I hope you like sherry. Mm-hmm. Always have it at home. <laughs> Good. Glad to hear that. Well, here's yours, sir. Thank you. And yours. Thanks. There. Well, shall we drink to something, gentlemen? Well, let's drink to you, sir, as a sort of apology for interrupting your sleep. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) That's very good, you know. (laughs) You did interrupt me. (laughs) I wanted to show off. I had seated them in the old man's room. And after all, in a way, this was a celebration, a token of my ingenuity. 
I'd seated myself on top of the very spot under which I'd hidden the body. We had one glass of wine, then another, and another. We were talking quite freely when I, when I heard it. Oh, won't you gentlemen have enough... Uh, what's that? What's what, sir? That noise. That beating. I don't hear anything. Anything wrong, Mr. Crowther? No, nothing. Nothing's wrong. Uh, have some more wine. I wish they'd leave. They were getting on my nerves. I had a terrible headache. And I seemed to hear a beating in my ears. They began to look at me queerly. And yet that sound increased. There was nothing I could do about it. It was a low, dull, quick sound. Like the beating of a drum. Where, where had I heard that sound before? They watched me closely. I paced the floor. I didn't know where the sound was coming from. Beat, beat, beat. Throb, beat, throb, throb. Where had I heard that sound before? I knew they suspected. Who wouldn't with that incessant beating that filled the room that seemed to make the very walls shake with its monotonous beat, that rhythm? Where had I heard it before? Where had I? I knew. I knew where I'd heard it before. Beat, throb. Beat, rub, beat, 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 yes. I knew what I'd heard it before. It was the beating of the old man's heart. What's the matter, Mr. Crowther? Can't you hear it? Hear what, sir? Perhaps I can push it out. What's the matter with you? What are you trying to do? Stop it from beating. Stop what, sir? Get out of here. Both of you. Get out of here. Get out of here. I can stifle his heart, that throbbing heart. Can't you hear the throbbing? Can't you hear it? The only thing we hear is you, Mr. Crowther. I can't stand it. I can't. The continuous pounding will never stop till I tell you the truth. The truth about what? About the old man, about Lawrence. I did it. I did it. What did you do? I killed him. Under the floor. The body is under the floor. Let me stop that beating. <laughs> stop the beating of his guilty heart. <laughs> with me. Always with me. Why did you do it? Why did you do it? Listen. Did you hear it? Slow, rhythmic beating. 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 It's with me. It follows me wherever I go. The pounding of his heart. The pounding, the pounding, the beating, beating rhythm of his telltale heart. Be quiet! Be quiet! Be quiet! So runs tonight's tale of the unusual, the terrifying, the unknown. Join us again when next we journey down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy to hear another strange tale of the supernatural. All characters and events portrayed in these programs are fictional, and any similarity to actual events or persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. Good evening, friends. This is your host to welcome you through the creaking door into the inner sanctum. Come in, please do come in. Our little place may not be a mansion, but it has its advantages. For one thing, it's thoroughly scare conditioned. The scream pipes are always in good working order, and we're very proud of our hot and cold running slaughter. And the rent's quite reasonable, too. We get a cut break. 
<laughs> As the trunk murderer caught by the police and asked for the whereabouts of his latest victim, murmured, it's in the bag. <laughs> Tonight's Inner Sanctum Mystery, Bird Song for a Murderer, was written by Lou Vittis and stars Ted Osborne in the role of Carl with Arlene Blackburn as Elaine. Well, you've had your warning. Whatever happens from now on, you asked for. Just be sure the family is provided for. And now to our happy little anecdote. Bird song for murder. My name is Carl Warner. An undistinguished sort of name, but I'm an undistinguished sort of man, so the name fits, I guess. I'm not a young man any longer, but I don't mind that. I wasn't very happy when I was young. Now, well, at least I'm not unhappy. And late at night, after Elaine has gone upstairs to bed, she's my wife. She's very pretty and younger than I am, and maybe I made a mistake in marrying her, but anyway, late at night, I go into the room where I keep the birds, and then, listening to them sing, I get as close to happiness as I can expect. I stay an hour, and then I cover their cages, and then they know it's time to sleep, and they sleep. Even on the stormiest of nights... And this was a stormy night. The birds were still. And I turned to go upstairs when... Someone knocked at the front door. It was late. We know very few people. We kept to ourselves mostly, Elaine and I, so... I worried a little when I opened the door. Yes? Mind if I come in, Mr. Warner? It's kind of damp out. Oh, uh, no, of course not. You seem to know me. I do, don't I? But I don't know you. My name is Brew, Chester Brew. Oh, uh, how do you do? Well, I'd do better if I was sitting down. I'm sorry. Uh, please. Thanks. Chester Brew. I still don't remember. Doesn't matter. What, uh, what did you want? Nice place you got here. Much nicer than Cragmont. Cragmount? Cragmount Asylum for the Insane. You work there? I used to work there. This is all very interesting. Funny but... thing happened just before I left. One of the inmates escaped. Very neat job. Was helped from the outside. Uh, I... Disappeared. Made quite a sensation. It must happen frequently. Not as frequently as all that. Besides, this baby was a homicidal lunatic. <laughs> Homicidal. That's right. I don't see what all this has to do with me. I didn't say it had. There was one funny thing about this inmate. Was there? Loved canaries. Loved to listen to them sing. Psychiatrists at Cragmount found it very interesting. Birdsong was the only thing that kept the murderous impulse down. I... Uh, Mr. Warner, I'm out of work. That, uh, that's too bad. You're not doing badly. Nice house, furnishings... Didn't I hear canaries singing before I come into the house? Maybe, maybe you did. So, uh, 5,000 in the morning? No. I think yes. Otherwise, Cragmount will be happy to hear from me. 11 Crescent Place, room 2B in the morning. You can show me to the door now. Of, of course. Good night, Mr. Warner. Till we meet again? I watched him go into the blackness. And the blackness swallow him. And then I went back into the house. I stopped at the foot of the stairs leading to the bedrooms. And then I turned and went into the aviary. The birds were quiet. I thought for a moment of taking the covers off the cages and letting the birds sing. And then I thought... That night, it might be better if I didn't let the birds sing. Okay, 
Okay. Who uh, it? Oh. Couldn't wait till morning, huh? I didn't expect... Wait. That knife. No! No! Oh, I... I shouldn't have let you... Surprise... Surprise... Oh! Oh! oh. It had been a bad night. I couldn't have slept more than two or three hours. Fortunately, Elaine and I had separate rooms and at breakfast the next morning. She was fresh and young and beautiful. Carl. Hmm? Why are you staring at me in that funny way? Nothing. You really shouldn't read it, Niels. Oh, it's only the paper. So many exciting things happen. I can't wait till I get to them. Still... Oh... Isn't that terrible? What is? A man was murdered last night. Not very far from here. In Crescent Place. Crescent Place? Huh. It's an odd name. Chester Brule. <laughs> Carl, your coffee cup. I'm sorry, but I... I wish you wouldn't read the paper. It says that his canary... He had a canary cough. Was singing when the landlady found the body. Oh, that's pathetic. Hey, Elaine, I told you not to read that paper. Darling. Give it to me. <laughs> Carl, you're tearing the paper up. What's the matter? I, I'm, I'm nervous this morning. I don't remember you ever having been like this before. I told you I was nervous. Look, darling, why don't you go into the aviary? Listen to the birds for a while. You love them so, and they have such a nice effect on you. I went into the aviary, as she suggested, and listened to the birds. It was quite a little while before I stopped trembling. Carl? Yes, dear? Come into the kitchen. All right. I've been washing the breakfast dishes, darling, and found this among them. The carving knife. Hmm, isn't that funny? And, and besides, look at it. The blade's all covered with brown stains. I see. Sure, I washed it after dinner last night. Did... Did you use it for anything? No, darling. Give it to me. I'll wash it now. Oh, I can do it. I just wondered. Oh, the door. Will you... No, give me the knife. You answer the door. But... I said you answer the door. Well, all right. There's nothing to shout about. I don't know what's the matter with you this morning. I washed the knife. Quickly but carefully. Very quickly. But very carefully. It didn't take long. The... The stains hadn't hardened much. The brown stains... Carl? Yes? Someone to see you, a man. What does he want? Well, he didn't say, except that it was important. I'll go see him. He said he's a lieutenant from the police. There are 17 steps between the kitchen and our living room. I know, because I counted them while I was walking to see Lieutenant Gregg of the police. 17 steps to make my face. Polite, relaxed, smiling... But would I be able to hide the trembling of my hands? You're Lieutenant Gregg. My wife said you wanted to see me. That's right. <laughs> Have I been parking in the wrong place again? I'm afraid this isn't so simple. Oh, you're beginning to frighten me. What is it about? Murder. Oh? Mr. Warner, did you know a man named Chester Brule? Chester Brule? Well, I, I can't say offhand. I've, I've such a bad memory for names. I, I may or may not. Why? Well, he's the man who was murdered last night. Well, if I'd murdered him, I'd certainly remember his name. Of course, of course. You understand this is just routine. You see, we found your name and address in Brule's address book. I see. We thought you might be able to help us. The fact that my name was in his address book doesn't prove, prove that... anything? Of course not. Would the fact that Brule used to be an attendant in an insane asylum mean anything to you? Why should it mean anything to me? Well, I didn't say it should, Mr. Warner. I just well, it doesn't. Well, I guess that's that. Sorry to have bothered you, but we have to check every possible lead. I, uh, I understand. I'll be going along now. Well, let me take you to the door. Funny thing, there was a birdcage in Brule's room with a canary in it. Singing its head off. Oh? 
But lots of people are fond of canaries. Oh, sure, sure. What was funny about it is that Brule's landlady swear Brule never had a bird. That, uh, that is funny. Way well, looks to kill a knife, Brule, and then left the cage and the bird in it behind him. Doesn't make any sense unless you figure the guy who killed Brule was insane. Lieutenant Gregg of the police walked down the front path across the sidewalk to a small black car and drove away. I shut the front door. The birds had been quiet, but the slam of the door maybe started them off. And I knew that somehow I would have to get the cage and the bird in it out of Rue's room. I didn't know how I'd do it, but I'd do it, no matter how insane it was. It was dark when I got the present place. Dark on a lonely street. There was no one in front of the house. Nothing to show that a man had died inside, horribly, the night before. Blood welling from his throat. The door was open. There was a dim light in the vestibule, leaving the stairs beyond in darkness. I went up to them, to the second floor... There was no one in the corridor. The door of 2B opened. And I went in. There was no light. The moon cast a pale glimmer over the room and... Someone in a chair near the window. For a moment I thought it was Brule. But there was no blood. And then I realized... It was a policeman in uniform asleep. The cage was near the sleeping man... Would his sleep be sound enough? I reached out, lifted the cage, reached the door, and closed it. Oh, I was safe. That... That would be a problem. I should have killed it instead. I left it at a pet shop where I'd gone and done business once, and then went home. Carl? Yes? Oh, I'm so glad you're home, dear. That Lieutenant Greg is here again. He's in the bird room, dear. The bird room? Yes. I, I was in there with him for a while, but then I, I couldn't stand all the noise. <laughs> Excuse me, Carl, but... You know I don't like their singing. Why did you take him to the bird room? Well, he asked me to. All right. I'll go in there now. Well, don't let him keep you very long, darling. You're not well. I'll try not to let him keep me. Lieutenant Gregg. Hello, Mr. Warner. Quite a collection of canaries you got here. Yes, I have. Like them, huh? I wouldn't be likely to keep them otherwise, would I? Yeah, suppose not. Were you home all last night? Of course. That is still about uh, Chester Brule's murder. Uh Uh-huh. Your wife and you sleep in the same room, huh? That's none of your... No. More convenient that way. Only trouble is she couldn't swear to your being around all night. Why, uh... Why should she have to? No reason at all, just the way a policeman's mind works. Funny thing happened a little while ago. Somebody walked into Brule's room and walked right out again with that birdcage. Weren't the police guarding the room? Mm, Supposed to be, but we slipped up. Say, uh, remember my mentioning I thought the man who'd killed Brule and left the birdcage behind him must be insane? You did say something of the sort? Yep, and then there's the fact that Brule used to work with insane people. Begins to mesh, huh? I know very little about police work. Well, I hope I'm not boring you. Anyway, it occurs to me maybe I'd better take a trip up to Cragmount. I suppose going to asylums or any place else is a part of your job. Sure, sure. Did I mention Cragmount was an asylum? Why, 
You must have. Yes. Yeah. That is yeah. a... Yeah. I'll run up there, and I wouldn't be surprised if I get all the answers. What do you think? I think I'm going to... Carl, I... Oh. What is it, Elaine? Well, it is... It's so late. I thought... I can take a hint, Mrs. Warner. Don't bother showing me the door. Night. He seems like a very nice man. He... Carl, stop it. What? That stare. If I didn't know you so well, I'd say you were... We're going mad. Go to bed, Elaine. All right, darling. Oh, Carl, look. Look at what? Through the window. The garden. Lieutenant Gregg didn't go away. He's down there. Get away from the window. Go to bed. I'm going. He looks as if he's waiting down there for something. For what, Carl? I knew what he was waiting for. Elaine went to bed. To sleep. I went to my room. I didn't put the lights on. From my window, I could see him. It was very still in the house and outside. I went away from the window. Sat down. I knew I mustn't go to sleep. Things happen when you sleep. Terrible things. But I hadn't slept well the night before. Not well at all. And there'd been the strain of the day. It was night now. And dark. And still. Terribly still. Gargan? Gargan? <laughs> Right. It was right. Only it wasn't Gargan. I'm cold. Cold. Oh, it's such a lovely morning, Carl. Lovely. I looked for Lieutenant Gregg as soon as I got up. He wasn't in the garden anymore. He must have got tired, gone home, or... Mm. Back to headquarters, uh, wherever policemen go. Oh, dear, that's the Swenson's dog. And he got into our garden again. I'll have to get him out. Elaine, don't. Darling, he'll dig up all the flowers looking for bones. I'd better go. Elaine! Maybe, maybe he won't be there. Maybe somehow the truth isn't the truth and I'm not... <coughs> Elaine, where are you? Oh, under the tree. Here. What? Look, Lieutenant Craig. His throat. <coughs> Come inside. All right. The kitchen. Carl, where are you going? The kitchen. What are you doing? The drawer, silverware. Yes. Yes, it's here. The carving knife. That's right. Well, I thought you washed it last night. I guess you didn't. You'd be wrong. I did wash it last night. The stains are still there. The brown stains. These are fresh ones. But, Elaine, get out of my way. But, uh, I've got to go to the bird room. Oh, God. Please don't go away from me. Go! I was holding the carving knife in my hand. I started to put it down. And then I held onto it anyway. It would make taking the covers off the cages awkward, but I held onto it anyway. The birds were still. They'd remain still. Unless I took the covers off. Oh. Elaine. Carl, you must tell me. What's wrong? Don't. Come any closer. But... Elaine, please. Not any closer. You... You've got that knife in your hand. Yes. The one with the brown stains. Oh, Carl. Shh, don't say anything. Carl, the night before last... Elaine. Don't ask questions. That's dangerous. You were out of the house. No. Last night, when Lieutenant Gregg was killed... I was asleep. You have the knife, Carl. Yes. Give it to me. No. Please, Carl. No, stay where you are. All right. You may keep the knife. Because... Look, Carl. A revolver. Yes. 
Lieutenant Gregg's revolver. I looked at her. There was a flush on her cheek. She was fresh and young and very beautiful. And quite insane. Elaine, give that to me. Oh, no. No, I took it from Lieutenant Gregg last night. After he stopped crying. They always cry when you... Elaine. I didn't like the way you'd been looking at me, Carl. You were thinking bad things about me. You were thinking that maybe you'd have to send me back to Craigmount. I wasn't. You were, Carl. I knew you were. After Chester Bull died. Elaine. Stop where you are. All right, Keep but... your hand away from the birdcage. Don't pull the covers up! Don't! Uh. 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 Carl. Carl, I've hurt you. No. Never mind. But I, I didn't want to. Oh, Carl. Are you going to cry? Like the others? I'll try not to. Because... I wouldn't like that. I know. I'm sorry I hurt you. Doesn't matter. It was my fault. I loved you too well. I really killed those others. Not you, my dear. That's a very silly thing to say. And I'll become quite angry. I am quite angry! Carl, Carl, you silly. You pull the covers off the cage. Carl. Oh, Carl, I'm speaking to you. Those, those birds, I don't like them. I, I... Carl? Oh. Oh, poor Carl. He's dead. I loved him. Now he's dead. But anyway, he didn't cry. He didn't cry. Well, there it is, the story of a couple of lovebirds who, instead of billing and cooing, went in for killing and shooting. Of course, it was all little Elaine's idea. All Carl did was cover up. Too bad he got shot for him. However, the police would have nabbed him for murder anyway. So you could say he paid a high cover charge. <laughs> Be with us again next week at this same time for another Inner Sanctum Mystery. This program was originally heard in the United States over CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System, and has been rebroadcast for servicemen and women overseas through the facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education.
like a common criminal. And I didn't mean it. You know I didn't. Oh, stop whining, Gerald. Take your medicine like a man. What? All right, Harvey. I'll stop. You're responsible for the whole thing. You know you are. And since they can only hang me once, even for two murders... Midnight. The witching hour when the night is darkest. Our fears the strongest. And our strength at its lowest ebb. Midnight. When the graves gape open and death strikes. How? You'll learn the answer in just a minute in... Death's Goblets. And now, Murder at Midnight. Tales of Mystery and Terror by Radio's Masters of the Macabre. Our story by Sigmund Miller is Death's Goblet. It all began at one of Arthur Cunningham's parties. He always gave a party when he came back from one of his trips abroad. I went there with Gerald, my partner, and his wife, Susan. Beautiful Susan. Did I care for her? (laughs) People used to say so. But she was too self-centered a woman for me. I like to look at her just as I like to look at anything that's uh, lovely. That was all. As for Gerald, well, he was rich, which was the only reason he was my partner. But suppose I start at the beginning. At the moment we got to the party and Arthur came over. Well, hello, Harvey. Glad you came. Wonderful to see you back, Arthur. You know Gerald and his lovely wife, Susan. Of course. Hello, lovely wife, Gerald. It's nice to see you again, Arthur. Good trip, I think. Marvelous. And you're just in time for a drink. Uh, let's get away from this mob. Come into the study. Oh, oh, nice. I've just opened my last bottle of Chateau Albert. Oh, nice. Here we are. Oh, well, someone get the glasses out of the cabinet, will you? <laughs> Marge <laughs> parties make me very nervous. <laughs> you know, I'm much yeah. Here we are. <laughs> Why, what an odd goblet this one is. Oh, uh, put that one back, Susan. Why, what's wrong, Arthur? Uh, use any of the others, but not that one. Oh, I'll be careful of it, if that's what you're worried about. Oh, it's not that. I just don't want you to drink from it. What's all the mystery about, Arthur? Well, you'd all think I was mad if I told you. Uh, take a look at it. It's a very strange-looking glass. Yes, looks uh, Venetian, possibly from Murano. It is. This red spot here on the side. Yes, it's supposed to be a drop of blood. That's very odd. How do you know that? Well, Gerald, this goblet has a legend, a terrible legend. And, of course, none of you will believe it, but the story is that anyone who drinks from this goblet will kill someone. Oh, that's wonderful. And you believe it? Why, yes, Gerald. You see, I've had proof. Good heavens. I, well, I once drank from this goblet. What? Arthur, you're joking. You mean that Yes, you... Susan, it was justifiable homicide, but after I drank from it, I did kill someone. Uh, he was a thief and he attacked me, but still I killed him. Well, you never told us about that. There's not anything that I care to remember particularly. Oh, how terrible for you, Arthur. Where did you get the goblet? From a murderer. A man who killed his wife. They were auctioning off his estate. Hmm. Extraordinary. May I look at the glass, Arthur? Yes, if you like. Everyone stared at the goblet in silence as I held it to the light. It had a delicate brown tint, reminding me of old blood, except that it sparkled and glittered. The spot of red did look like a drop of blood about to roll down the side. It seemed ridiculous that this inanimate object could make men commit murder, and yet there was something about it that that fascinated me, and suddenly I wanted to drink out of it. You seem very interested in my goblet, Harvey. Yes, will you pour some wine in it for me? What? No, Harvey. This happens to be one superstition I believe. Everyone who has ever put his lips to this goblet has killed. I don't know why it's so, but it is. Oh, it's silly, of course, but why tempt fate? Oh, nonsense, Gerald, nonsense. I'm going to drink out of it. You'll have to pour the wine yourself, Harvey. All right, I will. Well... Here's, um, health and, uh, long life. No, Harvey, I won't let you. Oh, well, Susan, 
You shouldn't have done that. You've spilled some of Arthur's best burgundy and ruined a good tablecloth. Well, it doesn't matter. I'm glad you did it, Susan. I won't let you or anyone else drink from that glass. It's strange to get so distressed about a ridiculous legend. I don't think murder is ridiculous. You know, I'd like to get rid of it. I was thinking of destroying it. Well, why don't you just fling it against the fireplace? No, I can't. Uh-huh. I've tried several times, but somehow I couldn't. Um, Arthur. Yes? How about uh, giving it to me? I'd rather not. Oh, come on. You want to get rid of it, and I have a fine glass collection. I'd, I'd, I'd like to add to it. I'll keep it locked up. You'll be sorry, but if you want it that badly, Harvey, it's yours. Arthur, please don't give it to him. Susan, what's the matter with you? You watch over Harvey as if... Well, as if... As if what, Gerald? Oh, the whole business is absurd. Of course it is. Yes, and if I should drink out of it and commit a murder, that would be the most absurd thing of all. (laughs) I kept the goblet on the mantelpiece in my library where the lamplight made it glitter. I discovered that the red drop was not paint... It was ingrained in the glass. Oh, very cleverly. One night, both Susan and Gerald were at my home. As we chatted, I got up, went to the mantelpiece, and idly toyed with the goblet. That goblet? It's the one Arthur gave... Yes, yes, you remember. He gave it to me. Why don't you smash it, Harvey? Get rid of it. Ooh, it gives us all the creeps. Mm. Well, Gerald, you aren't really afraid of a piece of glass, are you? You don't believe Arthur's story at all, do you, Harvey? On the contrary, Susan, I do believe it. But uh, not the way you think. What do you mean? Well, I mean to say murder is not in the goblet. It's in me, in you, even in in Gerald. What a silly thing to say, Harvey. Oh, yes. You don't need a magic goblet to commit a murder. All you have to do is let yourself go. Let go of the civilized controls that tie you up. Why, Gerald, if you had cause, you could murder me or even your lovely wife. Oh, I couldn't kill a fly. Oh, but you could if the fly gave you enough trouble. Now, supposing, uh, just as an example, supposing that you discovered that Susan was really in love with me and only married you for your money. (laughs) Wouldn't that make you want to murder her, Joe? Oh, you're crazy. That's not very funny, Harvey. Even you, Susan. What? Even though you have a lovely face and exquisite hands, even you could commit murder. Why, there must have been times when you hated Gerald, or only for a moment, of course. But in that moment, eh, in that moment, if you were not so civilized... Stop it, Harvey. Why, you could even put your lovely hands around my throat. Oh, stop it, Harvey. <laughs> You're not that important to her. And then just why are we on this gruesome subject? That's Harvey's idea of humor. Susan looked at me, a touch of red at the point where the cheekbones make the skin taut. She seemed angry, but she wasn't really. Oh, yes, she loved me. I could see it in her face. She looked at me for a moment and then dropped her eyes. May I look at the goblet, Harvey? No, I'm afraid not, Susan. You might accidentally drop it. It might be a good idea. Well, I have an even better one, Gerald. And that's to go home before we get really serious about this murder business. I sat there staring at the goblet after they left. It it fascinated me, glittering in the lamplight. And as I looked at it... It almost seemed as if the red spot of blood was uh, uh, moving, rolling down its side. Why why shouldn't I drink from it? Why? And before I knew it, I'd taken it down and put it on the table. I got a bottle of burgundy, opened it, and I poured slowly, filling the goblet just up to the red spot. And then I drank from it. Uh, seemed to me that the wine had a, a different taste, although I had drunk this wine often and knew its taste well. It was delicious. Uh, I had another. It was heady. And it made me a little dizzy, although I felt fine and, and, and free. Yes, light and dizzy. But, but after a while... When the dizziness wouldn't go away, I decided to go for a drive, even though it was close to midnight. 
I drove fast. The speed and power of the car gave me a feeling of great exhilaration. I took the turns at full speed, enjoying the danger of the sharp curve. Then I came to a long, level stretch of road. I pressed down hard on the gas. The needle of the speedometer slowly moved upward. 60, 70, 80, 85. The road, like a black ribbon, rolled up in front of me. And then I suddenly saw him, but it was too late. I struck him with my right fender. He never made a sound. The car swerved a little from the impact. My heart in my throat. I stopped. Then I... I backed up. Backed up. Back up to where the body was lying, sprawled grotesquely on the edge of the road. One look was enough. He was dead. But no one had seen the accident. I stepped on the gas and drove off. <laughs> Death's goblet and the man who drank from it. A corpse lying limp by the side of a lonely road. And a car speeding away as the clock strikes twelve for... Murder at midnight. to Murder at Midnight. Harvey challenged the curse of the goblet and found it true. He had just killed a man after drinking from it. Let's listen to him as he continues the story of Death's Goblet. I knew now that the story of the goblet wasn't a myth, and I also knew what I was going to do about it. The next night, I got Gerald to come to my house to do some work. I can't make head or tail out of your cost estimates, Harvey. Oh, no, really, Gerald is very simple. Just concentrate. Oh, why can't you take care of it like a good fellow? I'm awfully tired. Well, all right, let's stop for a couple of minutes. Have a drink. Oh, what are you doing, Harvey, the goblet? Why, you don't really believe that story of Arthur's, do you? Well, You're much too intelligent for that. Mm-hmm. Well, you only pretended in front of Susan, didn't you? Well, I... <laughs> oh, yes. Had to pretend, you know, women. Well, of course. And even if you did believe it, I have a feeling that... Basically, you're pretty reckless, aren't you? Well, I used to be pretty wild when I was a young fella. <laughs> On a motorcycle once. And... Yes, yes, I know, yes. Well, let's drink up. Find me a victim, will you, Gerald? Huh? Well, you know, according to the legend, I've got to murder someone. Uh, maybe even you. <laughs> Harvey the murderer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh. Uh. Mm, very nice wine. How about another? Right. Well, here's to uh, your lovely wife. And um, how about switching glasses? Huh? Well, you might as well get a kick out of it, too. Um, well, uh, okay, here goes. I watched the fool swagger as he drank down the wine. In an hour, when he was alone, he'd be shivering with fright at what he'd done. <clears throat> well, I did it. You certainly did. And by the way, Gerald... Yes? I checked Arthur's story about this goblet. Yeah? And it seems that he's right. Everyone who ever put his lips to this goblet... Has committed a murder. You mean... Well, of course, it's all coincidence, but... uh, Then again, who knows? All the next week, I kept reminding Gerald about his drinking from the goblet. I wasn't really trying to get him to kill, but it was amusing to see him get upset and uneasy. And I noticed he was getting a little bolder, particularly with Susan, and had developed a temper. And one night, just as I was about to retire... Hello, is that you, Harvey? 
Yes, Susan, how are you? I'm fine. I'm just a little worried about Gerald. He oh. usually gets home at about six and it's eleven o'clock now. Do you know where he might be? Why, he's having dinner with his sister. His sister? Yes, a tall, dark girl. She was in the office today and... Harvey, uh... oh, Gerald has no sisters. Oh, he hasn't? No. Oh, uh, I, um... Uh, I guess I got him mixed up with someone else. Yes, yes, it, it was Les Gordon who was meeting his sister. Yes, Gerald had some business to take care of over in Milford. You're and not that... very good at covering up, Harvey. I'm coming right over. Please wait up for me. <laughs> good. Things are beginning to happen. It was becoming very interesting. Now we'd see. Harvey, I want you to tell me everything. I must know. Who is this girl? Take it easy, Susan. Come, sit down, sit down. Oh, never mind that. What about Gerald? I don't know anything about Gerald's private life. And besides, you're not the one to talk. What on earth do you mean? You know perfectly well what I mean. You don't really care for Gerald. Actually, you're in love with me. Harvey. Well, you are. Aren't you? Maybe. Sometimes I think I am. <laughs> oh, but you're too cold-blooded. I'd never be sure I could trust you. As a matter of fact, you'd like to get rid of Gerald. Why, why do you say that? Well, I'm just putting your thoughts into words. You never really loved him, did you? Oh, but Harvey... And he's finally become unbearable, hasn't he? Oh, Harvey, if you only knew... Do you know that the last time Gerald was here, he drank out of that goblet of Arthur's? It's possible that he wants to get rid of you, too. Oh, stop it! Stop it, you hear? Well, I'm just telling you what I think you ought to know. Oh, you see, I left word at home that Gerald was to meet me here. And if he does come, well, we'll see. We sat and waited, not talking much. Susan's face was pale and agitated. It was most exciting. Susan, with all her charm and embellishments, was really a fierce animal underneath. I could almost hear her rage seething. Are you expecting anyone? Just Gerald. Well, let him in. Oh, hello, Harvey. Susan, what's up? Why did you leave word to meet you here? It's almost midnight. Where have you been all the evening? At Milford. With whom? What's going on, anyway? What are you so excited about, Susan? What were you doing in Milford? Why, I went there on business. Oh, really? You've been behaving very strangely lately, Gerald. If you don't love me, why don't you say so like a man? What? This is all your fault, Harvey. You've been filling her head with poison. I? I had nothing to do with this. I told her that you went to Milford. All he did was to make me see clearly something I've felt for a long while. And I think this is the time to do something about it. Oh, are you out of your mind? Put that gun down. You remember it, don't you? You gave it to me. Said it might be useful in an emergency. Harvey, take that gun away from her. She's liable to shoot. She won't shoot. She's only trying to frighten you. Am I? Let's see. Oh, my shoulder. Give me that no. gun. Give me that gun. Harvey. She... She's dead. Yes, Gerald. And you killed her. But... But it was an accident. She shot at me, and I was only trying to get the gun away from her. You know that's what happened. I only know that you drank from that goblet and that you killed her. What? But... Oh, you... You dirty treacherous. You planned all this so that you could get rid of me. So that you could have Susan. You could have the firm for yourself. You'll have to do better than that to beat the gallows, Gerald. The gallows? Please, Harvey... We've been friends for a long time. You can't let me down. You wouldn't have pressed the trigger if you hadn't had murder in your heart, Gerald. You shot her because you wanted to. That's what I saw. I believe in telling the truth. Harvey, I'll turn over the business to you. I'll do anything, anything, if you'll just... I don't accept bribes, Gerald. All right. But I'll fool you. I'll call the police myself. Well, there's the phone. I'll prove my case in court. They won't convict me. Operator. Operator. Give me the police. Hello? Police department? This is Gerald Hamilton. I, I just accidentally shot my wife. And my friend's home. Yes, she's dead. The address is 411 Grove Street. That's right. I killed her. Accidentally. Yes. I'll be waiting here. Cigarette, Gerald? Oh, treating me like a condemned man, huh? Well, I'm not going to die. 
All I have to do is tell the truth about everything, including you. Oh, but you forget, Gerald. There must be fingerprints, your fingerprints on that gun. That won't look very accidental, will it? I... But... But Harvey... You did it, Gerald. I saw you. If you don't back me up, they'll hang me like a common criminal. Please, Harvey. Don't let them do that to me, please. Oh, stop whining, Gerald. What? All right, Harvey. I'll stop. You're responsible for this whole thing. You know you are. And since they can only hang me once... You raised the gun, but I'd been expecting it. I grabbed his hand, pushed it against his chest. My finger pressed on his and on the trigger. And suddenly, he went limp. You won't get away. My alibi was perfect. All I had to do was wait for the police that he himself had called. The minutes ticked slowly away. And then... Hello, Harvey. Arthur. Glad I found you in. Say, you look as if you'd been in a fight. Arthur, you'd, uh, you'd better not come in. Why? What's the matter? No, no you, you'd better not come in. Oh, but Why? Well, uh, uh, Gerald and uh, Susan, they, they had a quarrel, and he killed her. What? And then he shot himself. What are you talking about, Harvey? Well, all right, come in. Look for yourself. Good. Good Lord. Well, tried to kill me, too. But, but why? It doesn't sound like him or like either of them. Well, I don't know why. Fit of insanity? Or maybe it was the... The goblet. Your goblet. He drank out of it, you know. The goblet? Why, that's ridiculous. As he spoke, he picked up the gun. It made me furious. All those fine fingerprints of Gerald's were now erased. Put that gun down, Arthur. There are fingerprints on it. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize. I tried to get hold of myself. The stupid fool, he was going to ruin everything. But I had to keep calm. What, uh... What... What were you saying about the goblet? Why, it has no curse or magic. I just made that story up. You... you... you made... you mean... Of course, I bought the goblet in an antique shop. As a matter of fact, I have a whole set of them. The pulses hammered away in my head. A vast, uncontrollable anger seized me. Was it because of those precious fingerprints that he'd wiped out? Or because I had believed in the goblet myself? I don't know. I only know that I had to fight to keep from grabbing him by the throat. You know, I don't think you're telling me everything you know about this horrible business, Harvey. In fact... A red hot wave came over me. I don't remember exactly what happened. Let me go! Get your hands off me! (laughs) Arthur's body is lying there too now. Next to Susan's and Gerald's. But the police will be here any minute, so I have to hurry. First, the goblet. There. That's done. That... No. Some of the broken fragments still glitter in the lamplight. I've got to crush them. Grind them to powder under my heel. But... But there are always other pieces that I can't find. There... They're hiding from me. They're afraid of me. But I'll find every piece. I'll find them. I'll find them. I'll find them. Three bodies lying huddled on the floor. That madman crushing the fragments of the broken goblet to powder as the police car drives up and the clock strikes twelve for... Murder at midnight. <laughs> to be with us again when death appears at the door wearing the face of a friend and the clocks strike twelve for murder at 
midnight. The part of Harvey was played by Eric Dressler. With music by Charles Paul, Murder at Midnight was directed by Anton M. Leader. Clinic, stories of the world's great detectives of fiction, Men Against Murder. Each week at this time, WOR Mutual turns the spotlight on one of the great figures of crime detection and brings you his most exciting case. Tonight, Agatha Christie's unique detective, Hercule Poirot, in the tragedy at Marsden Manor. Evening, Monsieur Poirot. I'd recognize you anywhere, I think, thanks to those magnificent mustachios of yours. Merci bien. They are very magnificent, no? They are indeed. Uh, tell me, did they help you solve the tragedy at Marsden Manor? Uh, no. It was the little gray cells in the brain of the great Hercule Poirot that prevented this great miscarriage of justice in the death of Richard Maltravers of Marsden Manor. It all began in the little village of Marsden Lee, less than a hundred kilometers from London. Coming? Coming? Yes, yes, what is it? Be you Dr. Bernard? Yes, I am. Come quick, the master's done for. You mean Mr. Maltravers of the manor? I, the master. The Mr. she says, fetch the doctor, she says. But it be no use. He's a dead un. I knows a dead un when I see un. What was it, man? An accident? No, be no accident. I found him in the lower meadow, with the blood running out of his mouth. Be a stroke. A stroke? That's what it be. Well, hurry, man, hurry, man, let go. <laughs> come, come now, <laughs> Mrs. Beltravers. You must get hold of yourself. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. After all, we are all of us mortal. But, but why, Richard? He was so good, so kind. Why did this have to happen to him? Oh, come, come, please. He seems so well, so full of life. Why, only last week he passed a medical examination for insurance. How could he have died so suddenly? Doctor, what happened? A hemorrhage due to stomach ulcers, undoubtedly, resulting in a stroke. <laughs> Mr. Hyde. Hello, Poirot. You know my good friend, Captain Hastings, no? Good morning, Captain Hastings. Hi, right, sir. Well, Poirot, you got my message, I see. I did. What is it that disturbs him when I mean? Uh, Richard Maltravers dies. <laughs> you sent for Poirot. What was the cause of Monsieur Maltravers' death? The death certificate says a hemorrhage resulting in a stroke due to stomach ulcers. But surely you did not bring Papa Poirot here to talk of the stomach ulcers. <laughs> this Richard Maltravers had... Taken out the insurance policy in your company, no? And what a policy. For 50,000 pounds. Well, good square sum, that, eh? Hmm. Rather. So, what is it you wish me to do? It is unfortunate for your company, but everything seems, uh, how you say, uh, open and above the plank, no? <laughs> no, Puerto. Open and above board. Ah, my good friend, the great Hastings. Always he corrects the English of Hercule Poirot. <laughs> Monsieur Wright, I ask you, do I not speak the English of a, of a super? <laughs> you do indeed. But to get back to your previous question, what my company wishes you to do is to investigate the circumstances of Mr. Maltravers' death. So, what is it you suspect, mon ami? Well, of course, you know in the case of suicide, the policy is invalid. Yes. And when a man past the prime of life takes out an unusually large policy in favor of a young wife half his age and then dies within two weeks, 
the possibility of suicide cannot be ignored. Oh, mauvais certainty, mon ami. But suicide by hemorrhage? That is a queer saucepan of fish. Now, if the cause of death had been heart failure, ah, ah, then I would smell a mouse. Heart failure can always mean that a, a stupid doctor did not find the true cause. But hemorrhage? Ma foi. Hemorrhage is, well, the, the, uh, hemorrhage. Exactly. <laughs> Nevertheless, we are determined to proceed with the matter. You will undertake the inquiry? But of course. Hastings, that great professor of English, shall go with me. <laughs> hey, mon ami? <laughs> Gladly, Poirot. Eh bien. Now, where is this place, this Marsden Manor? You take the Great Eastern Line from Liverpool Station to the little town of Marsden Lee. Marsden Manor is about a mile from the village. Mm, Marsden Lee. All right, Hastings, we go. <laughs> This is Marsden Lee, eh? <laughs> I hope we can get a conveyance up to the manor. Ticket, ticket, sir. Ah, here you are, my friend. I suppose you'll be coming down for the funeral, sir. Funeral? Uh, what funeral? Uh, you say you made a funeral of Master Maltravers. About oh. the manor. Oh, uh, you say the manor. Uh, could that be Marsden Manor? Aye, it be. Hmm, that is a odd coincidence. Uh, my friend and I, we have come down with a thought of uh, buying this Marsden Manor. You couldn't pay me to live there, you couldn't. Why not? It'd be haunted. Haunted? I haunted. Seen things there, folks says. Yeah, we should see. Now, could you tell us where uh, Dr. Bernard lives? Aye, up yon hill, about half a mile. Well, come, it stinks. <laughs> Then, Dr. Bernard, that you signed the death certificate of a Mr. Richard Maltravers. Yes, I did. You understand, Doctor, with such a big policy, we must make the careful investigation. Of course, of course. I suppose he was such a rich man, his life was insured for a big sum. Hmm? You consider him a rich man, Doctor? Well, was he not? He kept two cars, you know, and Marsden Manor is a pretty big place to keep up. Mm. Although I believe he bought it very cheaply. I understand he had had uh, considerable losses of late. Mm, is that so? Indeed. Mm. It's fortunate for his widow, then, that there is this insurance. Yes, yes. Very beautiful and charming young creature, but terribly unstrung by this sad catastrophe. I've tried to spare her all I could, but of course the shock has been very great. Why shock? These ulcers of the stomach, uh, they are what uh, you call chronic, yes, eh? Yes, yes. They are not sudden. No. Did mm. you not attend uh, Mr. Maltravers before, Doctor? My dear sir, I never attended him. What? I understand Mr. Maltravers was a member of a faith healing sect. But you examined the body? Certainly. I was fetched by one of the under gardeners. And the cause of death was clear? Absolutely. There was blood on the lips, but most of the bleeding must have been internal. He had not been moved? No, no, the body hadn't been touched. He had evidently been out shooting crows, and a long-barreled bird gun lay beside him. The hemorrhage must have occurred quite suddenly. Gastric ulcers, without a doubt. He could not have been shot, huh? My dear sir, I beg pardon. But I remember once a doctor who said heart failure until the constable showed him a bullet wound for the head. Mm, you <laughs> will find no bullet wounds on the body or head of Mr. Maltravers. Now, gentlemen, if there's nothing further, uh, I... Thank you, Doctor. Uh, uh, just one more thing. You saw no need for the autopsy, huh? Certainly not. The cause of death was perfectly clear. In my profession, we see no need to distress unduly the relatives of a dead patient. Now, gentlemen, if you'll pardon me, good day. Well, Hastings, what do you think of our good Dr. Bernal? <laughs> Bit of an old fool. Precisely. Your judgments of character are always profound, mon ami. Except where a young and beautiful woman is concerned. So now you must uh, mind your Q's and P's. Because the good doctor has said that the next one we see is both young and beautiful. This Madame Maltravers. <laughs> Maltravers, 
Yes, I cannot tell you how I am sorry to bother you in this way. Must I be bothered now? I know nothing about this insurance of my husband. Courage, madame. It is necessary. I will do all to make this matter not too unpleasant for you. I, Hercule Poirot, swear it. Now, if you would recount briefly the sad events of last Wednesday, huh? Well, I was changing for tea when the maid came up. One of the gardeners had just run up to the house. He'd found Richard. No, I comprehend. Enough. You had seen your husband earlier in the afternoon? No, not since lunch. I'd walked down to the village for some stamps. I believe he was out pottering around the grounds. Uh, shooting the crows, no? Yes, so I understand. He usually took his bird gun with him. In fact, I heard one or two shots at a distance. So? Where is this bird gun now? Why, in the gun cabinet over there, I suppose. With your permission, madame. Now, here it is. Ah, two shots fired, I see. And now, madame, a delicate question. Monsieur Maltravers, your husband, is awaiting burial, I believe. Yes. He's lying in his room. Uh, if I might see? Why, yes, of course. It's the, the first room at the top of the stairs. You'll forgive me if I don't go with you. What, of course. Hastings, you remain here with madame. Do you think Mr. Poirot will understand why I didn't go with him? Oh, I can assure you, Mrs. Maltravers, Poirot is most sympathetic. I don't doubt it, Mr. Hastings. I only wish there was more that I could tell him. Oh, I understand. And I wonder, Mrs. Maltravers, if you could tell me one thing. Oh, yes? Well, the station master, an odd character named Volk, said something about Marsden Manor being haunted. Marsden Manor haunted? Why, surely you're joking, Mr. Hastings. Oh, no, no, I assure you. He told us that people have seen things. We must have been referring to my my humble experiments in extrasensory perception. I've always been tremendously intrigued by that subject, and doubtless some of our servants have been gossiping. Madame, you are mediumistic. How fascinating. Oh, I wouldn't go so far as to say that, Mr. Poirot. I've dabbled a bit, that's all. So? I've managed uh, table levitation and simple things like that. Hmm. But I suppose to the simple rustics around here, it looks like black magic. Very interesting. Under kinder circumstances, I would implore a demonstration. Why, are you interested in such things, Mr. Poirot? All fields of knowledge interest the great Poirot. Uh, Poirot, don't you think perhaps we'd better... Oh, I forgot, madame. Uh, I thank you for your so great courtesy. I do not think you need be bothered any further by the matter. Uh, by the way, do you know anything of your husband's financial position? Nothing whatever, I'm afraid. I'm very stupid about business. I see. Then you can give us no clue as to why your husband suddenly decided to insure his life. Oh, was it sudden? I'm sure I don't know. Enfin. And now, with your permission, madame, we will go. Hastings? Oh, uh, I'll see you to the door. Merci. Oh, uh, just one more thing, madame. Could you tell me, when they found Mr. Maltravers, did they find him unshod uh, without the shoes? Why, really, Mr. Poirot, I, I don't understand. <laughs> it is nothing. It does not matter. And now, madame, adieu. Oh, but look, you have another visitor. Someone is coming up to walk, huh? Archie! Hello, you! Emily. Why, I, I thought you were on your way there to Australia. Yes, I was. But I read the news of Uncle's death in Paris and hurried back. Emily, my dear, is there anything I can do for you? Anything? Oh, of course not. What could you do? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting. Uh, Mr. Poirot, this is Captain Black, my husband's nephew. Uh, Captain Black, Mr. Hastings. How do you Emily, how did this happen? Uncle seemed perfectly well when I was here Monday night. You've evidently read the papers, Archie. You must know what happened. But they gave no details, just the bare notice of his death. What happened? Archie, I... I just can't go through all that again. Yes, Captain Black, I'm afraid my friend and I, we have disturbed, madame. What are you doing here? I am Hercule Poirot. The Hercule Poirot. Uh, Mr. Poirot is from the insurance company, Archie. That's just why I've come back. To protect you from annoyances like you this. You shouldn't have risked your job, Archie. I if you left right away, you might still get to Paris in time to make your boat train. Uh, you say Paris, mon capitaine. You go to Australia by way of Paris? Why, yes. I intended taking the Orient Express from there and pick up the Pacific Mail at Port Said. Ah, oui. That shortens the journey, does it not? You are staying here, Captain Black? Yes, I'm staying at the Pig and Thistle. 
That's the inn down in the village. Aye, village inn. It serves the roast beef, no? <laughs> Why, yes, I suppose so. Good. So, is things. Let us try this roast beef at the pig and thistle, huh? Ah, Poirot, now you've had your roast beef. Hadn't we better be getting back to London? No, not so fast, my good Hastings. London, she will not run away. But no. this Capitaine Black, he may do so. A garçon, garçon. For heaven's sake, Poirot, Englishians don't have garçons. No? Then who is it who approaches? What do you have, Gavin? For my friend, the dictionary. For me, a, a, a bock. <laughs> he means beer, George. I mean the ale. Right, oh, Gavin. Uh, you've been up at the manor, sir? Aye. I mean, yes, we have. It's sad business, that. I knew no good had come of it as soon as they took the man. Eh? Uh, you mean this, uh, Maltravers? Uh, they were not popular? Well, uh, not that, Governor. He was a bit too old for her, if you know what I mean. Awesome. She might better have married the nephew. At least, ways on. I'll bet a bob the nephew thought she Ah, there has been the gossip, huh? Eh? Well, I wouldn't go so far as that, Governor. But he did hang around a bit. And the husband, uh, Mr. Maltravers? He object? Mm, not as I knows of, Gavney. But I is my opinion, I is. Mm, without the doubt, it is the worst opinion, no, George? But, ah, the Captain Black, here he comes now. Hello, Poirot, here you are. Uh, Captain Black, uh, come, will you not join us? Uh, bark, perhaps? Yes, thanks, I don't mind if I do. Wait, a mug of ale. Oh, no, Gavney. Sad business, this death of your uncle, huh? Yes, and so sudden, too. He seemed in excellent health when I dined with him Monday night. So? And was he also in good spirits? What did he say? Or what was the talk at this dinner Monday night? Oh, I don't know the usual general topics. I see. My uncle asked about my people. We talked of Australia. Yes. Then Mrs. Maltravers asked a lot of questions about East Africa, where I've spent some time. I told them one or two yarns. That's about all, I think. Madame Maltravers uh, seems much upset at the death of her husband, no? Naturally. They've been married less than a year. So I hear. A remarkable woman, this lady. Remarkable in what way? What do you mean? She has, uh, how you say, the seeing eye. I hear her tell Hastings. She does the seance. He seems most interested, no, Hastings? Oh, I, I wouldn't go so far as that. Uh, always the conservative Hastings. Me? Uh, I am not so. Well, Mr. Poirot, don't tell me you believe in this psychic stuff. Oh, I have not the closed mind. For example, Captain Black, you have told us all that your conscious self knows. Now, with your permission, I would question your subconscious, huh? Psychoanalysis, eh? Well, it's nonsense, but I don't mind. Merci. It is like this. I give you a word. You answer with another word. Any word, the first word you think of. Eh bien, shall we begin? Go ahead. Hey, Stings, note yeah. down the words, please. Oh, very well, Paul. Now, day. Night. Name. Place. Bernard. Shore. Monday. Dinner. Journey. Ship. Country. Uganda. Story. Lions. Bird gun. Farm. Shot. Suicide. Elephant. Tusks. Money. Lawyers. So, that is all. You are a good subject, mon capitaine. You don't mean to tell me that rigmarole means anything to you? Maybe not. But nevertheless, you are a good subject. <laughs> well, if you don't need me anymore, I think I'll go upstairs and unpack. Shall I see you again before you leave, Mr. Poirot? Yes, I should not be surprised. Good. See you later. Au revoir, mon capitaine. And now, my clever Hastings, you see it all, no? Well, I don't know what you mean, Boyle. Does that list of words tell you nothing? Uh, sorry, I'm afraid it doesn't. Then I will assist you. To begin with, the Capitaine answered within the time limit. No pauses, no making up the mind. Uh -huh. Day to night and place to name are normal associations. Then I give him Bernard, the name of the doctor, if he knew him. Oh. Evidently, he does not. When I say Bernard, he says Shaw. Monday means dinner, country as Uganda. Story recalls the lion story, he tells them. 
all uh, natural. But now, notice. When I mention bird gun, I get the unexpected answer, farm. When I say shot, he answers at once, suicide. A man he knows commits suicide with a bird gun on a farm somewhere. <coughs> Imbecile that I am! The great Hercule Poirot is, is hoodwinked. What are you talking about? Do you not see Hastings? That is the story the Captain Black told at the dinner Monday night. Oh, I see. And you think that gave Maltravers the idea? You think he shot himself in the mouth with that bird gun? Why not? Remember, the bird gun has a very tiny charge of powder. The bullet would remain lodged in the brain. All that would show would be the blood in the mouth. Come, Hastings. It is not too late. Of course, but, but where? To see once more this dead man, to Marsden Manor. Hastings, to Marsden Manor. <laughs> Mrs. Maltravers, it is true. Your husband shot himself to the mouth with the bird gun. You mean suicide? It would seem so, madame. But the insurance... Naturally, madame, the suicide will void the policy. It is unfortunate, but <laughs> what will you? Oh, but this is impossible. My husband would never commit suicide. It's, it's inconceivable. But the evidence, madame, it is conclusive. No, there must be some other explanation. You mean, uh, murder, madame? Well, of course, that is always possible. But no, no, not likely, I'm afraid. But you do admit it's possible. You just said it was possible. Yes, of course, everything is possible. Have you any idea who might have wished to kill your husband? Why, no. No, I haven't. Madame, I have a suggestion. It is bizarre, no doubt, but perhaps if you are willing to help. Oh, yes, yes, of course, anything. Madame... You are mediumistic. Perhaps if you would try... Perhaps you could... you're right. Perhaps I could get through to Richard. He might tell us what happened. I am sure you could do it, madame. Yes, yes, I'll do it. Uh, come back here tonight at eight and bring Captain Black with you. Eh bien, madame, I am sure you will succeed. Until eight, madame, au revoir. <laughs> Time, as you see, Hastings and I have brought Captain Black with us. I say there's a bad storm coming up. Would that interfere with the experiment? Certainly not, Mr. Hastings. This isn't mumbo-jumbo. The weather has nothing to do with it. Well, well. Let us proceed, huh? Uh, yes, yes. Now, uh, will you draw chairs up around this table, please? Yes, sir. Uh, now, Mr. Hastings, if you'll put out the lights. Certainly. Now, remain perfectly quiet, please. No matter what you hear or see. Richard. Richard. Can you hear me, Richard? Can you hear me? If you can, rap. Rap 
three times. Did you hear that? Ah, but of course, madame. Did you not tell him to rap three times? That's how Richard always used to knock. Perhaps he is outside. No. They say the suicide never rests, always returns. Listen. What was that? The front door slammed. What? No, Captain Black. It was but the thunder. Where are I? I hear footsteps. Oh. Just the wind, madame. I will close the door. Ah, I have locked it. Uh, don't do that. If it should open now. What oh. job it is open. He's there. There in the doorway. I see nothing, madame. I saw him, I tell you. My husband, you must have seen him too. Look. She's right. He is there. His hand. Look, it's pointing. What's that light coming from? It's pointing at her. What did you... Her hand. Her right hand. It is scarlet with blood. Blood? Yes, it's blood. I killed him. I did it. Take her away. Take her away. Lights. Good heavens, Poro. She's got away through that window. Do not worry, mon capitaine. The good inspector Jap outside will stop her. Good heavens. That, that lovely creature, a murderer. And a very clever one, my susceptible Hastings. After all, she could not know she would come up against the great Hercule Poirot. And she might even have fooled me if she had only taken off his shoe. His shoe, Poirot? Only with his toe could he himself have pulled the trigger of this bird gun. And par bleu, his shoes were still on when they found him. But I don't understand. This seance, was it all fake? Mais certainement. She meant to pull the sheep. Ah, wool. Very well, wool. But it was I who pulled the sheep's wool over her eyes. Thanks to my good friend Henri Dubois, who played the part of the husband's ghost, and Papa Poirot, who put the red paint on her hand in the dark. But what was her idea in having this séance? Parbleu, mon capitaine. Do you not see? Madame, she will go into the trance. She will hear the voice. She will come out from the trance. She will, with the great reluctance, name the murderer. You mean she meant to confess? Mais non, mon capitaine. She meant to name you. You have been listening to Murder Clinic. Murder Clinic, the WOR Mutual Series, which brings to you each week one exciting case. Tonight, the tragedy of Marsden Manor, with Agatha Christie's unique detective, Hercule Poirot, played by Maurice Tottenham. Next week, Murder Clinic will bring you Fred Irving Anderson's Deputy Farr, the Vermont farmer who became chief of the Homicide Bureau in New York City. Deputy Parr, the man with the nose for murder. The story is Gulfstream Green, in which the deputy proves that the conceit of murderers is colossal. Original music was composed by Ralph Barnhart and conducted by Bob Stanley. This program was an international exchange feature over the coast-to-coast -coast network of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. Tales told on Murder Clinic are adaptations by authors Lee Wright and John A. Bassett. Murder Clinic is produced under the direction of Alvin Flanagan. Frank Knight speaking. Though it hath no tongue, murder will out. <coughs> Rainier Brewing Company, Brewers of Rainier Beer and Ale, presents Murder Will Out. Starring William Gargan as Inspector Burke, Chief of Homicide, with Eddie Marr as Detective Nolan, 
in another challenging story written and directed by Lou X. Landsworth. The mystery of the swindled songwriters. On the second floor of a drab downtown office building was was located the American Institute of Music Composers. Despite its impressive name, this establishment was not an institute. It was a bunco racket operated by song sharks. Their victims were unsuspecting amateur songwriters lured by the promise of fame and riches. On the morning of Saturday, April the 20th, 1946, a burly young man entered the Institute's outer office. Hiya, miss. Well, here I am again. (laughs) I guess you remember me, all right, huh? Uh, why, yes, I... I, I... Bailey, Bill Bailey. Oh, yes, of course, Mr. Bailey. <laughs> uh, Mr. Morse said he'd have my song published today. Oh, I'll tell Mr. Morse you're here. Yeah. Oh, thanks, miss. Hello, lady. How do you do? Do you mind if I sit down here? Uh, please. Uh, are you a songwriter? Yeah. Face one, off the press today. And between you and I, lady, I sure am a lucky guy. Indeed. Yeah. Love song. Oh, how wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> Today's Shirley's birthday. Shirley? Yeah, that's my girl. I'm going to give Shirley this song I've written. Birthday present. Oh, how beautiful. <laughs> yeah, it sure is. But believe me, lady, I sure had to work. I don't mean writing the words. That comes natural to me. I mean, getting the dog to pay Mr. Moore for composing the music again. Pay, pay him to, to publish the song. Uh, I've come to see Mr. Moss about some words uh, I wrote. No. <laughs> well, congratulations, Miss... Uh, uh... Uh, uh, Mrs. Swope. Mrs. Henry Swope. Well, Mrs. Swope, it's a pleasure to have met a fellow songwriter. Thank you. Uh, but uh, I'm not a songwriter uh, yet. Uh, no? I-, I hope Mr. Moss thinks I have enough talent to let me join the... Uh, Institute. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, how much does he charge? Well, he, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Bailey, Mr. Moss will see you now. Oh, yeah, uh, thanks. Well, excuse me, Mrs. Uh, Swope, and uh, good luck. Uh, thank you. Hiya, Mr. Moss. Mr. Bailey, let me shake yeah. your hand. You have genius, true genius. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess you could call it that. Oh, the lyrics you wrote. Such yeah. words inspired me to compose some of the greatest music of my career. It, it, here, yeah. here, the piano. Yeah. I want you to hear the song even before I show you the printed copies. Uh, listen. Yeah. Your hands are soft like baby's skin. Your lips are just like berries. How the way I love you is a sin. And I think you're the berries. We ought to get hitched like a trot to a trailer. I'll stay in like you was my tailor. My pearl of the deep blue sea. If you say yes to me, I'll be a happy deed. Well... You like it? Uh, don't sound a lot like Peggy O'Neill? Sister, <laughs> Peggy O'Neill has been close to the hearts for people for two generations. Well, you're in a hurry. I'll get your copies. That'll be fifty dollars. Fifty dollars? Printing charges. But I, I already paid fifty dollars. Twenty-five for music. Twenty-five for printing. You made a down payment. The full price is a hundred dollars. A hundred dollars? Hey, wait a minute. You said I could have professional copies for 25 bucks. Professional copies? Why, Mr. Bailey, you ordered the deluxe sheet music edition. Specially dedicated to Shirley Hobson. Yeah, I have your signed order right here. Yeah, but, but you said it was for free. For 50 bucks, I could dedicate my song to Shirley, and I ain't going to spend no, 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 I got to have my songs today. Today's Shirley's birthday. Mr. Moss, will you step in the other office, please? Excuse me, Mr. Bailey. Yeah, but I ain't going to leave till I get my songs. You hear? What is it, Ruth? Outside. Two men want to see you. I think they're the police. Plain clothes. Police? So starts the mystery of the swindled songwriters. Another Inspector Burke mystery drama brought to you by Rainier Brewing Company. After the mystery, four contestants chosen from our studio audience as amateur detectives will compete for prizes. They'll be asked a number of questions regarding police findings and who they think committed the crime and the one clue that reveals the criminal. But first, here's Larry Keating. What's it going to be tonight, Larry? I was just thinking about that tune, Reed. It's been a long time since I've heard Peggy O'Neill. Well, you know how it is, Larry. The old favorites come and go. Mm, But not all the old favorites. Some come and stay. Sixty-eight years ago, and that's longer than most of us have been around, a favorite was born that's still going strong. 
And I mean Rainier beer. Yes, Rainier had to be good to please so many generations. And it is. What's more, today it's better than ever. The Rainier you buy today is made best to taste best. Yes, made best to taste best. Rainier's own hops, Rainier's own malt. But above all, the priceless ingredient of tradition. Sixty-eight years of brewing skill bring you the beer made best to taste best. Rainier for good cheer. Now back to our story, The Mystery of the Swindled Songwriters, starring William Gargan as Inspector Burke. In here, gentlemen. Just up in this other office. You're Dave Moss? Yes. Now, what can I do for you? We're police officers. I'm Inspector Burke. This is Detective Nolan. Oh, uh, how do you do? How are you? We're looking for a Hubert Collins. Know him? Hubert Collins. Hubert Collins. Yeah, Hubert Collins. You published three or four songs he wrote. Oh, uh, my my partner, Charlie Reed, might be able to help you. Yeah, where is he? Oh, he's out right now. Mr. Reed takes care of all financial matters. I take care of the artistic side of the business. Uh Uh-huh. Well, have you any idea where we might find Hubert Collins? I know. uh, Oh, is something wrong? Yes. Last night, an unsuccessful attempt was made to rob the store where Collins works. And the description we have fits this Hubert Collins. The person attempting this robbery was surprised by a special patrolman. There was some gunplay. The patrolman's condition is serious. Oh, how terrible. Oh, young Collins had such talent. Uh, look through your records, your files. Any information you and your partner can give us, no matter how small, phone headquarters. Where you been, Charlie? I came in while they were here. Ruth tipped me off. I waited till they were gone. That Hubert Collins. He's in trouble. So what? So he might make trouble for us. Drag us into it. How? We're operating within the law. Who's that? Some sucker told him to wait in my office. Get rid of him, Dory. No, 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 no. Not yet. He's good for another 50. Listen, I ain't got all day. I want well, my song. Mr. Bailey, Mr. Bailey. Why, this is my partner, Mr. Reed. We were just discussing your talent. Yes, yes. Uh, Dave tells me you're a genius. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. But I want my songs now. No, Mr. Bailey, I already explained to you, you, you owe $50. Are you dirty, rotten crook? I already paid $50. No, 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 just Alex, a minute. You... Don't sorry, any rough stuff, Bailey. No rough stuff. Take the joint apart if I don't get my songs. Let me go. Let me go. Do I get my songs or do I must you up? Let me go. I'll shove your little nose down to your ankles. Don't hit me. Don't Bailey, go. Bailey, let go. Let go. Can you hear? Huh? Don't make a move. No, no, no. Wait. That that gun. Don't hunt. Don't use that gun. Get out of this office. O- okay. But I'll have you arrested pulling a gun. No, no, you won't. We'll have you arrested. Yes, we know the law. You threaten my partner's life. We'll swear out a warrant. That side door goes down the hall. Use it. Okay. Okay. But I'll be back sooner than you think. And come back with $50, or we'll sue you. We'll attach your salary. You? You? you. Yeah. yeah. Wait. Did he get his songs? I don't know. Come on. Good luck. In my office. No. Now, his songs are all here. My desk drawer. All 12 copies. Okay, put them back. <laughs> if the sucker wants them, he'll be around. Yes, he'll cool off. He'll show up with the other 50. What's all the commotion? Oh, some chump was in here. Must have had to shout to cover up. What is it? That old lady sitting out there, Mrs. Swope. What about her? She wants to join the Institute. And she's got all her savings with her. $500 cash. Well, well, sit down, sit down, please, Mrs. Swope. Thank you. You're a songwriter. No, 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 no. Don't tell me you aren't. I recognize talent when I see it. Well, I I don't know if I am or not, Mr. Moss. I've, I've written some words for a song. Here, here they are. Oh, Thank you. I want you to tell me if they're any good. Oh, I'll be brutally frank, Mrs. Swope. You, uh, you will tell me the worst. Oh, you can count on me. Now, let's see. <clears throat> we wedded in the springtime like the birds and bees. Oh, 
Mrs. Swope. Brian. Oh. What is it? Beautiful, beautiful Mrs. Swope. Genius, pure genius, that opening line. It inspires me to compose some of the greatest music of my career. Here, here, sit down by the piano. I don't want to lose the mood. Listen, Mrs. Swope, listen. <laughs> We wedded in the springtime Like the birds and bees The bleeding hearts were bleeding The love bark was on the tree Then the angels took you I saw this song I wrote for my dear dead husband, named Henry Swope, in memory of Henry Swope. Ah, oh, Mrs. Swope. Pardon me while I have an emotion. Oh. What is it? Is something wrong, or are you ill? Oh, I'm overcome. Dear Mrs. Swope, the beauty, the poetry, the sheer magnitude. I wrote that in memory of my dear departed husband. Mrs. Swope, you're a genius. I demand you become a member of the Institute. I won't take no for an answer. Really? We'll make your song as famous as the end of a perfect day. We'll print thousands of copies. I'll even make a recording with my own voice now. Well, uh, how much will all this cost, uh, Mr. Moss? Mrs. Swope, such talent as yours should be given to the world. I insist you become a senior member. Well, what does that mean? We will publish every song you write. You will be famous, wealthy, from the royalties you receive. Well, uh, uh, how much will it cost? Only $500, Mrs. Swope. You owe it to yourself, to the memory of your dear departed husband, Henry Swope. Another cup of coffee, Ruth? No. This might be it, baby. What we've been waiting for. A light, Charlie. Still want to go through with it? Takes money. I'll get the money. How? Simple, baby, simple. Let Dave take the 500 away from the old lady. Then we take the 500 away from Dave. Why not? Cops were nosing around. Sure. Cops start asking questions. Get wise to the racket. This is our chance, baby. We'll skip out. Let Dave hold the bag. What time is it? Yeah, a little after two. I uh, told Dave we'd meet him at five, the office. What do we do till five? Go to a movie, relax, enjoy ourselves. Let Dave do the dirty work. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Moss? What? Hubert Collins. What are you doing here? Listen, Mr. Moss. Hubert, you sap. The cops were here this morning. you got to help me, Mr. Moss. I've got to get out of town. Look, it's almost half past two. There's a bus leaving at three o'clock back east. You're out of your mind. Cops will spot every bus depot in town. I've got to take the chance. I can only get some money. Get back east. I can... Oh, no, no. No dice. Listen, Mr. Moss. I've spent over 500 bucks with you. All I'm asking is a loan of 50 bucks. Give me a break. I haven't got any money. Okay. I tried to pull a job last night. Know why? I'm not interested. So I could get more dough. You little fool. I didn't tell you to pull a stick up. You told me if I got more dough, you'd promote my songs. I'd be riding high. Hit the big tent. Get out. Not until you let me have some money, Mr. Moss. If the cops pick me up, I'll drag you in. I'll tell them why I did it. To pay you. <laughs> Police headquarters, this is Dave Moss, Institute of Music Composers. Yes, yes. Some officers were here this morning looking for Hubert Collins. Robbery last night. Yes, that's right. Collins just left here, not five minutes ago. He's headed for the Central Bus Depot, blackmailed me out of $50, said he'd tell a lot of lies about me if I didn't... Oh, yes, yes. All right, all right. Send some men right down. You can pick him up. Uh, 
This way, officers. In this office. You two discovered the body? Oh, yes. We we called the police. Yes. Ruth and I came back from a movie a few minutes before five. We entered my partner's office. All right. And... Uh, you two stay in this outer office. Close the door, Nolan. Okay, Chief. Well, it looks like a cyclone hit this office. Yes. Let's take a look at the body. Why, it's that fellow we were talking to this morning, Chief, Dave Moss. Hmm. Looks like two bullets did it. Both, both bullets struck in the vicinity of the heart. Yeah. This door's open. Looks like the place was thoroughly searched. Uh-huh. Robbery might be the motive. Uh, what if this was an inside job, Chief, made to look like robbery? Might be. Well, we let the medical examiner and the fingerprint men go to work. Have a detailed search the officers thoroughly. Come on. Where to? Talk to the victim's partner and that girl. Check on every person known to have entered this office today. Come in, Nolan. Well, we got all the people lined up, Chief, holding them separate. Good. Uh, I had a talk with the girl, Ruth, and that uh, Charlie Reed. Oh? Uh-huh. Got their story. What about the reports? Anything new come through? No trace of the murder weapon yet. Ballistics identifies the two death slugs as having been fired from a thirty-two Smith & Wesson. Uh-huh. Medical examiner definitely establishes Dave Moss met his death sometime between 4 and 4 and 15 p.m. Well, uh, right now, as far as we know, there was only two persons know Dave Moss's death. Yes, the girl Ruth and the victim's partner, Charlie Reed. What do you think about our plan? You think it might work? I can't tell. The shock impact uh, might be a complete surprise to our suspects. Uh, we'll watch their faces carefully. Well, I got the record player rigged up in Lieutenant Williams' office and that record we found in Moss's office. When we're ready, uh, I'll press the buzzer, signal the lieutenant. He'll phone me, and then we'll listen to the record on the intercom. Good. That way everybody in the room can hear. Well, let's go to work, Nolan. Bring in our people. All right, all right, everyone. Sit down, please. Mr. Swope here. Mr. Reed. Oh, Chief, this is Miss Shirley. Uh, Shirley Hobson. And my girlfriend, Shirley. She come with me. Protect my interest. Yeah, here, officer. These songs Mr. Moss printed for Bill, all 12 copies. We want our money back. Yeah, or we make trouble. Mr. Bailey and me want to swear out a warrant and have Mr. Moss arrested. Arrested? Well, I don't understand. Mr. Moss is a dear, kind man. He's a philanthropist. Well, I don't know what that means, lady, but if you ask me, he's a dirty, rotten crook. Fit Bill's beautiful words to Peggy O'Neill. To Daddy Jip. Why, when Bill gave me those songs for my birthday, I could have cried. And then when I heard Mr. Moss charge $50 for that tune, I knew he was a crook. That's right, Inspector. Moss was a crook. He stole my money. He and his partners, Charlie Reed and that girl. What do you we don't mean? know what you're talking about. Just a minute, all of you. Hello? Lieutenant Williams, Inspector. All set. Who? Well, hello, Mr. Moss. Moss! Quiet, quiet, both of you. Can't you see the inspector's talking? Why, uh, some friends of yours are in my office, Mr. Moss. Uh, you what? Compose the greatest song of your career. Well, we'd all like to hear it. Go ahead and sing it, Mr. Moss. We went in the springtime Like the birds and bees the bleeding heart were bleeding. The love bark was on a tree. Why, that's my song he's singing. He's not singing that song. This is some trick. Yes, why are you doing this? We thought Mr. Moss might tell us who shot and killed him. Mr. Moss, what about it, Hubert? Why, I, uh, I don't know what you're talking about. But last time I saw Mr. Moss, he was alive. He loaned me 50 bucks. The police picked you up shortly after four this afternoon. Yeah, but I was miles away. I didn't go to the bus depot like I told Moss. When did you last see Moss alive? Uh, about half past two, when he loaned me the money. Yeah, and the last time I seen Mr. Moss was this morning when him and his partner pulled a gun in No, no, wait. We can prove where we were. Yes, we were in a movie until almost five o'clock. Oh, dear. What will happen to my beautiful song? We don't know about your song, Mrs. Swope, but uh, we'll return your $500. 450 was found on Mr. Reed's person, and Hubert Collins had the other 50. I already explained to you, Inspector, I had nothing to do with killing Moss. No, when we saw Dave Moss on the floor, Charlie looked in the drawer in the cash box. The $450 was there. I took it. We were partners. Here you are, Mrs. Swope, your $500. And we're holding one of you for the murder of Dave Moss. Ladies and gentlemen, you've heard the testimony of the suspects. You know all the facts and clues in tonight's mystery. Did you find the one clue that reveals the killer? In a minute, Larry Keating will question our four amateur detectives who were chosen from the studio audience about tonight's police finding. But first, have you ever heard this at your house? Gee, Mabel, I hope that isn't more company. We've got a house full now. Well, chances are it is more company. That's the way things happen. So why not be ready for them? 
The economical way is to keep a good supply of Rainier Ale on hand. It's the West favorite, bound to please whoever's at the door. It's convenient to serve, too. Just uncap a few cold bottles, and your refreshment problem is solved. Rainier Ale, the West's favorite, economical and convenient to serve. I'll remember that. Yes, and remember Rainier is made best to taste best. It's Rainier for quality, for flavor, for good cheer. And now here's Larry Keating, ready to question our four amateur detectives regarding the evidence furnished by Inspector Burke. Our amateur detectives tonight are Mr. Irwin B. Hershon of Hollywood, California, Mrs. Molly Malone from Springfield, Missouri, Mr. Keith Williams of St. Louis, Missouri, and Mrs. Rita Hatton of Los Angeles, California. Before we get underway, I'd like to point out the rules of tonight's crime quiz. To each contestant who finds the murderer and the correct clue, Rainier Brewing Company will pay a $50 savings bond. If our amateur detectives find the murderer but do not have the correct clue, they receive a $25 savings bond. And here's something else. To each contestant solving tonight's mystery, Rainier also awards a special gold detective certificate, suitably framed. The winners of this award rate the honor of joining the ranks of expert amateur detectives. And now, Inspector Burke has given me the basic evidence in tonight's mystery. Each contestant will be asked several questions. For answering correctly, Rainier Brewing Company will pay $5 in saving stamps. Now... Let's review this evidence. First of all, here is Mr. Irwin Hershon. Is that the correct pronunciation, Mr. Hershon? That's correct. All right, fine. Here is your question. The victim, Dave Moss, was shot and killed. At approximately what time did the medical examiner establish his death? Between uh, 3 and 4 o'clock. 2 and 4, I think. Between 2 and 4? No, it couldn't have been 2 and 4. It was... Take your between, time. Between uh, about 2.30 and... Of three and four o'clock. Well, I'm sorry, old man, if you had said between four and four fifteen, you would have had it right on the nose. Better luck next time, and let's talk to Mrs. Molly Malone now. Mrs. Malone, the Ballistics Bureau identified the two slugs that caused the victim's death. What caliber were these two bullets? Thirty-two you know? Smith and Wesson. Thirty-two. I see you are consulting all the data you have there. Very good. That's the way. Give this thorough. I knew the time he was killed. You did? Great. Well, I'm sorry, but we asked that the young man. But I'm here. <laughs> All right, you know so Maybe much, I won't Mrs. Maybe I will know Mo- the next one. I'll bet you will. Uh, do you know what make the gun was? Smith and Wesson. Oh, how easy. Well, oh, I'm sorry we can only give you $5 for all this information. $5 in saving stamps, but you'll be back again and get some more money, we hope. Now, here is Mr. Keith Williams. Mr. Williams, you're quite a big boy. How tall are you? Uh, six feet, three and a half. Six, three and a half, and you are from St. Louis, eh? That's correct. And I see you're with the amphibious forces in the Navy, right? That's right. Here's your question. The receptionist, Ruth, found out Mrs. Swope carried her savings with her. How much money did Mrs. Swope have? $500. That's a lot of coconuts, isn't it? That's certainly Good. Right. You get $5 for giving us the correct answer, Mr. Williams. Now, Mrs. Rita Hatton, if you please. Shortly after 4 p.m., Hubert Collins was picked up by the police. How much money did Hubert have in his possession? 50. Do you know where he got said 50? From Moss. From Moss. He, he sort of borrowed it in a rather blackmail the money from Dave Moss, didn't he? Yeah. But you get $5 in saving stamps from Rainier with our very hearty congratulations, Miss Hatton. Now here is uh, Irvin Horshawn once more. The victim's body was found by Charlie Reed in the girl Ruth. At about what time did this happen? At uh, quarter to five. A quarter to five, I would say, would be very close to it. A few minutes before 5 p.m., uh... Where did these two claim they were at the time of the killing? They were at a movie. And five dollars to you, sir, courtesy of Rainier. Very good. Mrs. Malone, once more. Mrs. Malone, I see you have the books at hand again here. (laughs) You're studying your Gladstone, I see. Here is your question. When did Bill Bailey say he last saw Dave Moss alive? Look it up. Take plenty of time. (laughs) Just go ahead. That's on page four, I think, Mrs. Malone. What? This is, uh, we're, we're discussing Dave Moss. When did Bill Bailey say he last saw him alive? That might be in the footnotes there. Do you want to look for it? Have we got it? No. At 2.30, uh, he pulled a gun on me. Yeah. Uh, 2.30. Uh, that's right. He pulled a gun on Collins at 2.30. But now we want to know when, uh, when Bailey's... That's the wrong page. Yeah, wrong page. Now the question, I re- may I repeat the question? <laughs> Granted. Here is the question. When did Bill Bailey say he last saw Dave Moss alive? Is your secretary here? We could no. send... No. <laughs> Mrs. Malone has it all written down on the back of old envelopes, laundry bills, everything. What? Haven't got it? Would you care to make a a stab in the dark? 
when did... Now, think this over. You, you heard the story. When did Bill Bailey say he last saw Dave Moss alive? I guess I don't know that one. Well, I'm sorry. It was in the morning when Moss and Charlie Reed forced him out of the office at the point of a gun. Too bad. Now, Keith Williams again. When Bill Bailey was tossed out of the Song Shark's office, did he have the printed copies of his song with him? No. Where were these songs? They're in the desk drawer. You're right. Five dollars more to you, young man. Now, Miss Rita Hatton, please. A nice hand for Mr. Williams. Good. Miss Hatton, Mrs. Hatton, rather. Bailey's girlfriend, Shirley Hobson, came to police headquarters with him. Shirley brought Bill's birthday present with her. What was this present? His song. Oh, what a present. Five dollars to you, young lady. Very good. And now let's see what this evidence revealed to you. Ladies and gentlemen, here is Inspector Burke to check the papers each amateur detective received at the start of tonight's mystery on which to write who they think committed the crime and the one clue that reveals the criminal. Thank you, Larry. Well, I've checked the deductions of each of our amateur detectives, and I find that Mrs. Molly Malone of Springfield, uh, Missouri, said that Charlie Reed was the murderer. I'm sorry to say that she's wrong. Uh, Mrs. Rita Hatton of Los Angeles, California, said uh, also that Charlie Reed was the murderer. I'm sorry to say that she is wrong. However, Keith P. Williams of Clayton, Missouri, and uh, Irwin P. Hershon of Hollywood, California, both said that Bill Bailey was the murderer, and they're absolutely correct, and both also gave the correct clue. Now let's see exactly what happened. We held Bill Bailey for the murder of the song shark, Dave Moss. According to Bailey's story, he claimed the last time he saw Dave Moss alive was on the morning of the murder, when Moss and Charlie Reed forced him to leave the office at the point of a gun. Now, immediately after Bailey left the Song Shark's office, the two swindlers looked in Moss's desk and found the 12 printed copies of Bill's song. Yet later, when Bailey's girlfriend, uh, Shirley Hobson, appeared at police headquarters with Bailey, Shirley had all 12 copies of this song. Unwittingly, and in a state of righteous indignation, Shirley gave Bill away. Because only by returning to Moss's office at a time later than he claimed could Bill have obtained these songs. It was this obvious slip-up that trapped Bill Bailey. Shortly before 4 p.m., Bailey returned to the office, demanded his songs. When Moss refused, Bailey started taking the place apart looking for his songs. Moss threatened Bailey with the gun. In the struggle that followed, Moss was shot and killed. Hurriedly, uh, continuing his search... Bailey finally found his songs, left the office, taking the murder weapon with him. Bill Bailey pleaded self-defense. Hubert Collins was held for the attempted robbery of the store he worked in and wounding the patrolman. Charlie Reed and Ruth were arrested by the Bunko Squad. Their racket was exposed and smashed. Thank you, Inspector. And so tonight we find that Mrs. Molly Malone of Springfield, Missouri, has won $5 in saving stamps. Mrs. Rita Hatton of Los Angeles, $10 in saving stamps. We have two first prize winners tonight. Mr. Irwin B. Hershon of Hollywood and Keith P. Williams of Clayton, Missouri. They each receive a $50, $50 in savings bond, won $5 in savings stamps, and Keith Williams $10 in savings stamps. Congratulations. <laughs> and to each of the winners bring their awards a special gold detective certificate honoring our guest as expert amateur detective. And now, Inspector, what about next week's story? Next week's story, Larry, is about an innocent witness to one of the strangest cases on record. Threatened, terrified for his life, this person came to the police and revealed a fantastic plot. What this strange plot was will be told in the mystery of the startling secret. I'll see you then. Good night, everyone. Good night, Inspector. So we bring to a close another Inspector Burke mystery drama, starring William Gargan and brought to you by Rainier Brewing Company of San Francisco and Los Angeles. Brewers of Rainier Club Extra Pale Beer and Rainier Old Stock Ale. All characters and incidents used on this program are fictitious. Any resemblance to actual persons or incidents is purely coincidental. This is Larry Keating saying good night for Rainier Brewing Company and inviting you to listen in again at the same time next week. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. And now, the Hall of Fantasy. Dedicated to the supernatural, the unusual, and the unknown. Come with me, my friends. We shall descend to the world of the unknown and forbidden. Down to the depths where the veil of time is lifted and the supernatural reigns as king. Come with me and listen to the tale of Stone's Revenge. He let him stay out there in the freezing cold, pounding on the door and yelling, let me in. Monroe's daughter tried to let him in, but the old man wouldn't let her. 
So Jeff stayed there in the freezing cold, and the girl heard him say, I'll make you pay for this, Monroe. For as long as Monroe lives, I'll make you pay. And that's the end of the story? Yeah, not by a long shot, young fella. Ever since that time, people have died who stayed in that cabin. People up here say they've heard him pound on the door and yell, Now let me in. And when they do let him in, they die. Real strange like they die. The Hall of Fantasy will present Stone's Revenge in just a moment. And now for our story, an original tale of fantasy entitled Stone's Revenge. Jim Loring was my best friend. His sister Betty more than my friend, for we were set to be married the following November. We'd all been working pretty hard and we figured we needed a rest, so we took a two weeks vacation and headed up north. Before we left the city, Jim rented a cabin from a real estate broker about 400 miles north of here. We left about three in the morning and drove steadily. Hey, what uh, time is it? Uh, 11.30. Oh, we've made good time. Yeah, that's right. According to the last marker we saw, we ought to be pulling into Woodlake in a few minutes. How far is the cabin from town, Jim? Well, Garing, the real estate man, said it was about six miles out of town. You're, uh... Sure he said there were fish in that lake? (laughs) Some of the best fishing in the state. That's what he said. (laughs) That's what they all say. (laughs) We'll have to stop in town and pick up plenty of food. That's right. Enough to hold us for a few days anyway. Oh, look, up ahead. I think we're coming to it. Oh, we are. It says, uh, you see, a wood lake, population 709. Hey, big town. Better slow down. You know these small towns. Yeah. The broker in the city said I could get the key to the cabin from the sheriff. It seems he also owns a store here, Sheldon's General Store. Well, if that's the case, we might as well pick up our food there. Yeah, might as well. Hey, look, there it is. Huh? Oh, yeah, I see it. Oh, open that door in a hurry. I, I just hope my muscles haven't frozen in this position. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh it feels great. Uh, oh, oh, boy. Good. Beautiful day, isn't it? Weather report said we're in for a storm tonight, though. Oh, well, maybe it'll blow over by tomorrow. Oh, it's nice and cool in here. Yeah. Anything would be cool after driving in that hot sun. Oh, it doesn't seem to be. Well, yes, there is. Leaning back in that chair with a paper over his face. Look. <laughs> <laughs> He's sound asleep. Pretty alert fellow, isn't he? <laughs> yeah. I heard that, young fella. <laughs> I was only joking. <laughs> Don't you worry, none, son. I can take a joke as well as the next one. <laughs> uh, you'd be wanting something, maybe? Uh, yes, we uh, rented a cabin up here, and we need some food. And you come to the right place. <laughs> yes, sir. Now, what can I do you for? Uh, you'd better take charge here, Betty. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, let's see. We'll need some eggs. Uh, about two dozen. Coming right, right up. Yeah. You come in fresh this morning? Uh, where are you staying? Oh, the old Monroe place. A real estate man in the city said we could pick up the key from you. Yep. Yep, I got the key, all right. Yeah, what else, ma'am? Well, let's see. Some bacon, a pound of coffee, pancake flour. Pancake flour. Potatoes, potatoes oranges, oranges, some cream, sandwich. Yeah, wait, 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 wait a minute. Hold on, ma'am. I got what you said, but don't say no more, because if you do, I'll forget everything. <laughs> <laughs> So, you're staying at the old Monroe place, huh? That's right. Let's see now. Coffee, flour. You got a five-pound sack of potatoes here. Oh, that'll be fine. Yeah. Uh, go over there and help yourself to some oranges, ma'am, and anything else you see. Just pick it up and set it on the counter here. <laughs> All right. I, I guess that will be the easiest way. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. So, you're staying at the old Monroe place, huh? Uh, you uh, said that once before. Yeah, I know I did. I know it. I just wanted to be sure I was hearing right. Well, your hearing's all right, Sheriff. Uh, by the way, may we have the key? Sure enough. Sure enough. It's right here under the counter. No. Yeah, long time since that cabin's been rented. Oh? How come? Eh, people just don't like to go up there. Oh, why not? Anything wrong with it? Not exactly. Still the best cabin around these parts. Got a nice refrigerator. <laughs> Indoor plumbing. Real nice place. But uh, you oughtn't to go up there. Why? Because of old Jeff Stone. People around here say they've seen him up there. Oh, he won't bother us. Eh, don't you count on that, young fella. Look, if he comes around the cabin, we'll ask him to leave. Only leaving, that'll be done. It'll be done by you. 
Why? Is he dangerous? Yeah, yeah, he's dangerous. And he's dead, too. What do you mean? Just what I said. Well, you can't expect us to believe I don't that. expect you to believe nothing. I'm just telling you what I know for a fact. The real estate man didn't say anything he's about... He's only interested in renting it. Now, you listen to what I got to say. So I don't think... Let that... him talk to you. Thank you, thank you. I'll tell you about what happened up there. About 15 years ago, it was. Old man Monroe hated Jeff Stone. Used to make life miserable for Jeff. And Jeff used to come in here and say that he was going to get even someday. And the hatred inside him would come out on the surface. And it even made me afraid. It was the winter time when it happened. Old man Monroe was in his cabin and there was a big storm outside. One of the worst we ever had up here. His daughter was with him. She was the one who told me what happened. <clears throat> Jeff got himself caught outside in that storm. He knew the only place he could reach was old man Monroe's cabin. So he fought his way through the blizzard... And he got to the cabin, half froze. Yeah, he pounded on the door. Let me in! Let me in! Old Monroe knew it was Jeff outside. He wouldn't open that door. He let him stay out there in the freezing cold, pounding on the door and yelling, Let me in! Let me in! Well, Monroe's daughter tried to let him in, but the old man wouldn't let her. So Jeff stayed out there and froze to death. But just before he stopped yelling, the girl heard him say, I'll make you pay for this, Monroe. For as long as the Monroe lives, I'll make you pay. Yes, sir. In the morning, when the storm was over, they went outside and found him frozen to death. And that's the end of the story? Yeah, not by a long shot, young fella. Ever since that time, people have died who stayed in that cabin. First Monroe's daughter, then him, and then others. Anybody who went up there. People up here say they've heard him pounding on the door and yelling, Let me in! Let me in! And when the folks in the cabin let him in, they die. Real strange-like. They die. We'll return to the Hall of Fantasy in the tale of Stone's Revenge in just a moment. Back now to the Hall of Fantasy in the tale of Stone's Revenge. The sheriff leaned across the counter as he spoke to us. Even though the day was warm, I could feel a chill creep over me as he told us the story of one man's revenge. So I wouldn't go up there if I was you. Uh, certainly a frightening story. Yep, sure is. Is there any other cabin around here for rent? Yeah, it's been a busy season up here. Most of the places got people living in them. I got a place, though, I could let you have. Not too bad a place. Let you have it mighty cheap. Maybe we ought to... Uh... Nonsense. No, we'll go up to the cabin. Well, it's all right with me. Well, I think that about does it, Sheriff Sheldon. All right, let me see now. 95 for coffee, 57 for bacon. Our uh, eggs... You sure we have everything we need? Well, as long as you two manage to catch a few fish we have. <laughs> if you don't, then we'll be making quite a few trips into town. Wait till we get out in the boat. Ha, I'll wait until I get the fish into the pan. Yeah, it comes to $11.92. You can check my figures if you want to. Oh, no, we trust you, Sheriff, here. Yep, out of 12. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Always good to have a little business on the side, like this here store. Here's your change. Thank you, sir. Hmm. Uh, you, look, you're sure you don't want to go to my cabin, huh? Well, we're sure. Well, I warned you, warned you, you're walking in with your eyes open. I hope you walk out that way. <clears throat> that is, alive. Certainly is far enough away from everybody. Mm -hmm. It's a good thing we have a map or we'd be lost. Hey, look, I can see it. Huh? Yeah, hey, so do I. Yeah, it looks pretty nice. Oh, and there's the lake. Oh, it's beautiful. Hey, can I pick him or can I pick him? Oh. This lake is so hard to get to that I, I bet it hasn't been fished much. I could hardly wait to get out there. They ought to be hitting pretty well this afternoon, huh? We'll get the boat off the trailer and whip that lake to a froth. Jim. Mm hmm. I heard that story that the sheriff was telling you. You don't think there was any truth to it, do you? Of course not. You notice when he finished, he said he had a place that we could rent? Oh, I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> well, I did. 
He just wanted to talk us out of coming up here. Always good to have a little business on the side, he said. I wonder how many people he's talked out of coming up here with that crazy story of his. Yeah. Quite a few, I suppose. But it... It did frighten me. We found the cabin to be in excellent condition. We moved our things in, had a bite to eat, then Jim and I unloaded the boat and went fishing while Betty took a sunbath on the beach in front of the cabin. The big ones weren't hitting, but the panfish were. And when we came in, we had a stringer full of bluegills, crappies, and perch. Betty fixed dinner, and we had all the fish we could eat. The rest of the evening, we took it easy, listening to the radio we'd brought with us or reading. The weather report was right that day, and a little after 9 o'clock, it began to rain. Hey, we're right about the rain. Yeah, sounds like it'll be a good one. I hope we don't have rain the whole time we're up here. That would be just our luck. Hey, who turned off the radio? I did. Nobody seemed to be listening to it. Well, put it on, will you? Oh. I want to catch the rest of the news before I turn in. If we're uh, going to get up early tomorrow, we'd better think about turning in. Yeah, we'll hear the news and then call it a day. Okay. And that's the news of the world and the national scene. As for the local news, there's... Ladies and gentlemen, a bulletin has just been handed to me. Lawrence Graham, an inmate of the State Institution for the Criminally Insane, escaped from the grounds a little more than two hours ago. So far, he has not been apprehended. His description follows. Six feet tall, gray hair and brown eyes. Last seen wearing gray shirt and pants. This man is dangerous. If you see him, on no account try to apprehend him, but get in touch with the local police of your area immediately. I repeat, this man is dangerous. Be very careful. Turn it off, Betty. The state hospital is for the criminally insane. That's pretty close to us. I think it's about... Five or six miles away. Oh, they'll catch you. Don't worry about it. He won't get away. I hope so. Well, I think I'm going to turn in. Uh, Listen. What's the matter? I I heard something. So did I. A crash of thunder. No, something else. I I thought I heard a voice. Oh, nonsense. Uh, Maybe you're right. Maybe. There it is again. I heard it too. Yeah, so did I. We'd better take a look outside. Yeah, all right. No, d- don't go outside. We'll just stand in the doorway and see if there's anything out here. Huh? Do you see anything? No. Nothing. Then come back inside. Yeah. All right. Maybe it was someone lost in the storm. Uh, or maybe it was the man who escaped. Or Jeff Stone. <laughs> Is out there. Yes, there is something out there. We'd better go see what it is. All right, I'll. Let me in! He's outside the door. Let me in! Come on, let's see who it is. Okay. Let me in. Oh, I'm glad I found you here. What's the matter with him? I found him lying on the ground about a half a mile from here. I've been carrying him ever since. Here, let me help you. Put him down over here. That does it. What's wrong with him? I don't know. He he doesn't seem to... What's the matter with him? He... He's dead. You are listening to the tale of Stone's Revenge on this week's journey down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy. We'll return to our story in just a moment. And now, back to our story, entitled Stone's Revenge. The storm was getting worse. Outside, thunder roared and the rain fell in torrents. Inside, we turned to look at each other, for a dead man was lying on the couch. Are you sure? There's no pulse. He's dead. Was he dead when you found him? No. Then he must have died while you were carrying him. Yes. Storm's pretty bad. You'd better stay here until it blows itself out. Thanks. Gordon. Yes? Come over here a minute. All right. What do you want? Don't talk so loud. Do you see his clothes? Who's? But not the dead man. What's so different about them? Gray shirt and slacks? Remember the broadcast? Gray shirt and slacks. 
six feet tall with gray hair and brown eyes. Well, that man fits the description of the one that, that they put out the warning about. Hmm. What do you think we should do? I don't know. The announcer said he was dangerous. But it might not be him. What if it is? Hey, uh, what are you two talking about? Uh, we, uh, we were wondering if you'd like, uh, uh, something to eat, sir. No. You, uh, you live around here? At one time. Do you, uh, know who he is? I remember the face very well, but the name escapes me. What, uh, your name? I'd rather not say. <clears throat> well, um... Why don't you drive into town and, and get some cigarettes, Gordon? But we have... uh, Yes, we, uh, we're almost out. Uh, I'll go right away. But I don't... Understand. We don't have enough, Jim. Oh, all right, if you say so. You ought to wear a raincoat. No, I'll be uh, right back. I'll get back as soon as I can with the, with the cigarettes. Hurry, Gordon. Plenty. Did you hear the broadcast about the escaped killer? Yep. Well, there's a man at our cabin who fits that description. You sure? Yeah. He came to the cabin and he was carrying a dead man. What did the dead man look like? Well, blonde, nice-looking fellow. He's dead, huh? Yeah. And we think the other man killed him. The lunatic? Yes. He couldn't have. Why? Because he was captured a few minutes after that broadcast. You must have turned your radio off right after the bulletin. Well, yes, we... we did. But, Sheriff, then, who are the men in our cabin? The men in your cabin? I'll tell you who they are. The young one was Tom Monroe. He was going up to see you. Tom Monroe? Yes. Why? To tell you that it just wasn't a wild story I told you. To tell you to get out of that cabin before it was too late. Then the other man is Jeff. Stone. I told Tom not to go, but he wouldn't listen to me. He said he didn't want any more people to die up there. And so, he died himself. Sheriff, Jim and Betty are still up there. With Jeff Stone? Yes. Well, we're going to have to move off her fast to save him. Come on! so slippery. I hope we can make it up to the top. Hey, we're almost there. Keep driving. Yes. I almost didn't make it down. I got stuck once up there. We'll make her. Oh, if anything's happened to them, I don't know what I Just do. pay attention to the road. All right. Here's the spot I got stuck in before. Ah, we're not moving. Rocker, little rocker. Right. Ah, oh, no. We're stuck. We're stuck good. Then leave the car here and we'll travel the rest of the way on foot. All right. All right. Let's get out. I can see the lights through the trees. Come on, let's go. All right. It's slippery. Yeah. Watch your step. Betty! Jim, we're coming! I can't hear you, not with this storm and all. Oh, I thought if he heard me. Yeah, forget it. Just watch. Are you all right? Yeah, I guess so. Here, I'll help you up. Thank you. There you are. All right, let's go. All right. And we're almost there. Yeah. I hope they're all right. We'll go in quietly. Huh? Just open the door and walk in. Right. The storm ought to cover any sounds we make. Right. And you just let me handle this. All right. Here we go. It's locked. We'll have to break it down together then. Here all right. Well, that was Betty. we got to get that door down. All right. That's it. That's it. Betty, Betty, what's wrong? You. Well, of course. I brought the sheriff with me. Where's the man that was here? Oh, he's gone. I I thought it was him returning when you crashed against the door. That's why I screamed it. I was afraid. Well, I want to be sure that... Yep. It's Tom Monroe, all right. You know this man? Yeah, he's the grandson of old man Monroe, who murdered Jeff Stone by letting him freeze to death outside. Jeff Stone's revenge is over now. But 
But if he'd killed other people that came here, then why didn't he hurt us? Revenge is a strange thing, ma'am. In Jeff Stone's case, I think it was strong enough to bring him back from the grave to try to even the score. And so he killed old man Monroe over again every time someone died here. And when he killed young Tom here, then his feeling for revenge left him. Why? Tom was the last of the Monroes, Mr. Blake. Jeff Stone's revenge is complete now. Yes, sir, it's complete now. And he can rest quiet in his grave. So runs tonight's tale of the unusual, the terrifying, the unknown. Join us again when next we journey down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy to hear another strange tale of the supernatural. All characters and events portrayed in these programs are fictional, and any similarity to actual events or persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. speak again the immortal tale, The Mark of the Plague. Give me your hand, Lucille. What is it, Harry? You look worried this afternoon. It's much too beautiful here to frown like that. Sit down on this bench next to me, darling. I I have something to tell you. Mm, there. Huh. Now, dearest, what is it you have on your very, very serious mind? (laughs) Oh, you little (laughs) minx. You can't take anything seriously, can you? Not even love. You know I love you more than anything in the world. And nothing's ever too serious when we have each other. All right, smile now. That's better. (laughs) It certainly would be difficult if I had something important to tell you. (laughs) You're about as unpredictable. Look, Harry, look over there. What? It's a double cowslip coming out already. One of the roots I set out myself. Darling, everything's blossoming. It will be all our lives for us, won't it? As long as we're together. And we will be always, won't we, dear? Oh, I hope so. Is there any doubt? There isn't in my mind. Nothing could keep us apart, Harry. Nothing. Not even death. Why, Lucille, what a thing to say. (laughs) Thank heaven we have a long time ahead of us before we have to think of things like that. There's no way of telling that, Harry. You never know when death is standing on your own doorstep. (laughs) I never know from minute to minute what's going on inside that pretty head of yours. I'm serious now. You never can tell. Oh, can't we arrange to be married soon? I want to so much. Well, that was what I wanted you to sit down here and talk about. Our marriage. There's nothing I'd rather talk about. We may have to wait, dear heart. Wait? Just for a little while. Until I can talk to Father. Your father doesn't want us to marry, does he? He's afraid of something. What is it, Harry? You've never told me. Well, he's a very proud man, Lucille. Too proud for his own good. And I'm just a shopkeeper's daughter. Is that it? But we love each other, don't we? Tell me, Harry. Tell me that you love me. Oh, I do, I do, Lucille. Can't you see it in my eyes? Hear it in my voice. I've never felt this way about anyone before. But you don't love me enough to stand on your own feet against your father. I will, Lucille, I will. But you know what a situation this is. My father, all our friends, everyone, they'll, they'll talk. I'm thinking of you, dearest, as well as myself. Will we be able to last against all the opposition? If we're strong enough, if we believe in each other and in ourselves, yes. Determination is what we have to have. Why, Lucille, you... You sound almost militant. I've never seen you this way before. I feel very strongly about this, Harry. 
I don't believe in snobbishness. Not in our day and age. Not now. And when it's us... Well, I... I guess it just hurts more than ever. Lucille, I... London's a big place, Harry. But not as big as that. We're living here within the boundaries of the same city. My father is an honest, good man. And just because he happens to own a shop instead of having a family fortune the way your father does doesn't make him less than anyone else, Harry. Not in my eyes, anyway. Lucille, we'll talk about it again very soon, shall we? Talk about it soon? Why can't we settle it now? Get something definite in mind. Darling, it can't go on like this. In two weeks, Lucille, we'll talk to Father together. We'll go to him and tell him the whole thing. And when he sees you, dear, when he knows what a wonderful girl you really are, then then he can't object. Is that a promise? Yes. You see, I'm going away for a little while. I have to travel to the north for Father's estate. When I come back... All right, dearest. I'll wait until then. Two weeks. You come then. Come to the house. And we'll go to him. I'll be there, darling. Oh. Oh, someone's just come into the shop. I'll have to go. Daddy's in the office and doesn't want to be disturbed. All right, my love. I'll go out by the back gate. Goodbye, dear. I do love you so very much. Goodbye. In two weeks, I'll be with you again. Goodbye. I'm coming. I'm coming. Who can be in such a hurry? Oh, oh, Mr. Kent, I'm I'm so sorry you oh, had to wait. Oh, Mrs. Darcy, good day. Daddy's busy and he left me to mind the shop. I'm afraid I was playing truant. Perfectly all right, ma'am. I only wondered whether... I know, you wondered whether that box had arrived from the Levant. The goods you wanted. Why, well, yes, exactly. Well, it has arrived, Mr. Kent. In fact, it just came this morning from Holland. I do hope the things you wanted are in it. Here it is. Here. Father opened it when it came. Oh, let's see. Here are the things. Yes, and here are yours. Mm-hmm. Some um, herbs and uh, and this material, wasn't it? Exactly. You may as well take them along right now if you like. And uh, the payment? Oh, why don't you settle that with Daddy later? I'm not sure what their value is and he will know. Well, that'll be fine, Mr. Stossy. Thank you and good day. Good day, sir. Lucille! Lucille! Yes, Daddy, I'm right here. Oh, Lucille. Lucille, this is terrible. What, Daddy? Well, you look as though you'd seen a ghost. I almost have. And I'm likely to see more unless we get rid of that confounded box. What box? Oh, oh, the one that came this morning from Holland. Yes. It's still here, isn't it? Where is it? It's been opened. Why, you opened it yourself when it arrived. Oh, may heaven have mercy on us. What is it, Daddy? What's happened? Why, it's this. This letter. It just came a few minutes ago from Holland. Yes? From the agents there. They warned me not to open the box. The plague has broken out in Holland, and they believe it was brought in in this very shipment. The one this box came in. But, Daddy... No one has received anything from it, have they? I I just gave Mr. Kent his goods from it this very minute. Oh, it can't be. It can't be. The plague spreads like fire once it's started. Well, I'll go after him and get the things back. No, no. No, Lucille. No. We daren't. We can't tell anyone. Not anyone. Do you understand? What if Mr. Kent... No. No one. If it starts here, no one must know where it came from. I'd be ruined. But the box, Daddy, what'll we do with it? We'll burn it. That's it. We'll take it out and burn it. And we'll pray that the goods Kent took out of it were untainted. Lucille. Oh, thank heaven you've come. You said two weeks, Harry. I've come at the time you said. Come in. Come in, Lucille. I I hoped it was you. I, I answered the door myself. I've, I've hardly been able to contain myself waiting for you, my darling. Daddy's been ill. Or I, I would have been here yesterday. Well, my father's ill, too. I've been worried to death. I, I couldn't leave here to come to you. The servants are frightened and they won't go near him. Frightened? Yeah, there, there are so many ill in London now. The doctors are too busy to answer the calls. There, there's even talk of it of its being the plague. Oh, no. Hadn't you heard it? Most of our friends have shut their houses up and gone away already. If it gets any worse, we'll have to do the same. Oh, Harry, I'll go with you. I'll go anywhere or do anything to be with you. Take me to your father. I'll I'll be his nurse. I'll take care of him. I can't let you go away and leave me here. Especially not now. Oh, darling, you're splendid. Come, I'll take you into him. He's well enough now. He seems better and we'll talk to him. Tell him you're going to nurse him. Uh, Come on, uh, this is his room back here. He sleeps on this floor. Oh, Harry, it's going to be all right, isn't it? I'm sure it is, my dearest. Ready? Go ahead. 
Father. Harry, come in, boy. Father, I brought someone to see you. Someone to see me? Everyone's afraid now. Who is it? It's a young lady who wants to help you. She's going to be your nurse, Father. How do you do, Mr. Moore? <laughs> young lady, aren't you frightened? Everyone else is. Not at all. Now, just rest yourself, because I'm used to this. And, and we'll be all right. Yes. Who is this, Harry? Miss Darcy, Father. Very good friend of Darcy. Darcy? Well, yes, Father. Lucille. You dare. Oh, Harry, he, he... He mustn't get upset this way. Well, now, don't mind, Lucille. He's always had a sudden temper. He'll be all right. You dare bring that... That woman here. I'm a sick man. You're trying to kill me. No, no, Father. Lucille is going to take care of you. You'll see how fine she is. You'll see. I won't stand for it. You'll see. I won't have it. She may stay forever, but I won't receive her here. Take care of me, indeed. But, Mr. Moore, I... Oh, Harry, I'm, I'm going. Lucille, no, no, please. Wait just a minute. It'll be all right. Oh, all right, indeed. Harry, my own son, trying to kill his father. Father, rest a while. Think. Just think what this may mean, Lucille here. You'll know her, you'll love her as I do. Love her? Oh, you fool boy. Can't you see what you're doing? You'll kill me. Kill me? Perhaps we'd better go outside, Harry, just for a little while. Yes. Father, we're going now. Rest yourself and think. We'll be in the next room. How dare he bringing someone like that into my house? Oh, Lucille, I'm ashamed. I'm sorry. It was awful for you. He's very ill, darling. He doesn't know everything he's saying. Sometimes, Lucille, sometimes I think you're an angel. No one else would take it that way. No one else would understand. But we're in love. I can't help understanding everything about you. But he was so terrible, so much worse than I dreamed he'd dare to be. Oh, my darling, don't you be afraid. Everything will be all right. It surely must be. The servants. If only I could get them to go near him. But they threatened to leave if they had to serve him. Darling, I'd like to send you home again. I'll come to you right away. No, no, you don't understand me very well if you think I'd leave now. I came to help you and to help your father. Perhaps I can win his gratitude and make him understand... I want to try. I really want to try. Oh, you're wonderful. You have the spirit of a true woman. Darling, if you would... If you would stay even after the way he's acted, I... Harry! Uh, uh, Harry, what is it? You're not feeling well. It's, it's nothing. Just my head. For two weeks now, I've suffered with the most awful headaches. They, they pass quickly, though. It's all right. Just sit down here and let me stroke you for it. Uh, there. There, now it'll be better. Oh, your hand... So cool. Oh, darling, just the touch of you makes everything all right. We will be all right, Harry. We've got to be all right. Nothing can touch us. Nothing. I shouldn't have let you come. What if... What if you should become marked with the sickness? What if... Don't fear that. Nothing will happen to us. We are safe in our love. But, Father, what if he really has the plague? What... It won't happen to us, dearest. As for your father, don't worry. There are ways of getting him to agree with us. Don't worry about that. Everything will be all right. I'll take care of that. Yes. Don't you worry, Harry. I will take care of that. Lucille? Lucille? Yes, Harry. You've been in there with your father so long. I know, darling. He's very ill. I'm afraid... He hasn't got any better since I've been here. I know. But I can do no more. I know, darling. I know there isn't anything anyone can do. You look ill yourself, dearest. Are you all right? You won't let me help you. I'm all right. 
It's just these headaches. <laughs> Father's sent me out, Lucille. He wants something. Are you going out of the house? Yes, darling. But it isn't safe. No one goes out. Only the men driving the carts that carry no, away. No, no, don't, don't think of those things, Lucille. They're too horrible. I'll be careful. Where do you have to go? To Father's lawyer. He wants him to come here. His lawyer? Father's afraid he's going to die. But he may live for days, for weeks. He might... But he wants to be sure. Something about his will, the people in his house. And then again, on second thought, perhaps he will die, Harry. Perhaps he will. But hurry, dearest, hurry. If he wants to see him, hurry. He may die even before you get back. Why? He why may, Harry. You can never tell. Oh, Seal, you're not serious. It's a serious thing. I... No, go. Go on. Get the lawyer. Everything will be all right. I'll go in and take care of your father. Wait for me, darling. Wait. I'll be back right away. His money. His money. That's all he's worried about. As though that made any difference. It's not his money I want. Yes, hurry, darling, hurry. Because things may happen before you return. Harry? Harry, are you back? No, it's Lucille, Mr. Moore. Harry's just left. Go away. I want Harry. I must see my lawyer. I must see... Be quiet now, Mr. Moore. You'll be all right. Just let me put this compress on your forehead. I don't want that compress. Put it down. I don't want kindness from you. I want to remember how I hate you. You do hate me, don't you? You hate me enough to want to kill me. Where's Harry? Where's the lawyer? You tried to steal everything I've got. Is that what's really worrying you, your money? That's not worrying me. My estate. To a shopkeeper's daughter. To a common woman. Be careful. Be careful, Mr. Moore. You're a sick man. You're dangerously sick. More dangerously than you know. Right now you may die. Do you hear me? You may die even before they get back. No, no. I have to see them. I'm going to see my son again. Why? He's bringing the lawyer. <laughs> Mr. Stone is coming. It is your money, then. Your money. My name, too. My name, too. A creature like you. Your name. One might think that was worth anything anymore. What's wrong with the name I have? What's wrong with Darcy? Darcy. When the name of Moore is in question. Everyone knows the secret now. Everyone knows... This confounded plague started with the Darcy's. And it seems to me that you're a part of it. Darcy, the plague. And it finishes the Moors. It finishes the Moors. Do you understand, Mr. Moore? It finishes the Moors. Where's Harry? <laughs> You'll Harry. wait, Mr. Moore. You'll wait a long time before you see him again. No man can despise me, call me common, and drag my name in the dust as you have. No one, do you hear? You're going to wait a long time. I'm going to put this compress on you, whether you like it or not. No. No. <laughs> Lucille? Lucille? What is it? Where are you? Oh, Harry. Harry, come quickly. Darling, what is it? Harry, your father, he... Lucille. <laughs> Poor father. Dead. Oh, I can't believe it. He... He must have struggled at the end. He was weak. So weak, Harry. He could hardly move. This compress. It must have slipped over his face when he died. Yes, yes, it must have. Well, Harry, I wanted to have him like me. And, and want me to marry you, I Oh, he would have, day. Lucille, he would have. He had to love you. I went out. I went out. I, I called to the servants. I wanted somebody to help me, but there was no one here. The servants have all left. They were too frightened to stay. All of London is frightened. Frightened and quiet. It's better in here. Oh, Harry, I... I feel so weak. So terrible. Come with me, uh, darling. Come out of here. Yes. Yes. There. We'll feel better in the sitting room. But... But the lawyer... You, you went for a lawyer. Where is he? He's coming. He said he'd come. 
But it's no use now, I guess. No use. Harry, you... Your father... He wanted you at the end. But... But he died before I could reach him. He died without saying anything. He, he died before I got there. But, Lucille, you said... He, that... he couldn't talk. He hated me. He hated me, and he would never have forgiven me. He'd be never quiet, have... darling. Be quiet. Uh, now, sit, sit still there for a minute. He looked at me with those horrible red eyes, and he called me common. <laughs> there was no one there. Stop, Lucille. I... No. This isn't true. Tell me it isn't. No, Harry, no, don't touch me. Your father, he... And you have it, too. You have it, too. Look, I can see it in your eyes. The fever's in you, too. Lucille, you're delirious. It isn't true. Nothing you're saying is true. No, no, go away. This can't be real. I'm going in to see. No, Harry. I don't believe you. No, no, no. Harry, please, please don't go Let in there. Let go of me, Lucille. Please, please, stay away from there. Go back, Lucille. Please, now, calm yourself. Uh, go back into the other room. I'll be right back. I just want to see. But you don't have to see anymore. You, you don't have to see anything. Please, Lucille. No, no, Harry, no, please, no, well, no. Come with me, then, if you want. But I must see what's happened. <sighs> it's true, then. Oh, Harry, I couldn't help it. I couldn't. I... You murdered him. No. No, I didn't. I Lucille. Didn't. He asked for you, Harry. I, I, I went to him and... and... And he looked at me. Lucille, and I... tell me, tell me again, you didn't. Uh, this cloth, it, it was a compress. It slipped. It must have slipped down on his face when he moved. Lucille, tell me. Yes, Harry, I. I, I couldn't live always with that on my mind. I, I couldn't face you. Oh, Lucille, you. You couldn't have. I. I Harry! I. Uh, Harry, Harry, come with me. Oh. Let me hold you. Oh. I'm so. So weak, Lucille. Here, here, let me help you. Mm. Just come with me into the other room. It's horrible in here. Oh, here, Lucille. Lean on me, that's it. Uh, Just lean on my shoulder. Uh, come on. Oh, I need you, Lucille. I don't believe... In here, that's it. Oh. In here, my darling. Mm -hmm. Here, I'll, I'll loosen your clothes. Oh. oh, that's better, Lucille. It's better. There, mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. Oh, Harry, speak to me. Mm -hmm. Don't just look at me like that. Lucille, tell me. Tell me you didn't. Oh, my darling, darling, darling. How can I tell you? How can I live? Lucille, we... It, my, my father, he died alone, didn't he? No. No. I was with him. I... Oh, Harry. Mm. Harry! Harry! Speak to me. Harry, please, speak to me. Oh, no. No! The lawyer. The lawyer. They've come. I must go and answer and let them in. But I can't. I can't let them into a house of death. Look! Look, everyone, look at the house where misery has become massive. I'm coming, I'm coming. Uh, did someone come to help? They'll see. They'll see what happened. Yes, yes, you may come in, sir. You may come into the house of death. You two, come in and see. Uh, all the world will see soon enough. How do I look? Like a murderess? Like a woman who has committed a crime? An unholy soul condemned for the rest of her life. I, yes, yes, I'm coming, I'm coming. Uh, why so much impatience, Mr. Stone? You'll find no business here. No business but with the dead. My love is dead. Everything is dead. Uh, come in, sir. Yes, come in. Oh, uh, Mr. Moore sent for me. Will you be so good as to tell him I'm here? There is no Mr. Moore here. Why, what's the matter, girl? Are you mad? Well, this is his house. I've been coming here for years. Mr. Moore is no longer here. But his son came to call for me just a minute ago. Come in if you wish. If you dare to enter a house in London now, come in and see for yourself. Well, yes, his room's right back this way. I'll go back. That's the way to Mr. Moore's room, all right, but you will find only... But 
Isn't that Harry in there in the sitting room? It's not Harry. Why, yes, it is. Doesn't he see me? He's looking right at me. Harry's not there. Uh, My dear girl, what on earth's wrong with you? What's going on in this house? There's nothing right here, Mr. Stone. Nothing can ever be right here again. Oh, you know my name. Of course. You would have known mine one day. Well, who are you? A condemned woman. What? Who are you? Who are you, for that matter? You're a stranger, wandering in the wilderness, too. But you're not tortured. You're not lost. Well, you... You amaze me. Mr. Moore is not here. Look. Look, I say. Well, yes, of course he's here. There he is on the bed. It's not Mr. Moore. Mr. Moore is gone. Gone. I... Dear girl... Wait a moment. What's that on your face, child? On my face? Tears. No, 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 not that. That mark on the side of your face. A mark? Yes, it seems even to be spreading as I watch it. A mark? It's, it's... Let me see in the mirror. In the sunlight now with the door open, I can see it. No! No, it can't be. I'll wave it off. I'll stack it out. It'll go away. It'll go away. It must go away. Stop that. Stop it, child. That will do no good. It'll do no good. It'll do no good. That thing on my face. It will spread and spread. That's a part of my shame, a part of my punishment. No! No, it must go away. It must, it must. I'll tear it out. It can't be. It can't be. But it is. It is. The mark of the plague. From the time-worn pages of the past, we have brought you The Mark of the Plague. Bellkeeper, toll the bell. G. Marshall. Every age must have its heroes. You may well ask, what is a hero? Obviously, a hero must be one who performs heroic deeds. In the past, we had great patriots, great soldiers, great statesmen, and great scientists. Active men and women who changed the face of our nation and the course of our history. Is it a commentary on our times that today's heroes are only images on a screen. Our mystery drama, The Shadow of a Killer, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Fred Gwynn. Nondescript looking sedan comes to a stop before a seedy, sagging tenement building in a desolate section of a dreary slum. Three men get out. One is tall and rugged with what might be described as craggy features. Quietly, they enter the dismal hallway. Each has a revolver in his hand. They stop before a door. The tall, rugged one raises his foot with one crashing blow. He kicks the door open. Police! Freeze! Hey, what's the idea? Against the wall. Eddie, Jerry, frisk these animals. Well, hey, look at here. On the table, all these bills. Uh, 
They wouldn't be from the bank job where you killed a guard and two customers, would they? Uh, I don't know how that dough got there. You don't know how that dough got there, look, do you? Look, we'll, we'll, we'll make a deal. All this dough, you keep it. It's not enough. It's 250 grand. There's not enough money in the whole world. <laughs> Cut and print it. That was perfect, Mace. It's a take. Okay, Maxie, you can get up off the floor. Perry, look. Maxie, his mouth bleeding. Hey, what is this? He's hurt. Mace, what'd you do to him? I, I don't know. You must have really hit him. I thought it looked too lifelike. Hey, Max. Max, I'm, I'm sorry. Somebody go get some water. Yeah. Uh, get a doctor. Uh, say, Max, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. What got into you? We're only making a movie. Max. Hmm? What? Oh, oh, good. He's coming around. Oh, what? What happened? Uh, you're going to be all right, Max. You're going to be all right. Hi, Mace. Uh, listen, Perry, maybe you better not call me Mace anymore. This never happened to me before. I, I never lost control in a scene. How's Max? He's okay. It'll be in the papers. Why? There was a reporter on the set from the Trib, a dame. You should have seen her eyes light up. I can see tomorrow's headlines. The violence is not phony in the TV series Captain Mace Hacker Homicide. Boy, that's all I need. That's worth a million bucks in publicity. You know what I'd like to do? Walk away from the show. What, now? You're the hottest series in Hollywood. Perry, I'm scared. Of what? That's just it. I don't know. Uh, maybe you ought to see a shrink. Perry, what do you think of me? Well, I always thought you were a good actor, but now I believe you're great. You get better every week. Yeah, but maybe. But I want the truth. When they first called me into direct a series, it was just another cop story. No better, no worse. But may the good Lord forgive me, we have now become a work of art. Look, Perry, tonight I'm in no mood for soft soap. You've developed something with the show, Mace. You've brought it to a new height of realism. I'll tell you what, I'd like to go back to Broadway and do a play. Ah, in the first place, they'd never let you out of your contract. Second, you're doing some absolutely first-rate acting right now. That's the problem, Perry. I'm no longer sure it is acting. What does that mean? I wish I knew what it meant. It's got to mean something. Yeah. Perry, I've been trained as an actor. And I know that what we create is an illusion. Well, sure. But what if... What if what we create is real? Real? How? In what way? Mm, don't try to nail me down. It's, it's, it's just the... It's just a character. I, I don't know... When I walk off the set, sometimes I get the feeling that I'm not walking away from it. Ah, oh, you're too intense. <laughs> That's no help. Perry, you're a stage actor, a fine one. You've played the classic Shakespeare, Ibsen, Chekhov. You've come out here to do a TV series. You're accused of selling out, of frittering away your talents. So you say to yourself, I'll show these jokers what acting really is. I'll prove that performing as Mace Hacker can be as great as performing Hamlet. That's what you think, huh? And you've proved your point. Now you can relax. Hey, who are you? And, uh... How did you get in here? My name is Irene Fluitt. I was on one of the studio tours. We watched you filming your show. And the guide pointed this out as your dressing room. So I sneaked away from the rest of them and came back here. Uh, the door was open. Oh, uh, yeah. And uh, so here you are. Oh, please don't have me thrown out. I, I never have anybody thrown out. Uh, I'll say to you what I say to the rest of them. If you want a picture with my autograph, I'm glad to oblige. And now, let me open the door for oh, you. Oh, but please... Uh, look, let me explain something. We have a fantastic security system here. Special cops who know exactly how to handle this type of situation. So, if you think you might be able to work this into a big deal, you, you'll never get it off the ground. I don't want your money. I don't want your autograph. And I, 
I don't want you to make love to me. So what's left? I want you to listen. Uh, look, I really don't have any time. I want you to find my husband. Find your husband? He's disappeared. Well, why don't you go to the police? You're the police. What? You're Captain Mace Hacker. No, no, no. I'm Alvin J. Miller. Please, Captain Hacker. Uh, look, Mace Hacker is a character dreamed up by a writer. And I'm just an actor who plays the part. Don't say that. Mace Hacker is a fictional character. No, he is not a fictional character. Mace Hacker is the best detective in the world. There is no Mace Hacker. I see him every week. I believe in him. And now, finally, I'm talking to him. Uh, how would it be if I uh, got you a taxi? No, no, please. But... Please, don't dismiss me as if... As if I were not. I know I sound like one. But I have seen you on television. And I feel your absolute dedication to law and order and, and justice. Oh, those words. Listen... The writers put those words in my mouth. But neither they nor anyone else can put that conviction in your voice. You are Mace Hacker, and you know it. You're the world's best cop, because you've had more experience, more training than any police officer in the world. What are you talking about? What cop has worked on as many crimes as you have? And you've solved them, because you used correct techniques. Look, I really don't have any more time. Oh, please. Please find my husband. Uh, look, Mrs. Uh, Please. Uh, fluid. Uh, uh, you have to understand no. that. I... No, don't turn me down. I have nowhere else to go. Please. Maybe. Maybe they murdered him. Uh, maybe who murdered him? I don't know. But he knew too much. Ab about what? I don't know. But they... They had to get him out of the way. Who had to get him out of the way? They... They did. Who are they? My husband drives a truck. Last Wednesday night, he was very nervous. He couldn't eat his dinner. What's the matter, I asked him. Oh, please, Mrs. Fruitt. No, no, I won't leave here until you listen to me. Look... I'll tell you what I'll do. Mrs. Fluid, let me drive you to your home, and you can tell me about it on the way. This isn't a trick now. You're going to listen to me? You've got to promise. I promise. Turn right here, for Encero Beach. Well, as I was telling you, he was... Very nervous. I guess you could say scared. I asked him what was the matter. At first he wouldn't say anything. And finally he said, Irene, I'm in a jam. Well, what does that mean, I asked. I better not tell you, he said. But I'm your wife, I said. And he said, I got to keep you out of this. And then... Yes? Well, then he just got up from the table and he went out. Where? I don't know. I haven't seen him since. He didn't come home that night. So next morning, I, I went to the police station. Uh -huh. What did they do? Oh, they listened. They wrote everything down. I gave them his picture and that's it. Nothing's happening. How do you know? They're probably doing the very best they can. Well, I don't say they aren't. But their best isn't good enough. Look, all I know is my husband is gone. Look, Mrs. Fluid, he's your husband. Uh, you may feel a special way about him, but the fact is, he was in wrong somewhere. Somehow. He said so himself. He, he told you he was in a jam. But he wouldn't do anything wrong, I know. Oh, this is the house right here. Hey, this is the house. <laughs> Quite a place. Well, ever since we were married, that's all both of us ever wanted. A nice place to live in. Oh, please, won't you come in? Um, I'd like to, but I'm due back for a story conference in about 40 minutes. Oh, please, so... find my husband. What, what makes you think I can? Because you're Captain Mace Hacker. Oh, please, let's not start that all but, over but again. But you are. 
whether you like it or not. Mrs. Ford, I'm sorry. I have to go. You're afraid. Of what? Afraid you'll be unable to live up to your responsibility. What responsibility? Your responsibility to me. What responsibility do I have to you? To me and to the millions who watch you and who believe in you. I, I never asked anyone to believe in me. Oh, but you do. You speak to all of us and you say, I'm here. I'm here to protect you. You can count on me. Now, you know you say that. But those are just words. The, the writer's words. But we believe you. I believe you. There are pretenses which, after a while, become real. If not to the pretender, then to his audience. And why not? So many of us play a role in this life, and there are those of us who are actually paid fabulous sums to do it. They say sometimes you can't tell the real people from the pretenders without a scorecard. Maybe we'll have to issue some in Act Two, which comes shortly. like people to think you are. This is a piece of advice that comes to us from no less a philosopher than Pythagoras himself. And so there must be something to it. But like all these previous nuggets fashioned by the great sages, there's always considerable difficulty, not to mention distance, between the desire and the deed. But I believe you. You are Captain Mace Hacker. I believe you. I said I was sorry. I'll never believe anybody again as long as I live. Uh, Mrs. Floyd. Um, uh, Miss, Mrs. Floyd? <laughs> Mrs. Floyd. Mrs. Floyd? Yes. Uh, you must let me apologize. For what? That's it. I I don't even know for what. Uh, but I have this feeling I've done something wrong. Uh, uh, may I come in? Say, this is a beautiful home you have here. We're very proud of it. Look, you don't really have to apologize to me. Uh, I realize what I did was quite silly. It, it's just that I'm desperate. I don't know where to turn. Oh, I would offer you a drink, except I know you never take one. That's right. Um, I, I'll tell you what you could offer me, though. Whatever it is I'm smelling, it must be delicious. Oh, that's dinner. I just left it to simmer on the stove. What is it? Beef stew. You see, ever since I became Mace Hacker, whenever I go out to eat, wherever I go, I'm recognized. I can never enjoy a meal. Well, would you care for some? Well, thank you. And uh, why don't you tell me more about your husband? All right. I want to do the scene between Hacker and Inspector Kelly again. We have practically the same dialogue in every show. You should be able to do it in your sleep. So let's do it in one take. Roll them. May Hacker, script 28, scene 27, take two. Action. First, Mrs. Fluett, you tell me your husband drives a truck. Then I find out you live in this fantastic house in very exclusive Encero Beach. Cut! Hey, where do those lines come from, Mace? What? 
Mace, what script are we doing? Uh, I, I don't... Who is Mrs. Fluitt? Uh, Mrs. Fluitt? Yeah, whose husband drives a truck. Mace, none of this is in the script. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I realize that. You okay? Yeah, yeah, sure. I, uh, I, I just must have been thinking about something. You want to take a break? No, 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 no. It's, it's okay. I'll be all right. Um, uh, let's take it again. Uh, hello, Mrs. Fluitt. Oh, uh, good evening. Uh, you mind if I come in? Uh, no, not at all. Uh, Mrs. Fluitt, I want you to tell me the truth. About what? About your husband. I told you everything. You told me he drives a truck. Yes, that's right. Uh, well, what other source of income does he have? None that I know of. I checked the records at City Hall. You bought this house for $170,000. Yes, we did. On a truck driver's salary? Well, he makes very good money. Not that good. He told me he came into some inheritance. An aunt of his died. Who was she? I don't know. I never met her. Well, well he never did either. She lived in England. Who does your husband work for? Kazmaier. W.J. Kazmaier. Uh -huh. What kind of outfit is it? Oh, they import novelties. You know, all sorts of little souvenir type items from the Far East. Mm -hmm. It's a warehouse, huh? Yes, I, I think so. Mm -hmm. I see. And he drives his stuff from there to various stores and so forth? Well, I would imagine so. It, it seems to me you don't know very much about it. Well, he... He never talked much about his job. Mm -hmm. And you never wondered about where all the money was coming from? I was brought up in a family where a woman never asked her husband such questions. Uh, who have you been talking to downtown at police headquarters? A certain Inspector Rockfield. Rockfield, huh? Do you know him? Inspector Rockfield? Who? Oh, yeah, yeah, anytime. Send him right in here. Mace Hacker, come right on in and sit yourself down. Thanks, Inspector. Hey, uh, before I forget, September 23rd is a date for the annual PBA affair. I know the men will want you for guest of honor as usual. Sure. Mace, <laughs> isn't it remarkable how I instinctively call you Mace? It's just because you happen to be so real to all of us in the department. Uh, Inspector. Hey, I, uh, I guess you want my comments on the next script. Usually Perry calls me up about that. As usual, I've got nothing to say. Oh, a couple of little nitpicky things, but I don't even know if it pays to bring them up. Yeah, uh, Inspector, could I ask you a question? Yeah, sure. Uh, what's being done on the George Fluitt case? The what? The George Fluitt disappearance. George Fluitt? That name doesn't ring a bell. Is it, uh, something recent? It's very recent, Inspector. George Fluitt? Doesn't mean a thing. Well, I've been talking to his wife. She says she's been in here to see you. Well, we get hundreds of these things, and, uh, I see Fluitt, Fluitt. Let me think, uh... Oh, oh yeah, yeah. He, he did disappear then. So she claims. She said he was nervous, scared, in a jam of some sort. Yeah, yeah, I remember. That's what she said to me. Uh huh. Well, hey, we get twenty, thirty disappearances a month like that. You know why? No. Your average guy who disappears. Fades out for two reasons. They both begin with a D. Dames or debts. So his wife, his mother, his sister, his girlfriend, whoever's left holding the bag, she comes in here to try to sweeten the pot. They figure if they can throw a little mystery into it, a little hint of homicide, 
Maybe we'll try harder. Uh, so what you're saying is you don't believe her? What I'm saying is, don't worry about it, Mace. <laughs> so what's so funny? <laughs> That's exactly like the line in your show. When your boss, Inspector Kelly, tries to touch you off a case, don't worry about it, Mace. Yeah, and I always answer, okay, but do you mind if I scout around a little bit? Uh, well? What, Mace? Do you? Do you mind if I scout around a little bit? Yeah. Who? Oh. Oh, what are you talking about? I can't believe it. It must be a joke. Yeah. Oh, all right, send him in. Mace Hacker? Uh, Mr. Kazmaier. Why, this? It is Mace Hacker. Uh, do you mind if I come in? Uh, oh, oh, sure, sure, sure. Come on in. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, sit down. <laughs> oh, what can I do for you? I want to talk to you about George Fluid. George Fluid? I understand he drove a truck for you. Oh, yeah, 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 he did. What do you know about him? <laughs> All I know is he, he hasn't been into work for over a week now. Uh -huh. Do you have any idea why? No. Mm, was he in any kind of trouble that you know of? Trouble? <laughs> no, no, not at all. Uh, are you in any sort of trouble, Mr. Kazmaier? Me? In, in trouble? <laughs> what kind of a question is that? <laughs> a very simple question. Now, wait a minute. Are you, are you uh, actually working with the police? You didn't answer the question. Oh, no. No. I, I'm not in any trouble. Mm -hmm. I may be back. Thank you, Mr. Kazmaier. You've been a lot of help. You, uh, resting? Oh, no, no, no. Just going over my lines. Uh, come on in, Perry. When am I doing the set? You've gotten about an hour. Listen, I, uh, I got a phone call from that cop. You know, the technical advisor for the series, Roxfield. Yeah. Yeah, kind of weird thing. He said you'd been in to see him. That's right. About a real case. And he had this crazy notion that you were actually talking to him like a cop who wanted to work on it. Well, they're not doing anything on it. If, if you ask me, this guy's been murdered. How do you know the guy's been murdered? Call it one of my famous hacker hunches. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. You can't go around on the assumption you're a real cop. And she's not even a good-looking dame. Who isn't? I'm putting a couple of things together. First, you throw some lines into a script about a dame named Mrs. Fluitt. All this out of left field. Then later, the inspector calls me and tells me you're trying to involve yourself in the disappearance of a guy named George Fluitt. So I drove out to look. Who is this Mrs. Fluitt to you? She asked me to find him. Why you? Because to her, I'm a cop named Mace Hacker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can understand that. To her, you're Mace Hacker. But who are you to you? Who, who am I? Yeah. Who are you? Is he? All during our story so far, we've had little bits and pieces of suggestion, innuendo, even a certain amount of hard evidence. But the central question remains, as it must, until, of course, we solve it one way or another in Act Three shortly. Most 
of us are fated to live out our fantasies in private. However, here we have an actor named Alvin J. Miller, who plays the role of a television cop named Mace Hacker so convincingly that quite a few people have come to think of him as Mace Hacker. Indeed, their number has become so large that he's beginning to believe it himself. What are you trying to do, Mace? I'm going to find the killer of George Fluitt. But you're not... I'm not what? You're not a real cop. I'm Mace Hacker. Now, listen. It happens. It happens to all of them sometimes, especially to actors who play doctors and detectives. You get so involved in it, after a while it seems to be real. It is real. No, it is not. It's just a story that comes up on a screen for an hour, and it's gone. You turn off the picture, and it's all gone. But I'm still here. Mace Hacker is still here. Uh, a lot of this is my fault. I've been working it too hard. Listen, maybe you'd better... Uh, I, I know what you're going to say. Maybe I should see a doctor. Why not? Why should you be the only big star that's never been to a shrink? Mace Hacker has to help this woman. Why? Because she's getting the runaround from everybody else. Tell me, Mrs. Fluid, have the police been out here to see you? No. Do they know where you live? Yes, they must. They took down my address. Mm -hmm. They know where your husband works? Yes, yes, it's all in the form I filled out. Uh, how did your husband get along with his employer, uh, uh, Mr. Kazmaier? All right, I suppose. You suppose? Well, I told you, he would never talk about business. I would assume if they didn't get along, Mr. Kazmaier would have fired him. It's that simple, isn't it? <laughs> you live in a simple world, Mrs. Lord. I'm sorry. And you still insist you have no idea why your husband should have been nervous or frightened that night? No, sir. Mm -hmm. Just exactly how much did your husband make a week? I told you, he never discussed business with me. What did you do for money? He gave me some to run the household. How much? As much as I needed. How much did it come to? Oh, about... Two hundred dollars a week. Uh -huh. And he paid all the bills? Yes, I suppose so. Did he keep any papers around the house? I, I don't know. You don't know? I keep telling you I don't know anything about business. But you know about this. Hmm? It's a light switch, see? It turns on the electricity. You have to pay the utility company money for it, right? And, yeah. and this, see? It's a telephone. And it happens to be in working order. And every month, the company sends you a bill. Well, well, yes, but... There's a mortgage on this house, and every month, the bank has to be paid. So where are all these bills kept? W where's your husband's checkbook? Where does he keep his records? I told you, I don't know. You're lying. You have no right to talk to me like that. How much does your husband take home a week? Not enough to give you 200 for your pocketbook. Not enough to maintain a place like this. So where does the money come from? I don't know. You never asked yourself, how does a truck driver pay for this kind of a setup? I told you there was a legacy. What legacy? Where's the letter from the lawyer? I never asked him. You never asked him anything. Because you didn't want to know. But you knew there had to be something dishonest going on. No, I... I... You're living in this house three years now, Mrs. Fluid. Where did you live before? And please don't tell me you don't remember. I didn't say that. You had a two-room flat over on Vanderlee. Mm, not such a hot neighborhood. Your, your husband worked for a big national outfit, Universal Transport. But everything changed the day he took the job with Kazmaier. Didn't it? Didn't it? Yes. Why? What do you want me to tell you? The truth. The truth. Well, I... I taught at Downstate. I was one of those 
plain-looking girls who did well at school, but not so good at other things. Like dates. It's an old story. Mm, they're the best kind. All my friends said it couldn't work. He and I. Oh, we were from two different worlds. He'd never even finished high school. But he was a man. And he was handsome. And he... I guess... He was in awe of me. Can you imagine? Yeah. He just couldn't believe his good luck. That someone like me could be attracted to someone like him. At first, I couldn't believe it myself. I come from a very poor background. I worked hard to put myself through school. I always yearned for nice things. Mm -hmm. And so you started to demand them. It's funny how it worked. I never said one word. <laughs> that can be the loudest demand of all. That's right. The money started to roll in. It's the only way I can describe it. And you never asked him a single question. I couldn't. Why not? Because I had to justify it to myself. And so I created a kind of make-believe world where everything was all right. And then when he disappeared, I couldn't accept it. So I also had to go to a make-believe detective. What else can I tell you? I guess you told me everything. <laughs> Inspector Rockfield, how are you doing on the fluid case? Look, Mace. No. You look. She walks in here. She says, my husband disappeared. She shows you his picture, a real handsome guy. You look at her, a very plain Jane. So you say to yourself, simple, he walked out on her. That's what you said, wasn't it? Now, wait a minute. That's you... how you wrote it off. Who says we you wrote You take down all the information as a matter of form. George Fluitt, truck driver, 37 Primrose Way in Cerro Beach, age 36. Employer, Kazmaier, Inc. You wouldn't happen to go for this dame, would you? And then you took the sheet of paper and dropped it into the files. There's a terrific story on that sheet of paper. But nobody around here bothered to read it. What story? How does a truck driver make enough money to live in a house on Encero Beach? What kind of salary does he get at Kazmaier? Is he moonlighting? If so, at what? If not, why is he worth so much to Kazmaier? Kazmaier imports novelties from the Far East. So, what else could they be importing? A oh, hundred questions. But how many did you ever ask yourselves? None. Now look, this investigation is proceeding along in an orderly manner. Hey, you wouldn't kid an old buddy, would you? I'm telling you, the secret lies at Kazmaier. Oh. Uh, what are you doing here? Good evening, Mr. Kazmaier. What are you doing here? You again, the one who plays a detective. Uh, you haven't answered my question. What are you doing here? Oh, I got every right to be here. This happens to be my warehouse. Uh-huh. You keep very late hours. That's how to get ahead in this world. How'd you get in? I, uh, Jimmy'd open a window in the back. Well, the burglar alarm must be out of order. No, 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 it's fine. I, uh, happen to know what to do about burglar alarms. Oh. Is there any reason why I shouldn't call the police? Absolutely. Because I'd tell him what I was looking for. Oh, yeah? What are you looking for? Look, Kazmaier, you and I could save a lot of time if you told me. Uh, drugs? Diamonds, is it? Or counterfeit? 
<laughs> you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay, you uh, caught me robbing your warehouse, so call the cops. Nah. No, why not? If you're on the level. Oh, you're a famous television detective. What are you looking for, publicity? Why should I give it to you? Why? Because this is a perfect setup for something crooked. You're a reputable businessman. Nobody bothers you. Maybe your truck driver figures it out. Maybe it was his idea. Anyhow, he is in on it. He started making a lot of money. Now, you tell me the rest. Uh, was he becoming too greedy? Hmm? Too dangerous? Or, or maybe the other thing. Maybe his conscience started to bother him. Maybe he wanted to get out. Huh? No, Kazmaier, don't try to open that desk drawer and just keep your hands exactly where I can see them. That uh, gun of yours, is that the one you use in the show? <laughs> is it loaded with real bullets or blanks? Mine has live ammunition. I'm betting yours doesn't. Should we find out? It doesn't matter. They're wise to you. Nobody's wise to me except maybe you. In a little while, you're not going to make too much difference. You killed him, didn't you? Yeah, he's beginning to ask for too much money. He married a lady with very expensive tastes. Where'd you hide his body? Same place I'm going to hide yours. Come on, let's go. What makes you think I'm going quietly? I'd hate to have to drag your body out to my car. So why should I make it easy for you? Okay, have it your way. Uh, don't shoot, Inspector. We can take him alive. What? You kill him. I'm uh, sorry, Mr. Kazmaier. <laughs> you fell for the oldest trick in the book. Listen, listen, look. We can we could make a deal. What kind of deal? In a warehouse. I, I I got a shipment of drugs. You were right. A half a million dollars just for you. It's not enough. I'd right, name your price. There isn't enough money in the whole world, Kazmaier. And just don't you make a move. Yeah? Uh, Give me Inspector Rockfield. Mace, it's absolutely fantastic. You actually found the killer of this fellow Fluid. You solved the case. Yeah. Well, how'd you do it? Oh, how do I always do it? Uh, just routine police work. Oh, the media's eating it up. The whole country's talking about it. It was a good show. What was a good show? Listen, Perry, for a while back there, the scripts were all beginning to sound the same. But this time, the writers really wrote a great one. About Irene Fluitt and her husband. Mays, that wasn't... That wasn't a show. You never even meet the guy, but... You know, you can picture the whole relationship he has with his wife. <laughs> the writers could only come up with something like that every week. We're ready on the set, Perry. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, okay. You ready, Mace? You know me, Perry. I'm always ready. All right, everybody. Places. Roll them. Mace Hacker, script number 52, scene one, take one. <laughs> The problem. Does any of us really know who we are and where we are? It's all rather complex, you know. It would be relatively simple if we knew the difference between reality and illusion. At one time, the separation was quite obvious. Now, it may not even exist. But I do, and I shall return shortly. At one time, our heroes were drawn from real life. They were real people who did real things. Buffalo Bill actually rode a horse in the wild, untamed West and shot Buffalo. Today, our Western heroes are movie stars. Our great soldiers are movie stars. Our great doctors and detectives and lawyers are movie stars. And we invest these shadows on the screen with reality. And it isn't necessarily their fault if we take their make-believe seriously. And if 
After a while, they do too. Our cast included Fred Gwynn, Joyce Gordon, Robert Dryden, and Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Keeper of the book is ready to unlock the ponderous volume in which is recorded all the secrets and mysteries of mankind through the ages. All the lore and learning of the ancients. All the strange and mystifying stories of the past, the present, and the future. of the book. What tale will you tell us this time? First, I must unlock the great padlock which keeps the sealed book safe from prying eyes. <laughs> now, what story shall I tell you? I have here tales of every kind. Tales of murder, of madness, of dark deeds, and of events strange beyond all belief. <laughs> there. Now let me see. Yes. Yes. Here's a tale for you. A dark story of two brothers. One of them killed because he could not help himself. The other one was interested in murder, too, but in a very different way. The title of the tale is... The Hands of Death. <laughs> Here is the tale as it is written in the sealed book. It began in San Francisco on a night of thick suffocating fog. A young man hurrying homeward turns a corner 
and bumps abruptly into a huge figure striding toward him. Oh, oh. oh excuse me. Fog is so thick I didn't see you. It's all right. Uh, tell me, do you live here? Hmm? Uh, here in San Francisco? Why? Well, yes, I do. Do you know where Edward Morlock lives now? Why? No, I... No, I never heard of him. Now, if you'll excuse uh, me, but... Wait. But I, I've really got to get home. And... I just want a light from your cigarette. Oh, of course. Here, I'll hold it for you. Uh, just hold it like that. <coughs> what is it? What's the matter? Nothing. It, it's nothing. It's my hands, isn't it? They frightened you. No, no, it's it, it's nothing. My hands, they disgusted you. No, no, of course not. They frightened you because they're not like other people's hands. No, no, no let go of me. I assure you that... I, you I, thought I was a freak. Let go of me. You're crazy. You, I'm not crazy, do you hear? I'll show you. No, no. I'll show you. <laughs> So, the Phantom Strangler is at work in San Francisco. Hmm. Jennings will be interested in that. I beg your pardon, <laughs> Mr. Morlock. Huh? Oh, yes, Jennings? Uh, the postman just brought this package, sir. Oh, package, eh? Give it to me. Yes, sir. Now, wheel me over to the window. Of course, sir. Ah, this is close enough, Jennings. Uh, this package, I suppose you noticed it came from my agent in New York? Yes, sir, I did. Then perhaps you can guess what's in it. Hey, Jennings? No, sir, but I have no doubt it's another nice addition to your collection of objects of having to do with famous murders, sir. <laughs> yes, indeed, a nice addition. But speaking of murders, uh, have you seen this morning's San Francisco paper yet? No, sir. Well, look at these headlines. Uh, read them out loud. Playboy murdered in fog. Phantom strangler breaks victim's neck. <laughs> then he's back. Your brother Kane is back. Yes, back in San Francisco, looking for me. And he'll keep looking for you. And if he finds you, he'll kill you. Yes, he's dedicated his life to that purpose. And all because he feels I cheated him out of his share of the money our father left us. Oh, it's a great pity. Yes, sir. Of course, we know the truth. Quite so. As you say, we know the truth. However, I hardly think Kane will find me here. No, sir. So we'll forget about him. Uh, Jennings, tomorrow afternoon, a neighbor is dropping in for tea. A neighbor, sir? Yes, Inspector Tennant, the head of the local police force. He's coming to view my little collection. Of course, sir. He may bring a friend with him... So have plenty of everything? Yes, sir. Well, that's all. What are you waiting for? Excuse me, sir. I, I wanted to speak to you about this check you gave me yesterday for my month's salary. Well, what about it? It's for the usual 500, isn't it? Yes, sir, but uh, you see, Mr. Morlock, I, I've been thinking in these times I ought to have more. More? Just how much do you consider your services worth, Jennings? Shall we say a thousand a month? A thousand a month? It's quite reasonable, I think. After all, if I were to tell the authorities all I know about your father's will and how it happened that the entire fortune came to you and none to Cain... Never mind, I... Jennings. I'll make out another check. Thank you, sir. But be careful you don't drive me too far. Or you may regret it. Oh, I think I'll be safe enough, Mr. Morlock. After all, confined to that wheelchair as you are, you need me. That's enough. You'll get your check later. Yes, sir. Very good, Mr. Morlock. Mm. So you're getting greedy, are you, Jennings? I must find some way to discourage you. Yes. Some way to discourage you. <laughs> Afternoon, Edward Morlock, the strange crippled collector of murder relics, enjoyed himself thoroughly playing host to police inspector Tennant and Mr. Norman Smith, the criminologist friend of his. 
he began by showing them his latest acquisition, the one that had come by mail just the day before. And uh, now, gentlemen, look. A cashmere shawl? Yes, but no ordinary cashmere shawl. Until last month, it was owned by two very old sisters who lived in a dingy house in Baltimore. In Baltimore? Yes. You mean that's the shawl? Exactly, gentlemen. That's the shawl with which the two old ladies were strangled by a sneak thief. Well, I'll be darned. It's a prize worthy even of my collection, which is, I flatter myself, the most complete of its kind ever assembled. Funny hobby, I'd call it. (laughs) Every man to his taste, Inspector. Murder is your business, but it's my hobby. Now, if you'll just pull back those curtains there, the rest of my collection is on the shelves behind them. These curtains? That's right. <laughs> well, I'll be <laughs> jiggered. Mm, this is most interesting, Mr. Morlock. Yes, I knew you'd think so. Look there on the wall. An authentic headsman's axe. It was used in the brutal murder of the Baron de Morley, uh, an ancestor of mine in the 15th century. And right there below it is the blood-stained dress worn by one of the victims of Jack the Ripper. And on the next shelf, you see... And so there, gentlemen, you have the highlights of my collection... How do you like them? Well, if that's the sort of thing you're interested in, I'll say your collection does seem complete. It Thank is you. indeed. In fact, there's really nothing missing except perhaps a murderer and a victim. What did you say? That the only thing missing from your collection is a murderer and a victim. <laughs> the most interesting thought, Mr. Smith. And after all, why not? Why not what? Oh, excuse me, Inspector. I was just thinking out loud. Oh. Well, I'm afraid we got to go now, Morlock. Eh, hey, Smith? Yes, you're right, Inspector. It's been a great pleasure having you, gentlemen. And I do hope you'll call again. Yes, Mr. Morlock, you rang. Yes, Jennings. Before you help me to bed, I want you to mail these letters. Yes, sir. They are to major newspapers in San Francisco and contain a message to be inserted in their personal columns. A message? Yes, to my brother, Kane. We used to communicate this way in the past. But, uh, what... uh, here is a copy of the message. You may read it. If the gentleman with the unusual hand will visit his brother in Santa Villa, he will learn something to his advantage. <laughs> You're inviting him here? Exactly. You've decided to play safe, to trap him, and turn him over to the police? <laughs> oh, that's clever of you, Jennings. Yes, very clever. But you've already proved you're clever, haven't you? Now, just take these letters out and mail them, and soon, quite soon, I think, we shall be seeing my dear brother Kane again.
now for the rest of my story. The Hand of Death, as it is written in the sealed book. After Edward Morlock had put into effect his plan to bring his brother Cain to him, he sat in his wheelchair and waited. Seeming much amused at some secret thought of his own. One day passed. Then two. Then three. And then the newspapers carried strange new headlines. Hey, Craig, read all about it. Phantom Strangler in Los Angeles. Extra, read all about it. <laughs> So Brother Kane was in Los Angeles last night, Jennings. Eh, he's getting closer. I shouldn't be surprised if he arrived here tonight. I, I don't like it. Oh, nonsense, Jennings. You know you've got nothing to fear from Kane, Unless, of course, you're so careless as to make some remark about his hands. I know, but he intends to kill you. I think I'll be able to control him. I want you to bring me a glass of milk. Kane is very fond of milk. Glass of milk? With a triple dose of sleeping powder in it. But I don't understand. Never mind, just do as I say. Uh, what's that? I imagine that's Kane now. Kane? Here already? Quick, I'll let him in. You get that glass of milk ready. And bring it in when I ring. Y yes, sir. When you ring, sir. Oh, come in, Kane. I've unlocked the window. Yes, I'll come in, Edward, now that I've found you at last. Well, I'd hardly say you found me, Kane. Uh, I sent for you. It's the same thing. Now I'm where I can put my hands around your throat at last. I'm going to kill you. Do you hear? Kill you. Kane, sit down. And what? Sit down. I want to talk to you. All right, I'll sit down, but... You can't change my mind. Tell me, Kane, how many people have you killed since you got out of the penitentiary? Seven. Seven murders? They looked at my hands. They were disgusted. I didn't kill them. My hands did. You hear? I didn't want to kill them. But my hands killed them anyway. Why, of course I understand. Your hands. Your great-grandfather had hands like yours, you know, Cain. Don't talk about it anymore. Of course not, Cain. But you must be hungry. I'll ring for Jennings. He'll fix something for you. Yes, I am hungry. But please, Cain, don't startle the poor fellow... You know, he's very much afraid of you. Why? Why is he afraid of me? It's your hands. He says they give him nightmares. My hands give him nightmares? Oh, you mustn't blame him, Kane. He can't help it. My hands give him nightmares. Yes, sir. I've brought you a glass of milk, Mr. Morlock. My hands frighten me. Oh, thank you, Jennings. Uh, just put it down here. Yes, sir. Uh, why are you looking at me like that, Jennings? I, I'm not looking at you, Mr. Kane. You're looking at my hands. They upset you. They give you nightmares. No, 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 Mr. Kane. That's not true. I'll show you. I'll give you a reason to be afraid of my hands. Mr. Mark, help me. I'll no. show you. I'll Let show you. Let go. You're you. kidding. Help. There. That'll teach you to be afraid of my hands. You can let him go now, Cain. He's dead. My hands, they've killed again. Yes, he's dead. Oh, you've been very wicked, Cain. I didn't want to kill him. My hands did it. My hands, you hear? You must be quiet now, Cain. You must rest. I didn't want to kill him. Here, drink this milk. Then lie down and rest for a while. We'll talk some more in the morning. All right. I'll drink it. I'll take care of everything. Oh. That's right, Cain. Lie back and sleep. Sleep soundly. <laughs> so you would blackmail me, would you, Jennings? And you would kill me, would you, Cain? But I've been too clever for both of you. <laughs> Hello. Hello, police headquarters. 
Connect me with Inspector Tennant, please. I want to report a murder. And so, there you are, Inspector. Came's in the penitentiary for assault with intent to kill. Apparently, he escaped since then. He's been seeking for me, meaning to kill me. Good heavens, Morlock. Then he's the strangler who's been doing all these killings. Yes, I'm afraid so. Oh, and I never guessed until he showed up tonight to kill me because he thought, you see, quite wrongly, that I had cheated him of his inheritance. Jennings bravely came to my rescue and Kane throttled him. Then I tricked Kane into drinking some drugged milk and... Well, there you are. But why, man? Why? Why did he kill all these people? Because of his hands. His hands? Well, you saw his hands... Tremendously strong. Not hands at all, really, but more like demon's claws. Kane is morbidly sensitive about his deformity. When he feels someone is frightened by his hands, he kills them. Just like that. It's a good thing we got him at last. You can take him along now quite safely. But be sure to keep him well locked up, Inspector. And don't let anyone get within reach of his hands. A few weeks later, Kane Morlock entered the lethal chamber of the state penitentiary. Edward Morlock, the condemned man's invalid brother, was one of the few spectators. Kane Morlock, with his last breath, Cursed his brother and swore that someday he would be avenged. Then he died. The following day, Inspector Tennant and his friend Norman Smith paid Edward Morlock another visit. Oh, good evening, Inspector and Mr. Smith. It's very kind of you to stop by tonight. We dropped in to see how you were making out, Mr. Morlock. Thought maybe, what with your trip yesterday and the shock, that perhaps... Oh, no, 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 I'm quite all right, thank you. What must be, must be. You see, I'm a philosopher. You have somebody looking after you? Yes, Philippe. A Filipino boy is taking poor Jennings' place. Oh, and uh, gentlemen, that reminds me. I have something here that will interest you. Mm -hmm. Something that'll interest us? Yes, here on the table beside me. Uh, This jar... A burial urn, isn't it, Mr. Morlock? Exactly. And in this burial urn are the ashes of poor murdered Jennings. Jennings' ashes? Yes. You mean you're going to keep them with you? What, of course, gentlemen. I was very fond of Jennings, very fond. What more fitting than that I should keep his ashes to remind me of his years of faithful service? Besides, well, I can always look upon them as part of my little collection. Your collection? Yes, Inspector. It was Mr. Smith here who pointed out that complete as it was, it lacked both a murderer and his victim. Well, here are the ashes of the victim. Great heavens. (laughs) It's rather a unique item, Mr. Morlock. Yes, indeed, an item any collector would be proud of. But the really choice addition to my collection is here in this box, which just arrived. Uh, Would you care to look at it, gentlemen? What in the world? Now you needn't guess. (laughs) I'll lift the lid and... uh... See. Merciful heavens. A pair of hands. The hands of your brother Cain. Exactly. I can't believe it. But what is so strange about it, gentlemen? There are the ashes of a murder victim. Here are the unique and terrible hands that throttled him. Where in all the world will you find a collector who can boast such items as these? You must be mad. (laughs) Morlock, did you plan all this from beginning to end? Plan it, Mr. Smith. But how could I? You're quite mad. We could never prove it. You could prove nothing. (laughs) Nothing. Inspector, I think we'd better go. Yes. Come on, let's get out of here before I do something I'd regret. Call again any time, gentlemen. <laughs> Easily upset, weren't they, Kane? Upset by your hands. Your great, strong hands that are going to become the prize items of my little collection. The distorted hands of a murderer. Ooh, how cold they are. And yet I can almost feel the murderous strength in them still. You wanted so bad that he closed your hands about my throat, didn't you, Cain? But it's too late now. You're dead. 
And your hands are dead, too. Lifeless. Would you like to see how your hands look at my throat here? I'll place them there for you. See how nicely they fit around my neck. Just as if they... No! 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 Let, let go of me! Your hands! They're choking me! I... I can't breathe! I... Warlock, what is it? Where are you? Inspector, look. They're, they're on the floor. Good Lord. It's Morlock. And... No. No, it can't be. His brother's hands are clutched around his throat. They've strangled him. <laughs> and that is the story of the hands of death as it is written in the sealed book. Edward Morlock was quite dead when they found him, with his brother's severed hands about his throat. But they called his death heart failure. <laughs> For who would believe that two dead hands by themselves could wreak the vengeance that Cain Morlock swore to have before he died? <laughs> And perhaps it was heart failure. <laughs> perhaps Edward Morlock, thinking he felt the hands move, died of sheer terror. <laughs> You'll have to decide for yourself which is true. The answer is not written here. <laughs> but the sound of the great gong... Tells me I must lock the book once again. One moment, keeper of the book. What story from the sealed book will you tell us next time? Next time? <laughs> Are you sure you want to know? Perhaps my next story will be about you. For I have here all the stories that ever happened, and many that have not yet come to pass. But I'll find one for you in just a moment. Keeper of the book. Have you found the story that you'll tell us next time? Yes, yes, I found one. It's a story about a man who found the secret of immortality, of life everlasting, and how he tried to use it to make himself master of the earth. The title of the tale is The King of the World. <laughs> be sure to be with us again next time. And the great gong heralds another strange and exciting story from 
<laughs> the sealed book. The sealed book, written by Bob Arthur and David Cogan, is produced and directed by Jock McGregor. Now, the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California presents. Suspense. Tonight, Roma Wines bring you Mr. Joseph Cotton as star of The Earth is Made of Glass, a suspense play produced, edited, and directed for Roma Wines by William Spear. Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills, is presented for your enjoyment by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. Those excellent California wines that can add so much pleasantness to the way you live, to your happiness and entertaining guests, to your enjoyment of everyday meals. Yes, right now a glass full would be very pleasant, as Roma Wines bring you Mr. Joseph Cotton in a remarkable tale of... Suspense! Good morning, Dr. West. Good morning, Miss Adams. Well, there's one bed vacant this morning. I see that 4.36, Mr. Steele died, 4 a.m. Yes, I, I was there. Coronary thrombosis. You're not terribly concerned, Dr. West? Why should I be especially concerned? Well, the day nurse, Miss Rosenberg, said that you and Mr. Steele... You girls were... gossip too much. Yes, Doctor. But I understand there's no family. What am I going to do with Mr. Steele's things? What things? Well, his overcoat... This parcel was in it, this book. He said it was his journal, and he told Miss Rosenberg you were to have it. He said it had important scientific data. And... Well, I'll give it here. Yes, Doctor. Journal of Richard Thomas Steele. <laughs> important scientific data, I'll bet. I still can't figure out what was eating that guy. What he had to say to me that was so darned important. What do people want to keep diaries? <laughs> July 26th. Not a fruitful day. The weather this morning was heavy, sticky. <laughs> Lord knows what crazy stuff he's written here. July 26, not a fruitful day. The weather this morning was heavy, sticky. I stayed indoors with the blinds drawn, spent three and a half hours arranging and cataloging a shipment of books. And I must say, I gloated over my new volume of bacon, gold leaf, uncut, 1836... A treasure. In the afternoon, I ventured out to play chess with Elliot. Uh, he's an uninspired player and a worse conversationalist. I'm appalled that a man of Elliot's pretensions still wallows in 18th and 19th century thought patterns, twaddle in sentimentality. He's totally unaware of the potentialities of modern science. It was so apparent to me when we got into that argument over Ralph Waldo Emerson. I was thumbing through a volume he had of Emerson's essays, a cheap reprint at that. And I was annoyed by a paragraph in the essay called Compensation. I must have snorted because Elliot fairly leaped at me. Well, certainly I think there's compensation for everything. Tit for tat, measure for measure, love for love. Do you contend, Elliot, that no matter what a man does, it comes back to him? Well, one way or another, yes, yes, it does. Then if I do good, I get good back? Yes, I believe that, Richard. And if I commit a crime, I'm of necessity punished? Well, it depends what you mean by punishment. I mean that I will suffer somehow for the evil I do. Isn't that what Emerson says? I want to know what you believe. Well, I believe what he says. Well, I'll read what he says. Discount the poetry, old man. He used lush language. Emerson says, Commit a crime and the earth is made of glass. Commit a crime and it seems as if a coat of snow fell on the ground such as reveals in the woods the tracks of every partridge and fox and squirrel and mole. You cannot recall the spoken word... You cannot wipe out the foot track. You cannot draw up, up the ladder so as to leave no inlet or clue. Some damning circumstance always transpires. The laws and substance of nature, water, snow, wind, gravitation, become penalties to the thief. Well, Elliot? Beautiful, isn't it? Uh, you read very well. Don't try to turn me off, Elliot. We're discussing his theory. I, I don't see how there can be any argument. We know... We know a good deal more than Emerson, you old fellow especially about the laws and substances of nature. We've tested the substances, learned control over the laws, the scientific method, Elliot. It cancels out every word your friend Emerson wrote. Let's say, 
in conversation. Oh, the scientific method. I'd like to see it applied to some situations in nature, or to human nature. All right. Uh, say you commit a murder. A murder, very well. Say I do. Well, if you aren't caught by the police, and that can be managed by an intelligent man, you still won't escape. Oh, call it your conscience. That's what Emerson means. But say I commit a laboratory murder. What kind of a murder is that? Let me put it this way. When the police catch a murderer, they, they have found a connection between the murderer and his victim. Motive and clues, right? Mm. And when a murderer is caught by his conscience, it is still because he is connected with his victim through his emotions. Mm, I agree so far. Well, how is a murderer caught if he is in no way connected with his victim? Well, that's not possible. I don't know. There could be a pure abstract murder, a murder occurring in almost a vacuum, a murder in which the only connection between the two participants is the unadulterated act of killing. July 28th. The weather continues warm, humidity high. Today I roamed around my library, read a little, thought a great deal. It's odd that I should keep referring back to my conversation with Elliot. Abstract murder. A laboratory murder. I jotted down one or two theoretical points today. It will be an amusing project in such hot weather. July 29th. What utter nonsense to think as I have of a, of a laboratory experiment carried out in writing on paper. It's a contradiction in terms. The core of the scientific method is to prove theory in life. So, let us prove the possibility of a pure murder. It must be someone met in an emotional and material vacuum. Someone with whom I have no connection. Someone whom I have no possible reason to kill. The preparations for such a murder are, are of necessity classically simple. This afternoon, I bought my equipment. Gloves, sir? Uh, what kind of gloves? Oh, any kind of glove. But what do you want them for? Driving? Gardening? I want gloves I can use for anything. Well, uh, we call these utility yes, gloves. Yes, uh, those will be excellent. Thank you. Uh, what size, sir? Any size, medium. Well, now, these look just... No, 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 I, I don't want to try them on. I, I'll take them as they are. Just wrap them up. Yes, sir. Just as you say. You know, I'm very fond of a genuine old-fashioned hardware store, Mr. Jeremy. Like yours? Yes, and a lot of people tell me that, Mr. Steele. Yeah. Mm. Anything special you're looking for? I don't know. I suppose I'm just browsing. Mm, yes, sir. Oh, what are those? Uh, ice picks? Yes, sir, and pre-war metal, uh, too. You want one? No, no, I, I have one. Uh, my, quite a selection. Screwdrivers? And, uh, uh, there's something I want. Oh, a knife? One of those. Well, to be fair with you now, those are pretty poor knives. Doesn't matter. Well, just no darn good as far as I can see. The best possible recommendation, Mr. Jeremy. I'll take it. Mm. Meaningless knife, all-purpose gloves, knife and gloves new, factory-made, uncontaminated by human association, smelling only of the harsh, impersonal machines which turn them out. My first safeguards against the intrusion of emotion. In a laboratory, this procedure would be called controls. To complete the controls, who would it be? I must never see his or her face. I must never know his or her name, age, occupation, thoughts, or desires. I must come into contact with this victim as casually as though we were blown together by the wind. There can be no selection, no volition on my part except the elementary volition necessary to raise my arm to kill. July 30th. The exact record of what has occurred. I must write it down now while it is fresh in my mind. I will be absolutely precise and objective. Very well. Tonight, at some undetermined hour after dinner, I left my house on 74th Street with a new gloves and knife in my right-hand coat pocket. The only external circumstance I noted was that the air was hot, heavy, and still. But after all, everyone is affected equally by weather, so my consciousness of it was no limitation on my experiment. I walked an undetermined number of blocks, taking care to observe no street signs or landmarks. I observed only one thing. 
that there were many people on the street. In fact, I became aware only vaguely that I was pushing through a rather dense crowd, but I deafened myself completely to any specific words or conversation. Brilliant recording. Brilliant. And although I imagine there was traffic passing in the street, I successfully blotted out all sound except for a dull roar. It seemed to me that the ominous heat had increased. The stillness of the air was almost out. Perhaps brought me sooner to the final revolution of my plan. But when I found my progress through the crowd blocked by what I can only describe as a human, I raised my knife and drove it into the back with all my force. I can't stand it! I can't! I continued walking without haste, pausing only a fraction of a second to hear. He's fallen! Get back! Get in here! Get in here! To hear those few words, he's fallen. Give him air. <laughs> he needed no air, I knew that. And thus, I heard confirmed my unqualified belief that I had taken without any possible consequence to myself a human being's life. Suspense, Roma Wines are bringing you as star Mr. Joseph Cotton in The Earth is Made of Glass by Sylvia Richards. Roma Wines' presentation tonight in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Between the acts of suspense, this is Truman Bradley for Roma Wines. First called to my dinners says Miss Elsa Maxwell, is Roma California Sherry. For this delicious wine is a perfect beginning to a good meal. In fact, this famous hostess goes on to say, Roma Sherry is an ideal wine because you can enjoy it any time of day or night. Gold and amber with a rich nut-like taste. Glorious Roma Sherry is at its most delightful best served cool. Roma Sherry, like all the famous Roma wines, is made from carefully selected grapes from California's choicest vineyards. Grapes gathered at the peak of their flavored goodness when every grape is hanging firm and full on the vine. Then quickly, but gently pressed. Finally, by a process as slow and as old as time, brought to delicious liquid perfection by Roma's skilled vintners. Yes, all Roma wines are true wines, always unvaryingly good, bottled at Roma's own famed wineries. Enjoy Roma wines regularly for only pennies a glass. Remember, because of uniformly fine quality at reasonable cost, more Americans enjoy Roma than any other wine. Always ask for Roma. R-O-M-A. Roma Wines. And now, Roma Wines bring back to our Hollywood soundstage Joseph Cotton as Richard Thomas Steele in The Earth is Made of Glass, a play well calculated to keep you in suspense. August 1st. I was unable to write my journal yesterday because of the excessive heat. I suffered all day from a headache and a vibration in my ears. I'm writing today only to have on record the final control in my experiment, my laboratory murder. To ensure complete ignorance of the identity of my victim, I shall read no newspapers for a period of two or three weeks, no whole conversation with anyone apt to be morbidly interested in murders reported in the tabloid press. Compensation. <laughs> tut tut, Mr. Emerson. August 4th. The heat is unbearable. All day I have felt that odd, heavy vibration in my head. Now also in my arms and body. It is almost constant in a one, two, three rhythm. And sometimes it is a sound as well as a vibration. Like the distant sound of the sea. I must consult 
the doctor. Last night, I was kept awake by the throbbing in my head, and toward morning, I was subjected to a new agony. Very softly at first, but louder and louder like voices heard in delirium. My head became filled with an almost hysterical babbling. Brilliant. 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 A passionata. A passionata. A Brilliant. 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 Passionata. A passionata. Brilliant. 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 Brilliant.
standing at my shoulder, smiling. Young, apparently as alive as I, but it was. He was there, he, my victim. The face and the paper in his face were the same. I swear they were the same. I'm sorry to bother you. The girl at the desk said you had the July volume of the time. Yes, I... I'm I was sorry. Uh, did I startle you? Your, your picture, I... I'm looking at your picture. My picture? Well, you mean in the paper? I don't see any picture. He's dead. I, I know he's dead. I felt his heart leap like a fish on the point of my knife, then quiver and die. I saw him fall. I must believe that he is truly dead. And the dead neither walk nor speak. But today on Fifth Avenue. Hello. What? Well, what's wrong? Are you ill? No. No, 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 I'm all right. You look like you were about to faint. You're still green. Are you sure? I'm, I'm all right. Because I live right near here if you want to lie down. No, 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 please. Well, it's up to you. I can't make you come. But I don't like to see anyone suffer needlessly. <laughs> August 20th. He doesn't like to see anyone suffer. Yet because of him, there is not one day, one hour when I am free from despair and fear. Yes, I accept him now. The dead do walk and talk, at least one dead man does. Inevitably, if I venture out of my house, he finds me. Today, I started down the subway steps at 53rd Street after I'd looked to make sure he wasn't anywhere nearby. But I'd gone only three or four steps when I felt my arm jostled and I turned. Pardon. Oh. Oh, you again. <laughs> I'll bet you think I'm haunting you. Please, what do you want? Well, look, I don't want anything. Let's just call it fate or something. Why don't you let me alone? I've begun to think that maybe we were both to be spared this. So, so, so had I. If I were superstitious, I'd say we had some unfinished business. Please, will you tell me something? Will you answer one question? Do... Do you believe in compensation... You'll have to explain what you mean. If someone does evil, if I have done evil, must I get evil back? Well, uh, say it again. Do you believe in good for good, evil for evil? Look, look, what about killing? Well, there's all sorts of killing. But, but senseless killing. Killing with no reason. What is the compensation for that? You've asked a pretty complicated question of a pretty simple man. The only thing that comes to my mind right off is what it says in the Bible. An eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. That's what you believe? Why, oh, yes, I believe that. Is that any help to you? Yes. Oh, yes. Anything you say would help. for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a command, the price asked by the only one who can ask it. What will you have, quoth God? Pay for it and take it. Well, I'll pay, for I've learned that no event between two human beings can happen in a vacuum. We're all enmeshed, bound together through our blood in a pulsing net, and if one of us does violence to another... He does violence to himself. Very well. This price I am glad to pay. There is no other way. Are you awake, Mr. Steele? Where, where am I? You're in Washington Hill Hospital. How do you feel? Hospital, but I... I mustn't. I... I have to die. Not if we can keep you from but it. I have to. Did... Did I bleed much? Bleed? On the knife. You had a heart attack, Mr. Steele. Coronary. No, I tell you here, I... I, I stabbed myself here. Where's the doctor? Lie down, Mr. Steele. The doctor will be here in a minute. I have to make him understand. I promised... 
to die. You promised. Oh, here's the doctor now. Yes, but I... You. Of, of course, you. Well, Mr. Steele. I, I tried to tell her. I tried to, to tell her that I have to die. Call another doctor for this patient, nurse. But doctor... You tell her. The earth is made of glass. That if I don't die, you'll always find me. I know that. But tell her. Tell her the, the evil thing I have done so she'll let me die. Dr. West, his powerful. Emerson said it. I carry a malignity in me. But when I die, I make square the eternal account. Make square the eternal account. <laughs> Well, Miss Adams, that's all there is. The Journal of Richard Thomas Steele. Doctor, I don't remember reading of that murder. Do you? No. No, I don't. Who was the man he met? Who was it he thought he'd killed? It was me. You, Dr. West? Just as he described it. First in the library, and in a drugstore, near my home, on buses, in the park. I couldn't imagine what was bothering him. But who did he kill? Really? I don't know. But I have an idea. Where's the package you found in this coat? Right here. Shall I open it? Yes, go on. Ah. You see? The gloves. And the knife. And they've never been used. Then he never killed anyone. No. Richard Steele never drove a knife into a living back. But in his way, he killed. In his mind, he killed. I guess old Emerson would say even for that kind of crime, there's compensation. Commit a crime, and the earth is made of glass. Wines have brought you Joseph Cotton as star of The Earth is Made of Glass. Tonight's study in Suspense. This is Truman Bradley for Roma Wines, the sponsor of Suspense. These days, says Miss Elsa Maxwell, world famous hostess, more and more people serve only one dish for dinner with a salad and probably a sweet. That's why I'm sure so many more people serve Roma Wines. Because Roma wines add so much to a simple meal. With a savory pot roast, for example, I recommend glasses of good Roma, California Burgundy, served cool. Now, that's a good suggestion from Elsa Maxwell. For Roma Burgundy is a handsome wine with a good, warm heart. Try it and discover how happily its tart piquancy goes with meats. And if you enjoy cocktails before dinner... You'll make better cocktails with Roma's full-flavored vermouth, sweet or dry, made and bottled in the heart of California's famous vineyards, yet surprisingly low-priced. Try Roma vermouth soon, won't you? We would like to thank Joseph Cotton for appearing in the place of Clifton Webb, whose illness prevented his being with us this evening. Joseph Cotton appeared through the courtesy of David O. Selznick, producer of Alfred Hitchcock's Spellbound. Next Thursday, you will hear George Murphy in Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Now, Roma Wines, R-O-M-A, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Roma Wines present... Suspense! Tonight's 
tonight, Roma Wines bring you Mr. Paul Henry, the star of The Angel of Death, a suspense play produced, edited, and directed for Roma Wines by William Spear. Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills, is presented for your enjoyment by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. Those excellent California wines that can add so much pleasantness to the way you live, to your happiness in entertaining guests, to your enjoyment of everyday meals. Yes, right now a glass full would be very pleasant as Roma Wines bring you Mr. Paul Henry in a remarkable tale of Suspense. December 31st, 31st, New Year's Eve. I shall identify myself as John Forsythe, my true name, as I have no reason to fear its being known nor to assume one of a different character. My early life has no place in this narrative, save only to point out with the utmost objectivity that I have always been possessed since my tenderest youth of extraordinary intellectual powers. As witness, my acquisition at the age of 16 of degrees from not one, but three of the leading universities of Europe where, despite my British nativity, I spent my formative years. But this fact has no special significance other than as it applies to those events which were set in motion on another New Year's Eve in London, 15 years ago. For it was on that evening, as I had planned some weeks before it should be, that I stood outside a door and listened for confirmation of the relationship I knew existed between my best friend and... My wife. Oh, darling, darling, darling. It's all right now, Pam. It's all right. It's all over now. Yes. Are you happy? Yes, now that we've decided. Yes. Almost for the first time since I can remember. I know, darling. I suppose we should feel sorry for him, but I can't. Not after the way he's treated you. Raymond, what do you suppose he'll do? It doesn't matter, darling. Tomorrow, tomorrow we'll be on the Atlantic Ocean, and within a month we'll be on my uncle's plantation in Brazil, where he couldn't find us if he looked for a hundred years. No, I suppose it doesn't treat him. How long will it take you to pack? Oh, an hour. Well, I ought to be back by then. I just got to pick up the tickets and a few things. All right. Hurry, darling. I will, darling. I will. Goodbye. Goodbye, darling. Good evening, my dear. Why? What's the matter, Pamela? You look as though you'd seen a ghost. Oh, why, nothing. You startled me, that's all. You said you were going out of town for the holidays. And you... You don't usually come in by the back door. You needn't be alarmed. I shall only be a moment. I, uh, forgot something. Can I get it for you? Your anxiety for my every wish is, uh, touching. But no, thank you. Uh... By the way, Pamela, have you any last words? Any what? We may not see each other for a while, you know. John, what are you talking about? What's the matter with you? Oh, my dear, sometimes I wonder if I married you out of infatuation for your beauty or pity for your stupidity. Oh, John, please. Uh, Pamela, where do you suppose we shall all be, say, within the month? Does it really matter so much? <laughs> no. No, I suppose it does not. Within the month, I was on trial for their murder. You are Henry Jenkins, proprietor of the Crown and Lion, number 17 Buxton Street. I'm right? that one, sir. I am. Henry Jenkins, sole owner Thank of Proprietor River. Now, uh, will you kindly repeat the words spoken by the prisoner in the dock while in your place of business several weeks ago? Yes, sir. <coughs> Excuse me, sir. About uh, two weeks ago one night, uh, Mr. Forsythe there, who's a steady customer of mine, although not what you'd call a sociable man. Yes, 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 yes. Well, sir, all me other customers had gone out. And I was asking Mr. Forsythe to leave also, just so I could close up me shutters, you know. When all of a sudden he looks up at me and he whispers, kind of horse-like, Jenkins, I did it. I finally did it. Not knowing what he did, sir, I naturally ask him what he did. And uh, what did the prisoner tell you, Mr. Jenkins? He said, sir, warning me to keep... 
Warnie made to keep it quiet, sir. I bound him together and I killed him. And then he laughs in a crazy way and added, And Jenkins, I've hid the bodies where no one will ever find them. Well, that's what he said, sir. So help me a tip. I saw him burning what looked to be a lot of bloody clothes. In the furnace it was. And he didn't try to hide them either. Just stared at me kind of odd-like. And went right on as brazen as you please, he did. He wasn't worried at all. He said the two of them won't ever get away together. Except if they are dead. I heard him say it on the stair landing one night. And several other times in their rooms. Pamela, he says... If you don't stop leering at Raymond Tillotson with those evil eyes of yours, I'll see the two of you in your grave. I warn you. The uh, court feels uh, that it is its duty at this time again to remind the prisoner that he has so far made, nor allowed to be made by counsel in his defense, no cross-examination of witnesses, nor a buttle to the charges made by the prosecution of any kind. And that this attitude can only result adversely to his cause. The prisoner is therefore once more given the opportunity at this time to make such a buttle. Now, does the uh, prisoner wish to do so? No, Your Lordship. I do not. Does the uh, prisoner wish to make any statement of any nature whatsoever in his defense? I should merely like to ask the prosecution one question, Your Lordship. Yes? What is it? Has the prosecution found the bodies? Well, the uh, prisoner wishes to know if the prosecution has yet produced the bodies of the alleged victims of the crime for which he is on trial. Well, uh, <coughs> no, Your Lordship. We have not. That is all. Thank you. <laughs> To kill them had been my plan and my intention, naturally. But not in the usual stupid way such things are done, where men gamble their own lives against the lives of those whom they destroy. Every faculty of my intelligence revolted against such a thought. And so, for me, the gambler's risk was needless. So I planned it. It was therefore without fear or question that I stood before the court to hear the verdict which, in all the writing of it, I had contrived against Order. myself. Order! John Forsyth, the court has given most careful consideration to the fact that the bodies of the named victims have not been presented to this court as due evidence and a surety of murder, a fact which admittedly must alter the circumstances of guilt. But this Crown Court no matter how deeply it desires to aid you, cannot but recognize the fact that you have allowed every shred of evidence and element to point to you as a cold-blooded killer. Under such circumstances, questionable though they may be, I can do only as the King's Law directs me to do, tempered with the mercy of His Majesty's Court. I hereby sentence you to no more than twenty and no less than ten years at hard labor for the suspected and willful murders of your wife, one Pamela Felice Forsyth, and one Raymond Elton Tillotson. And may God protect the crown and the jurisprudence of this court of his royal majesty. Ten to twenty years. <laughs> It was perhaps a bit more than I expected, but uh, I was content. And it may be that there was even the trace of a smile upon my lips as I left the courtroom. Certainly, it was justified, if only by the looks of awe and admiration turned in my direction by the spectators. Clearly, they recognized my genius, and I knew they were thinking of the countless lesser men who had failed in their efforts to hide even one dead body. Whereas I, apparently without effort, had successfully hidden too. <laughs> Boy, 
For suspense, Roma Wines are bringing you as star Paul Henry in The Angel of Death by Alan Cameron. Roma Wines present tonight, nation tonight, in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Between the acts of suspense, this is Truman Bradley for Roma Wines. With the holiday excitement over, most of us are glad to enjoy evenings at home again, taking it easy and economizing. What a perfect time to serve Roma California Sherry. Yes, glorious golden amber Roma Sherry adds so much to happy hours at home, yet costs so very little. More Americans every day make Roma Sherry first call for dinner. You'll find Roma Sherry ideal for entertaining, too. Delicious any time. For Roma Sherry is a happy, mellow wine with tempting fragrance, satisfying, natural sweetness, and superb nut-like taste. Roma Sherry, like all Roma wine, is a true wine, unvaryingly good always. Crushed from choicest grapes, grown in California's finest vineyards, then unhurriedly, guided to tempting perfection by Roma's ancient winemaking skills. Bottled at the winery. Get Roma Sherry tomorrow. Now selling at lowest prices in years. Insist on Roma. R-O-M-A. Roma Wine. For uniformly fine quality at low cost. Remember, more Americans enjoy Roma than any other wine. And now Roma Wines bring back to our Hollywood soundstage Paul Henry as John Forsythe in The Angel of Death. A play well calculated to keep you in suspense. It was thus that I began my prison term and my association with William Waters, a sallow-faced, ill-favored little man who was to be my chief source of amusement and mental exercise for a long time to come, and to illustrate still further the inevitable triumph of the high intellect over all obstacles and surroundings. <coughs> <coughs> so you're the great John Forsyth, eh? You've heard of me then? Not off, I haven't. The luckiest beggar that ever cheated the hangman. Luck? There is no such thing as luck. Now? And how is it you're sitting here safe and sound? An out as free as air in 15 or 20 years, instead of stretching your neck at the end of a rope, eh? I'm here because I choose to be here. That is all. Because you choose to be, eh? (laughs) (coughs) Uh, Now, now, tell me, Forsyth, just between us two, how did you do it? By using my brains. And there's many another tried that before and been caught up with. Simply because they did not really have any brains to start with. No, it's luck, I tell you. Bad luck, like mine. (coughs) (coughs) You want to hear the worst bit of luck ever ruined a man's life? Well, if you wish to call it that, why not? It was like what happened to you in a way. The sweetheart, Agnes, her name was. The biggest, bluest eyes. The prettiest little thing you'd ever hoped to see. And you'd killed her. Oh, I didn't mean to. It was the usual, you know, and I, I caught her dead to ride. But she laughed at me. That was the trouble. Threw it in my face, she did. Next thing I knew, something snapped. And when me head kid, you know, I was sitting on the floor beside her, crying like a baby. And her lying there with her pretty blue eyes just tearing out of her head and her Pretty mouth all twisted. The red marks there on her throat. The marks of these two very hands where I'd strangled the life out of her. You weren't unlucky. You were stupid. You killed her without planning it. Well, and uh, what did you do with the body? Cemented her into the wall of the cellar. <laughs> and the bloke next door had a gas eater. Exploded and blew out the old ruddy wall between us, it did. By the time I got home, there was farming and bobbies all over the place. And there was Agnes, what was left of her, lying right out in the middle of the cellar floor, for all the world to see. 
The truly intelligent man foresees every possibility and guards against it. Who could? Who could put four years in Mark there? I could. You could? I stand before you as the living proof of it. In 10 or 15 years, I shall be free because I'm intelligent. Whereas you will rot and die here because you are stupid. Oh, pretty clever, ain't you? Now, just about everything there is to know, don't you? <coughs> no, no, not everything. But quite a lot of things. <coughs> For instance, I know something about that cough of yours. What about it? The color of your skin, the look about your eyes, the way you breathe. I hope you're not afraid to die, Waters. Oh, Rabbit, what are you talking about? Have you ever heard of retribution, Waters? What? Well, the inevitable fate it pursues and at last destroys the criminal mind. A vengeance, you might call it. Ah, uh, what? You don't think anything's going to happen to you or me, do you? No, not to me, Waters. For the intelligent man foresees and prevents even that. But to you, Waters, most certainly to you. Oh, indeed. And who's going to do all of this? Oh, he is known by various names, Waters, but best known as the Angel of Death. <laughs> Retribution, the angel of death. Absurd, was it not? But a most purposeful absurdity. For the intellectual stimulus so necessary to remaining mentally alert during the prison years ahead was here delivered into my hand. An experiment. And one almost impossible under any other conditions. And William Waters would be my guinea pig. An experiment to determine just how far a man might succeed through sheer superiority of intelligence in breaking down and destroying the mind and the body of another by the simple power of suggestion. I suggested nothing directly. Many a word here, a glance there. Drops of water wearing away the stone. <laughs> I got a fever again tonight. Haven't I, John? No, no, a touch perhaps, but that is all. The head feels up. <laughs> that blasting cough, what does it? No, no, you mustn't worry about it. It's very bad for people with your condition to worry. What condition? What condition, John? Why, nothing. People with a, with a cough like yours, people who feel, uh, well, uh, indisposed, that's all. Oh, What's that book you're reading, Nathan? Just a book. A, a scientific book that I got from the prison library. What sort of a scientific book? Oh, a general book on medicine. Things like that, you know. Let me see it. Oh, no, no. You wouldn't understand. Here, give it here. No, please, give it back to me. You wouldn't be interested. Oh. You had it open at this place here, didn't you? This is what you've been reading, ain't it? Well, yes. Uh, among other things. You Tuberculosis? Is that what I got, John? Tuberculosis? Oh, don't be silly. There's nothing seriously wrong with you. John, you've got to tell me. <laughs> I, I don't want to die. No, 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 you're not going to die. You take care of yourself. Why should he come to me? I've always been healthy. I'm not old yet. Of course you are not. You're just imagining things. Imagining things? You're worrying too much, that's all. So what makes you think I'm worrying? Oh, I don't know. Uh, sometimes when you're asleep... Uh, uh, tell me, uh, do you ever have dreams? What sort of dreams? Oh, well, about the past or... Oh, oh you mean... About... About her? Yes. Do you ever dream you see her... Lying there on the floor with her eyes bulging oh. out of her head and her mouth all twisted and her tongue all black no, and swollen. John, don't stop it. And your fingers digging into her no, throat. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Hey, 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 hey. What's the matter there? Oh, he seems somewhat disturbed in his mind this evening, God. Oh, his mind, eh? Oh, that reminds me. Doctor said we were to try to prevail on him to get out of his bunk tomorrow and get outside, get his exercise and fresh air. Oh? Uh, you tell him, eh? All right, yes. I oh, will. What were you two muttering about? Oh, he, he was just telling me what the doctor said about you. Uh, what? Oh, he wants you to stay in your bunk and get plenty of rest. <laughs> The 
time was drawing near, I knew. The time for what I had planned as the culmination of my experiment. Waters was having periods of definite delirium. But I waited. I waited for them to become more pronounced. Then, one night, when I'd listened to him tossing and muttering for hours in his bunk, I crossed over in the darkness. Oh, no. Wait. There ain't time yet. I don't have to go yet. No. William no. Waters. Yes. I've come for you, William Waters. What? She sent me, William. She sent me with her eyes staring out of her head. The black, swollen town. No, no. I'm the angel of death. I'll kill her. I'll kill her. Take your hand from my throat. Take your hand. I'll kill you. There. Perhaps that will quiet you. What's going on here? I had to hit him. The man is out of his mind. He thinks I'm... And some angel of death or something. Yeah, you. Come on. Up on your feet. Come on, there, Waters. Now, what's the matter with you? Buster. You. It's you what done this to me. Oh, I was told you he was you, out of his mind. It's you what done it to me. I'll see it now. Come on, now. You're coming with me. Come I'll on. I'll kill you, fool, sir. Come on. I'll get out of you. Come on. 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 <laughs> it was interesting while it lasted. And I've always believed that given a little more time, I could have ended my experiment successfully. But I had other plans to make now. Plans for the day when I would be free. And at last it came. At last I was walking away from the prison gate of free man. And now began my search. It was not difficult. It led me at last to Paris. To a small apartment where I went tonight, December 31st, New Year's Eve. Yes? Good evening. Well, good evening, sir. Did you, uh, did you wish to see someone? Oh, you don't recognize me? <laughs> Why, I do, of course, but, um, are, are you a friend of Pam's? I'm indeed. Darling. It's a friend of yours, dear. A friend of both of you. John. What? Yes, in fact, your husband, my dear, and Raymond's best friend. John, it's been... Uh... Fifteen years, yes. You only returned to Paris recently, did you not? Yes, a short time ago. And you never knew that I was convicted and sentenced to prison for your double murder, did you? Murder? <laughs> oh, that was quite as I planned it. I knew where you were, but the authorities did not. John. But perhaps you have heard of a curious legal technicality which provides that a man cannot be convicted twice for the same crime. You see, I've already paid for your murders. And now I've come to collect an ancient debt. Put on that gun. <laughs> <laughs> I then walked calmly from their rooms. I made no effort to hide my face, my trail, or my identity. I can now defy every element in life and in law. After 15 years, I've committed the crimes for which I've already paid my debt to society. I shall mail this letter to the police, who may give it to the newspapers, or whoever wants it. Although it is now a matter of indifference to me if the world remarks upon my cleverness or my patience. For my life is complete. No man has ever known such happiness. John Forsyth. <laughs> yes, yes, come in, Madame Leclerc. I have the letter now that I wished you to mail for me. I've come to you, John Forsyth. Waters. I'm not Waters any longer. How did you get out? They said I was insane. 
so I hadn't been responsible when I killed her. Then they said I was cured. Sane again. And then they let me out. But there was one thing they never knew. They never knew who I really was. What are you talking about? That's why I've come to you, John Forsyth. I am the chosen messenger of an higher power. Look here, Waters. I... Die, John Forsyth! I... And the story ends with a newspaper clipping. Let me read it to you. Paris, January 1st. This gay metropolis spent one of its quietest New Year's Eves in recent years. In all greater Paris, there were only two recorded deaths by violence, both of which, by a strange coincidence, occurred within a few yards of each other. The first was the fatal shooting by an unknown assailant of an Englishman, John Forsyth. The second victim, unidentified, had apparently leaped from a window or roof of the same dwelling occupied by Forsyth. Police were at a loss to explain a weird black silk robe and cape worn by the man. jean vier Leclerc, concierge of the building, alleges to have heard a voice repeating an English phrase, I am the angel of death, just before the suicidal leap. However, this can hardly have any bearing on the case, since the said phrase was undoubtedly uttered by New Year's revelers in the neighborhood. <laughs> Presented by Roma Wine, R-O-M-A, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. How much more pleasureful any meal becomes when Roma Wine is served. Yes, a fine table wine such as Roma California Burgundy makes any food taste better, brings out all the flavor, lends romance and friendly companionship to the meal. America's famed hostess, Elsa Maxwell, says, My simple secret for gracious and enjoyable dining is to serve my guests Roma Burgundy. It's so easy to make your meals more delicious, more exciting, as Elsa Maxwell does. Because Roma wine costs so little, anyone can serve it often. Compliment your next dinner with the fruity fragrance and appetizing piquant taste of red, robust Roma Burgundy. Get Roma Burgundy tomorrow, now selling at the lowest prices in years. And you get extra saving when you buy Roma in a half gallon and gallon size. No wine but Roma offers you so much for so little. Insist on Roma, R-O-M-A, Roma wine, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Paul Henry appeared through the courtesy of Warner Brothers Studios and will soon be seen in their production, Devotion. Next Thursday, same time, Roma Wines will bring you Mr. Phil Terry as star of Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills. Produced by William Spear for the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California. This is CBS. The Columbia Broadcasting System. KQW, San Jose, the Columbia station for the San Francisco Bay Area. You will stay where you are. You will not move. We have some preparations to make. And then... Then something very odd happened. Half of Dr. Marlowe came alive. His right side first. His right eye lighting up while his left eye stayed dead. His right hand twitching while his left hand remained stiff. Half of him came alive. Only half. Theater 5 presents Terror from Beyond. Get it! 
it, John. Try and remember. Huh? What's that? Did someone... Remember! Try and remember! Sir, you will not remember. Do you understand? When we are gone, it will be gone. As if it had never happened. And you will not remember. But you've got to remember, John! You've got to! The whole future of mankind, of life on Earth, depends on it! I sat up in bed, listening. The surf was pounding at the foot of the cliff. But that was all. Had I really heard something or just imagined it? I didn't know. All I knew was I was in a cold sweat. But that wasn't surprising after what had happened. The deaths and... Deaths? But they'd been accidents. Maybe if I went back over it from the beginning... was the beginning. When I arrived at the base, I suppose, went to the administration building for that first briefing session with Dr. Marlowe and Roy. Oh, it's good to see you again, John. It's good to see you, Doctor. Great to have you aboard, John. Did you mind our doing this, pulling strings to have you assigned up here for a while? Are you kidding? You said it was something interesting. We think it is. As interesting and important as any space work that's being done anywhere today. I know. We'll be putting a man on the moon in a few years, but... If we're to go on from there, one of the things we should know is what we're likely to find. In other words, whether there's intelligent life anywhere in the solar system. Mm -hmm. That's why I hated leaving the old project. You haven't. <laughs> this is still part of the old project. Uh, remember what our problem was on Van Gogh? Of course. A radio telescope can pick up any message from out there that might be beamed at us, but it's sometimes very difficult to tell precisely where it's coming from. Exactly. Well, we're using a technique here that'll take care of that. A light beam, rather than radio waves. You mean a laser? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, we discussed that. We've already hit the moon with a beam no bigger than a pencil, but suppose you do establish a contact, how do you get your feedback, your response? Well, we believe we've solved that problem, uh, theoretically at least. But we needed an electronic specialist to work on it with us. That's why we requested you. When do we start? Right away. Uh, by the way, you're sharing a cottage with Roy. Now, why don't you go on down there with him? Drop your luggage, we'll get to work. The work. I remember that. Weeks of it. Finally, the big night. The night of our first test. It was clear and cool. The ocean still, not thundering, but whispering at the base of the cliffs as if it were waiting... All the stars sharp and clear like signposts on the road to the infinite. Dr. Marlowe at the computer, Roy and I at the center console. T minus two. Check. By the way, Doctor, I meant to ask you before, what made you pick Damus as our first target? Well, it was a few weeks after you left the project. We got a message from there. No. Well, there was some question about it, John. First, as to whether it was really was a coherent message, and second, as to whether it was from Damus. The British got a fix on it, too. And it was on the hydrogen wavelength, the one we always said anyone out there would use. That's true. And even though we never got another one, I thought it was worth exploring further. Of course. But that's fantastic. Yes, it's an exciting prospect. But it's also a rather frightening one. Why do you say that? We're reaching out, John. We're getting close to the secret of matter, the origin of life, the mystery of the universe. Sometimes I become a little afraid. I'm afraid that we may stumble onto something that's too much, too big for us. T minus ten seconds. Check. Power on. Give me a reading, John. Vector nine. Eighteen point two and steady. Time. How long to contact? Three minutes, 28 seconds. We sat there tensely, watching our instruments on the clock. Then... There it is, the feedback. We've done it. The trick now will be to maintain contact. Uh, 
Wait a minute. What's that? It sounds like a pattern. Huh? Listen. Even numbers. Now, odd numbers. Great Scott, do you think we've got something? Follow it. Follow it. Start with an even series. We started following the pattern, and we got nothing. We kept at it all night, most of the next day. Still nothing. Wait. The next night, it's starting to come back to me now. I remember. I remember. It was the sound of the generators that woke me. It was about two in the morning. I padded out along the duck boards to the control building. The lights were on. I went in. And there was Dr. Marlowe. He was sitting at the control panel, and he was strange. His eyes were open, but he didn't seem to see me. Dr. Marlowe. Dr. Marlowe, what is it? What are you doing? Dr. Marlowe. Then, something very odd happened. Half of him came alive. His right side first. His right eye lighting up while his left eye stayed dead. His right hand twitched while his left one remained stiff. And then... What? Oh, oh hello, John. Is uh, anything the matter, Doctor? Oh, why should anything... Hey... What am I doing here? Doctor, have you ever walked in your sleep before? Oh, not that I know of. Of course, I haven't been sleeping too well lately. Rather disturbing dreams, but... John, did you change this beam frequency? No, Doctor. You must have done it in your sleep. Shall I switch it back? No. Cut the power, but leave it. I'd like to look at it again in the morning. Do some thinking about it. Somehow, neither of us mentioned it the next day. We just went on with our work, collecting data, trying for another contact, if it had been a contact. And that night, yes, it was that night that we discovered what it meant. The generators woke me again. I looked at my watch. It was almost three o'clock, and for some reason, I was terrified. The door of Roy's room was open. As I went by, I saw that his bed was empty. Then I was walking along the duck boards to the control building. The lights were on again. I looked in through the window. And Dr. Marlowe was at the panel as he'd been the night before with that same dead look on his face. And Roy was standing in front of him, talking to him. I could hear him through the window. Dr. Marlowe. Dr. Marlowe, what is it? Is anything wrong? He's asleep. Walking in his sleep. Better get John. He started toward the door. Then, apparently deciding he'd better not leave the generators on, he turned and went toward the master switch. And as he did, Dr. Marlowe moved. His face still dead, expressionless. He got up, took a heavy wrench, and followed Roy. Then, just as Roy put out a hand to throw the switch, he hit him. I saw Roy's body crumple to the floor. I stood there frozen, unable to move. Dr. Marlowe looked down at him for a moment with no sign of emotion on his face. Then, like a zombie, he went over to the workbench again, picked up an odd assortment of tools, and returned to Roy's body. He bent over him, looking at him as if he were a laboratory specimen. And as I realized what he was going to do, my paralysis left me. I shouted and started for the door. But just before I reached it, I tripped, hit my head, and that was the last I knew. I'm not sure how long I was out. But when I came to, I was lying in front of the door and a dark shape was bending over me. John, what happened? Keep away from me. Don't touch me. I saw what you did in there. And where? When? Just now, in the control room, to Roy. What do you mean? I just came up here from my cottage. I had a bad dream, came out to get some air, and I found you lying here. But I tell you, I saw you and... And what? I must have imagined it, dreamed it, because I thought I saw you kill him. (laughs) 
We looked everywhere, but there was no sign of Roy. Then we hurried back to the control building and searched it again. He's not here either, John. No. Must be in my mind. Of course, if it had really happened, there'd be something, if not his body, at least his blood. Where, John? Where would it be? Right here in front of the master switch. But there's nothing. No. Except that the floor is wet. Looks as if it's been scrubbed. Hey, you're right. John, did you change the beam frequency this way? No, Doctor. You must have done it just the way you did last night. Last night? You mean something happened last night, too? You don't remember? No, no. Tell me what you thought you saw happen tonight, whether you believe it or not. Well, you were sitting at the control panel with your eyes open, but as if you were asleep. Yes. The generators were on, and the beam frequency was set the way it is now. Roy was speaking to you, but you didn't answer him. Then when he started to cut the power, you picked up a wrench and hit him. I hit Roy? But that's not the worst of it. After that, you picked up some tools and bent over him as if... Well, as as if he were a laboratory animal. Telling you about it now, I know the whole thing's mad. It's impossible. I wonder... You mean it could have happened some way? Without your knowing it? In the old project. And in this one. We've been listening for messages from out of space. Trying to determine whether intelligent life exists anywhere in our galaxy. John, if it did exist, what form would it take? Well, it wouldn't necessarily look like us with two arms and legs. Exactly. And suppose it existed in a totally different form. In the form of electrical energy. Electrical energy? Why not? Isn't that the way the brain functions? Giving off electromagnetic waves? And what do we know about Deimos? Suppose... Suppose living beings existed there. In the form of complex electrical charges. And a channel were suddenly opened between it and the Earth. Our laser beam. Mm. You mean they could travel down and take hold of someone? You I'm speculating, John. Of course, even if it's true, we don't know if these entities are malevolent, dangerous or not. When they killed, made you kill Roy? Because he was going to shut off the transmitter, cut off contact with their base. As for the rest, well, they'd be very interested in the human body, particularly the brain. They'd want to examine it, study it. Do you realize what you're saying, suggesting, Doctor? Intelligences from outer space, another world... The taking over of a man's body by forces that we... Yes, John, I know what I'm saying. And while I'm only hypothesizing, I don't really believe it's possible. Do you own a gun? Yes. So happens I do. Well, start carrying it. And if you notice me doing anything strange, don't hesitate. Shoot. And shoot to kill. I didn't go back to sleep that night, and I was convinced that I would never sleep again, because it would be then that it would be easiest for them to... No, no, I can't think about it. I won't, even now. I felt a little better in the morning. I went over to have another talk with Dr. Marlowe, but he wasn't at his cottage. He wasn't anywhere on the base, and no one seemed to know where he was. Then I called Colonel Gately at headquarters. No one there knew anything about Dr. Marlowe or Roy. But by that time, something had happened to me. It had all become blurred, like an old nightmare that you know was frightening, but whose details you can't remember. About a week later, the colonel called me and asked me to meet him at the police station in the town nearby. You knew Swanson pretty well, didn't you, Parker? Yes, of course. Some fishermen found a body in their nets this morning. We'd like you to look at it. Oh? All right. Brace yourself. Here. Good Lord. I... I can't be certain, but... I'm fairly sure it's Roy. How did he die? We'll have to wait for the coroner's report, but my guess is that he fell off the cliff. And Dr. Marlowe? Nothing new on him yet, but if they were together, his body may turn up soon, too. He was a better prophet than he knew. He 
Because Dr. Marlowe came back that very night. I'd taken something to make me sleep. It was the only way I could sleep, but the sound of the generators woke me. I took my gun, went to the control building. The lights were on. I opened the door, and there was Dr. Marlowe. He was standing near the console, his face thin and drawn, and his eyes blank. And when he spoke, his voice was hardly human, as if someone was speaking through him. It is unfortunate that you awakened, Parker, and even more unfortunate that you came in here. What do you mean, Doctor? Where have you been, and why are you talking so strangely? We have been looking over your planet, studying it and its life, particularly you so-called humans. We have found it very interesting. And now, we are ready to go. Go? Go where? Wait. You said we. Dr. Marlowe, have they... You will stay where you are. You will not move. We have some preparations to make. And then... Her voice, that horrible voice, broke off. And Dr. Marlowe swayed as if he were about to fall... I grabbed him, held on to him, and then his eyes changed, came alive. And when he spoke again, it was with his own voice. John, John for heaven's sake, help me. What? They got me. They took me that night. Took me all over the country, looking, examining, studying. They picked my brain, John. And now they're going to take me with them. Take you back to where they come from, not my body. They're not interested in that. But the essential me and... In heaven's name, shoot, John. Shoot me! And now, we are ready. Look here. At his eyes. Look closely. Yes. Like that. As your friend told you, we are taking him with us. But you will not remember what has happened. You will remember nothing. Do you understand? Because someday we may come back. I stood there, frozen, holding Marlowe. Suddenly he broke my grip, pushed me away. Walking stiffly and mechanically, he went to the door, opened it, and went out along the duck boards to the edge of the cliff. Then, without hesitating, he stepped over the edge and disappeared. Now do you remember, John? It's all true. They exist. And they've got me here. Not only that, but they may return to Earth again for others. And... John, they're coming back now. They're coming. Do something. When I woke up about a half hour ago, I found this all written out on the pad I keep next to my bed. I remember some of what I'd written. But other parts, like Roy's murder and Dr. Marlowe's death, I don't recall at all. Either I'm mad, completely mad, or... No, no, I can't think about that. In any case, if I showed this to anyone, the world would think I was mad. There's only one thing to do. Tear it up. Every last page of it. Every last page of it. Every last page of it. Theater 5 has presented Terror from Beyond, written by Robert Newman and directed by Warren Somerville. In the cast, Robert Dryden, Ralph Camargo, and Gilbert Mack. Audio engineers Marty Folia and Bill Sandreuter. Sound technicians Ed Blaney and M.C. Brock. Original music composed by Alexander Vlastatsenko. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Osser. Executive producer for Theater 5, Edward A. Byron. This is Fred Foy speaking. Phantom 
Legends of a World Gone By speak again the immortal tale, Mad Moncton. When in Wincot Vault, a place waits for one of Moncton's race, when that one forlorn shall lie graveless under open sky, that shall be a certain sign of the end of Moncton's line. From mortal ken, from light of day, Moncton's race shall pass away. Ada, this is the end, absolutely the end. Nine o'clock and not a word from him. Oh, Mother, stop fretting. Alfred will come, I know he will. But when? When? The engagement dinner was at seven, if you'll remember. But what difference does it make? Ada Elmsley, I do believe you're still in love with Alfred Moncton. Of course I am. After all the terrible humiliation he's put us to, how could you be? How could any self-respecting woman? And to think you broke off your engagement with William Seeley, the nicest boy in the whole county. Oh, what gossip the servants will make. Mother, please. In two minutes, it'll be all over the village. Alfred Moncton didn't arrive, not even a word of apology. I can hear them now. Oh, the humiliation. Mother, please sit down and be quiet. I will not be quiet. I tell you, Ada, I tell you, I'm glad, really glad. I hope you'll never see him again. Mother, how could you say such a thing? Because it's true. You know as well as I do, there's something very strange going on in Wincot Abbey. Something nobody understands. You've been listening to village gossip again. I've been using my own good eyes and ears. Do you know why Alfred Moncton keeps himself cooped up in that ancient abbey day after day after day, never receiving anybody, making a hermit of himself? You exaggerate. He's a scholar. He studies most of the time. That's the lamest explanation I ever heard. How you could ever be in love with such an eccentric man is beyond me. And to have him deliberately... Oh, I don't care if he has a million pounds a year. I'll not allow you to marry him. Oh, we've gone over this so many times. If I don't marry him, it'll only be because Alfred doesn't want me himself. Ada! Look, a carriage on the drive. Well, it's about time. Is it Mr. Moncton? I don't know. Ada, don't see him. Send him away. Alfred, look, he's coming in. Alfred! Ada, come back. For my sake, don't see him. Alfred, you did come. Oh, I knew you would. Forgive me, Ada. Something's happened. I can't tell you what. I've got to go away. Oh, Alfred, no. Maybe that I'll come back. But I can't have you waiting for me, Ada. You mean... Our engagement's broken? Yes. But but why? Why, Alfred? I can't tell you now. But when will you return? I don't know. It may be a long time. Forgive me, Ada. Forget me. Oh, no. How could I? How could I do that? Alfred, I'll wait. Time doesn't matter. I'll wait for you. I do love you, Ada. I do. Somehow I'll come back again, I promise. Living or dead, somehow I'll come back to you. Well, William Seeley. Imagine seeing you here in Naples, of all places. And after so long, too. Has it been so long, John? Not many years. Five, I think, since Eaton. It seems long. What have you been doing with yourself? Last I heard, you and Ada Elmsley were engaged. What happened? Oh, I'm afraid we just broke it off, and I've been wandering over Europe, one place to another. Oh, don't tell me you're suffering from... uh... Broken heart, I believe, is what they call it. Oh, no. Just wanderlust, I think. At least that's what brought me here to the garden of the Villa Real. And a lucky thing, too. Let's drink a toast, shall we? Uh, I say... Oh, something the matter? Huh? No, no, not really. It's just that uh, that fellow over there staring at me as if I were his long-lost brother. It's, it's rather unnerving. Where? Oh, I say, do you know him? No, I I don't think so. Do you? Well, only by reputation. He's a character around these parts. Really? What's his name? Moncton, I think. Alfred Moncton. What? Oh, I see. Well, you do know him. Well, only slightly. I I haven't seen him since I was very young. We lived in the same county. Of course, I remember now. Moncton has Winkert Abbey, I believe. Yes. And also Ada Emsley. Oh, I say. Oh, you mean they're married? No, just engaged. I wonder what he's doing here. I have the slightest notion. Oh, look there. He's written a note. He's given it to the waiter. Yes. Yes, I noticed. Oh, and the waiter's coming to our table. Uh, Mr. William Seeley? Uh, yes. The gentleman just leaving, the one over there, asked me to give you this. Oh, thank you. You're welcome, sir. Hmm, I wonder what Moncton wants with you. Well, we'll soon see. Here, let's read it. If you are the William Seeley from Wilkinshire County, England... 
Will you do me the honor of calling at my flat this evening just before midnight? My need of a friend and confidant is urgent, and I shall be ever grateful for your compliance. My address is below. Alfred Monkton. Oh. That man gives me the creeps. Are you going? Yes. I think I will. He's tormented with some terrible fear. You can see that on his face. Maybe I can help him for Ada's sake. Still, I... I wonder what it could be. You are the William Seeley from Wilkinshire. I knew it. Come in, come in. I had no idea you'd left England, Monkton. Three months ago. Well, thank you a million times for coming tonight. What's the matter? Are you ill? No, no. Please, please sit down. Thanks. Will you have some wine? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I forget. I have no wine here. Uh, wait. Uh, wait a moment. Do you mind sitting in strong light? Why, no, not at all. It's easier for me to talk in strong light. Here, yeah, the reading lamp. Some candles. My, my hand's shaking. Would you like them for me? Of course. Oh, yeah. That's it. Thank you. How's that? It's much better. Light makes me calmer. Seely, can I trust you? I, I want to tell you why I'm here and what I'm looking for. It's hard to believe, but I'd like to hear you say that you'll tell nobody the secret. Well, of course I promise, Monkton. Thank you. I can trust you. I know I can. Seely, you were engaged to Ada Elmsley once. Yes. But she broke it off soon after she met you, old man. Yes, I know. She told me I'm sorry, Seely. But we love each other very much. Though I can never marry her. Never. But why? Come, I'll show you. Here in this room. What is it? There's, there's nothing here. Wait till your eyes grow accustomed to the darkness. Come here a moment. <laughs> Look. Long box. Why, not it's... It's an empty coffin. I take it with me wherever I go. Every moment of my life is built around this casket, Seeley. Because I'm searching for the body of a dead man. Whose body? Stephen Monkton, my uncle. The coffin's for him. Come. Let's go back to the light. Uh, sit down. Sit down and I'll tell you all about it. Are you sure you want to? More than anything in the world. I can't live with this thing much longer. I'm a haunted man. Haunted by fears and a curse. Listen, one evening last February, I was standing alone in one of the deserted rooms of the western turret at Wincott Abbey, looking at the sunset. Suddenly, I felt a sensation stealing over me. I could feel my very soul creeping out of my body. And yet I wasn't unconscious. For a long time, I stood there by the window. And then I began to see the form take shape. It seemed to creep from the shadows, advancing slowly, faintly luminous. Until it stood beside me. What was it? The apparition of Stephen Monkton, his ghost. That was how I knew he was dead. Did you have a strong regard for him? Oh, not at all. I should have been ashamed to feel any at all. He disgraced us wherever he went. Oh. Did you see him frequently? Only three times in my whole life. <laughs> then why are you so concerned? You'll learn in a moment. From an article in a French newspaper, I found out how he died. My uncle fought a fatal duel with the Count saint Lô, somewhere outside the Neapolitan States. The place of the duel was kept secret. Only the seconds knew where it was fought. Now, they too are dead. But this I know. Wherever it was, Stephen Monkton was left unburied on the ground where he fell. I must find the place where he lies, Celia. I must, I must. I don't understand, Monkton. Why is it so important to you? Oh, forgive me, I'm sorry. I tell the story so badly. Listen, uh, did you never hear of the curious old prophecy about our family that's still preserved among the traditions of Wincott Abbey? Yes, I believe I did, but it was a long time ago. Well, it's being passed along from a remote time, and I myself found the verses of the prophecy. That's why I secluded myself, looking for it. Where did you find it? On the blank leaf of an Abbey manuscript. The verses say, When in Wincott vault a place waits for one of Monkton's race, when that one forlorn shall lie graveless under open sky... That shall be a certain sign of the end of Monkton's line. From mortal ken, from light of day, Monkton's race shall pass away. You see the terrible thing it says. What does it say exactly? It says that the last of the Monktons will die. 
when one of us lies unburied. I am the last Moncton, and every member of the family lies in the vault of Wincot Abbey, except one. The prophecy dooms me to death, even if I find him. Now you know the story, and why I can never marry Ada. But I love her with all my heart, and I shall go back to her someday, dead or alive. Are you afraid of dying because of this superstition? No, not of dying, Celia. I'm afraid of living, of being tormented if I do live. If, if I set out tomorrow to look for my uncle's body, where do I go first? Where? Oh, Celia, what am I to do? You know how to help me. This misery has made me unable to help myself. I'll help you, Moncton, whatever way I can. It seems to me... Yes. Well, it seems to me logical to suppose that the jewel was fought somewhere near the Neapolitan frontier. Hmm? So, if I were looking for the place, I'd, I'd follow the frontier to the Lonely Mountains, asking every native if he had seen two carriages in the road last February. Surely then you'd, you'd come across some clue. You're right, Celie. It's an inspiration. Come with me. Please, come with me and help me find the dead man. Will you, Celie? All right, Moncton. I'll help you. But tell me one thing. Why did you say you're afraid of living, of, of being tormented if you do? Because I'm never alone, except when there's strong light in my eyes. What do you mean? I mean his ghost standing beside you now. A death glare in his black eyes. For ever since the day he was murdered... Waking or sleeping, day and night, Stephen Moncton's ghost is with me wherever I go, screaming for me to bury the unburied dead. Bury the unburied dead, Alfred Moncton. Bury the unburied dead. for a while. What's the matter, Moncton? You look tired. Oh, it's nothing. The search just seems so hopeless. Will we ever find him? Will we ever find him? Oh, you must have patience. It's only been a week and the frontier hills aren't far from here. How's the coffin riding? The canvas covers it well. He's still with us. Always with us. The ghost, you mean? Yes. Just yonder by the roadside. Suspended. Moving ahead. Waiting for his burial. I tell you, Celia, I'd rather die a million times than be companioned by a bleeding ghost. Look, there's an old woman on the road. She might know something. Oh, yes. Stop the wagon. Whoa oh, there. Excuse me, Signora. Do you live here on the frontier? Si. Si, Signor. Do you remember about three months ago seeing two carriages take this road? No, Signor. Then perhaps you heard talk of a duel that was fought near here by two men named Moncton and the Count Saint Lo. No, Signor. But wait. Now, I remember during February, two richly adorned carriages did pass my house late in the afternoon. Which way did they go? They were headed for the hills oh, and you. very fast. Thank you so much. Sealy, what luck. Let's go, quickly. Martin, calm yourself. All day you've been tense and I know you're feverish. I'm all right, I tell you. If we hurry, we can make the hills by sundown. Let me have the reins. Get up there. Get up. Moncton, don't drive so fast, you'll kill the horses. Look, we're in the foothills. Surely this is the place, this must be the place. I know, but it's growing dark and the road's treacherous. Hold on there, Moncton. Look, what's that on the road? The man with the lantern. He's motioning for us to stop. Whoa, whoa! Signore, you take this road at your own risk. Who are you? A sentinel from the village of San Bastia. Now, what's the matter with the road? A cave-in? No, oh, nothing so simple, Signore. The road has passed an ancient monastery fallen into ruins. It is my duty to warn you that the road surrounding it is haunted. Haunted by what? By a witch that scream in the night. The people here will not go near the wood. So frightened are they. Sealy, we found the place. We found it. But we must go on, Signor. We're not afraid. Thank you for warning us. You go at your own risk, then. And the guard will protect you. Get up there!
Look, Monkton. There in the moonlight, the ruins of the monster. Yes. Oh, there. Oh, this is the place, Seedy. I know it is. Jump down. All Let's right. search it quickly. Monkton. Listen to that. You hear him too now. Stephen Monkton pleading for me to bury the unburied dead. Where's it coming from? Yonder, on the hill. Come. You see his ghost? Wavers in the moonlight. Beckons from the doorway of the monastery. See, Lee, we found the place at last. At last. Come on. Here. Here's the door, Mark. Yes. Here. Help me push it in. There. Come on. Come on. While I lead the way. Look. The roof has fallen in. Monkton, wait. Look yonder. A slab of stone in the moonlight. Looking up to the sky. The body of Stephen Monkton. Say. He looks alive. His shirt is wet with blood. So he would remain forever. Left here, uncovered to the sky. When we place him in the vault at Wincott Abbey, his body will crumble. And he'll be dust again. Come. It's a long way to England. Let us fetch the coffin. There's the ship, Seely. There's the flora. Yes, and that looks like our captain. Captain King? Hello there. May we see you a moment, sir? Surely you okay. can. Always glad to oblige your fellow Englishman. Remember, Seely. Price is no object. You talk to him. All right. Well, what can I do for you, my lads? They uh, told us at the consul's office that your ship, the Flora, is sailing for England. Right you are. On the way home again. Well, uh, we're rather anxious to get to England ourselves, Captain. Will you take us? We'll pay whatever you ask. Well, now, can always use a few extra shekels. But I say, uh, what's in that box on your wagon? It's, uh, it's an antique statue, a uh, treasure of art, Captain. We're taking it back with us. Oh, well, now, I think you can arrange passage all right. How about 50 pounds for the lot of you? Yes, I think that's agreeable. Fine breeze in the sails tonight, Captain. Right you are, Mr. Seeley. She's blowing straight for England, and quick, too. Uh, Mr. Monkton coming up for a breath of air. <laughs> I'm afraid he's not the world's best sailor, Captain. He's staying close in the cabin. <laughs> Great Scott, what's that? Sounds like the very devil are wailing in the night. Yes, yes, so it does. Excuse me, Captain, I I think I'll go below. John Jay, I hear sir. that wail like a blooming banshee? I sir. Find out where it came from. Monkton, your ghost is haunting the ship. I know, Seely. I heard him too. But what do we do? You'll find out there's a dead man in the casket. Those sailors are dangerously superstitious. But what can I do? He screams to be buried in Wincott Abbey's ceiling. He'll haunt me till I lay his body there. Oh, but I never, never thought this way. Mr. Monkton, open the door. Seely, that's the captain. Come in, captain. Uh, there's something wrong among the men. They're silent and afraid. One of the Maltese boys is saying there's a dead body in that packing case there. Is he right? No, captain. It's only a harmless marble statue. Well, I wish one of you'd contradict the boy, then. The men are a parcel of fools who believe in ghosts. There might be trouble if this keeps up. We'll speak to the men, Captain. Fine. But do it soon. Because another hour will see you through Gibraltar Strait and in the open sea. Good night. Good night, Good night sir. Seely, did you hear that? The open sea? Then England. But the crew. The captain's right. Monkton. No, 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 wait. Believe me, it's best to wait. Look, the sun's coming up, and the ghost will be silent until nightfall. Then we'll be inside of England, and it'll be done, Seely. It'll be done. Captain King, how much farther to England? Yeah, port's just over the horizon, Mr. Seely. Now we we'll take a look at that black cloud. I'm not liking it. You may... Go aloft there. Take in that sail. But what is it, a squaw? Uh, the likes of which you'll never see again, I'll wager. Blast those demons. 
Uh, tempers are up because Mr. Monkton's stubborn silence. Get a move on you there, you men. Better get below, Mr. Seeley. We're beginning to roll. Seeley, what is it? The ship's in danger. I know it is. I've come to fetch you, Monkton. They're cutting away the foremast. The ship sprung a leak. Oh, no. No, I can't leave him here. Oh, what difference does the body make now? The men are already taking to the boats. Come on. No, no, I can't go. I can't. I'll be haunted the rest of my life. I'd rather die, Celia. I'd rather die. Duncan, what are you doing? There's no time. Look, we can take him out into one of the boats. I must get into England. I must. No. No, Monkton. No, the men will kill you first. Mine is gone when this coffin sinks in the sea. I've got to stay. I've got to take it back to Wincot Abbey. You go before it's too late. Seely, go! From the bottom of the sea, Alfred Monkton walked to the land of England and bury the unburied dead. Walk with the brine of the sea in your eye and the body of an unburied Monkton in your arm. Walk to the vault of Wincot Abbey where peace is and death. Bury the unburied dead Alfred Monkton at Wincot Abbey, at Wincot Abbey, and give my ghost eternal peace. Bury the unburied Monkton dead. Alfred Monkton's returned to England. You can help if you only come quickly. Alfred! Oh, what's happened, William? It's nearly dawn. Where is Alfred? We were shipwrecked tonight in the channel. A merchant ship picked up most of the crew. But Alfred was left aboard. Oh. I thought he had drowned, but somehow, in some incredible way, he got ashore. But where is he now? On his way to Wincot Abbey. Oh, please, come quickly. We can meet him there. I have a carriage waiting. Wait, I'll get a wrap. Oh, William, I knew Alfred would come back someday. I knew he would. He's not on the road. We'll wait for him at the Abbey Vault. Why at the vault? Because he was carrying the corpse of Stephen Monkton in his arms. Come now. William, look. The vault door's wide open. He's there. Alfred's there. Alfred! Alfred! Ada! Ada, wait! Alfred, where are you? Ada, wait a minute. Don't look in there. But why if he's here? Come. We'll go in together then. Look. Wet footprints on the floor. Alfred! Alfred, where are you? Oh. William, look. Two coffins pulled from their narrow places, the lids open. What's it mean? He said he'd come back. Look. The letters on this one say Stephen Monkton, below the family <gasps> crest. What's that inside it? What's left of the corpse? A pile of sea so clothed in bones. Oh, how terrible. Ada. Please come on. No, no, the other one. Don't look in it. But I must. <gasps> oh, Alfred. Alfred. You can't help him now, Ada. I didn't know. I, I thought he was alive. But he was drowned in the channel. Now their ghosts will not walk the earth, screaming for a place of burial. He had to come back to Wincot Abbey. Even death could not stop him. <laughs> I'll tell you. Now the last of the mountains is tormented no longer. He rests in peace. Come, Ada. Look. The sun is coming up. From the time-worn pages of the past, we have brought you the story Mad Mountain. 
Bellkeeper, pull the bell. Tonight, we present The Death of Halpin Fraser, adapted from the story by Ambrose Bierce. One dark night in midsummer, a man waking from a dreamless sleep in a forest lifted his head from the earth and stared a few moments into the black. said nothing more, for he was dead. The man was Halpin Fraser, and his body was discovered the following morning by Sam Holker, the deputy sheriff from Napa, and Jim Jarrelson, a detective from San Francisco. The two men left the town of St. Helena at the first glimmer of dawn and walked along the road northward up the valley toward Calistoga. They carried guns on their shoulders. Their business was man-hunting. How far is it? No, only a little ways yet. Uh, there's a turn ahead, and it's just beyond that. Don't see how we'll see anything when we get there. No. This fog. No, it'll thin out and blow off around noon, I expect. Then <coughs> we'll wait around until he shows. Till he shows? Oh, he'll show all right. I've seen him three mm-hmm. times. You say he's been hanging around the graveyard? Yeah, yeah. Where they buried his wife. Ah, now, she was the weirdy. Ooh. Maybe you can't blame him for what he did to her. You... Then he sure had a lot of practice before her. You see, she was a widow when he met her, in fact. <clears throat> Came to California to look up some relative. Then you know all about that. Mm. <clears throat> Strange people. Strange people. And well, well, now, here we are. Mm. Over here. You can see the graveyard's not kept up, not used anymore. Weeds all grown over the stones. Look out, you little Hmm. trip on them over there. What about Branscombe? Shouldn't we watch out if he's around? Oh, no. He don't show up till dark. Uh, I thought I'd show you the ground Hmm. and we could make some sort of plan for later. A grave is over here. He'll come by it like I saw him before. Over here under this spruce. <clears throat> you know, it's still a mystery to me why... Uh... He there. Hmm? He there now. What? He there now. Look at this. What is it? <sighs> hmm. Well. <clears throat> is it Branscombe? No, isn't him. Don't know who it is. The body lay upon its back, 
the legs wide apart. One arm was thrust upward, the other outward, but the latter was bent acutely and the hand was near the throat. Both hands were tightly clenched. The whole attitude was that of desperate but ineffectual resistance to... What? There's a shotgun over there. A game bag with, with birds in it. It's out game hunting. Hmm. Looks like he put up a fight, too. Yeah. Oak shoots all bent over. Somebody bigger than him, it looks. Mm. See the knee marks in the earth beside his hips? <coughs> yeah. Strangled, all right. Look at the face. Well, Miss Branscombe did it, sure enough. Mm. Sure enough. I had been all day in the hills west of the Napa Valley, looking for such small game as was in season. Late in the afternoon, it had come on to be cloudy, and the absence of trails had so impeded me that I was overtaken by night. Unable in the darkness to... To penetrate the thickets, I had lain down near the roots of a large tree and fallen into a sleep, dreamless, dreamless until I heard the name pronounced, I couldn't imagine why, from my own throat. Then I, I lay down and went to sleep, but, but this time no longer dreamless. I thought I was walking along a dusty road that showed white in the gathering darkness of a summer night. Why or where I traveled, I, I did not know, though it all seemed simple and natural as is the way in dreams. The side road left off. The appearance of having been long abandoned because it seemed it, it, it led to something evil. Yet I turned into it without hesitation, impelled by some imperious necessity. As I, as I pressed forward, I, I became conscious that my way was haunted by invisible existences. From among the trees on, on either side, I, I caught broken and incoherent whispers. Whispers in a strange tongue, which yet I, I partly understood. They, they seemed to me fragmentary utterances of a, of a monstrous conspiracy against my body and my soul. A, sh a shallow pool in an old wheel rut caught my eye with a, with a crimson gleam. Oh, I stooped and, and plunged my hand into it. It, it stained my fingers. It, it was blood. It was blood. Her blood was everywhere about me. The weed showed it in, in blots and splashes on their leaves. The file and the trunks of the trees were, were, were broad maculations of crimson. And, and blood dripped like dew from their foliage. Oh, all this I observed with a terror and an expectation. Seemed to be all in expiation of some crime. I was aware of my guilt, but I couldn't remember the crime. I tried to search it out by tracing my life backward to discover the moment of sin. Scenes, scenes and incidents came crowding. One picture facing in confusion another. But nowhere, nowhere could I catch a glimpse of the crime. I will not submit unheard. I will not submit unheard. Oh, there may be powers that are not malignant traveling this accursed road. I 
shall leave him a record. I shall leave him a record and on appeal. I shall relate the wrongs, the persecutions that I endure. I'm a helpless mortal yeah. and a penitent. <laughs> I, I, I found a memorandum in my pocket. But no pencil. I had no pencil. Uh, I, I, I broke a, a twig from a bush and, and dipped it into a pool of blood. And, and I began to write. I wrote rapidly. Rapidly, I, I wrote my appeal. My appeal. Oh, I, I don't know where the words came from. But I wrote, I wrote, I wrote. Yeah. I had hardly touched the paper with the twig when I heard her. Her. At first from some measureless distance away. Soulless. Heartless. A curse. A strange sensation began to take possession of my, my body and, and my mind. Some overpowering presence. A malevolence approaching me, approaching me. I could not tell from what direction, from everywhere. She was everywhere about me. I, I, I had to complete my, my record, my appeal. I wrote, I, I, I wrote with, with terrible rapidity. The twig in blood without renewal. My appeal, my appeal, my... In the middle of a sentence, I could not move my hands. My arms fell to my sides. The paper to the earth. I was drawn about. I looked up. I looked up. Staring into a face. Sharply drawn face. Blank, dead eyes. Standing white and silent in the garments of the grave. Uh, 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 Kathy? Uh, mother! Mother! Halpin was the youngest. He was more delicate than the rest, and perhaps a trifle spoiled. His father had little time for him. His father was what no southern man is not, a politician. It took a good deal of his time, and I suppose it saved us from the war. But then later, other children were at school, and I had helped him all of myself. I was very happy. We were both very happy. His father wanted him to study law. <laughs> oh, my law. Harpin was a dreamer, a romantic boy. I knew from the very beginning that he'd be a poet. Well, well, it was in his blood. And he was the living image and character of his maternal grandfather, the late and great Myron Bain. That was my father, the famous poet, you know. He died just before Halpin was born, so they never knew each other. But I used to think that Halpin was the very incarnation, the very living image. It's true, you know, that before Halpin was born, mine was all I had. Well, that was really how it was. My husband was in politics, you know, and the children came and went with him all so fast. And it's true, I can hardly remember a one of them now. Sometimes I think there was only helping after all. And before him, Myron Bain. Oh, Myron, we always believed we'd be together again afterwards. But being alive was... All we had, after all, wasn't it? You see, my 
father and I were, were very close. I was his inspiration. I was all he had. The only one he ever really loved. We had a perfect sympathy that the world would never have understood. So we had to take care. We had to protect our beautiful weakness, our guilt. Then suddenly he died, and I waited in all this dark world until Halpin was born. His father wanted him to study law. <laughs> oh, my. The Tennessee Frasers were a practical folk, having a contempt for any quality unfitting a man for the wholesome vocation of politics. Well, Halpin was going to disappoint them, and they could see it from the first. And what they said about him only showed their ignorance. They said said he wasn't a very bright and he was a crazy like his grandfather, Myron Bean. Oh, my. Sometimes you just have to shut the whole world out, don't you? So I expect his mother spoiled him a little. You can't go blaming her for that, can you? How happy we were, Halpin and I. <laughs> I, I was still young, you know, they'd say. Halpin and his beautiful mother. Of course, from his early childhood, Halpin called me Kathy. Halpin and Kathy. No one would have known to look. They were jealous. Yes, they were of us, as our attachment became yearly stronger, more tender. By the time he was 25, Halpin was the most beautiful of God's creatures on this earth. I must say, he didn't turn out to be much of a poet by then. But I knew that it might just burst out of him at any moment. He had it all in him, of course. All waiting. I tried to help him a little with his writing and reading. He was a little slow at first. But he was a dreamer. A romantic dreamer. You know, the two of us were almost inseparable. And by strangers observing our manner, we weren't infrequently taken for lovers. Oh, Ma, in all their wild days, they'd never believed how right they were. And we laughed at them, Halpin. We laughed at them, at their outrage and envy. We knew they envied us. That element, that element in all the relations of life, strengthening, softening, and beautifying. Yes, beautifying. Even those of consanguinity. Oh, Halpin, do you remember? Do you remember even a single moment? Well, then, then there was that day you left me. Happened to take a job with a local lumber company. Oh, he wanted to do something. Didn't want to be so dependent on me, I suppose. And this friend of his talked him into working for the Talcott and Bleecker Lumber Company. Well, he hadn't been with them a month. And then that day he came into my boudoir. I knew. I suppose I knew, Halpin. By the way, you kissed me on the forehead and toyed for a minute with a lock of my hair. Had you stopped loving me already, Halpin? We, we can't tell, can we, when someone really stops loving? Kathy. Kathy? Kathy? Well, Halpin... I have a distinct feeling that there's something on your mind. What is it, Halpin? Oh, Kathy, would you would you greatly mind if I were called away to California for a few weeks? To California? It's for the company, Kathy. Mr. Talcott himself asked me to do this. California is far away. How many weeks? Only a few, Kathy. Four. Maybe five. Well, Halpin, it is... 
hardly needful for me to answer with my lips a, a question to which my telltale cheeks have already made reply. <laughs> Evidently, I would greatly mind. Oh, Kathy, Kathy, don't feel that way. I, I want to do this for the company, you know. Yes, you want to get away, Halpin. No. I know. I know. Oh, my dear son, I should have known this was coming. Didn't I lie awake half the night weeping because during the other half, Myron Bain, your grandfather, came to me in a dream and standing by his portrait, young too and handsome as that, he pointed to your portrait on the same wall. And when I looked, it seemed that I could not see the features. You have been painted with a cloth over your face. A cloth such as we put on the dead. Your father has laughed at me when I've told him about my dreams. But you and I, dear, we know that such things are not for nothing. And how been? I saw below the edge of the cloth the marks of hands on your throat. Oh, how been. Forgive me, but we've not been used to keep such things from each other. Perhaps you have a different interpretation of my dream, Halpin. Perhaps it does not mean that you will go to California. Or, or maybe you take me with you. That's such a strange dream, Kathy. You dreamed all that before. Didn't tell me. Well, now you know, Halpin. I remember hearing that there are medicinal springs in California. Places where one recovers from rheumatism and neuralgia. Well, now, that might do me some good. M my fingers have grown so stiff lately. Y you see, Harpin? So stiff, especially in the morning. I'm almost sure they have been giving me great pain while I slept. Like they was grasping something and, and just couldn't let go. Like a throat, Kathy. Like a throat when you hold them like that. Oh, but that's only in a dream, Alpin. And we don't want to mistake a dream for real life. No, Kathy. No. We don't ever want to take a chance of mistaking a dream that way. was the last thing you ever said to me, Halpin. Seems I remember it as. You were gone next morning. Couldn't see you for dust. Oh, Halpin. At first I thought it was in a dream you left me, and I couldn't wake out of it hard as I tried. My poor hands never straightened out. They tried to find you in all their emptiness. You never wrote. You just vanished like you never was. Oh, oh my. I came all the way to California looking for you. A long while in San Francisco, someone said you'd gone to sea. So I watched the ships and the sailors. I thought each one was you, Halpin. I may believe they were because I, I wanted to wake up out of my dream. Then a, a very mean man, a very mean man indeed, took me up here to the mountains. And we lived a while torturing each other. <laughs> I hid all his stolen money in the graveyard. Still looking for it, I suppose. Oh, he was very mean to me, Halpin. He, he had a little knife, which he kept sharp as a razor. Kathy. Look, Alpin. Kathy. Look no. at me. Kathy, go. See what he did? <laughs> he, Kathy. he said he, he wanted to find the spot that hurt the most. <laughs> but nothing hurt, Alpin. Nothing hurt. Kathy. Nothing hurt anywhere. Only the memory. And he couldn't find the right spot for that. But he got very close one dark night. See, Alpin? My delicate white throat. 
Oh. See how he cut with his razor knife from this ear to that ear. It, it never stopped bleeding, Hopkin. Oh, you, you'd never believe how much blood could be stored up in one soulless body. See it, Hopkin? Keeps me strong enough to come to you. Keep away from bring me, these aching hands no. to your own warm, no, to your no. throat. Cassie, no. See no. me helping. Kathy. No. See what's gone out of me. No, Kathy. Get away. Kathy. Oh, my. Kathy, no. Oh, please. Oh, love. Gone out of me. To Jarrelson and Hulker, the nature of the struggle was made clear by a glance. The face and throat were purple, almost black. The shoulders lay upon a low mound, and the head was turned back at an angle otherwise impossible. From the froth filling the open mouth, the tongue protruded, black and swollen. The throat showed terrible contusions, not mere finger marks, but bruises and lacerations wrought by two strong hands that must have bedded themselves in the yielding flesh, maintaining their terrible grasp until long after death. Yeah, the work of a maniac, all right. Branscombe LaRue. Look here. Uh, looks like he was... Writing something in a memorandum pad. Yeah. Pretty scrawly. Well, I guess under the circumstances. Can you make it out? Uh, let's see. It's poetry, looks like. Uh, the, the air was stagnant all. Silence was a living thing that breathed among trees. Hmm. Um, with blood, the trees were all a drip. Sounds like Bane. Uh, Bane? Who's Bane? Myron Bane. Poet half a century ago. Now, why would this poor fellow want to be copying down that dismal stuff? Hmm. Dismal, all right. Well, in a way, I guess it figures. This is Orson Welles. Speaking from London. The Black Museum. Here in the grim stone structure on the Thames, which houses Scotland Yard, is a warehouse of homicide. A warehouse where everyday objects, a salt shaker, a pair of scissors, an umbrella, all are touched by murder. Stick. Black wood, silver mounted. Maybe it's real ebony. Stick which might have belonged to your grandfather. It's that vintage, about 1865. A gracious era with crinolines and beaver hats. Still harping on that walking stick of yours, Martinson? I've stated a thousand times, and in public, this stick was given me by Garibaldi. I'm proud of it. Well, it's not really my business, of course, but... Don't you think, Martinson, you ought to stop lying to yourself? Even if you don't stop lying to the gullible public. Well, that walking stick can be seen today in the Black Museum. From the annals of the Criminal Investigation Department of the London Police... 
we bring you the dramatic stories of the crimes recorded by the objects in Scotland Yard's Gallery of Death, the Black Museum. Museum, Scotland Yard's Mausoleum of Murder. Yes, here lies death. I make no virtue of killing, but I'm fascinated by the facts. Facts I've learned in this room from these silent witnesses to the act of murder. Now, this is a plaster cast of a heel print. Found, it says on the small label... In a flower bed outside a ground floor window, note the scratches and rubber hue. Those markings led a man to the gallows. This is a steel file, sharp pointed, well tempered, meant for cutting metal cleanly. This file, no, it was not used to escape a prison. No, it was used to put a man in prison. This file became a weapon. Cut through human flesh and bone. Ah, here we are, the walking stick. It came from Glasgow more than 80 years ago, 1865. Its owner was uh, Dr. Richard Martinson, an interesting fellow. Loved to give lectures, sometimes with lantern slides on places where he said he'd been. This is Capri, lovely isle in the Mediterranean. Loveliest of all the seven seas. Here, as you can observe, blue waters with a picturesque coastline. Adding their salt... He had the soul of a poet, apparently, this Dr. Martinson. And he was, according to himself, a great lover of liberty. I knew Garibaldi, whose courage was as great as man's can be. Garibaldi set freedom above life. He gave me my walking stick as a token of the high esteem in which he held me. Altogether a remarkable... Of course, there were those in Glasgow who were skeptical. Perhaps with reason. Capri, my foot. Martinson's never been out of the British Isles except for one week in Paris. And as for that Garibaldi nonsense, Balder Dash. The discussions about his veracity didn't help Dr. Martinson's practice. This was something of a pity as the doctor had a wife who was chronically ill. And how are we today, Sylvia, my dear? Oh, as well as I can expect, Richard. Have you had anything to eat today? I don't have any appetite, you know that. The tonic I gave you is to stimulate your appetite, dear. Oh, I can't abide the tonic, Richard. I'm sorry, but I can't. You make me feel rather inadequate, darling. Not only as a provider, but as a doctor as well. Oh, don't feel like that, Richard, please. It's not you. You're doing your best, I know. I hope I am, my dear. I truly hope I am. It is a little strange. I'm the one who's ill, and I'm doing the... But Dr. Martinson bore up under his trials. He bore up rather well. And then company came. To stay. Richard, I don't believe you're giving Sylvia proper attention. Now, Mother, to me, she's getting the best medical care available. And she still won't eat. Richard, you're a fool. I won't have my daughter neglected. I won't have it. You won't have it. So you suppose I enjoy it? I've made up my mind, Richard. I'm taking over where Sylvia is concerned. First thing necessary is strength. Oh, yes. Mrs. Toomey had come to stay a while. And she made her presence felt at once in the kitchen. Evelyn, I want to make my daughter something light and tasty. Do you have any tapioca in the house? And, of course, in the bedroom. Particularly in the bedroom. Put the tray on the dresser, Evelyn. Yes, ma'am. Mother, what is it you're doing now? Just rest yourself, dear. You may go, Evelyn. Yes, ma'am. Of course. But, Mother... Hush, darling. Your mother's here now. And you're going to start eating at once. Oh, Mother... Night's tapioca. Light. Really tasty. Oh, Mother, I can't. I won't. Look, I'll put some sugar on it. Right from the bowl. There we are. Now, doesn't that look appetizing? Oh, I can't stand the sight of it, really, Mother. I'm not a child. Look, I'll eat some. Do you remember, dear, how I used to get you to eat when you were a tiny lass? 
by eating from your plate myself, like this. Now it's your turn, dear. Come. Of course it didn't work. Would it work with you? <laughs> of course not. Mrs. Toomey ate all the tapioca herself. What in the name of... Oh, Doctor, she's taken so sick. Who has taken sick, girl? My wife? Oh, no, sir. It's the old... Uh, it's Mrs. Toomey. She's taken dreadful sick. Moaning and groaning and all. She woke me up, she did. With the noise of it. Richard, please. His mother sick. It seems so, dear. Oh, please do something, Doctor, please. All right. I'll go to her. Meanwhile, you get your coat on and run for Dr. Barclay on the high street. Hurry now, I hesitate to treat my wife's mother. My That's wife. quite ethical, you know. If you're a doctor, you don't treat members of your family yourself. Dr. Barclay, despite his reservations concerning his colleague, honored his own Hippocratic oath. He returned at once with evil. I'll take my coat, girl. Where's the patient? Yes, sir. In there. Good of you to come over so quickly, Barclay, in spite of everything. Our job, Martinson, is to heal the sick. Now, let me see the patient. First, Barclay, I, I think you should see this. Oh, where did you find it? Near her bed. Uh, she reeks from the stuff. Oh, then this is nothing more than an ordinary drug. Drunken... I would uh, diagnose it as something more. She's been taking some of this, apparently. Hmm, I know that sedative. Opium base. What's your diagnosis, Martinson? Apoplexy. She's the choleric type, you know, apparently subject to these attacks. Now, um, if you'd care to examine the patient, Doctor, I should be glad to give you whatever assistance... Barclay examined the suffering woman, described a sedative, and went on his way. He called again the next morning. Oh, she seems to be resting comfortably, Martinson. She'll be all right in a day or two, I'm sure. If you want me, send the girl. The coolness between the two medical men remained and succeeding events didn't tend to improve their relationship. Richard, my mother, and I'm the one who's sick. It must come to all of us, Sylvia. Your mother lived a full life. Now she is at rest. But I miss her. I miss her terribly. The passing of her mother was extremely upsetting to Sylvia Martinson. Her husband, qualified physician that he was, used to the sight of death... Seemed somewhat affected himself. His wife was not present to see him. Evelyn, I want you to see something. Yes, Doctor? This bottle. Remember it? Well, of course, sir. I bought it from the chemist myself. Mrs. Toomey sent me. She said it was for sleeping. When was that exactly, Evelyn? Day before yesterday. The day she came. And the bottle was full then? Oh, yes, sir. And now... I can see for yourself, Doctor. More than half the medicine's gone. Exactly. And I want you to remember this, if there should be any question. Understand? Yes, sir. I've made out and signed the death certificate. Uh, can you find your way to the registrar's office? Oh, yes, sir. Go there, then. Uh, I'll give you a note. Uh, file this paper. I've certified the cause of death as apoplexy. Understand? An obedient girl, that Evelyn. Not too bright, perhaps, but obedient. Very loyal to the doctor. In fact, her loyalty had a tendency to brim over at the edges. I think he's a grand man. Grand. And why, may I ask? Well, you only cook for him, Mrs. Bemis. You don't see him at the front of the house like I do. So considerate. So kindly. Have some more cheese, Evie. Thank you, I will. Now, this cheese. He went to the other end of the city for it, just to tempt the madam to eat something. But she wouldn't touch any of it. It's the husband's duty to care for his wife. The doctor does more than his duty. Spends all that time at her bedside. Tries to help her every way he can. Hmm. Maybe it's because he's got so much time on his hands, not having many patients and all. I'll have a bit more of that cheese myself. I heard over the fence yesterday half the neighborhood is talking of what a prevaricator he is. Oh. 
with his walking stick from the Italian. <laughs> Nonsense. If he says it was a gift... Well, then you can be sure it was not. Hmm. A great one for making up... A bit of below-stairs gossip, a touch of the local scandal that kept patients away from the doctor's door, just some gossip at the end of the servants' dinner, as so they lingered over the cheese poor sick Sylvia refused. Yes. The cheese. <laughs> Oh, where does the doctor keep his bicarbonate of soda? I I think in the medicine cabinet. I don't feel so well myself. I'll get it. Oh, hurry. Oh, my stomach's that twisted. Must have been the cheese. Oh, it did taste a bit tangy. No hurry. Oh, no, thank heaven. The poor mistress refused to touch it. Thank heaven, yes. Oh, if I can find the soda, if I can find it quickly without... Another tiny piece of the puzzle. Another incident. The cheese which the wife refused. As she refused nearly every other food in the house. As she literally starved herself. Wasting away. Slowly. Slowly. (laughs) I'm glad you called me when you did, Martison. Your wife's in bad shape. Looks as if she hadn't eaten or slept in days. Poor Sylvia. She's had gastric fever for months, you know. No, I didn't know. High time you called me. Here, send your old girl for this sedative. We'll get her some sleep. Then we'll try to take care of her properly. You can't dodge truth with this, Doctor, as you do with your walking stick. Oh, Mother. I see you. You're here. Doctor... What's happening? She's talking to her mother. It happens sometimes in the crisis of gastric fever. The patient has hallucinations induced by weakness. Oh, mother, help me. I'm I'm afraid to die. Oh, doctor, can you do nothing? <gasps> doctor, she's dead. She's gone. No. Sylvia, No. <laughs> Dr. Martinson's grief seemed genuine. How much of everything was play-acting? And how much was truth? And the answer to that question lay in the doctor's own hands. In the shape of a walking stick. That same stick that can be seen today in the Black Museum. took Sylvia Martinson to Edinburgh, to her own family, to place her with her mother. A heartbroken husband took the long, slow journey, and it was long and slow in 1865. At the church... No, it isn't so. I I cannot accept it. I, I cannot. Wait. Wait. Before you take my beloved away, let me kiss her sweet lips once more. A trifle overdone, don't you think? Well, perhaps it was sincere. However, the emotion was not considered unseemly. However, other things were considered so, and people at times made it their business to call the attention of strangers to such happenings. Here's a peculiar business, Stuart. Just another letter, Sergeant. A crank, I'd say. I'd like to think so, but this fellow seems to know what he's talking about. Are you certain it's a man, Sergeant? Well, do you notice the signature? Amicus judici, friend of justice, masculine, a man. Ah, uses a foreign language. Latin. That's what it is, Latin. I thought only doctors knew Latin and chemists to read the prescriptions the doctors write. (laughs) You haven't read the letter yet. Read it, Stuart. Read it carefully. Gentlemen of the police, it appears to me that a man who falsifies the way he obtained a walking stick and creates fantasies of troubles he never experienced may well be a subject for suspicion in other matters. Odd? Why? Go on. Keep reading. The man whose fabrications have entertained some and bored a great many more is the same man whose mother-in-law died some few weeks ago under rather strange circumstances at his house in Socky Hall Street. 
Yesterday, this man's wife also died under strange circumstances. This man is Dr. Richard Martinson, and it is the writer's belief that a thorough investigation can be only of benefit. Either it will restore public confidence in a man of medicine, or it will uncover a murderer. Amicus judiciae. Well... They never found the writer of that letter, but in the Martinson house, which was searched, Warren provided, with a great deal of thoroughness, while Evelyn Warren looked on. Found this, Sergeant. Medicine bottle. No, nothing particularly out of the ordinary about that in a doctor's house. Or is there now? Is there, my girl? Oh, no, sir. Nothing at all. We have dozens. Hmm. All with the label? Sleeping draft, Mrs. Toomey is directed. All of them? No, sir. Only one. That one. Not much left in it, is there? Anyone been taking it? Oh, no, sir. The doctor was very definite. No one was to touch it. He showed it me just after the old... Mrs. Toomey passed on. Stuart. Uh, yes, sir? I want an analysis of the contents of this bottle, and I want a copy of the prescription from the chemist who filled it. But it couldn't be anything wrong with it, sir. But... I fetched it from the chemist shop myself. Oh, you did, girl. Good. Then you can take us there. The analysis was over quickly enough. The report was quite brief. Here it is, Sergeant. Ten percent mineral poison antimony. Sufficient to kill a strong man, let alone an elderly lady. Next stop, the chemist. Where Evelyn Warren had obtained the sedative. My name's Pine, sir. Sergeant Pine, CID, Glasgow Police. Uh, yes, Sergeant. Do you know this girl? Uh, not by name, sir. Uh, but you are Dr. Martinson's maid, aren't you? Yes, sir. I am. Good enough. Perhaps you'll tell me what was in the sleeping draft the girl had here. It's a standard mixture, Sergeant. Some opium, not very much. It's only small quantities. Some people have been known to boil it, evaporate the other contents to get at the opium itself. Any mineral poison antimony in it? Poison? Quiet, girl. Well, sir, that's a uh, tartar emetic you speak of, Sergeant. There'll be nothing like that in our sleeping draft. You're positive? Oh, yes. Of course, Dr. Martinson did obtain some of the emetic from us occasionally in the past few months. <laughs> Enough to <laughs> cause trouble? He's a doctor, Sergeant. He'd know how and when to use it. <laughs> The telegraph wires, it was 1865, remember, hummed between Glasgow and Edinburgh. Edinburgh Police CID official. Request exhumation order and autopsy, Mrs. Harry Toomey, daughter, Mrs. Richard Martinson. Suspect homicide, wire reply, Pine Sergeant Glasgow Police CID. The wheels were turning, even while the wheels of the train bringing Richard Martinson back to Glasgow were slowing to a stop in the railway station. Dr. Richard Martinson? Yes, I am he. I'll have to ask you to come with me, sir. May I ask who you are and how you knew my name? Detective Stewart, sir, CID. Your description was given me, particularly the walking stick. Oh, yes, uh, this. Uh, given me by Garibaldi, a great man. He... Am I under arrest? The sergeant has a few questions, sir. If you'd step this way, I have a handsome waiting... Sorry to put you to all this, Doctor, but it can't be. Isn't wait for the autopsies. They took the doctor in charge, as they put it, at once. Suspicion of murder was the booking. A short while later... The report from Edinburgh, Stuart. Both women were poisoned. The wife was full of arsenic. Apparently, he'd been getting into her for quite some time. It's a cumulative poison. The charge was changed simply to murder. <laughs> The trial paraded the usual number of experts and police officers to the witness box. The medical evidence was almost overwhelming. But through it all, not one shred of motive. No one could find a reason for these deaths. Until, at last, the Solicitor General, the public prosecutor in those days, brought in a surprise witness. Your name, please, Miss? Evelyn Warren. Miss Warren. We understand you were the housemaid in the establishment of the prisoner. Yes. And during your employment in that household, did the prisoner make any advances to you? Did he? Answer me, Miss Warren. 
Yes. When did this happen? Before his wife fell ill? Yes. What did you do about it? I spoke to the mistress. I asked to be... to be let go. What did she say? That I was to stay and she would speak to the doctor. Did she? I don't know. Did the advances continue? Yes. Did he ever ask you to marry him? Did he ever promise to marry you after his wife died? Answer me, did he? Yes, sir, but only once, only once. Was this the motive? Counsel for the defense refused to accept it, naturally. Strangely enough, the defendant never took the witness stand in his own cause. Not once during the trial did he utter a word. It was almost as if he welcomed punishment, as if he were already walking out to meet it. The judge spent a part of his charge with the jury on the question of motive. The question of motive is not your concern in this case. Why this murder was committed is of no moment. How it was done, by whom? If murder was committed, and if it was, did Dr. Martinson commit it? You have heard the evidence. Now you will consider your verdict. And during every moment of your deliberations, remember, the decision you make can never be undone. The jury was out exactly 55 minutes. The verdict they brought in gave the judge no choice of sentence. Richard Martinson... You stand before us found guilty of the terrible crime of premeditated homicide. It is the sentence of this court that you be carried from the bar to the prison and there be detained until the 1st of July, 1865. And upon that day, to be hanged by the neck until dead. And the walking stick... The evidence which helped the slender value of the doctor's word, that stick which helped to hang him, can be found today in the Black Museum. Why did he do it? What had he to gain? In modern terms, what compulsion drove Richard Martinson to sacrifice his future as a physician to the lies of his lectures, to the fabrication of his walking stick story? to the murder of his wife and her mother. Perhaps today, psychologists would have the answer. In 1865, no one had the answer, not even Richard Martinson himself. He did state, just before he died, I can assign no motive for the conduct which actuated me beyond a species of terrible madness and the use of ardent spirits. And now until we meet next time, till we meet in the same place, and I tell you another story about the Black Museum. I remain as always obediently yours. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents. G. Marshall. I'm sure you'd be interested, so I thought I might define a charnel house. According to Webster, it is a house, vault, or other place where dead bodies or the bones of the dead are deposited or piled up. Why do I bring up such a gruesome subject? Join me in our story and tell me later whether or not I should have. mystery drama, The Charnel House, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Roberta Maxwell. I'll be back shortly with Act One.
the turn of the century, the last place anyone would have connected with a charnel house was the prestigious Chisholm Clinic, some 30 miles northwest of Boston, on the rugged shores of Cape Ann. Dr. Carlton Chisholm had poured his life savings into a miracle palace of diagnostics for those who could be rescued from the shadow of death, and a haven for those who could not be helped to escape it. But dark shadows lurked behind the bright promise, as Jane Pryor is about to discover. By the time I got off the train at Marblehead and into the Hackney carriage, I was exhausted. The long 12-day trip that had brought me home from Vienna had been a nightmare, tortured by fears and uncertainty. Now that I was on the final lap, the last thing I wanted to do was to make conversation. In all the rush, I didn't get a chance to introduce myself. I'm Dr. Stephen Garrick. How do you do? May I ask your name, Miss... Uh, it is Miss, isn't it? Yes, it is. Miss Jane Pryor. Oh. I, uh, I don't mean to pry, but are you headed for the same place as me? I don't know. I don't know where you're headed. Oh. Well, I thought from the fact I was a doctor. I mean, I'm going to the Chisholm Clinic. So am I. You work there? No. Well, you certainly can't be a patient. I'm going to visit my father. He's a patient there. Oh, good. I, I, I mean, I, I'm sorry he's a patient, of course. What, what I meant was, if you visit there often, I thought I could ask you a couple of things about it. I'm just about to start there. It's all new to me. I'm afraid it's just as new to me, too, Dr. Garrick. Oh? Your father just took ill recently? No. He's been a patient at the clinic for... Uh... For a little over a year now. Uh, I, I didn't mean to upset you, Miss Pryor. I only hope that... <clears throat> that there isn't anything for me to be upset about. I sure hope so, too. What, um... What's the nature of your father's illness? A year ago, he had a bad fall and fractured his hip. He wrote me from Chisholm Clinic to say that it had been reset, but that he would be spending quite a while there till it healed. Quite a while? A year? Longer than that, actually. Fourteen months. Oh, I wanted to come to him, but he put me off. It was a long trip, and it would have been very expensive. You were out of the country? I was in Vienna, studying voice. I was to be there two years. I see. Your father is an older man? Oh, no. He's quite young, really. I mean, I, I don't know exactly how old he is, but somewhere in his late forties. We exchanged letters every week at first, and he seemed to be coming along quite well. Then there was some sort of setback, and apparently they had to operate again. But he was very cheerful about it and insisted that I must not come home. There was nothing I could do anyway. Well, certainly with the reputation that Chisholm Clinic has, he was under the best of care. I knew that. And also, Dr. Chisholm was an old friend of the family, practically an uncle of mine. So I didn't worry that much till about three months ago. Well, what happened then? All of a sudden, my father's letters just stopped coming. But you kept writing to him? More often. The last two letters I even sent directly to Dr. Chisholm. Were your letters returned to you? No. Even the ones I sent to our house in Boston. Well, it's a big ocean, and mail does go astray. I'm sure there must be some simple explanation. I'm sure there must be. Anyway, I'm being a fool, since I'll find out very shortly now. I, uh, I wish to help you any way I can. You already have. Now that's enough about me. Tell me about yourself. You're quite young for a doctor, aren't you? <laughs> it's the way you get to be when you're just fresh out of med school. Will this be your first job? Sure will. And not a moment too soon. What do you mean? Well, I more or less had to put myself through medical school. So it had to be a small one. And you don't waltz into good internships that easy if you're not from one of the bigger schools. In fact, I'd just about given up hope when this fell open. I mean... The Chisholm Clinic. That's really hitting the jackpot. I congratulate you. Yes. What a piece of luck. You say the job fell open. How did that happen? Now, that's the part that's not so good. The guy they had was in his second year. He was carrying around a virulent culture in a test tube, and somehow it slipped, and in trying to catch it, he cut his hand and got it infected. Is he very ill? Not anymore. He got blood poisoning through his whole system and died of it two days ago. The 
looks like rain. Do you have luggage? Just this small bag. I can manage it. Let me help you down. Thank you. You're welcome. I, uh, I suppose I won't be seeing you again. I suppose not. Mm. Will you be going back to Boston tonight? I don't know. That depends on how I find my... my father. I hope you find him in the best of health. I'd just like to say, if I can ever be of any help... I'm sure I can manage everything now. I don't think you understand. I'm not trying to take advantage of a chance acquaintanceship. You may need help, Miss Pryor. I had scarcely reached the cover of the portico before the rain came. Since I was sheltered, I hesitated before ringing the bell. The strange way Dr. Stephen Garrick had said that I might need help, emphasizing the word need, had caught my ear. I had the uneasy feeling that had haunted me all the way from Europe, that something was very wrong. But as Dr. Garrick came up the steps carrying his bags, the door suddenly opened to reveal a tall woman in a nurse's uniform with a forbidding hatchet face. Good afternoon. You would be Dr. Garrick? That's right. I'm head nurse Banyan. Uh, we were expecting you, but couldn't spare anyone to meet you at the station. Uh, come in. Thank you, Nurse Banyan. But I think, first of all... We can talk after you're in. The wind is blowing the rain, and I'm getting wet. Well, I only wanted to introduce Miss... Oh, I didn't see you there. Is she with you, Doctor? We came in the Hackney together. What can I do for you, Miss? I'm here to visit my father. He's one of your patients. Well, uh, shall we step in before we get soaked? Suppose you drop your bags by the hall tree, young man. Dr. Mandley will want to see you. I'll take you to him just as soon as I get this young person straightened away. We were not expecting any visitors. Why didn't you write? I did, before I left Vienna. Vienna, Austria? Yes. I couldn't give you an exact date because I didn't know when I would arrive. A visitation hours for permanent guests are once a month on the weekend. Not till a week from Saturday. I've come over 4,000 miles to see my father, and I intend to see him now, today, this minute. Uh, may I inquire the name of the patient? Mr. Robert Pryor, and he's a close friend of Dr. Chisholm's. I, uh... I think you had uh, better talk to Dr. Mandley, Miss Pryor. You will, uh have to wait, Dr. Garrick. That's all right. I don't mind. I don't want to talk to anyone else but my father. Well, of course. But you must see Dr. Manley first. Why? Who is this Dr. Manley? At the present time, he is the head of this clinic. Uh, th this way, please, Miss Pryor. She turned and headed towards one side of the big hall. My head was clamoring with unasked questions. I had a sick sense of foreboding. What is it, nurse? Dr. Manley, uh, this is Miss Jane Pryor. The daughter of Mr. Robert Pryor. Robert Pryor? Oh, my dear Miss Pryor, yes. Come in, come in. Won't you please sit down? Dr. Manley, I want to know what's going on here. I'm not a fool. Obviously, there's something very, very wrong. It's father, isn't it? What's wrong? Well, I thought, of course, you knew. I, I, I'm afraid that your father is dead, Miss Pryor. Oh. When did it happen? Uh, about two weeks ago. Oh, no. Oh, father. Uh, uh, close the door, nurse, and uh, fetch some brandy in the decanter. Oh. Uh, now, Miss Pryor, you must try to relax. I know what a terrible shock this must have been. All the pent-up emotions of the last 12 days, the agonizing frustrations of what had seemed like an endless journey, the strain of trying to turn away from the terrible presentiment that my father might be dead hit me. I felt the room spin, and I must have fainted for a while. When I came to, I was saying, Why didn't someone write and tell me? But we did, my dear. Apparently, our letter must have reached Vienna after you left. But, but how could...
could he die? I mean, just of a broken hip? Well, your father had a great deal more than that the matter with him. You mean the other operations? I mean the cause of them. Something we were not able to arrest. I don't understand. Your father had osteomyelitis, my dear. What's that? A disease of the bone and the bone marrow. The disease has a normally slow growth, but in your father's case, the deterioration was very rapid. Oh, I assure you, he had every care, everything that money could buy. Even after the money ran out, the clinic provided the same lavish care for him, but, well, to, to no avail. The, the money ran out? <laughs> The cost of medical care can be astronomical. But then, what is more precious than life, if it can be saved? But if there's no money left, what am I going to do? Well, I thought, I, I mean, you were off in Europe, and your father was not exactly a rich man. We, we thought you were independently wealthy. I had to beg, borrow, and steal to get myself home. I have less than two dollars in the whole world. I don't know what... know what. I want to see Dr. Chisholm. Well, I'm afraid that won't be possible. Uh, perhaps we could uh, put up Miss Pryor for the night, Dr. Manley, and uh, tomorrow she could talk to Dr. Chisholm. Yes, 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 that's, that's an excellent idea, Nurse Banyan, and I shall prescribe a sedative for her so that she may have a good long rest, the one she needs. Miss Pryor, I won't take no for an answer. You must be our guest. I had this dreadful urge to run. Run from someone who seemed only trying to be kind. In any case, where was there to run to? Intriguing, isn't it? I mean, are the good Dr. Manley and his somewhat forbidding head nurse just exactly what they seem, and as much the accidental victims of the slow and chancy communications of 80 years ago? Or is this, as Jane somehow senses, a case of, step into my parlor, said the spider to the fly. I shall return shortly with Act Two. Pryor's instincts may have told her. A practical assessment of the spot she finds herself in have drowned them out. And she has spent the night at the Chisholm Clinic in a long, dreamless sleep. One pleasant surprise has been that instead of the aseptic coldness of a hospital room, it has been spent on a soft, quilted bed in an exquisitely furnished bedroom on the second floor of the main building. Awake early and already dressed, she is gazing out at the sunrise from this room. The sun was just rising. It was a lovely, brisk fall day outside. In spite of the long rest, my head felt heavy and my eyes swollen and puffed. I had an urge to get out and breathe some of that air to clear my head. I went downstairs, seeing no one, crossed the empty hall slipped the chain from the door and let myself out. I came off the porch, remembering the sea and turning to walk in that direction. I could begin to see other buildings now. A large, fairly new one that must be the clinic proper. A big old one far in the distance. Other buildings dotted about. Before I had gone very far... Well, surprise! Good morning, Miss Pryor. Good morning, Dr. Garrick. Where did you pop up from? The clinic over there. They put me right on duty yesterday. Haven't even found a billet for me yet. I'm on my way over to administration to find a bed. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm beat. I must look a mess. Not at all. You look very efficient in your white. Oh, skivvies. The clothes make the man. 
But what are you doing here still? About your father? He's dead. Yes, I know. Oh, how did you know? Yesterday, when you went in to see Dr. Mandley, I couldn't help overhearing while the door was open. There's something wrong, isn't there? Any way I can help? I'm afraid not. I really want to. If you just... What the devil? What is it? What are they? Well, house pets, I get. Hey, those are pinchers. Get behind me, Miss Pryor. Oh, are they dangerous? They're attack dogs. Down, boys. Down. I can't stop them. I'll keep them busy. Then you run for it. But, Doctor... Listen to me. They're vicious. Down. You hear me? Down. Shit. Shit, hands. Shit, weather. Easy, then. Easy. Stay. Oh, shh. Sure, I'm glad you showed up. Who are you? Who are you? Dr. Garrick. And this is Miss... We ain't got no Dr. Garrick here. I just joined the ranks yesterday. Oh, you're the new intern? That's right. Well, who are you, sister? Well, this is Miss Price. Let her answer for herself. Now, just a minute. Who do you think you are? I'll tell you, Doc. The name is Morris, the enforcer. I'm in charge of security around here. You break my rules. I'm the boss. Please, d don't. Don't argue. My name is Pryor. Jane Pryor. My father is... was a patient here. How did you get on the grounds? I came yesterday afternoon. And stayed the night? Yes. I never heard of no visitor staying overnight. It was Dr. Manley's suggestion. Oh, I'll check on that, you know. Why don't you go do that, Mr. Enforcer, and take your two brutes with you? I'm not quite finished. Where was you headed, miss, at this time in the morning? I wanted some air. I thought I'd walk down to the sea. And you, doctor? They haven't given me a place to live yet. I was working at the clinic, and I was going over to administration to see Dr. Manley or someone about getting somewhere to sleep. Okay. Now, you know this. From sundown to sunup, the dogs are loose. Anyone wants to move around outside, you check with me first. What is this, a prison? No, Doc. But you see that big old building down there? We got a lot of strange cookies in there, ain't got their heads screwed on right. For their protection, as well as everybody else, we make sure everybody stays where he won't get hurt. Now you better get back inside. I guess we'd better get inside. What a terrible man. Yes, I'd like to catch him without those dogs of his and... I, I don't think you want to tangle with him. He looks awfully powerful. Mm, like a bouncer or an ex-pug. I can't understand Uncle Dr. Chisholm having a man like that in his employ. I think I'll speak to him about it when I see him. Uh-oh. What is it? We have a reception committee. Dragon Lady, Nurse Banyan. I suppose she's looking for me. Will I see you again? I don't expect so. My father is dead and I've found out I have no money. I don't know where I'm going to be. Miss Banyan peremptorily told Dr. Garrick she would show him to his room and that Dr. Mandley was waiting to see me. In his study, I found him in operating whites and in a rather strange mood. First of all, let me apologize for the earliness of the hour, but I shall be in surgery all morning. I, uh... I didn't know that you knew Dr. Chisholm so closely. Well, I... I don't anymore. I haven't seen him since I was 10 or 11. I see. But you and your father were very close to him. Oh, yes. Uh, in a certain way. I mean, my father was Dr. Chisholm's driver till he moved out here to open the clinic. Oh, your father didn't come with him? No. Uh, he, he didn't want to take me away from my music school and teachers. So the doctor helped him get his own carriage and hackney service. That's how he was able to afford to send me to Europe. Well, I had no idea he was a special friend of Dr. Chisholm's. He was visiting the doctor out here when he broke his hip. Didn't you know that? Oh, why, no. I wasn't on his case. I'm surprised that Dr. Chisholm in all that time never mentioned it. Yes. Well, as a matter of fact, there's one reason I wanted to see you. First of all, let me say that Dr. Chisholm is deeply grieved. Deeply at your tragic loss. He wants me to convey to you that you must make your home here until, well, until you can make whatever other arrangements you decide. Well, I can't. I, I 
can't take charity like that. Well, I tell you what, if it'll make you feel better, you can help us here. We're always short-handed. We can make you a nurse's aide. I don't really know anything about hospitals. Oh, Banyan will take you in hand, teach you all you need to know. I must tell you, this will make Dr. Chisholm very happy. And I want to make it quite clear this was his desire. Yes, but... Well, if I'm going to see him myself, why do you have to tell me all this, Dr. Mandley? My dear little girl, you say you haven't seen Dr. Chisholm in several years. Well, I'm afraid you must prepare yourself for quite a shock. He had a rather massive stroke just after your father uh, joined us. And his recovery has been distressingly slow. Distressingly slow. Here's little Miss Pryor come to see you, Dr. Chisholm. What? Who's that? Uh, Nurse Banyan. Not you. Who? It's Uh, me, Uncle Carl. Remember? Little Janie. Janie. Little Janie. Janie Pryor. Don't you remember, Uncle Carl? How I used to come here summers and we'd run down to the water and how you taught me to swim and all the places, the secret places you showed me in the rocks and the shells we gathered and how we'd run on the sand. Shells, sand, yes, little brown legs, sturdy legs. (laughs) Janie, little Janie. Oh, you do remember. I'm here, Uncle Carl. Uh, Don't. uh, Good to have you back. Don't go away. I... I I won't till you're better. Uh, Children. uh, Lonely men need children. Lucky man, Pryor. Good man. Where is... uh, Where is Pryor? Doesn't he know? He does, but he forgets. You'd better leave him now. But I just came. Where's Janie? Little Janie. I'm here, Uncle Carl, here. But Janie's going to have to leave. It's time. You're doing him harm. Go. I've got to sedate him. Janie. I... I have to go now, Uncle Carl. Don't go away. Don't leave. I promise. I won't leave. I'll stay... For as long as you need me. And so I stayed. A week passed, and I was kept so busy I had little chance to see Uncle Carl. There was another huge building I came to know, down by the sea, filled with human flotsam and jetsam. The elderly, the nearly senile, the lame and the crippled, the unwanted, deserted by their families. They needed help, too. And I tried to give it to them. As the days passed, I wondered that I hadn't run into Dr. Garrick. And then, one day as I was wheeling a new arrival to her room... Well, it's a small world. Dr. Garrick, fancy meeting you here. No accident. I was looking for you. I've got to talk to you. I I can't right now. I... Oh, Dr. Garrick, I want you to meet one of our new guests. This is Mrs. Elizabeth Browning. (laughs) Not Mr. Robert Browning's wife, the poetess, although heaven knows I'm old enough. Pleasure to meet you, Mrs. Browning. I find you as ageless as the first one. Oh, my, such a nice bedside manner. (laughs) Don't waste it on me. Save it for the young lady. Um, But she's not my young lady. Uh, Yes, but keep trying. Go talk to him, Miss Pryor. He has something he wants to say to you. I can't leave you alone. Oh, of course you can, my dear. I can wheel this chair myself into my own room. As for being alone, it's a condition of the old. One gets... Quite used to it. Nice to have met you, Dr. Garrick. We'll meet again, I hope. I don't want to leave that sweet old lady alone. What is it you want, Doctor? I... 
I've got to talk to you. All right. But not here. I... Oh, Lord, here comes the dragon. Now I've got to fade. I'll find some place where we can talk in private. What about? I can't tell you here. Just this one thing, if we don't get a chance soon. Get out. Get out of this place, I beg you. Before it's too late. this strange establishment with its atmosphere of mystery and decay. This land of the lost, of the abandoned, the mutilated, and the insane. I shall return shortly with Act Three. None of us really likes the hospital, but we applaud its function and its efficiency to heal. We are less fond of an asylum or a sanitarium, but again, it has a goal, to help bind up the wounds of the mind and return people to their worlds again. But no one can like a hospital for chronic cases, for those who have no family or a family who either can't or won't care for them anymore, and worst of all, for those who can't afford to pay for care, to whom the last refuge of the human soul, the preservation of dignity, has been denied. Jane? Yes, Miss Banyan? Was that Dr. Garrick you were just talking to? Yes. What was he doing here in this building? I don't know. I suppose his duty... His duty is confined strictly to the medical clinic... I'll have a few words with that young man. Oh, uh, where did you put Mrs. Browning? I put her right here in five. It's empty now, and... She does not belong here. Take her upstairs to 51. Oh, oh the general ward? But she doesn't belong there. She's not The sick. woman is senile. Indeed, she is not. She's bright as a penny. May I remind you that you are not a doctor? I don't have to be for this. Why, if you put this sweet little lady up with all those poor, sick women. I want to talk to Dr. Chisholm. I'm sure he wouldn't allow it. You are to stay away from Dr. Chisholm. Your presence is not good for him. He's had quite a setback since your visit. I don't believe it. And you can't keep me from seeing him. The orders are not mine. They come from Dr. Mandley. Then I'll go to him. As you wish. In the meantime, as long as you are working here... Get Mrs. Browning up to 51 and right now. I felt like an executioner, but I followed orders and took her upstairs. When I left her, she was wheeling about brightly among those sad old women and scattering cheer like popcorn. The rest of the day, I couldn't get her out of my mind. I tried to see Dr. Manley, but was told he was out for the evening. I went up to my bed in the deepest depression I ever remembered being in. Oh. Don't be afraid. And keep your voice down, Jane. Jane? Well, sooner or later, Steve and Jane. Might as well be now. Though I could have picked a better time. What is all this about? I don't know at all yet. Just enough to make me sick to my stomach. And scared to death for anyone who doesn't carry a fat wallet or a stethoscope. Which is why I want you out. I can't leave here. First of all, I haven't any money. I'll give you all I've got. Steve, you know I can't. What is it? This place, the Chisholm Clinic. When I was a pre-med student, all through med school, how I revered it, looked up to it. The house of life, the miracles that happened here, the breakthroughs, the new techniques, the... Well, I wanted to intern here more than anything I've ever wanted in my life. I applied. But, as I told you, it was my best friend who got the job. How I envied him that first year he was here. The letters. His admiration for Dr. Chisholm. The way he had it made. 
Then the letter stopped. And he didn't reply to any of mine until... Until? He smuggled a letter out to me. I won't go into most of it. I'll just quote a couple of sentences that are burned on my brain. This place is a charnel house. It reeks of death and the ones who profit on it. They have destroyed Dr. Chisholm. And I suppose they will destroy me. I have only one last word. Help. What was he talking about? It was too vague and emotional for me to know. I took it to a doctor I know who is high in medical counsels. I was surprised that it got so much attention. He became part of a group that enlisted my help. When my friend died suddenly, it was they who secured me my appointment here to try to find enough evidence for doctors to move against the ones who run this clinic now. Dr. Manley and yes. Nurse Banyan? Yes. Evidence of what? <laughs> Name a crime in the book they haven't committed. Overcharging on a colossal scale, faulty diagnosis, deliberate or through ignorance, a policy that anyone seeking refuge for old age must sign over all their assets. But isn't that standard procedure? Where the home guarantees complete service until the patient's death. Don't they hear? Sure, as long as they shall live. Only they don't live. What are you saying? I told you it was a charnel house. There are other neat tricks for making money carrying a patient on the books long after the patient has passed on. How can they get away with that? Simple. The people who pay the bills are only too anxious not to be saddled with the problem. They never check up. They may be paying money for people who have been dead for months? That's right. Oh, I... I can't believe it. You'd better believe it. There's another neat little trick you might as well be aware of. What? They don't carry anyone who can't bear the freight... What do you mean? I mean, you'd better not run out of money, like your sweet little Mrs. Browning. It's as good as signing your death warrant if they need the space and think they can get away with it. Oh, no. Now do you see why I want you out of here? I see a lot more than that. Father. That's what happened to him, wasn't it? I mean, he didn't die just recently. He's been dead for quite a while. Ever since his letter stopped. I think his death may have been one of the many my friend had discovered. He was ready to blow the whole thing wide open. That's why he got killed. He didn't die of blood poisoning? If he did, I'll bet my hat it wasn't spontaneous. And Dr. Chisholm? Oh, there's no doubt he had a stroke. That's when Manley had his chance to take over completely. But they had to keep him alive because his prestige was too important to the whole scheme. I'm... I'm sick to my stomach. Sick enough to get out of here like I tell you? What are you going to do? Stay here till I can gather enough evidence to prove all I'm telling you. I want to stay and help. No. Why not? Don't you see why? Because I love you. That's ridiculous. I agree, but there it is. I have since the first moment I met you. Maybe it isn't ridiculous. So have I. Oh, my darling. I never thought... That... What is it? You fell over something. Oh, that... It's, it's some kind of heat register or oh, fresh air duct or something. Me. I tripped over it myself. Never mind it, Steve. It's kind what about us? It won't be that easy. Listen. That quickly, Get down with me. Get away with it. Where? Get On the floor. Be by quickly. the register. Oh, don't run scared. Shh, listen. Our cover is gone. Dr. Chisholm just had another massive stroke. In spite of all we could do, we lost him to cardiac arrest. All right, it was inevitable. We can cover long enough to get out free. I'm not so sure. Everything is piling up. Remember the Pakula girl? I think so. Haven't we been carrying her on the secret dead roll? For over a year. So what? Her father and mother couldn't care less. According to this letter I've just received, a favorite uncle out of the blue cares a great deal. So much so, he plans to visit his niece this weekend. Day after tomorrow. The girl's been dead for ten months. Uh, we have to offer him proof she hasn't. He hasn't seen her since she was a child. And so it appears. So, uh... You mean the one upstairs? Jane Pryor? She's one of the loose ends we must tie up eventually. She'd never go along with it. How could you persuade My her? My dear Martha, we don't need her cooperation. Only a young body. I didn't say it had to be alive. 
Good. That's enough for tonight. I'm tired. That settles it. We've got to get you out of here tonight. How, Steve? Remember? The dogs. The dogs patrol the fence. They're not down by the water. If we could avoid the dogs, we could go that way. Ah, oh, not without a boat. I've checked. The fence runs way beyond low tide. Built up on jetties beyond that. It's too cold and too rough to swim. No way there. But of course there is. The caves. What caves? The caves that Uncle Carl and I... Dr. Chisholm used to explore when I was a little girl. You can find your way through them halfway to Marblehead. You think you still could? I never stopped to think about it before. But now that I do, I know I could. We had stopped only to take the documentary evidence that Steve needed. Hastily bundled into two knapsacks and a portmanteau. Somehow, through guile or luck, we had evaded the dogs and found our way down to the top of the cliffs that guarded the south end of the beach. Then, all of a sudden, a bright torch stabbed out, pinning us in its beam. Ah, ain't that a pretty sight? You're going somewhere, Sonny? And your little girlfriend, Miss Pryor? We're minding our own business. Why don't you mind yours? Come right down to it, ain't I got the inside track? This is really my business. Could you say the same? We've got to get past him. Get his attention. Where are your dogs? <laughs> They're loose somewheres. And don't forget, once they are, Morris here is the only one who can call them off. What the... It looks as though someone else is loose beside your dogs. It's too bad for them. If you... Run! Why, you pipsqueak doctor... You think you can take me out with a blind cider? I'll make mincemeat out of you. I've got a rock. Don't make me use it. You just try it. I've been looking forward to this. No, Steve. Stay back, Jane. Come here, Sabo. You <laughs> had to get... <laughs> No, I can't swim. <laughs> what happened? I tripped him. He was going to kill you. He slipped and fell into the sea. I can't just let him die. Maybe I can get down to him somehow and... Margo! Margo, the dogs! Call them off! I told you we shouldn't have come out! Where's Morris? I don't know! Hands! Let him down! Oh, I, I, I can't control him! Morris! Don't scream! You're getting a game of excitement! Auntie, don't you see? They'll kill us! Morris! Morris! Oh, no! Margo! No! Oh, come on! Where are you going, Jane? We've got to try to get help. It's too late. And we couldn't anyway. They're only getting what they deserve. But they are human beings. After what they've done, not in my book. Oh, come on, darling. Those dogs have tasted blood. And with no one to call them off, none of us is safe. Let's get out of here while we still are. <laughs> I suppose that Nurse Banyan must have checked my room and found me missing. Perhaps she was suspicious of Steve also. There's no way of knowing why they panicked and came out of the house after dark to expose themselves to the dogs. Probably they thought they were safe because Morris was there to call them off. Only Morris wasn't. He was already dead. And now, so were they. Dr. Chisholm died, but his clinic went on living. The same group of doctors who had arranged for Steve Garrick to investigate it took over. They planned to run it only until Dr. Garrick was ready and accredited to take over. They had as deep a faith in this young doctor as his wife, the former Jane Pryor, had. No two people were more wedded to the proposition that no one should be allowed to approach death without dignity. I'll be back shortly.
This was a story of almost a century ago, when communications were slow and unsophisticated. And you might think that many things were conceivable which no longer are today. But treatment of the elderly, as you can confirm for yourself by reading any big city daily, is always an opening for the ruthless. It's a sad fact that wherever there is money to be made, there are always people who don't care how it is made. Our cast included Roberta Maxwell, Gordon Gould, Grace Matthews, and Court Benson. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. somewhere in the jungle. Oh, what a frightening Are you sure they won't attack our camp? The campfire alone is enough to keep them at a good distance. Don't worry, Sharon. You'll be safe. Listen. Yes, native drums. Somehow they, they sound ominous. They only sound ominous if you believe them to be. The diamonds bring death. What's going on out there? Just a wounded animal screaming out. Oh, no. No, there was something else. Do you think the jungle has a voice for our Courtney? That is only for children to believe. In just a moment, the Hall of Fantasy will present The Diamonds of Death. And now for our story. An original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne, entitled, The Diamonds of Death. Vince Porter had just returned from a business trip to Caracas. He called me shortly after his plane landed and said that it was important that Sharon and I come over to his hotel that evening. I tried to get more information out of him, but had no success. At 8.30 that evening, we were in his apartment, and there began the story I am telling you. Good to see you, Vince. Glad to be back, Jeff. Sharon, you're looking lovelier than ever. Oh, always there with a compliment, Vince. Now, why don't you say nice things like that to me, Jeff? <laughs> I'm married to you, darling. <laughs> There's someone else here that I want you to meet. Well, you sounded so mysterious over the phone, I'd almost think you were guarding some great secret. Well, it's a secret, all right. I'm going to tell you what it's all about tonight. Oh, uh, these are the people I told you about, Carl. A pleasure. Sharon and Jeff... Courtney, Carl von Ornberg. How do you do? How do you do? Have you told them anything yet? No, sit down, kids. Make yourself comfortable. Uh, now, what's it all about, Vince? Oh, show it to them, Carl. Yeah. What is it? It looks like a diamond, but it can't be. I've never seen a diamond that large. It not only looks like a diamond, it is one, Jeff. The largest diamond in the world. Well, you're not trying to joke with us, are you, Vince? No, I'm not. Where did you get it? From a man I befriended in Caracas. He gave it to me. Well, that's worth a fortune. What would he want to give it to you for? He certainly could use it himself. Not where he is. What do you mean? The man who gave the diamond to Herr Porter is dead. 
Oh? Well, I hope you'll excuse me if I seem a little dense, but I'd appreciate hearing the story from beginning to end. All right, Jeff. I met this man. His name was George Maupate, a Frenchman, at the hotel in which I was staying in Caracas. He was a strange man, seemed to be afraid of his own shadow. One night, it was quite late, he knocked at my door. He asked me if I'd let him come inside for a while, that he had reason to believe his life was in danger. I couldn't refuse him, of course. That was the first time I saw the diamond. He said he'd been with a hunting party that had gone deep into the Belgian Congo and stumbled upon a strange race of white men who worshipped a huge stone idol on the bank of the Congo River near the equator. They made offerings to this idol, and the offerings were diamonds. His party waited until the ceremony was over. When the people had gone, they took all the diamonds they could carry with them and started back to civilization. But one by one, the men in his party died until he was the only survivor. He felt sure that he was being followed and took passage for Caracas. That was when he met me. Then what happened? Well, two days later, he again came to my room. Carl was there with me. He gave me the diamond, said I was to keep it for him. That if anything happened to him, it was mine to do with as he wished. Well, evidently something did happen to him. Yes, early the next morning they found him dead in his room. How had he died? No one knew. It was quite unusual. Three doctors examined him and not one of them could tell us how he died or what caused his death. George Mopate had just stopped living. And so you have the diamond? Yes, that's right. What are you going to do with it? Keep it and go into the Congo and look for these people he told me about. Won't it be dangerous? Yes, but I don't expect it to be too dangerous. We ought to be able to get back in one piece, eh, Carl? Yeah, and when we come back, we will bring with us as many diamonds as we can carry. Oh, that's the reason you're going in. Yes. Why have you told us all this? Because I want you to go with us. What about it? I don't know. Think, Mr. Courtney. When we return, all of us will be millionaires. What do you think, Sharon? It's your decision, Jeff, not mine. Well, Mr. Courtney, I'll go with you. Then I'm going to. Oh, you'd better stay. Oh, no, I won't be any trouble, believe me. Vince, she can come with us. As long as she makes no trouble for us. No, don't worry. I can take care of myself. All right, then it's settled. I just thought of something. What? Well, this is going to cost a lot of money. Where is it coming from? From the diamond we already have. We are going to sell it. Huh. I guess that takes care of all the answers. All of them. And it is agreed that we share in the diamonds equally, one quarter share for each. I like that. You bet you will. We'll leave as soon as we can get ourselves clear. Oh, it seems such a shame. Jeff. What's the matter? Look. Look at the diamond. I don't see anything. It's shining so strangely. Before it was dull in color. But now look at it. Gleaming and shining as, as if there was something inside of it that was alive. Back now to our story. An original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne entitled The Diamonds of Death. A month later, we took off from New York, bound for Dakar. There, we changed planes, and several hours later, found us in Leopoldville, where we bought a car and a truck and our provisions, hired three native men to come with us, and set out on the last leg of our trip. The roads were good for the first 500 miles, but eventually we were forced to abandon the car and truck and set out on foot. How much farther have we to go? About 250 kilometers. I've been noticing the natives we brought with us. They seem to be getting nervous and afraid. Yes, they've heard stories about the idol in the jungle and they're afraid of it. They say to go near it means misfortune. To steal from it means death. What's that? A cat. Probably a tiger somewhere in the jungle who has just found his dinner. Oh, frightens me. It's nothing to be afraid of, Sharon. We can protect ourselves. We have all the guns and ammunition we need. I was wondering, Vince... You don't think there's any danger of the natives taking off some night and heading back? I don't know. They don't know where we're heading, do they? No, but they do know it's in the general direction of the Stanley Falls. I think that's what's making them nervous. I should think the closer we get to the falls, the more apt they'll be to desert us. They will die if they try to desert us when we get close to the falls. I will see to that. Well, you mean you'd shoot them down? Not really, but I will say that to them if need be. They will think twice, then, before they try so foolish a thing. Elephant. 
Are you sure the animals won't attack our camp? The campfire alone is enough to keep them at a good distance. Don't worry, Sheridan. You'll be safe. I hope so. Listen. There's native drums. Somehow they they sound ominous. They only sound ominous if you believe them to be. A wounded animal screaming out. Oh, no. No, there was something else. I heard it, too. A voice that spoke from the jungle. You're imagining it. I don't know. <laughs> Do you think the jungle has a voice, Herr Courtney? That is only for children to believe. We pushed ahead in the days that followed. The deeper into the jungle we went... The more difficult was it for us to travel. And the drums, the jungle messenger who throbbed out before us that we were coming, coming to steal the diamonds from the idol. Now, according to the map, we should reach the river tomorrow. This is the spot the Frenchman said where we would find the idol. This is the end of our trail. We'll all be rich. But will we be alive to enjoy it? Of course we will. I'm beginning to wonder. The drums. Those are the same drums we've heard ever since we started into the jungle. They know we're coming. They're waiting for us. Do you notice that every time those drums start up, it seems to drive the animals mad? They're comparatively quiet until the drums start beating. They do seem to get angry when the drums begin. I say to you, the diamonds bring death. There it is again. There, what is it? The voice. Nonsense. You heard nothing but the animals and the drums. Oh, didn't anyone else hear it? I thought I heard something. I'm not sure. I think you're tired and nervous, Sharon. We all need a good night's sleep. In the morning, you'll feel a great deal better, I'm sure. They're going as fast as they can, Charles. They are afraid, and their fear makes their feet lag. Why don't you relax, Carl? We're almost there. Because I won't be satisfied. Look. The idol of the diamonds. Why, it must be a hundred feet tall. Standing up with its legs outspread, and its arms stretched forward as if it were waiting to greet us. There's something frightening about it. Look. Where? Over there. There's a man coming toward us. Put your gun down, Carl. What do the strangers want? We have come to see the idol. The idol has seen you, and you have seen it. You speak English? Yes. Some of your countrymen have stumbled upon our secret. From them we learned your talk. We come as friends. Friends? Of all those who have come here, none came as friends. They came to steal, to steal the diamonds from the idol. What's that noise? Time will teach you. You say you come as friends. If so, you will be treated as friends. If not, then the diamonds will be your death. Come, follow me. I shall take you to my village. I guess we're to spend the night here. Well, they seem friendly enough. Strange how they all disappeared when it became dark. Well, the whole village seems to be deserted. What fools we are. Of course. This is the night of the full moon. This is the night they make the offerings to the idol. The village is deserted. Listen. I am going to see the ceremony. We'll all go. Do not make any noise, then. Come. All right, let's go. <laughs> So fast, be quiet. They must not hear us. They must not know we are watching them. They must be getting close. Yeah, we are. I can see something ahead. Yes, through the trees. The whole village is there. And look, each man walks to the idol and sits at its feet. Diamonds. What's the matter? 
stop chanting. Strangers, we know that you watch us. Step out into the clearing, but always remember that if you betray our trust, death will reach out and touch you, and the power of the diamond idol will destroy you, even as it has destroyed all others who have betrayed us. Strangers, step out into the clearing. Back now to our story, an original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne, entitled The Diamonds of Death. We had followed the sound of the chanting, and it brought us to the river bank, and the clearing in which the idol stood, white and tall, rising up into the sky. We thought they weren't aware of our presence, but we were wrong. Strangers! Step out into the clearing. They know we're here. Let's do as he says. Right. Don't try anything, Carl. That is as far as you can come. Stop there. You have followed us, strangers. You say you are interested in the idol of diamonds? Then you may stay here. You may watch the ceremonial offering. Carrying a dime on the place at the idol's feet. The place of when the village is asleep, we shall return to this place. And when we leave, we shall take with us all the diamonds we can carry. Now I leave you, you will spend the rest of the night here. Thank you. Make no attempt to steal the diamonds, for the idol will raise up in wrath and bring the fury of the jungle down upon your heads. He will raise his voice in anger, and there will be no escape from him, for the fever of the curse will be upon you, and you shall die. They understand, Buddha. It is my hope that you do. May we meet again on the morrow. Well, let's go inside the hut. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Miss? I don't know, Jim. He said if the diamonds are stolen, the idol will cry out in anger and death will be our reward. I believe him. So do I. I think they're right, Carl. I think we should leave here. Just the way we came. You think I came all this way so that I could turn around and go back to civilization empty-handed? You're mad if you think that. Think of George Mopate. Mopate died of a fever. That's what we thought he died of. But it wasn't caused by the jungle. It was caused by the power of the diamond idol. You are a superstitious fool. Be quiet. Do you want the whole village down on our heads? All right. I say to you, we came here for diamonds. We leave here for diamonds. I'm not taking any. Get right. And I agree with him. <laughs> all right. Let it be that way, then. Perhaps it is better that way. For in the end, I would have been the only one left. What do you mean? That when we got near the edge of the jungle, I was going to kill you. Because I wanted them all, not just one fourth. But now you have said you want none of the diamonds. That means I own them all. And you will help me carry my diamonds back. You and the native forces we brought with us. That's where you're mistaken, Carl. We're not going to help you carry them back. Oh, but you are. He has a gun. And I will not hesitate to use it. You're a fool. You are the fools, not I. Now, my gun is ready to talk for me. The village is asleep now. We will go back to the clearing and get the diamonds. Move. I said move. You mean that is correct. The native workers we brought with us are in the next hut. You will get them. Tell them that we are leaving. They will be more than glad to come with us. Now get your packs, and we shall go. We, we can't 
possibly carry any more diamonds. You are not carrying enough. It'll have to be enough, Carl. If the natives are loaded down, they can hardly walk. Our packs are just as heavy. We can't take any more. It is a shame to leave them here. But then, one can always return without his companions, of course. It's a long trail back from Arnberg, and you'll have to sleep sometime. We shall see about that. Now let us go. Move along! To think that you believe the story he told us. What fools you all are! Maybe. Maybe not. They do not even know that we have gone. What's that? I don't know. And the idol shall raise his voice in anger. And there will be no escape from him. Listen. They do know that we're gone, Carl. Then you must hurry. The first one who slows down shall answer to me. So the whole jungle is awake. Hurry! Move quicker! Start to run! Traveling like this for two hours. You cannot rest. Even you're tired, Carl. We must rest or we won't be able to go on much longer. Oh, please. For your own good, too. If we don't rest along the way, we'll drop down in our tracks and we won't be able to carry the diamonds out for you. Stop then and rest. But do not try anything. Don't worry. We won't. We won't have to. Shut up. Vince. Yes? Haven't we been here before? Don't get you. This is the spot we were in when they discovered us watching the ceremony. Are you sure? Yes. Just ahead of us, there should be a clearing. The clearing in which the idol stands. We've been traveling in a circle. What did you say? We, uh, we can go on now. Then let us go. Uh, 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 Move along. Move. Yeah, you're right. The clearing is... Something is wrong. We have been here before. We are back in the clearing. We have traveled in a circle. I must get away. I must... The animal... It jumped out from behind the trees. He didn't have a chance. How horrible. Yes, it is horrible. But it was the death that he deserved. He didn't want to take the diamonds, Ruta. I know. When you came here, the thought was in your mind. But you were wise in that you pushed it away from you. What? What are you going to do with us? You and your party may leave this place in peace. And when you return to your world of civilization... It would be better if you did not tell them of what has occurred here. But there will be others, even though you do not tell them. There will be others who come upon this place. Let us hope that they do as you have done. For if they steal from the diamond idol, death shall be visited upon them. And it may come in many forms. It will come. So runs tonight's tale of the unusual, the terrifying, the unknown. Join us again when next we journey down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy to hear another strange tale of the supernatural. All characters and events portrayed in these programs are fictional, and any similarity to actual events or persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. The Mamas in the Little Theater of the Air. <laughs> oh, stories. Weird stories. And by 
murders, too. <laughs> the hermit knows of them all. Turn out your lights. Turn them out. Ah. Have you heard the story without end? Eh? Then listen while the hermit tells you the story. <laughs> This is a story of love that has no end, of the deep, dark shadows of sorrow, of dreams that span the bridge of time. It's my story and Loray's. I am David Runzo, just an ordinary guy with hopes like yours and dreams like yours. I was one in a foxhole with thousands of boys, and in the nighttime when the enemy was pouring all they had on us, I did what a lot of fellows did. I put my mind on other things, but not so my pal Jim Green. The giving is all we got tonight, Dave. Yeah. There was a funny feeling a guy gets out here, never knowing just what minute the end is going to come, and yet, oh, it's so close, you can down near taste it. Yeah. It's a funny thing, though. It never seems to get you like it does me. You know why, Jim? <laughs> Got some secret system? Maybe. Well, give. Let another guy in on it. You got a girl back home, Jim? <laughs> hey, girl. Man, I've got dozens. I've got just one. <laughs> I figure there's more safety in numbers. You've got just one. How do you know she'll be yours when you get back? I know, Jim. There was never anyone for Loray but me. And there was never anyone for me but Loray. You got more faith than I have, Dave. Still a lot of fellas on the home front making hay while the sun shines. So they tell me. I never worry about Loray. She's always with me. Always. Yuck. Christopher, that was a close one. Yeah. I hate all of this. Why do we have to be out here? Our bodies targets for death. Quiet, Jim. Think about something else. You're a fool, Dave. You don't have any more chance than I have. But I have. I've got faith. You know what, Jim? It always seems that Loray is right beside me. Sometimes walking in front of me, shielding me from enemy fire. <laughs> That's rot. You don't have to believe me, but I know it's true. I can feel her presence tonight more than ever. I know she's here beside me. You expect me to believe in such a thing? As if a person a million miles away could protect you in this foxhole. What's more, it's getting hot around here. We're in for it tonight. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. I'm afraid, Dave. Let Loray protect you as she does me. Down, next spot it is. We gotta move out of here. Jim, don't be a fool. It ain't safe here, I tell you. There's zero in on us. Jim, come back. Oh. Jim. Oh, Jim, I told you to stay by me. Loray would have protected you. Jim! You may not believe my story any more than Jim, who lost his life that night. But I knew my darling Loray was constantly by my side. No matter how terrible the battle, she was protecting me. When I was in the front line, she was my shield and my protector. When we moved along the roadways and our planes above spotted us, I had no fear. For Loray was near me. Since childhood, we'd been pals living on nearby farms. Somehow... Even as kids, we seemed to sense that there was a strong bond between us that no amount of kidding from the other kids could harm. They're all laughing because you're walking home with me, Dave. As if I care. They'll bother you all day tomorrow in school. Let them just try. Dave? Yeah? Are you planning to marry me when we grow up? Well... I guess I am. I'm planning to marry you, too. Can't nobody bother us. Only Pa. He says it's silly for a little girl to have a sweetheart. You are my sweetheart, aren't you, Dave? Well, I guess so. You're the only one I like in all the world. More than your uncle and aunt that you live with? Sure, they ain't like real folks to me. You are. I'll always belong to you, Dave. Always. <laughs> And 
that's the way it was, right up through the years. We always belonged together. Maybe it was because I didn't have any real folks. I was an orphan, and the folks that adopted me let me call them aunt and uncle. They were good to me. Uncle Henry planned to let me run the farm when I got through my course down at agricultural college. And someday, the farm would be mine. And Lorraine and I, we planned to be married just as soon as I finished my school course and began to run the farm. And then, along came the war, and I had to go. And the evening before I left, Lorraine and I walked to our favorite place for meeting, in the woods, just beyond the clearing of Uncle Henry's place. We had a favorite old log there where we could peer through the clearing and see the house and hills beyond. And a patch of sky to the west where the sun dipped down from sight and sent colored streamers out into the sky. And here, when night came, we could look up above the treetops and see the stars and watch the old moon come riding forth into a purple field. Our trysting place was like a seat in a cathedral. Everything good and clean in life was close to us there at our meeting place in the woods. It was here that we said goodbye. You don't want me to come into town and go to the station, Dave? Don't you think it's better to say goodbye here? We'll never say goodbye, Dave. Never. No matter where you go. I'm always going to be with you. Sure. I kind of feel like that, too. And, Dave, when you come back, the very hour that you return to me, I'll know it. I won't come down to the station. I'll be waiting here in the woods. Here on the old log. This is where you'll find me. Oh, Lorraine. Dave. You'll be brave? Yes. I'm going now. Don't turn and look. I'm walking away, but I'm not really leaving at all. I'll be with you always. Oh, don't turn and look. Before you know it, I'll be back. I'll return and be sitting beside you. Here on the log at our old trysting place. And so it was that all during the long days of war, I never felt that I was really away from Lorraine at all, or that she was absent from me. Why, there were times when it was as if I could reach out just a little and find her beside me. In fact, there were times that I could actually hear her voice. I recall the first time I heard it. It was a bad hour. The enemy was giving us everything they had from the sky. I knew and liked were dropping all around me. Their cries struck terror in my heart. of all the hellfire and dying, the pain and the terror. Just as clear as a bird call on a silent night, I heard Lorraine's voice for the first time. Not here, my darling. I'm here, Dave. Here beside you. It was so clear, that voice of hers, that I expected to look and see her standing near me. You can scoff if you like. You can shrug your shoulders and pass my whole story over lightly if you wish. But I know Lorraine was there beside me as the battle raged all around. And then it was over. The war was over. And finally the day came for leaving the battle-torn old world, getting on a ship and starting homeward. There was shouting and rejoicing. There was singing and laughter. There was hope about to be fulfilled. There was home just beyond the horizon. We were at sea. Then we were in the harbor. Then on shore. And then soon discharge. I'd made up my mind I'd return without a word to anyone. Yes, I'd fool Lorraine. She said she'd know the very hour that I'd be returning. I wouldn't have to tell her, she said. The very hour that you returned to me. 
I'll know it. I won't come down to the station. I'll be waiting here in the woods. Here on the old log. This is where you'll find me. Yeah. We'd see how good she was. We'd test that second sight of hers, that intuition. All the while on the train that carried me towards home, I kept chuckling to myself. We'll see. Just see if she will be waiting on the old log when I come walking into the woods. My heart was pounding with the excitement of my returning, of the surprise in store for Loray. Oh, it seemed as though the long train trip would never end. But finally, we pulled into the station. There was a little bunch of town folks around the old depot. I didn't want to see anybody. I waited until the train was almost ready to leave, and then I jumped off on the opposite side. I took to the fields that led out to the road to where our farm stood. It was autumn. Already there'd been a frost. And the old maples in the woods were dressed in scarlet, brilliant red. Under my feet, the dry leaves made soft music. Only a little way further to go, and our log would be in sight. And then, there it was before me. I stopped, dead still. I couldn't move. For there she was. There was Lorraine, seated on the log just as she'd promised. The setting sun made her all golden. Her fair hair was touched with it, and sparks of light danced upon it. She was looking right at me. Now she was standing, her arms stretched out to me. Oh, Dave. Dave. Oh, you knew. Yes, Dave. You knew I was coming. Yes, my darling. Just as you said you would know. Yes. Oh, darling Lorraine, you've never been absent from me, not for an instant. No, Dave. You followed me wherever I went. Yes. There were times when I actually heard your voice. Of course. What did you say to me? Do you remember what you said? Yes. Tell me. I remember. I said, do not fear, my darling. I'm here, Dave. Here beside you. Yes. That's what I heard you say. We will never be separated, Dave. Never. Of course we won't. Not now. I'm home safe and we'll never be parted again. Never let anyone tell you differently. Never let them say that we are parted. What do you mean? We're together. We can't be parted, not ever again. Dave. Oh, my darling. More beautiful than ever. But you're so cold. Night is coming. It's chilly here in the woods. I must get you home. (laughs) Try and catch me. Try and catch me, Dave. Well, hey. Hey. You can't run away from me like this. Wait, I'll catch you. I'm a pretty fair runner these days. (laughs) Don't you know I've been in training? Hey. You can't hide from me. Well, what do you know? You've pulled one on me. I I can't see you anywhere. Lorraine, where are you? Say, you can't run out on me like this. I'll find you. Huh. Well, what do you know? Got out of my sight. Okay, honey, you win. If you can hear me, I'm going up to the house to clean up a bit. See Uncle Henry and Aunt Martha. But I'll be over to your house on the stroke of seven. Do you hear me? At seven. And tomorrow we get the license to be married. Lorraine, can you hear me? The license to be married. feeling to oh, see you two. Oh, don't he look wonderful, Henry. Taller than ever and filled out, too. Oh, we're glad to have you back, David. Glad you made it safe and sound. Oh, I tell you, there wasn't a chance of me not making it. You know something, Aunt Martha? All through the terrible business, I felt that Loray was beside me, protecting me from death. Oh, Davy. And the most wonderful part about it all, even though I never let any of you know I was coming home today, Loray had a feeling about it. She was waiting in the woods for me just now at our old log where we always used to meet. What did you say, Dave? Loray was waiting in the woods for me. I just left her. She sensed that I was coming home today, and just like we planned before I went away, she was waiting for me in the woods. My boy. Henry. Henry, you got her. Didn't you get our letters, Dave? Well, sure, I got some, but mail hasn't caught up with me now for a long time. Dave. 
Oh, David. What's wrong? What is it? Well, David, it's like this. She couldn't have met you in the woods, David. Lorraine couldn't have been in the woods just now. But she was. I just saw her. No, David, no. Lorraine died, my boy. She passed away just a little while after you went overseas. We wrote you. We finally wrote you about her death. David finds that the person close to his heart, who he has just met at the old trysting place in the woods, is of this world no more. She's a dream and a vision that is ended in death. What will happen to David's life now? Eh? The hermit will tell you before the night is done. <laughs> now the hermit again. And now David Runzo goes on relating the story of his life to the hermit. Listen. <laughs> you ask, what happens to my life now? You think that I believe that death has separated Lorraine and me? Never. As we reckon time on this earth, my Lorraine was asleep in death at the time she appeared to me on the battlefield. She was not of this world when, in returning home, I met her in the woods at our old and destined meeting place. Uncle Henry and Aunt Martha have taken a place in town. They've left me the farm as they promised, and I'm working it. I've been here three months now. Last evening, Aunt Martha came out to see me. I brought you a pie and some cookies, David. Thanks, Aunt Martha. Oh, your Uncle Henry and I worry about you, my boy. Oh, you must not do that. But we can't have you here all alone. I'm not alone. David, you need somebody to keep house for you. You should find a nice girl. Court her and, and marry her. Aunt Martha, her. never. Oh, it ain't right. It's a sinful terrible thing, you thinking that a dead girl is beside you all the time. Oh, stop, Aunt Martha. You can't talk this way to me. I got her, David. The living can't bow down to the dead. Lorraine is not dead. I saw her lowered into her grave. You must say no more. It's the way I want it. There's no one in all the world, here on this earth or after, that I want but Lorraine. Oh, David. It's the war. It's touched your mind. No, Aunt Martha. There's no use trying to explain. There's a bond between Lorraine and me that is stronger than life, deeper than earth, and beyond all time and reckoning. Sometimes I wonder. I puzzle over the why of it all. Why am I left on earth alone? Why, if Lorraine had to pass beyond, I could not have met her there? But such was not the way it was planned. And I'm not alone. Often as night gathers, when the stars light the sky, when the wind is soft and blows a fragrance in the windows, I hear the door open softly. Lorraine? Yes, David. I am here. I can feel your presence. But I cannot see you. I cannot always return to your sight. But I am ever present. Yes, I know. I will always be near you. Oh, why can't I too die that we may be together? That I cannot answer. There will be an hour. A time for meeting. You will never appear to me again like you did in the woods when I came home? No, my darling. Not until the final hour. Until my death, you mean? We do not call it death. We who love, for love is stronger than death, my darling. Love is of the spirit, and the spirit never dies. And 
so it is I know. The love I bear for Lorraine and the love she bears for me knows no boundary, nor no ending. Do you scoff? Do you shake your head in disbelief? Do you believe, as does Aunt Martha, that my mind is addled by the horrors of war? Do you believe it untrue that my Lorraine, because of death, hath left me? Uh, what matter what you say or what you think? I tell you, she is with me always. During the soft early hours of dawn, when the sun rides the summit, when dusk falls and the shadows lengthen to bring the night, when the wind sings, when the pines mourn, she is near me. This is my story of love that never ends. David Rudzo, a boy who believes in a love stronger than life or death. This is a story he told me, a story without end. Turn on your lights. Turn them on. <laughs> I'll be back. Pleasant dreams. <laughs> Characters, places, and occurrences mentioned in the Hermit's Cave are fictitious, and similarity to persons, places, and occurrences is purely accidental. Dead tired. But I kept on walking through the mist. And suddenly I started hearing footsteps behind me. I turned around, and then I saw him. He was walking along slow, dragging his feet, walking as if he couldn't see. His face was all covered with blood. But I knew who it was. It was Miller, the guy I'd killed. Midnight. The witching hour when the night is darkest. Our fear is the strongest. And our strength at its lowest ebb. Midnight, when the graves gape open and death strikes. How? Oh, you'll learn the answer in just a minute, then. The dead come back. <laughs> Tales of Mystery and Terror by Radio's Masters of the Macabre. Our story by William Morewood will threaten your sanity. Its title, The Dead Come Back. About one o'clock in the morning, on a dark, deserted street, standing in the doorway of a gloomy brownstone house, a man with a wild expression on his face rings the bell desperately. There is no answer, and he rings again. Then... Hey, Doc Padgett. Why, yes. The brain doc knows what goes on inside a guy's head. Well, yes, I'm a psychiatrist. I've got to talk to you. It's very late. If you come back tomorrow during office hours... Now, Doc. Something's been happening to me. Something that's driving me nuts. I'm sorry, but... Get inside. Be careful with that. He won't go off until I pull a trigger. Sit down, Doc. Very well. Just to make sure we understand each other, I put this gun here on the desk and my watch. We got just half an hour to get everything cleared up. 
And then? And then, I got a guy to kill. Suppose we start at the beginning. Your name? Lefty O'Connor. O'Connor? So you heard of me, huh? I'm not sure, but the Tilson murder case. That's right. But as I remember That's it... That's right. He decided I was nuts, put me away. But get this straight, Doc. Yes? I was never out of my head, and I ain't now. I see. Insanity was something that I cooked up to keep from burning. I played it up all right. Good enough to make monkeys out of the doctors and the jury. But when I got to the nut house, it was different. I didn't have to pretend no more. You know, Doc, some of them wax act just as sane as you and me. Yeah, I was getting along fine. Till two nights ago, when I was called in to see the superintendent. He was a white-haired old guy, named him Miller. Ah, uh, sit down, Lefty. Cigarette? Thanks, Mr. Miller. Here you are. What's that? This? Just a music box. Plays when you open the lid. That ain't just a... What are you trying to do to me? Oh, what do you mean, Lefty? I just offered you a... That's the box I kept talking about at the trial. The one old Mrs. Tilson kept her jewels in. I'm afraid you're mistaken, Lefty. In a pig's eye. I know what you're trying to do. But I don't remember nothing. Nothing, you hear? Then why does this tune seem to disturb you, sir? Never mind why. Turn it off. Yes, of course. Take it easy, Lefty. I called you in here because I want to help you. You're trying to trick me into admitting I knew what I was doing when I hit old lady. Nothing of the kind. Next, you'll be asking me where I hid the jewels. Don't you think I know that routine? There's no routine here, Lefty. You're a liar, Mr. Miller. You got me in here to give me the third degree to try to break me down all over again. Well, you won't do it. Not again. I've had enough. Lefty, I'll put down that paperweight. Uh, so I... So... I didn't have no idea of escaping when I hit him, Doc. I was just scared. I was scared of what would happen if he kept after me. When I found a gun in his desk drawer, I began making plans fast. I brought him around. I told him exactly what he had to do. We went out, got into his car, started for the gate. Okay, Miller, it's up to you now. I understand. Now remember, I'll be lying back here with this gun against your spine. Evening, Mr. Miller. Hello, George. Going out kind of late, aren't you, sir? Uh, yes. Something unexpected came up. Uh, you wouldn't be smuggling out anyone under that rug and back, sir, huh? I might. <laughs> <laughs> yep, looks suspicious. Just the right shape for a man. But I'll take a chance on you, sir. Okay, Charlie. Open up for the super. Good night, Mr. Miller. Turn the left fork here. Ah, the Ganville Road. I was afraid of this, Lefty. The Tilson Estate's up this way, isn't it? You're too smart for your own good, Mr. Miller. You can turn off here. But there's no road. In under the trees. All right. What happens now? Do we walk the rest of the way? One of us does. Get out. You're no use to me anymore. I'd like to know. Put that gun away. You can't. You fool. You won't get rid of me this way. You are. Oh. I left him there beside his car and started walking. I don't know how long I was at it. Maybe an hour when I hit the outskirts of town. The light was kind of funny. It was different from anything I'd ever seen. It was kind of yellow. Kind of yellow mixed with a mist that was curling up. Maybe I was tired, I don't know. But suddenly I began to hear footsteps behind me. I looked around, and then I saw him. He was walking on the other side of the road, blind, as if he couldn't see where he was going. And his feet were kind of dragging along. His face was covered with blood. But through the blood, I could see that it was him. Miller. I don't know what happened then, Doc. I must have passed out. Because the next thing I knew, somebody... People, faces bending over me. 
He's coming too, Tom. Yeah. Uh, How are you feeling, chum? Hey. He's as, as white as if he'd seen a ghost. Who, who are you? I'm Ruth Mason. This is my brother, Tom. We live right by. We heard you yell and came running out. <laughs> did, did, did you see anyone else? I know. No. Road? no. You were lying right in the middle of the road till we pulled you off. What happened? Did the car hit you? Yeah, I don't remember. Well, take his arm. Help him up, Tom. Okay, sure. Here we go, Mo. <coughs> the name is uh, Sims. Johnny Sims. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm all right. <laughs> you look kind of bushed in there. I, I, I've been walking all night. Out of a job, see and broke. Well, our house is right over there. You come on in and we'll... Oh, thanks. You. I gotta keep moving. What's the rush if you're just looking for a job? Well, I... Uh, hey. Cops coming this way. Probably looking for that man that escaped from the state hospital. That's but, right. They said uh, that... But, Johnny, what's the matter? <laughs> you look as if you're going to fade again. I guess I must be worse than I thought. Look, does that invite still hold? Well, of course. Right this way. Something more, Johnny? No, thanks, Ruth. Couldn't manage another thing. Full up. Oh, then you lie right down on that sofa. That is, if Tom will get off with his paper. Oh, <laughs> sure, sure. I was just reading some more about that guy, Lefty O'Connor, that broke out of the asylum. Seems he forced the superintendent to drive him out in a car. Please, Tom. Let's not talk about it. it. Gives me the creeps to think of anyone like that being loose. Maybe he ain't so bad. He's a murderer, Johnny. A homicidal maniac. How do you know? Maybe the super deserved killing. The super? Yeah. But the paper doesn't say anything about the super being killed. Well, Ruth said... I meant the old lady, Mrs. Tilson. Oh. Yeah, I, I guess I must have heard. Uh, maybe I just thought... I'll try the radio. Maybe there's some late news on it. Well, you're probably right, Johnny. The super wouldn't stand a chance. Sure. The way I figured... Johnny. Turn that off. What? I said turn it off. Why? Johnny. Hey, what gives? Well, I'm sorry. I, I don't like radios. Well, it's all right, Johnny. We understand. Now, suppose we show you to your room and you take a good long sleep. I must have slept like a dead man, Doc. It was dark when I woke up. There was nobody in the house. I switched on the lamp and looked at my watch a few minutes before midnight. I didn't have much time if I wanted to get the jewels and blow town before morning. So I started for the door, but before I reached it, it opened. And standing there, smiling, kind of sad-like, was Miller. Hello, Lefty. Did you get the jewels? You! It can't be you. You're You're dead. I told you you wouldn't get rid of me so easily. What do you want with me? Nothing, Lefty. Just what I wanted before, to help you. You're a lion. You still think you can break me? Give me the confess, but I'll show you. I must have hit the lights, Doc, or maybe they were never on, because suddenly the room was all dark. I struck a match. I bent down to look at Miller, make sure that he was really dead this time. And... I ain't crazy, Doc. You gotta believe me. But the man lying face up on the floor was Tom Mason. A dead man who came back. And now, a second victim, as the hands of the clock move inexorably to the witching hour. And yet another. Murder at midnight. <laughs> Back to Murder at Midnight. To Lefty O'Connor, sitting in the psychiatrist's office with a gun in front of him, trying to convince the doctor and himself that he is sane. My hand was shaking so much that the match went out. It was Tom, all right. Tom Mason, dead. But it was better that way than what I'd thought, because it meant that Miller hadn't come back from the grave. 
I probably just imagined I heard him talking to me. I frisked Mason. I got the keys to his car and went out. It was a little coupe parked in the driveway. I opened the door. I was just getting in when... Hello, Johnny. Huh? Ruth. <laughs> you look a little better than you did before. How do you feel? Oh, I, uh, fine, fine. Oh, that's good. You were sleeping so soundly when I left it. Well, are you going somewhere? Well, yeah, yeah. There was something I had to do, and, uh, Tom told me I could borrow his car. Oh, all right. I'll go inside. No, and... you can't go in there. Well, what do you mean? Why not? Well, I mean, uh, such a swell night. Uh, have a little drive, Ruth. <laughs> but what about your errand? Well, that'll just take a minute. It'll be swell having you along. Well, I don't know. I, I don't suppose Tom will mind. But... I'm sure he won't. Well, then, all right. <sighs> I guess that's one of the wonderful things about life. You just never know when something completely unexpected will happen. That's right, baby. You just never know. so quiet, Johnny. Huh? <laughs> you ask me to come driving with you, and I do. You don't say a thing to me. What should I be saying? Well, you might start by telling me something about yourself. Like I said, I'm just a guy looking for work. What kind of a job did you have before? Chauffeur. Well, that sounds interesting. Did you work around here? Why? I just wondered. You seem to know the road so well. Listen, baby, let's not talk about me. I'd rather hear about you. Well, there's not much to tell. I'm 21, fancy free, and I work for a living. I'm a nurse in a psychiatrist's office. A what? Psychiatrist. A doctor who, well, helps people who are disturbed mentally. Like people who, uh, see things that ain't there? Oh, yes. He gets a lot of those kind of cases. What does he do? Mm, he talks to the patients, explains away the hallucination. His name is Dr. Paget, and he's really wonderful. Johnny? Yeah. Where are we going? Why, baby? We've turned off the main road. This leads past the old Tilson mansion. What's that? The house where that terrible murder took place about a year ago. It's all boarded up now, of course. Yeah, but... yeah, that's the job Lefty O'Connor pulled, yes. huh? Yeah, he was old Mrs. Tilson's chauffeur. Uh, what? Chauffeur. Quite a coincidence, ain't it? Johnny, you're turning in the driveway. Yeah. See, a couple of nights ago, I broke into this place to sleep. It was just an empty house to me. I didn't know anything about no murder. I left the parcel behind. I want to pick it up. Oh, oh I, I see. You think I had any other reason for coming here? No, Johnny. Sit tight, baby. I'll be back in a minute. All right. All right, Johnny. I... Well, why are you taking the keys? Just to make sure the car stays here and you with it. But of course I'll stay. You better, baby. Gotta be just too bad. I pulled the board loose from one of the windows. Climbed into the old house. It was black as pitch inside. That musty, shut-in smell. Felt my way along the wall of the stairs. Climbed to the second floor. The old lady's room was at the head of the stairs. It wasn't so dark in there. The windows hadn't been boarded and the moonlight was coming in. And I saw that marble fireplace with a gargoyle in the middle grinning at me. So I picked up the poker and smashed into it. And there, behind where I pushed it past a loose brick, was a paper bag containing the jewels. I looked inside to make sure that everything was safe. Moonlight sparkled on them shiners. And then, then Doc, suddenly, suddenly out of nowhere it started. That music started. Johnny, stop it! Stop it! Johnny, where stop are it. you? What? Oh, Ruth! What? Ruth, get in the stop. Get in the stop. Oh, get Mrs. Tilton, that tune. What tune? You mean you don't hear nothing? Well, no, Johnny. But you must. Yeah. It's gone now. But Johnny, you're shaking all over you. Johnny, what's that? What's what? Well, they're all over the floor. They look like diamonds, jewels. Didn't I tell you to stay in the car? What are you doing up here? I, I heard noises and you You were spying on me. No, I wasn't, Lefty. I... What did you call me? Nothing. I... So you guessed it, huh? 
Okay. I am Lefty O'Connor, and I came back for the jewels. But that information ain't traveling far. Not with you, anyway. Yes. You mean it? No! I was rattled, Doc. The music did it. That and everything else. I left the lion there and I picked up the jewels and beat it. It started to come fast. Just about hit the main highway when the wheels started acting funny. I stopped and got out to look. It was a flat. My luck had played out. If I took the time to change it, someone might come along. And just then I did hear a car coming. I, I froze, waiting for it to pass. Instead, it stopped. And... Hi, Johnny. Come. Don't miss. I got out as soon as I could. Which is the flat? What? How did you know? How did I know why you just called me? You told me you couldn't find the tools. And... I called you? Why, yeah. Don't you remember? No, no, I don't. I couldn't have. I, 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 I... Of course, it's none of my business, Johnny, but... Look, you've been acting awful funny. I'm beginning to think maybe you ought to go see a doctor. Someone like Doc Patchett that Ruth works for. There's nothing wrong with me. Nothing. Okay. Okay. Get started with this, Jack. The rest of the tools are under the front seat. I'll get them. No, no, wait. What's this paper bag? Give me that. (laughs) You're calling in for pebble collecting, eh? Pebbles? Yeah, look at them. Oh, they are pebbles. eh? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) What's happening to me? Oh. I don't know. (laughs) But I told you, you don't look well. (laughs) Hey, where are you going? Hey, wait, wait a minute. I told you that was a borrowed car. Get off that round, yeah. boy. I say get off. You're nuts, Johnny. You're nuts. You're crazy. Well, there it is, Doc. Yeah, huh? That's the story. I kept hearing what he said, Tom, over and over again. I'm nuts, I'm crazy. But I couldn't stand it anymore. So I looked you up in the phone book and I come over. So what do you expect me to do, Lefty? Do? You're a brain doc. I'm not nuts. I know I'm not. Why am I seeing these things? What's happening to me? Well, it's rather difficult to make a diagnosis this quickly, but uh, I'd say that you were suffering from hallucinations because of a sense of guilt. Guilt? About what? Well, it probably started with that first murder, Mrs. Tilson. And it's been weighing, preying on your mind ever since. Now, if you could extrovert that, get it out of your system. But I I did. Uh, That's true, but not as a confession, with all the details. That's the only way you can achieve a complete catharsis. Well, that's crazy. All right. You wanted my advice, but you don't have to take it. And you think... Okay. Okay, I did kill her. I knew all the time what I was doing. I waited for a night when there was only the two of us in the house, and then I beat her brains out with a tire iron. There. There, I said it, I told you. Yes, Lefty. And I think that now I can promise you you'll never be troubled by hallucinations again. You sure, Doc? Quite sure. That's good. Because, remember I said that in a half an hour I was going to kill someone? Yes. Well, a half hour is up. And you're the man. Am I, Lefty? Yeah. I'm sorry, Doc, but you know too much now. You're the only one who does, so... I wouldn't, Lefty. Why, why are you sitting there like that? I shot you. Yes, Lefty, with blanks in your gun. All right, boy. Take it easy, Lefty. We got you covered. No. And Mason. Did you get it? Uh Uh-huh. Every word. The cops. No kidding. Then the whole thing. 
Letting me escape and everything that happened afterwards was just a trick. That's right. You wanted to show I wasn't nuts, get me to confess. Smart boy. You made just one mistake, Lefty. Or rather, Ruth did. Following you into the Tilson mansion. She paid for that with her life. But now, now you're going to pay. No, no. Shut up. Yes, Lefty, for that and for the Tilson murder. And my only regret is that rats like you can only burn once. Two grim-faced men take hold of Lefty O'Connor. And Lefty knows that he's come to the end of the road. The road began when he first heard the clock in the old Tilson mansion strike 12 for... Murder! At midnight! to be with us again when death's face peers out of the darkened windows of deserted houses and the clocks strike twelve for murder at midnight. The part of Lefty O'Connor was played by Joseph Julian. With music by Charles Paul, Murder at Midnight was directed by Anton M. Leader. Once again, the keeper of the book is ready to open the ponderous volume in which is recorded all the secrets and mysteries of mankind through the ages. All the strange and mystifying stories of the past, the present, and the future.
keeper of the book. What tale will you tell us this time? What tale shall I tell you? I have here tales of every kind. Tales of murder, of madness, of dark deeds and events strange beyond all belief. There. Now, let me see. Yes, yes, here's a tale for you. The story of a small and desolate island off the coast of New England and the people who lived on it. The title of the tale is Devil Island. Here is the tale as it was told by Anne Drake and is written in the sealed book. It all began on that bleak autumn day when I hired a motorboat to take me out to the island, Devil Island. The bleak-looking island which lay ahead and belonged to the Drake family for 200 years was to be my new home. I kept staring at it, wondering what it would be like to live on this island with my father, whom I'd never seen. Twenty minutes later, the boatman had landed me at the dock and left. Towering above me was a high cliff, and on top of it was the house, a huge stone mansion that looked as old and weather-beaten as a medieval castle. I climbed the steep, rocky path that led from the dock to the house. Hello, I'm... Don't tell me. Anne, I've recognized you any place. You look exactly like your mother. Are you my father? Yes, <laughs> Are you disappointed? Oh, no. No, of course not. Come into the drawing room. Your stepmother and uncle are waiting to meet you. Uh, Hester, Henry. Anne. I want you to meet my daughter, Anne. Anne, this is a great pleasure. Thank you, Uncle Henry. Anne, I'm your stepmother, and I can't tell you how happy I am to have you here. Uh, won't you call me Hester? Uh, thank you. I'd, I'd like to. Oh, Hester. and uh, let me introduce you to the remaining member of the household, Anne. This is Abel. He served the family for 30 years. He can't talk, but he understands what you're saying. Abel, this is my daughter. Uh, hello, Abel. Oh, Anne, it's going to be wonderful having you here. You're just what Drake Manor needs to make it live again. I do hope we'll be able to make you happy here. The weeks slipped by, and I was happy. I spent the days reading with Father and taking long walks with Uncle Henry and being taught cooking by Hester. And at night, Uncle Henry and I would play chess. Well, that's another game for you, Anne. <laughs> <laughs> the trouble is, I taught you how to play the game too well. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yes. uh, it looks as though another Northeaster is on its way. Yes, it does. Uh, would you like me to draw the curtains, Uncle Henry? If you will, Anne. That window over there uh -huh. seems to be... He's there, huh? looking in at me. Who, Uncle Henry? There's no one at the window. Can't you see him? He's beckoning to me. But there's no one there. Here, I'll draw the curtains. <sighs> Is that better? He can't see me now. But he's still out there, waiting for me. Who is? Your uncle, Richard. Uncle Richard? But he's been dead for 15 years. Yes, I know. And now he's come for me. Oh, no, Uncle Henry, you only imagined you saw him. Perhaps the same thing is happening to me that happened to the others. What happened to the others? Your grandfather, Daniel, Aunt Harriet, Uncle Richard. They all died insane. Oh, oh no. No, it can't be. But they did, Anne. There's a strain of insanity in the Drake family. Aunt Harriet for weeks before she died, kept screaming that Grandfather Daniel was trying to pull her into the grave. Oh. And Uncle Richard, he died crying out that Aunt Harriet was at the window calling oh, him. no, no. They all died during a storm like this one. And now my time has come. Richard is waiting for me. I'll be the next of the Drakes oh. to die. Please, Uncle Henry, you mustn't say things like that. Oh, Anne, I'm so afraid of insanity. I'm dying. Uncle Henry, I'll spend all of my time with you now. We'll end this nightmare you're living in. The only end to it will be death. <laughs> On 
Uncle Henry never spoke of his terrible fear again. But in the weeks that followed, he grew haggard, became frightened at the sound of a door opening. Then one day, another northeaster set in. By nightfall, it had whipped itself into a gale. At midnight, I woke suddenly to hear Uncle Henry speaking to someone in his room. Richard! Richard, stop tapping on my window. Go away, do you hear? Why can't you leave me alone? I don't want to go with you. No, not yet. I quickly opened please, my door. Please, I stepped no, into the hall. No, don't take me now. Uncle Henry's voice grew you, wilder and wilder as I approached please. his room. Why don't you go away? You're dead. Dead. You have no right to bother the living. Uncle Henry, let me in. No, it's no, Anne. No, Uncle Henry, no, please I unlock the door. I won't go with you, Richard. My time hasn't come yet. No, I won't. You can't make me. Henry. Why are you raising my window? No, Richard. Don't come in. Stay away from me. <laughs> Uncle Henry. Uncle Henry. Anne, what is it? What's wrong? Oh, Father, do something. It's Uncle Henry. He was screaming and now he... Come here, dear. Hush now, hush. No. <laughs> The door is locked. I'll have to break it down. <coughs> Henry. Father. Father, is he? Yes. Yes, Anne. He's dead. Here in the island, burying grounds of six generations of Drakes, we place the remains of our beloved brother and uncle, Henry Drake, secure in the knowledge that in thy arms he shall find everlasting. Ah, oh, dear. Life in this house won't be the same without Henry. Father... Uncle Henry was terribly frightened for weeks before he died. Anne, whatever are you talking about? It all began during that Northeaster we had last month. Uncle Henry and I were playing chess. But Anne, why didn't Henry tell me about those hallucinations he was having? He didn't want to worry you. Father, did Aunt Harriet... Uncle Richard and, and your father dying, same. Oh, Anne, Henry should never have told you about them. Promise me you won't worry about our hereditary trouble. I'll try not to, Father. We've lost Henry, but the three of us will go on as before. <laughs> Three of us tried to go on, as before, but an unspoken fear had crept into our lives. Often I turned to find Father and Hester watching me anxiously. Then a month after Uncle Henry's death, another storm lashed the island. I'll be glad when this storm blows over. It's getting on my nerves. Father, why don't we close up Drake Manor for a few weeks and take a vacation on the mainland? You mean leave the island? No, that's impossible, Anne. We have enough money to get along on the island, but not elsewhere. But I have all that money. My mother left me. We could use that. You won't receive that money until you're 21. That's six months from now. Besides... Oh, Anne. Well, what are you staring at? Look. Look at the window. Eh? It's Uncle Henry. He's beckoning to me. Anne. Oh. There's no one at the window. He's there. I tell you, he's there. Look. I... Now he's gone away. Oh, you saw him, didn't you? You must have. Darling, you only imagined you saw him. Oh, no, no, I did see him. He was beckoning to me, the way Uncle Richard beckoned to him. It means I'm going to be the next Drake to die. Anne, what are you saying? Oh, you mustn't talk like that. You just imagined you saw Uncle Henry. It was just a... An hallucination. And I'm going insane, as he did. Oh, no, no, don't say that. And you must rid your mind of all these fears, of everything Henry told you. Promise me you won't think about it anymore. But that was a promise I couldn't keep. At night I'd lie in the darkness in my room, thinking of everything that had happened. 
Listening to the night noises. And when that I heard footsteps above me in the tower. That limp. Oh, that unmistakable limp. It was Uncle Henry in the tower. There was an icy coldness about the house as I climbed the steps to the tower. I opened the door. The tower was in complete darkness. But by a window, his face goes like in the moonlight. The Uncle Henry. I come to take you with me, Anne. Your time has come. The grave will wait no longer. No. No. Do not be afraid. Your death is not a thing to be feared. But to be welcome. No. No, stay away from me. I cannot return to the grave without you. Give me your hand. No. 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 For the rest of the story, Devil Island, as it is written in the sealed book. Martin Drake, hearing Anne's screams, rushed up to the tower of the old mansion to find her lying unconscious on the floor. After Martin and Hester had taken the girl back to her bed, Martin went to the mainland. At dawn, he returned with a doctor and waited impatiently for him to finish examining Anne. I've just given her a sedative, Mr. Drake. She's asleep now. Will she be all right, Doctor? I'm afraid she's on the borderline of insanity. Oh, no. And I'm afraid in a case of this type, where there is inherited insanity, there's very little that can be done. <laughs> Sleepyhead, oh. it's about time you were waking up. Oh, hello, Father. How long have I been asleep? A little over ten hours. It's just getting dark outside. Is, is the doctor still here? No, Anne. He left hours ago. And, darling, he says you're going to get well. Why, of course you are. Now you'd better get some more rest. Good night, darling. <laughs> Thank you. 
A moment later, they were gone. I was alone again. Alone in the dark. And all I could think of was... I was going insane. Perhaps I was already mad. The hours passed. The very stillness of the house made my heart pound in my ears. And then... The stillness was broken. That, that limp again. It was Uncle Henry in the tower. Back and forth from one end of the tower to the other, he limped. Then silence. I lay in the darkness waiting. Waiting. And then suddenly... The door to my room was opened. I wanted to scream, but I couldn't. Oh, Abel. Oh, Abel, what are you doing in my room? Oh, what are you trying to tell me? I, I don't understand. Oh, oh, he's walking again. Abel, you hear him, don't you? You do hear it. I told them that Uncle Henry had come back from the grave, but they said I was just imagining it. You, you, you mean no? He, he hasn't come back from the grave? But if he hasn't come back from the grave, then you hear what I hear. You... Abel, you don't... You don't mean that he's still alive. But that can't be true. You buried him yourself. I saw you. You... You mean you didn't bury him? That he wasn't in the coffin? Oh, but you must be wrong. Oh, when we broke into his room, Father found him. He... he... No. No, what? What do you mean, no? It... Are you trying to tell me something about Father? You are. You are. What do you mean, Father, no? Father, no. You mean... You mean he isn't my father? Uh, 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 oh, but you must be wrong. Oh, of course he is. It, it, well, that doesn't make sense. Why should he say he is my father if he isn't? What, what does he gain by it? My mother's estate. Uh, 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 oh, no, no, you must be wrong. Even if I were to die, he wouldn't get it. The estate would then go to charity. It's in Mother's will. Oh, why does he keep walking in the tower? He's driving me crazy. He's driving me crazy. You... You mean they want to drive me crazy? Oh, but why? What reason could they have? They... Oh. Oh, if I were to become insane... He could have himself appointed my guardian. Take over the estate. Is that it? It is. But, but, Ava, if he isn't my father, where is my father? Is, is he dead? You mean he, he is dead? Oh, then... Then who are these three who say they're my father and stepmother and uncle? Oh, I, I don't understand, but no matter who they are, they'll kill me. They'll kill both of us if they learn we've discovered their secret. Oh, but we've got to escape. But how? The only boat is locked and, and he has the key. Uh, uh, Why are you handing me that flashlight? You mean the window. Signal the mainland for help. Yes, of course. Abel, Abel, you better go. We can't let them find you in here or they'll suspect. I'll keep signaling as long as the batteries last. <laughs> Keep signaling much longer. For now, Professor. Andy, what are you doing out of bed? Oh. And with that flashlight? Oh, nothing, nothing at all. I... You weren't signaling someone on the mainland, were you? Oh, no. No, I just had the flashlight in case someone came in the room. Oh, oh. why, you're trembling as though you were frightened. You're not afraid of your own father, are you, dear? Oh, no. No, of course not. Now, now, no more walking around. I want you to get some sleep. Good night, dear. It was gone. Taking the flashlight with him. Did he suspect that I knew? Oh, the hours seemed endless until the first rays of dawn came. Would rescue come with it? Or had my signals gone unnoticed? After I dressed, I went to the window, and, and then I saw it. A strange launch tied up at the dock. Suddenly frightened as the callers leave before I could speak to them, I rushed out of the room. 
They ran down the stairs. I could hear voices in the drawing room. Well, Sheriff, if Dr. Arnold has spoken to you about my daughter's mental condition, I'm quite sure you'll understand Sheriff, that... Sheriff, listen to him. He isn't my father. <clears throat> what was that, miss? I tell you, he's not my father. He's an imposter, and so is she. Oh, Martin, she's having another one of her spells. Now, please, Hester. They're acting, I tell you. The moment I set foot on the island, they began their plan to drive me insane. First, they gained my love and trust. Then they had Uncle Henry confide to me his fears. And when Uncle Henry was found dead, they, Hello. they told me... That... Who says I'm dead? Oh, you... <laughs> I've never felt better. Oh, Sheriff, allow me to introduce my brother, Henry. Oh. Well, Miss Drake, your Uncle Henry doesn't look very dead. He wasn't. They just pretended he was. They even buried an empty coffin to make me think I was attending his funeral. I really think you should take Anne up to her room, Hester. She needs rest. Oh, Sheriff, they're lying, the three of them. Have you any proof, Miss Drake? Yes. Yes, Abel will tell you. He knows. I'm afraid that Abel can't tell you anything, dear. <laughs> the poor chap fell off Devil's Cliff into the sea early this morning. Oh. You pushed him off the cliff so that he couldn't talk. Mark, the excitement's too much oh. over. She's getting worse. Sorry to trouble you, Mr. Drake, but it was my duty to investigate those signals. Well, Sheriff, you can't leave me here or they will drive me insane. I assure you, <laughs> Sheriff, she'll be given the very best of care. We have a specialist coming to see her next week. Oh, no, Sheriff, wait. Wait, please. Now, Miss Drake, I think you'd better stop. No, 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 wait. I, I just want to show you this gold locket. Look. Look, I'll open it. You see what's inscribed in it. Oh, yes. For my daughter, in commemoration of her fifth birthday. What are you driving at, Miss Drake? If that man's my father, if he claims he is, ask him what my middle name is. It's inscribed in the locket. Well, just to humor her, Mr. Drake, what is her middle name? Um, her, um, her middle name? Uh, well... Well, frankly, Sheriff, I... I seem to have forgotten. Oh, he hasn't forgotten it, Sheriff. He never knew it. He isn't my father. That's strange. You're not knowing your own daughter's middle name. Well, it's uh, just that... Uh, well, I I have an awful memory for names. So have I, but I know my kid's middle name. There's something peculiar about all this. I think you three and the girl better come with me to the mainland. What for? So I can do a little checking. If you're Martin Drake, as you say you are, there must be someone on the mainland who can identify you. Oh, see here, Sheriff, this is ridiculous. Just because... I, I... said you're going to the mainland with me. Well, I... I always said you were the weak link in the chain, Gerald. Shut up, you fool. It's no use, Gerald. The game is up. The trip to the mainland is more than we can stand. You just have to look at Hester's face to see that she agrees. Who are you folks? We're actors. Things having become difficult a few years ago, we accepted employment on this island from Mr. Drake. When he died, I thought of this little scheme. It really was a perfect plan, until this fool slipped up on the girl's middle name. Ah. By the way, what is her middle name? Why, uh, according to this locket, she hasn't one. It's just inscribed to Anne. <laughs> And that is the story of Devil Island, as it is written in the sealed book. Because an imposter slipped up on a middle name that didn't exist, an almost perfect crime was prevented by Sheriff Williams, and an innocent girl was rescued from imprisonment and probable death. It was a small slip, but a fatal one. But the sound of the great gong tells me I must close the sealed book once again. One moment, keeper of the book. What story will you tell us next time? Next time? <laughs> Are you sure you want to know? Perhaps my next story may be about you. For I have here all the stories that ever happened, and many that have yet to come to pass. But I'll find one for you in just a moment.
now, keeper of the book, have you found the story that you'll tell next week? Yes, yes, I have found one. It's the story of two helpless old ladies in fear of their lives and the desperate measures to which they were driven in order to save themselves. The title of the tale is Escape by Death. <laughs> Be sure and be with us again next time when the great gong heralds another strange and exciting story from... The Sealed Book. The Sealed Book, written by Bob Arthur and David Cogan, is produced and directed by Jock McGregor. Oh, the phone. It's in the middle of the night. No, not that, not that again. Not him, not that voice, not those words. Theater 5 presents Ring of Evil. This is Lorraine Rayburn. Who's this? Vince? Vince who? What do you mean, just Vince? I can't think of any Vince I know. Oh, I'm frightfully sorry. I just can't place you. I've been running all over town the last month showing my own spring designs. But that's the fashion business at showing time. I hope you don't feel insulted, Vince. It was nearly one when I got in, and I passed out from utter fatigue. Hmm? Well, it's two o'clock. Of course I'm lying in bed. What? What do you mean, what I'm wearing? That's none of your business. I don't care how you like to think of me. Well, I don't think it's a bit funny. Never in my life have I... Now, stop it. Are you drunk or something? I don't know who you are, what you are. Stop it. Stop it. Stop saying that disgusting word. Leave me alone. Leave me alone. Leave me alone. What happened? Oh, Anne, I've never... Never? Never what? I I, I heard you shouting. It's somebody. It was the phone. Oh, I thought somebody got in or or a nightmare. It was the phone. I was asleep and I... Well, who was it? I don't know. A man, he called himself Vince, but I don't know anybody named Vince. Oh, you mean just a wrong number? No, Anne, he asked for me. In the most awful language. I'm not exactly a prude, and you hear some pretty rough stuff around the workshop at times, but never in my life. It's the kind of thing you see scrawled on subway walls. Oh, I feel like things are crawling all over me. And and you don't know who it was? I have the slightest idea. Couldn't recognize the voice or the accent or anything. He wouldn't tell me his last name. He said I didn't know it. Possible. You meet hundreds of people, and some of them are kooks and creeps, but whoever he is, you're not responsible, Lorraine. Yes, that's what I keep telling myself, but maybe I am. Maybe I give men the wrong impression that I'd welcome such a call. Oh, Lorraine, that's idiotic. Maybe, but I don't know what to think or what to do. I'm afraid to go to sleep. I can't change my telephone number in the middle of the season. I'd be dead. And I'm so tired, I could scream. Lorraine, calm down. Get to sleep. When Peter picks me up tomorrow night, you discuss it with him. Oh, I I couldn't. Not Peter. He's too nice a guy. 
Oh, Anne, you don't know how lucky you are to be engaged to a man like Peter. I sure miss you when you get married. <laughs> it's not luck. I worked at it. And you could do as well. But you want your career, your freedom to circulate. All I want is Peter. You talk to him. He'll help you. Thanks, dear. I will. I, I feel better, much better. I think I can sleep now. I hope. No, don't answer. No. Hello? Yes. Yes, Vince. I hung up because I couldn't stand it. Please let me sleep tonight. I need my sleep desperately. That's terrible, Lorraine. Anne told me a little bit about it at lunch, but I didn't realize it was as repulsive as all that. Oh, Peter, you wouldn't have any idea. Oh, I've heard of things like that. These obscene phone calls, but... Peter, what do you think I can do about it? Well, now, Lorraine, I, I don't want you to be offended, but are you sure that this whole thing happened? Sure? Well, of course I'm sure. Peter, dear, I heard her shouting. Well, what I'm getting at is, couldn't it have been a nightmare? No, Peter, I saw Lorraine. And I'll swear she was awake. Yes, I was, Peter. And I was for the second call. And most of the rest of the night. Oh, I, I'm just exploring the possibilities. Now, this fellow Vince, uh, would you say he was drunk? Well, he didn't sound drunk. His speech wasn't slurred. It, it was clear. Only too clear. I didn't miss a word. I see. A and you've never met anyone by that name? Well, maybe I have, but I can't remember. Well, maybe he got the number from the phone book. Well, you know our number here is unlisted. Well, then you must have given it to him. I guess I must, unless he copied it some some office record somewhere. Oh, Peter, I'm so upset. I thought maybe I ought to call the police. Oh, I think you're making a little too much of this. But what do you advise, Peter? Well, I told Lorraine I, I was sure you'd have some suggestion or some help. <laughs> Believe me, I need both. Well, Lorraine, I, I, I would try to ignore the whole thing. It may never happen again. And if it does, this this Vince character will soon understand that you're too nice a girl to play his game. Peter's sweet optimism was very contagious. But my optimism lasted only until 12.30 that night, when the telephone bell once more shattered the stillness of the night. This time I was prepared, I thought. I tried to find out where the call was coming from. It was useless. I knew I couldn't hang up on him until he'd poured out the sewage of his mind. There was no escape. So it continued. Soon he began to call during the day, too. He seemed to know when I might be home. And even when several days went by, there was no relief. Whether I wanted to or not, I thought of him constantly with fear and disgust. My life was distorted. My career was suffering. I had to do something. So, Mr. LaManna, I've decided I can't take it any longer. That's why I've come to the telephone company. Well, now, I understand, Miss Rayburn, but you must realize it's a very difficult problem. Well, surely you can do something to stop it. Miss Rayburn, we handle 25 million calls a day. 25 million, mind you. Now, our company can't be responsible for the content of these calls. Well, I'm not interested in the 25 million calls. What can you do for me? Well, of course, we can change your number or we can keep it unlisted. But, unfortunately, this would cost you many valuable contacts, both business and social contacts. I don't want to change my number. I shouldn't have to. Well, in your case, I can't even advise it. We have found out that anybody who really wants the number can get it. Uh, not from us, mind you, but from personnel records and so on and so forth. Mr. LaManna, I can't go on living like this. I'll go stark raving mad. Can't you investigate and trace calls? Well, we have no power. This man is violating the criminal code. Now, I suggest you go to the police. The police? Well, it's the only way. Now, we cooperate with them all that we can. We can do nothing without them. <laughs> Oh, 
Not at all, Miss Rayburn. It's my job, and I'll do everything I can. But I can do nothing without you. I'd be a pretty poor policeman if I told you otherwise, miss. Detective Simmons, what can I do? I've tried every way to get him to reveal his address, his telephone number, his last name. He's driven me to distraction. You forgive me for saying so. There's one thing any woman can do. Talk. It takes lots of time to trace a call, even if it comes through just one exchange. It's bad enough to listen, but talk... You'll have to, miss. I'm sorry. Each contact point has to be checked by the telephone company while the call is still in progress. But I've got nothing to say to him. Well, you'll have to hold him on the line, sweet talk him, make old Vince think he's getting somewhere with the object of his peculiar affection. Oh, no. Really, no. Oh, yes. Now, I don't say it's either easy or pleasant, but you got to get close to a snake before you can kill it. Think it over, Miss Raper. Yes. Yes, Vince. I'm here. No, I, I've been awake. I've been reading. Don't you understand, Vince? I couldn't sleep. I was waiting for your call. I missed you. Of course I did. I can't help it. Your voice is so exciting. It just gives me chills. No, really, it, it does. It's so exciting. <laughs> I was too impulsive when I decided to play along with Vince and his disgusting calls. But I had to do something. I found myself in a nightmare that terrified me. Could this be me? Could this be my life I was living? The only thing that kept me going was Detective Simmons and the loyal friendship of Ann Howard and Peter Wardell. At least I could talk to them, and I poured out all my worries and troubles. Lorraine, we'll just have to change our number. Yeah, why don't you? Well, because I promised Detective Simmons I'd see this through, and I'm going to, even if it kills me. Which it may very well, if you're not sensible. You're not looking well, Lorraine. Oh, I'm just tired. He called twice last night? Once at 1.15 and then 4.30. I kept him talking for eight minutes the first time and 11 minutes the next. And neither were long enough to trace. I still think Peter ought to stay here in our apartment on the couch tonight. If this Vince heard a man's voice, it, it would scare him good and plenty. Yes, but I don't want to scare him. It's too late for that. And besides, Peter's done enough. Lorraine, believe me, I'd be glad to. Oh, Peter, you're sweet, but you stayed over twice and lost a lot of sleep for nothing. Just because he didn't call those two nights doesn't mean that he won't call tonight. Well, Peter's done enough. He'd be glad to stay, wouldn't you, darling? Of course I would. Lorraine, Ann and I have talked it over, and we feel we can't get married until these calls are stopped once and for all. I wouldn't dream of leaving you alone in this apartment as long as that man is loose. You two are wonderful. Well, all right, let's try again tonight, Peter. Good. If I could only rid you of this Vince, I'd be the happiest guy in the world. Peter stayed that night, and reassured by his presence, I slept a blessed sleep. But the telephone didn't ring all night, so nothing was accomplished. Nothing seems to work, Detective Simmons. I can't keep this up. I just can't. Isn't there some other way? Why should we be so helpless? Miss Rayburn, everybody's doing all they can, but the calls don't seem to come from the same exchange. The other night, the telephone company traced through five digits. Another few minutes, they might have had the whole number and we could have moved in. But you know, it takes time. The calls just aren't long enough. I try to extend them. Heaven knows I try, but... There's just so much I can stand. I listen and talk and listen, and then all of a sudden I feel sick to my stomach. I panic. I admit it. And I close the conversation as fast as I can. You see, I was brought up in a small town, so I suppose 
this sounds foolish to you. Oh, not a bit, Miss Rayburn. I was brought up in the streets of New York, but some of these guys I feel like handling with tweezers. So I have nothing but admiration for you, miss. You've got guts, if you'll pardon the expression. Well, thank you, but I wish it did me some good. Maybe it will, but that depends on how much more you can do. Not much more. I'm almost at the end of my rope. Miss Rayburn, listen to me. If you're game, we'll try a long shot. Game for what? I want you to make a date, Vince. Oh, I couldn't. Take your friends with you to be witnesses. I'll be there, and if Vince shows, I'll pick him up. I, I, I don't know. You'll never be bothered again, miss. Think of that. I am thinking of it. Maybe... Maybe I'll try. Yes, Vince, I'm listening. Well, sure, honey, I was waiting for your call. That voice of yours is so thrilling. You must be a fascinating guy to be with. No, no, Vince, I'm not kidding you. It's great talking to you, but... You know, it's been a long time since you first called. And I'm bored with just talk. You know what I mean? Yes, I want to meet you, Vince. I, I've got to meet you in the worst way. I do nothing but think of you all day and all night. Oh, please, Vince, let's get together. Well, what's there to think about? Not maybe. Say yes. How about tomorrow at 8 o'clock in the evening? You know the hotel, Phyllis? Yes. Yes, that's it. 45th Street, just east of Broadway, in the lobby. Well, just wear a red handkerchief in your breast pocket. Oh, don't worry. I'll be there. I'll be there. Hello? This is Miss Rayburn. I want to leave a message for Detective Simmons. Now, Miss Howard. Yes, Detective Simmons. You sit over in the corner where you can see Miss Rayburn. Read your book, but keep a sharp eye for anyone who approaches her. I'll go there. Right casual, now. casual. Keep it casual. Mr. Mordell? Yes, sir. Lean against the pillar like you were waiting for a date. Whatever you say. Don't glance at Miss Howard or Miss Rayburn. I get it. Uh, where will you be? I'm going to slip on a porter's jacket. Look like I'm cleaning the lobby. I guess that'll make me entirely inconspicuous. Think you're going to nab him tonight? Your guess is as good as mine, Mr. Wardell. Through the corner of my eye, I saw Anne and Peter take their places. A moment later, Detective Simmons started mopping the grimy marble floor. I knew their eyes were on me and their hearts were with me. Or I would have run away. As it was, I waited, with my heart pounding, watching the approach of each strange man, looking for the red handkerchief, which meant that this was the malignant spirit who had appropriated my life, scanning each masculine face for the shadow of evil. Time passed slowly like it had in the many nightmares I had known since that first telephone call. I waited. I waited. He never showed up. Peter took Anne and me home. I excused myself and went to bed, but not to sleep, not for a long time. Not until I heard the door slam shut as Peter took his leave of Anne. That was the last thing I remembered until... Hello? Hello? Oh, it's, it's you, Vince. What happened to you tonight? Why did you stand me up? Well, of course you stood me up, and I know why. Sure, I'll tell you, Vince. You're chicken. Oh, yes, you are. You're not man enough. All you can do is talk, talk, talk on the telephone. You're afraid of me. That's why you didn't come to the Hotel Phyllis tonight. What? What do you mean you were there? Where? You were there watching me? And you thought I was trying to trap you? Well, Vince, how was I going to trap you? Ann and Peter? And that detective? What detective? Simmons? You know his name. I see. And you know Ann 
and Peter. <gasps> oh, dear God. Peter. Nobody else fits. Peter, listen to me. No one else knows those three names. That's how I know. The voice doesn't fool me any longer. Oh, Peter, Peter, what am I going to tell Anne? No wonder I never heard from Vince the night you stayed here. Oh, Peter, 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 listen to me. You need help. You're sick, sicker than anyone I've ever known. And unless you get help, I'm going to have to tell Anne the whole story. As sure as God is in his heaven, I'll see that she doesn't marry you, Peter. It's no use telling me that you love her very much. You have to face the fact that you... Peter? Peter? Peter! They found his body the next morning. Torn. Torn, as it were, between the two worlds in which he lived. Anne kept him in her memory with infinite love. She never understood his sudden death. And I never told her. Presented Ring of Evil, written by Raphael David Blau and directed by Ted Bell. In the cast, Vicki Bola, Roger DeCoven, Ann Costello, Elliot Reed, and Hal Hackett. Audio engineer, Bill Sandreuter. Sound technician, Ed Blaney. Script editor, Jack C. Wilson. Original music by Alexander Vlasdotsenko. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Osser. 